You can hear them. They're ready. I know everyone's already here. It is our penultimate day of TI-12. The fans are rolling in. Everyone's hoping to see the players show up today. We already had a fantastic day one at Climate Pledge yesterday on Friday. See? Look at these guys. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to be the early birds, and there is already a pretty full arena here, but Rezo, Effie, and Lacoste joining me once again for the pre-show for the morning schedule. How are you, Lacoste? I'll start with you on the end, because you had a pretty casual day yesterday. Yeah, pretty much, you know, managed to enjoy some Dota and uh, being part of this always feels good, you know, just watching some top-tier Dota and also hearing the crowd in a long time, which uh, makes my heart pretty full. I actually got a chance to be one of the members of the crowd yesterday and watch the games from the inside. It's such a good energy and like just, you know, just feeling that uh, that vibe and like watching the games and cheering with the, with the guys. It's just such an am amazing feeling. So I'm really happy to be here as well. Have you ever actually attended a TI just as a, a viewer, not a player? No, no. Really? I was, one, one time I was just watching from home, but I never like attended as a viewer. Maybe just only work or like playing. That's it. That's all you are. Work hard, play hard. What about yourself, Abby? <laughs> I know you were here pretty much all day as well, and you were excited for the final series that was yesterday. Yeah, I mean, every series yesterday had some kind of stake that we were emotionally invested in. Um, I mean, we're starting today with very high stakes too, but I just feel like the crowd hits different, you know? You can't even feel sad for your teams being eliminated or losing if everyone's just having such a good time. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the arena as well. There's the secret shop that you guys can go to. I know that tomorrow as well we have the uh, cosplay contest. That's what I was looking for. And also the late show was going on. Did you guys tune into that one? Oh, no. I'm, I went to sleep. <laughs> I feel really bad for you, you know. <laughs> I was watching the games from bed, and then I see, oh, Nat, she's on the late night show. Yeah. Oh, in the morning, I'm like, ah, oh, hell no. Nah, you didn't get enough sleep, huh? <laughs> I, got, I got a good solid How was it? six Did you hours. enjoy the Late Show was fantastic. If, if no one tuned in, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we, I went on with Cheapstick and Pyrian and Jenkins had us do like a little friendship test to see how well we knew each other. We only got four questions because time was running short, but we got three out of four. So, That's pretty good. Yeah, and they were obscure questions that you normally wouldn't have conversations about. It was like, super. what would be your superpower or something like that if you could pick anything? It was a multiple choice? No. There was free reign. We just had to, yeah, there was no multiple choice. We just got asked the question. We just had to write the same answer. So That's impressive. Yeah, it is. So we have that little graphic there as well of everything that you can expect over these next two days. Today being our penultimate day and tomorrow going to be the last day of TI. It's going to be three teams only remaining tomorrow as well, which means even though we have our top six right now, three teams are going to have to go home today, Lacoste. Yeah, it always feels sad, you know, these elimination games, you get uh, so heavily invested, you watch these teams throughout the year, and it, it kind of feels bad, it's just uh, the way it is. But we witnessed some really good Dota, we've seen, you know, LGD Gaming crowning themselves to be the best Chinese team uh, throughout the year, because they managed to play a couple of games against the Zor Ray, that was a very interesting series, you know, watching uh, Zhao 8 draft against uh, Big Draft Lanham, so that's always uh, an interesting one, and uh, I mean, every series had a little bit of uh, oomph to it. Yeah. To me, the highlight of the day was the uh, Bad Boom series against VP. The second game, especially, was like went to 90 minutes. It was like super chaotic. You don't you don't know like for the to do, till the very end who's gonna win because like the megas and people are like death in megas very easily. But then you know one mistake of uh, Kiritich just <laughs> going to the uh, barracks and trying to snitch that uh, you know range barrack and paying off like with their two rapiers and losing that on that spot. It was like very very exciting to see. That game was wild for sure. Um, we we all came to the early by the way and we had like the last 40 <laughs> minutes of that game sitting here just kind of hyping and we're like what's going on what how are they doing this Dude, it really looked like VP had that second game at some point when they first got the rapier on Muerta and then they just ran for the GG push and Wraith King was gonna d die back on, on Nightfall but then they kept them a I don't know. They, it was the, the refresher. His, his I asked this question. question. Yeah, and then he refreshed when he was a wraith. Yep. With the wraith king ulti, he refreshed and then he just respawned. I've never seen that happen before. I thought that was so freaking. Yeah, cool. neither did I. I turned it to Al and I was like, Wait, how, "How? How?" And he explained to me. I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> that, that makes more sense." But as great as the Dota has been, what's really elevated these games has been the crowd and two people who love the crowd almost as much as us is Tsunami and Slacks. 
Another day of Dota. Another day at the International. That's right, Neil. We've been here all night in this beautiful fog. <laughs> I've been sleepless in Seattle, waiting for another day of Dota and more teams to be eliminated because we need to crown a champion soon. Absolutely. You know, it's Friday, good day. A lot of people, sh Jesus Christ. A lot of people showed up, you know, on a Friday to support the teams, but today is all-star matches all day, baby, and it's Saturday. Weekend Dota is real. I can't believe it. We got our upper bracket final coming later on today. We got LGD versus Spirit, a timeless classic, and we're starting things off with Liquid versus Gaiman. Ah, wonderful. Well, uh, with that news, I'm gonna go back to sleep. Liquid Gaming, seen that enough? Thank you, <laughs> good night. See you soon. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> After laying in that much fog, they might actually just be dead. We, we <laughs> might have to check in on Slacks and Tsunami in a little bit there, but the Wraith King impersonation. They, Do they, they have Refresher in the Wraith King form? Well, that's how they're still here, because I think they actually did sleep here all night. They spent the whole night here. I didn't see them back at the hotel. That is true, but I never see Slacks back at the hotel. I do. That, that means oh, do no you? Good. Yeah, because he's my neighbor. I can, <laughs> you know, I can hear some random screaming going on. Oh, you don't actually like physically see before. him. Uh, one time, I can't remember. It was 2022, one of the events, and uh, I was his neighbor. I had to change my room in the hotel <laughs> because of him. He was just—he's just way too loud. It does. It does happen sometimes when we're all in the same. Place. Sometimes we all share a hallway, and people are playing Dota on their laptops, and you can hear screaming at three in the morning. I've had, I've had that. Yeah, it happens a lot. It does happen a lot, but let's talk a little bit more about the Dota before we go into too much detail. We have a little bit of a video for you guys, and we're going to talk about the heroes that we think are, are broken or are co coming up in the meta at the moment. Most broken hero right now in Dota? There's a lot of broken heroes right now in Dota. That's easy. Spirit Breaker. Definitely Spirit Breaker. I think Spirit Breaker. Mmm, <laughs> Spirit Breaker. Spirit Breaker. Spirit Breaker. You just click Clue. You see Doc, ooh, and you just run at the guy. And that's it. It doesn't take like one or two brain cells to play this hero. Spirit Breaker. Okay. I hate to play against him. Oh, I'm dying? Let me go click Nana Lane and charge away. W, maximum speed. Spirit Breaker or Primal Beast? Primal Beast. He picks you up through BKB and he steps on you and he breaks you and he like clobbers you and a bunch of other mechanics that just don't exist in the game, but he does them anyways. I think I already said it to my teams like many times. You guys have to play Primal. This hero is like you cannot hit them, otherwise you're gonna die. I mean, there's also Bristleback, honestly. Bristleback, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. The most unbreakable hero. I think Dota right now has no most unbreakable hero. So, uh, how do you beat it then? How do you beat it? How do you beat Spirit Break? Man, you gotta like completely draft around beating the hero, ending the game, beating him in lane, having a way to catch him. Yeah, do like 30 things, and he's just gotta do like one thing: Q left click. What mascot Dota hero best uh, you know represents your team? I love it. Spirit Breaker seems to be the one. A lot of different reasons, though, as to why Spirit Breaker is, is broken. I kind of like Moon Meander's explanation the most, though. Yeah, you see, Dot, you click. You run at it. And then you, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Actually, I liked how Shalit said there is no broken hero in Dota, mm -hmm. which is kind of a little flex he's doing there. I'm he's the like, I know how to beat drafted. all of them. I can beat every hero in Dota. But fun fact about him is Jowait is a Spirit Breaker player. He's been playing it for many years before it was popular, before it was in, in meta a few years ago even. Mm -hmm. I remember during one of the ESL falls in 2022, he, he created Spirit Breaker mid because he had to stand in for LGD when nothing to say wasn't there, and he could only play two heroes because he's an open player. So he's either doing mid Pinga or mid Spirit Breaker, and he kind of made it a thing back okay. then. It was very cool. Weirdly viable, and has come full circle, and we're seeing it here now. Uh, 
Two heroes I was surprised wasn't mentioned, and I'm going to assume because that recording wasn't yesterday, it was a little, it was a couple of days ago, is the Weaver and the Pugna look cost, especially the Pugna, because he's been rising in contest rate from groups into playoffs, and now he's at a 67% contest rate of yesterday alone. Yeah, he's just an insane hero. The, I mean, the reason why he wasn't so popular at the start is he got nerfed, but he also got buffed in the light, latest patch, and also some of the heroes that he was usually paired up with are not as popular, especially Storm Spirit, but this hero does everything. He's the fastest hero in Dota with 330 move speed. He can easily harass, you can't catch him, and also some of the buffs that he received. The extra 15% on that decrypify slow. This is one of the heroes that is, are, like, it's most difficult to trade in the lane with him. All this constant chip damage, he's also damaging the tower, and when it gets to the mid game, he has like four, four saves pretty much. You do have the Cryptify, Life Drain, uh, defensive items like a Force Tap, Glimmer Cape, very difficult to catch. I actually thought you were going to mention Dark Willow and the Muerta because Muerta is the hero that deals like ton, uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of damage and like the Russians are dying like within a few seconds sure. to this hero and, and Dark Willow he has like this broken mechanic of like not ever catching him and like dealing a, a lot of damage as well so like I think those two heroes are also like worth mentioning on the on the broken side of <laughs> things so there's a lot of things going on in Dota nowadays. Yeah for sure those heroes have been a nuisance but I, I do feel that Willow and Muerta have been a nuisance since the start of the Road to TI until now whereas Weaver I mean that hero has seen a re-emergence all of a sudden. And it's really interesting to see how the main stage meta changes everything, but all it takes usually at TI is one team to play something, make it look good, and then everybody picks up on it. And I think that's what we're seeing with Weaver, because when you think about it, the hero's pretty good against all the strong melee offlaners, right? They can't really catch him. He scales well into the late game, and he combos very well with the popular supports in the patch, like the Willow and the Grimstroke. And it's also a flex hero. Like, we've seen some teams playing it as position four, plus also you do have a really good scaling, whether from position one or two, or position four, and also you do have a new shard, like relatively new shard that allows you to become Gyrocopter, pretty much. This newer Deso build, uh, Shikuchi, you put a mark on everybody, and this suddenly you're hitting multiple people in the middle of the fight, also having Satanic, uh, and uh, it just feels so good. I feel like uh, some of these heroes were coming into TI, were not considered good, but as Effie mentioned, all it takes is one team to play it, and others are like, what What the hell is this? This is uh, one of the finest creations we had. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure the, the four days, it was a lot of small, it was a small pool of teams that were scrimming each other too, so if one's pulling out a Weaver in the scrims, I'm sure they're like, okay, how do we deal with this? How do we make it that we could potentially pick the Weaver too? So, They've had that time to adjust for themselves, and we saw a lot of Weaver and Pugna yesterday. In fact, let's have a look back on yesterday and the gains that we were blessed with. Though. Coming out from Lilith, this may buy Gunner some time to get more magnetized stacks onto Quinn. Nails him with the next rolling Bogle as he tries to swatch Buckle away. Locked in though by Tofu. Great stuff on and they're gonna be able to catch him in the hammer. Ravage into the hammer. The chain stuns are real, but Gunner is somehow still alive and he's going to in. Up with the magnetized, he's gonna chase after Tofu. Tofu gets the armor room. Shield room. What a turnaround. Shallow Grave on somebody, they're getting these heals, they get a hand of God. It's a huge amount of burst heal. Oh, straight through the portal. There's gonna be the follow up here though. The Tusk's gonna fall in. Yamsin joins in on this as well, thanks to the Spectre. And now they're gonna be able to chase down Tofu on top of that one. A lane of barracks before the 20 minute marker. Garachu is gonna clean up at least Yamsin, while the others limp back to the fountain, barely alive. As now will be defeated in a swift 2 0 as gaming go wild. That boom team! Versus Virtus Pro. There it is. Stampede run together above the torrent. And then into the ink swell. That was well played. And exactly what VP needed. But then everybody dies on the other side. Oh man, that Wukong's command was devastating. Oh, on. The throne is there. It's exposed. But nobody is hitting it. Notice tries to get out. But God, they do so much damage with the rest of these heroes. Now kicking back in. The tombstone double tombstone down. The throne exposed. Pure. All on top of it. Can they bring it out in time? Save. He's in the shadow realm and trying to end the game. The control, it's going to be there, but they 
find the hex, trying to kill him. Games are in it! Toronto, Tokyo, ends the game! And with that, that boom! They are going to knock out Furnace Pro in a thrilling 87-minute game. Team Spirit versus Team Liquid. That skill is dead in the water. He's making kind of with the god He's going to be able to kick out one, but that's just the Aegis. Can he take out Collapse in tow as well as the Egg is yes. continuing to go out? Will get the stun off. Do they need to get spirit? Oh. Right. Demonic Purge onto Zai. Do they have the damage though? He's half AP with that BKB already activated. Going in really deep. They pop the Egg with the Sunray as well. The Ravage is being expended as well. He's getting healed now from Insania. This cow will live on. Vegans around the world rejoice. He lives. And now they're going to try to turn this around onto Yatoro by Mickey. Getting one more charge off. Eventually, he will fall, though. So, beef enjoyers enjoy, but Jotaro will drop as well. So, there is a trade, and it's very heavy. Jotaro is using Satanic to pick off Curse Crown, not even caring about anybody. It's so much building damage. Already, both tier fours down to stack. Started putting all their efforts onto the Weaver. Laura literally ignoring everybody, along with Collapse, as they will take down the Ancient and Team Spirit secure themselves top three. We're enjoying that fight in the minute if it kicks off. We're going to see okay. the try and start thing. They get the drive back on to Chalice with the skewer. Good damage here. They're able to cleanly take him out the first time round. It's pretty isolated. See if they can go for round two. RP straight away from nothing to say. Another skewer getting him right up into the base. Up towards the tier three. The fear there as well. They'll be able to take him down. Jamming tried to hook up forward to help him out, but Chalice has fallen. Maybe going to find him Drive by with a shield, they'll catch up one. Oh, wow. I mean, those are massive catches. This is this a gem as well, too, picked up? I think it is. TP's coming in. There's a split. The split is there. Shira, he's ready to dive in. They're getting aggressive on the Sombers underneath the tab. And F5's in with a snowball. Five time for Sombers to try and survive with the damage. He's done nothing. The same finish is all off for the illusory orb. They'll go for F5. Stolen snowball here from Planet, closing in onto the Tusk. F5 caught by the stun. Further team is coming in. Chalice hits in hard with the star break over towards Shira. He's been caught by the sun. Shira is surrounded. He looks to jump out with the Ottomans over. I got killed on TRD. GD take this series 2-0, knocking Azure down. A phenomenal day one. It did see us saying goodbye to Nouns, though, and obviously Virtus Pro 2, but not before Virtus Pro were a part of the record for longest game at TI 12. So they're at least going to have a record to their name. For now, it might be beaten. And we did see Liquid falling to the lower bracket as well as Azure. So they no longer have that second life for themselves. They're in that elimination and they're in that do or die situation for themselves, Reza. It's crazy to think that Liquid and Gaming Gladiator are facing you know quarterfinals uh, of the lower bracket and you know and for elimination match instead of like playing in the finals like we used to see them right in the and during the season and uh, I do think that uh, <laughs> you've seen all the liquid fans rolling in as well right this is actually all the early birds it's just all of liquid and gaming gladiator fans yeah I mean it's it's, it's crazy I, I, I love the people behind us they all were cheering for the I can see some liquid, liquid signs Woo! yeah <laughs> We were, we were gauging the reaction before. I was like, Liquid fans, it was pretty loud. I asked for gaming, and it was like, maybe 80%. Okay, I maybe two people for gaming. They're on the other <laughs> side. Oh, yeah, they're, they're on that side, you reckon? But anyways, like, I do think that uh, gaming are coming to this series way more prepared because they already like won three series behind them, yeah. right? And uh, for Liquid, like, they're dropping from the upper bracket. So it's like, it's not, it's not as easy to like, I'm um, from the you know from the losing position to like win a game, but uh, when you're like on the streak and for for gaming as well, like they have this unique way of playing when they're like pushing people, and uh, there's no other team that plays like that in this in this tournament. But on the other hand, Liquid are no stranger to the lower bracket. I mean, they have made it to so many grand finals this year, running through the lower bracket. Whereas gaming, we tended to see them succeed just through the upper bracket. When we saw them truly tested at Riyadh, they had to, they were knocked down actually by Liquid to the lower bracket and they didn't make it to the grand finals. So I, I do feel that in terms of being in this position, if there is a team that you shouldn't be concerned about in the lower bracket, it is Liquid. 
We're seeing here the, the major results. Everyone that knows the story of the repeat, the three B <laughs> between gaming caddies and liquid. A story, a tale as old as time. But before we really delve too much more uh, into this matchup, into the games that we're going to see today, we were talking about heroes, broken heroes beforehand. And we actually didn't hear from the one person I think is going to give us the most valuable information about some broken heroes, and that's Purge. Thank you, Nat. Yeah, the hero that we didn't talk about this morning was Bristleback. Uh, he's the fourth most picked hero of the tournament with a 50% win rate. But yesterday, every single game except one, he was banned in the first phase. So the game that he did get through in LGD versus Azure, they had expectations for how to beat him. And we can take a look at some of those. Before the game even began, they blocked the camps to make sure that these couldn't be stacked. That way, when later the supports come by to get these free stacks, they say, hey, there's nothing there. That should delay when Bristleback is effective as a hero. But eventually those get dewarded by FY, which is very effectively done. That was at the five minute mark. But here we are at the 10 minute mark, and we still, we already have giant stacks for him to take. Now, briefly before he clears these stacks, take a look at his net worth here. He's sitting at 4,500 net worth. By the time he clears this entire camp, he's made 1,100 gold for himself and the gold that Shadow Demon and Experience gets, uh, and Shadow Demon, the Experience and gold that he gets. So 1,100 gold catapults him to the top of the net worth chart. And this translates to this great Ag's Bloodstone build. Now, this is a big highlight from yesterday. He had already lost a team fight. He runs up against the enemy squad and his quills are doing stacking damage and he's life stealing 75% of the damage that he's doing to enemy heroes. That was 20 quill stacks on Magnus. Each additional stack was doing 1200 damage. And at the end of the game, right before they lost it with the Bristleback, despite a great performance here, Shiro ends up going for the kill. He uses his uh, Silver Edge here to break him, but unfortunately it procced on the Weaver instead. And then he utilized his ultimate here. This makes him ethereal, so he can't take physical damage. Watch how many stacks of quills he gets while he tries to kill this guy. 32 stacks. Oh, he's not done yet. More. 40, 43 stacks on Bristle before he finally kills him. Each quill would have done 2,600 damage there if he wasn't immune to damage from his ultimate. So it takes a lot to beat this hero. It is very strong, and we are definitely going to see a band at some point today. Thank you so much, Pudge. I mean, 42 quill stacks there. Actually, I, I take it back. Maybe the audience is here for Purge and not for the teams at all. That's a big old cheer for him. Our schedule for today, we talked about it. Starting off with Liquid versus Gaming Gladiators. We might have seen this matchup a bunch of times. That's normally in the grand finals. It's going to be followed by another elimination match. It's Azure against Bet Boom. We're going to shift to the upper bracket, that Team Spirit LGD. Who, see who's going to be making it to the grand final tomorrow. And then our final series will be yet another, our third elimination match of the day between whoever wins in those two first series there. Yeah, all bangers without a doubt, but the one I'm looking forward the most is Team Spirit against LGD Gaming because these two teams have really long history together. Every single time they meet, you know that top tier Dota is guaranteed. You know that like they're going to be pushing the limits with the heroes, uh, with the drafts that they're going to come in, in the, into that series. And also, like this is a TI-10 rematch pretty much of the grand final, so... Really looking forward to that one. There's a lot of back and forth between those two teams since TI-10 as well, because we had uh, Riyadh last year between yeah. them as well, Arlington Major between them as well. So yeah, it extends. It's a pretty lengthy history. For sure. And the Arlington Major definitely had TI-10 vibes in the sense that it felt like LGD could have won it at some point. It was a 3-1, if I recall. But they were playing so dominantly in the first two games and just draft choked which was the story of them since TI-10 mm -hmm. up until now. But it seems like they fixed a lot of their stubbornness that they had in drafting. So I'm sure that Zhao Aid has a bone to pick with Spirit. Like if there is a series that he prepared for, for the entirety of this tournament, it is this one. They have a lot to prove and I'm just excited to see it happening. But something else I also wanted to comment on is yeah. the winner of the first series of the day is going to play again during the fourth series of the day. Yeah. That is exhausting. That, that is a position that might be very difficult for either GG or Liquid. So 
I'm, I'm really curious to see how fatigue plays into today as well. If you were in that position, Rizzo, would you rather be a part of the first series getting a two series break and playing the fourth? Or being a part of the second series, having a one series break and playing the fourth? And that's not that big of a difference, oh, right? Really? But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, usually playing f a second and then the last is better because like there's a little break and uh, you can just like chill a bit, meditate and <laughs> get your things together <laughs> and then go for the next series as well. How many of them do you think are, are, are meditating in that time? I don't, I don't like, I don't think a lot of players actually using that power. To be honest, like I, I only know that uh, you know, Jerex, like the, the guys from the past OG, were doing that. But for nowadays, like I don't know how much of the liquid are are, are doing that or like gaming. I mean, I think gaming should be doing that because like like Tofu looks like a guy who uh, <laughs> he looks pretty zen. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he looks salary. pretty zen. <laughs> In the booth the and other the day, he was yeah. looking pretty chill, you know, summoning uh, his <laughs> we were having for a good debate. 30 seconds. We were having a debate over whether that was meditation or if he's like, I don't like this era, I don't like this draft, what are we doing? He, he did look like he was in physical pain, but or maybe he was just really sleepy. But uh, Tofu does look like the kind of he, dude who'd eat Pray Love in India or something, you know? Like he'd go he on went around. Find himself, bring his teachings to Dota. He could be, he is the type for sure. He's gonna ground all of Gabe and Gladiators. Well, we could continue this conversation, but first, let's hear more about Gabe and Gladiators. And we have a video piece on them that we get to watch right now. I've been playing games throughout my whole life, whether it was on Game Boy, consoles, eventual computer, like all due to my older brother and his friends that I just watched, I wanted to play, and I got into it. I was backpacking throughout Asia for a year, and I saw some poster of TI and some public viewing in the city. So I showed up there, and there's all of, I don't know, a thousand people, and I was like the only white dude walking in, so everyone was looking at me, people were like getting interested. I bought a laptop there, I started playing on a laptop. Then at some point back home in Germany, started studying, I'm like playing from the kitchen table or lying down in my bed. And eventually, when they in introduced the DPC leagues, I was like, Div 2? I can do Div 2. And then, I don't know, I eventually got ambitious and wanted to prove whether I can make it or not. He's still alive, but not for much longer. Eventually, he will fall to Tofu. I started grinding into top 100, getting into games with pro players, eventually making contacts, friends. The Golem comes down on the Sash Curtain on through, though. GG's are called, and the series will go to the Hellbear Smashers. My first team was Helper Smashers back then. Get tofu though, watch Tofu, watch Tofu. But I don't know, it's not really real if you're not playing against a real and big competition. From watching TI, it's like build of hype and emotion, and you see these teams with like fireworks winning and sad teams losing, the whole spectrum of emotions you get with like eventually people lifting the ages and me at home at the screen watching, like shredding tears, like it's so intense that you really wish to experience the same, like to be there. For me, actually making it there now is an experience that I wouldn't trade for anything else. And I'm really glad that I made it to the main stage and I hope that I get the chance to lift the ages. He didn't talk about meditation, whether Tofu is one for meditation, but he's been able to come on the main stage. He was playing yesterday, it was a very quick 2-0, and one step closer to be able to have that dream fulfilled for himself of lifting the Aegis. But I don't want to talk about Game Gladiators too much more. I kind of want to shift a little bit more onto Liquid and how we see them as a team, maybe what their mental is coming into this one, going from lower bracket and shifting, sorry, going from upper bracket and shifting into lower bracket now. They broke the curse. I mean, nobody beats Team Liquid 17 times in a row. This is what Insania tweeted after they managed to beat them at three at Masters, dropping them down to lower bracket. But uh, yeah, I mean, Team Liquid, they were always like strong mentally as a team, having Blitz as a coach who does a lot of things for the team. And I'm not too worried about them. They showed that they can play some really good Dota and even under the pressure. I mean, the sad thing about Team Liquid is they could have been the best team throughout the 2023 if somehow Gaming Gladiators didn't show up as strong. I just realized we might have the inverse per se of Riyadh. So uh, Talon put Gaming Gladiators into the lower bracket. Now Liquid might knock them out, whereas Riyadh, Liquid put them into the lower bracket and Talon knocked them out. So uh, maybe there's a little bit of uh, scar tissue as well for Gaming Gladiators when it comes to this matchup. I mean, for sure, Liquid are the team that is showing up like the best when they're, you know, against uh, against the wall already. And like when there's a high pressure, this is when they start playing like really well. So I'm not I'm not gonna be surprised that they're gonna take this series super easy. 
Yeah, and I mean, we saw them last year not qualifying through DPC points, only to make it through the last chance qualifier, only to make it to third place at TI. I mean, they are no strangers to pressure. They are no strangers to this kind of environment. So I'm not worried about their mental state. I'm just worried about the matchup okay. itself, because it feels like of all the teams that they could encounter in the lower bracket, Gaming Gladiators is the one that knows them in and out. Mm -hmm. But I guess the inverse can be said for Gaiman, where Liquid knows them really well. But there's also just the mental burden of having such a bad track record versus them this year. And the thing is, at one point, they were going to have to face off against each other. Whether it was this, in this round of the lower bracket, the next round, or even the grand finals, these two teams were destined with how this uh, bracket has has. Uh, played out that they were going to meet again the cost. Yeah, the, uh, at coming into this uh, tournament, uh, we thought that whole year was pretty much scripted because how it worked out throughout the whole year, but uh, eventually, like, this is the final boss that Team Liquid was preparing to face throughout the whole year, so now it's their time. All right, we heard the horn there. Everyone in the arena getting excited. It does mean that our day is going to start. That's right, day number two of our finals weekend here in Climate Pledge Arena. We have four best of threes, and the first one is going to begin now. It is a beacon sounding a call to greatness that echoes worldwide. A crucible, forging a single contender worthy of rising above the very best. And a celebration, gathering a community of millions to witness history unfold. It is the International, the final proving ground, where the world's finest Dota teams assemble to face each other in the ultimate test. Each challenger has earned this honor through hard-fought victories in matchups around the globe. The journey has tested some more than others, but the favorites and underdogs all know the road to the Aegis defies all prediction, and anyone can carve a new legacy here. The Aegis of Champions returns to Seattle, and with it, the eyes of the world. Six teams compete for ultimate glory. Only one can seize immortality. Who will emerge victorious? The battle begins. Absolutely. I can't wait to see any more of these games today. Oh my god. Well, you don't have to wait much longer because we're going to welcome our first team to the stage. They're going to be hearing that as they are walking out on stage. They're going to be taking their positions at 
the booth off a rough day for them yesterday, losing that series to Team Spirit. They are five players that we know are able to bounce back and bounce back they're going to have to if they want to see their run at TI continue. Effie, this matchup, we're going to hype it up a little bit more and we're going to try and break it down some more as well. I mean, this is the El Clasico of this year. It's always been Liquid versus Gaiman, Gaiman versus Liquid. It's just been, people start to think there's a script, right? There's something going on behind the scenes, because how could this happen so often? But this is unprecedented at TI for both of these teams. I'm not at TI, just throughout the year in general, for these teams to meet in the lower bracket. It's always one of them making an upper bracket run, facing the other, but I mean, this time around, it's different. It's a different kind of pressure. They're not just fighting for the finals, they're fighting to stay in the tournament. So this means a lot for the both of them. It is an elimination uh, match. It's that lower bracket for themselves. So I'm sure there's not going to be that much experimentation happening. But I do have to ask that question of how much change up is there going to be, Lacoste, for a drop, for a playstyle? Because the tempo of gaming gladiators against Nouns yesterday was really high paced. They were closing out those games between the 20 to 30 minute mark, whereas most other people were taking it 50 plus minutes. Does a tempo, does something like that work against Liquid? This is their bread and butter. This is how they played throughout the whole year, pretty much. And they decided to speed it up when they started to play against Nine Pandas. You mentioned the Noun series as well. Uh, the key hero in that in those series was Chen. Three out of four games, they like this is how Celery made the name for himself, uh, playing it. Enchantress mostly, but these are similar type of the heroes, these lane dominators. Uh, and now he's buying auras on Chen, coming online super fast. We've seen these like healing strats coming out from gaming gladiators and uh, Team Liquid, they will need to figure it out how to match this tempo. I think the Chen is going to be banned in this series, so they're going to so they're gonna need to have final replacements for that playstyle to work, like to keep working. They need to find some maybe Dazzle, some maybe Vengeful Spirit, some other heroes to replace the Chen and keep building the source and keep having that ball, you know, that death ball that uh, Liquid and need to, you know, be stopping. Mm. I and mean, you can't forget about the Enchantress, too. That is a Celery specialty, and they can play on a tempo like that. They can also just accentuate it with these aura heroes. Reza mentioned the Vengeful Spirit is something that can carry an aura. It can also just be some, you know, pipe buyer from the offlane like Tidehunter. We did see them run that yesterday versus Nouns as well. So there are a lot of ways to play into that tempo draft. But honestly, Game Gladiators can also play into the late game. This isn't something that these teams are strangers to. If you play competitively in this patch, you are regularly playing these 60 minute games and you've gotten used to it by now. I feel like it used to be late game was this anomaly. People didn't really know how to play it because games were very rarely getting there, whether it was in scrims, whether it was officials or anything like that. But now we're seeing it more frequent. So I think teams are understanding the patience and the maneuvers that need to occur when it comes to late game. And we talked a lot about Celery, trying to ban out some of his comfort heroes. And that's tough. If, if you're trying to put that much focus on a POS 5, it begs the question of what's going to get through. And Lacoste, we already mentioned about this Pugna. Do you think it's going to be highly contested between these two teams? Uh, potentially. I mean, uh, probably there's a lot of talks coming into this series about Pugna because he really shined uh, throughout yesterday. And uh, Team Liquid, they did not play it at all. But uh, I mean, Insania did play it yesterday. That's my yeah. bad. But uh, they understand how strong the hero is. He's a lane dominator, makes uh, a lot of things very difficult. Like he's a snowball hero. And also like CY, this guy, he's cooking up some really cool drafts for gaming gladiators. And I can see why they decided to pick him up at the start of the year. Do you think CY has the answers uh, to a pug now, Rizzo? I mean, I'm sure he does, but I, I didn't like that really big and, and white yawn from, yawn from Blitz. From Blitz. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's that about. <laughs> like, if Shao he, 8 he was, was up, there... He was up watching the late show, you know? Yeah, That's what if, it was. If Shao 8 was there, he would tell him to go watch his face right there. <laughs> The thing about Pugna is I feel that this hero was in the meta last year uh, during the Arlington Major to the point where he's been solved and how teams should already have an idea of how to play against it. Now I see Pugna being very effective in this meta because you have a lot of these tanky blade mail hard buyers that go in first and outside of your spell kit and your laning being so strong, the life drain sustain is not something to be scoffed at. But a lot of the teams have already gotten used to playing these shakers mid these Earth Spirits mid, these Kunkas mid, any kind of hero that can make sure Pugna's disrupted in the backline, 
can easily be worked into a draft. So I feel like in terms of solutions, both of these teams should already have an idea and not be very scared of it. The things to be really afraid of, I believe, are the Spear of Rigor, the Bristleback, the Muerta, yeah. the, the things that have been plaguing us since the start of the road to TI. I was trying to think outside the box of, you know, <laughs> the other things that aren't always the stock standard that we're being seen, but you're right, you can't overlook those ones either, and we can't overlook these stats between Liquid and Game and Gladiators. Their winning game time was pretty similar. It's very close, and I don't know if that's just now Game and Gladys having a lower average from yesterday's series, or Team Liquid's average going up because of yesterday's series. I mean, I think these two teams are very aggressive in the way that they play, but the difference between them is usually Game and Gladys drafts usually have like some way of uh, killing towers faster, and like th those timings are coming like way sooner. Like they, they would take the map from the Liquid sooner than Liquid would, you know, be able to take the map from, from them. Okay, sorry, I thought you were going to keep going there, Reza. No. But no, you, you were right, and that's why I asked earlier whether the, the tempo that Game of Gladiators brought would be able to match up to this one, but what do you think the conversation is in the booth right now, Lacoste, between either team? Oh, the headset's not working, apparently, so I think that's Can you lip read? <laughs> can you lip read? Um, I, I can make stuff up. It's like, yeah, the, the, the fabric is too soft, and you can... You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're definitely going to deal with their tech problems right now, but probably I, I think they're thinking about how they're going to play that tempo style you talked about, Nat, the early game aggression. So I think the carries that they're eyeballing are the Chaos Knight and the Weaver for Duraccio especially. I'm sure that Liquid know that in advance. I mean, CK has been banned out almost consistently for yesterday. We even had Aoi come in panel and say that he thinks that's the most valuable hero of this TI, is that CK. So you're looking at the CKs and the Weavers, but now you also have to think about the Bristlebacks that have, you can't let that man slip through. And then of course there's a Spirit Breaker. There are so many heroes right now at this stage of TI that have to be solved in the first phase that you can't really solve them all. You're talking about the Chaos Knight, very valuable point. Let's actually talk about carries. Let's start with Liquid's carry, Mickey, right? He loves that Chaos Knight. You already talked about it, why it's constantly being banned out for him. And uh, this is some of the stats of what he has so far for TI this year. And he is in the top four for a lot of them, Reza. Yeah, he, he loves to take buildings. 175,000 damage. I mean, th this guy, he's uh, he's like very similar to Duracho. He's playing very aggressive. He's more of a like, uh, he takes more of a position one approach uh, more than Duracho, but uh, like still they're very similar in terms of like how active they are and like how they're finding these little pickoffs and like setting the tempo for their team. It really, it really depends which heroes he's playing because Mickey can be super explosive. He tends to join early on whenever he plays this Beaver, uh, plays uh, Spectre as well, CK. It's all about the timings. I think Team Liquid also has general, like one of the best teams in the world to understand understand how they're going to hit their timings. And I think Mickey plays a crucial part in that. And also it's just where Mickey farms on the map, right? He farms very aggressively, which is something Duraccio is no stranger to. Cause Jirach is always pushing out waves he shouldn't be pushing out, and it works for Gaiman, but I don't feel like Liquid operate in the same way, where if Mike dies in a really dangerous place, they benefit from it. Because what comes to mind is their series versus Spirit yesterday when he was playing Spectre. Uh, it looked like that game was theirs, to be honest, but uh, Spirit had a sequence where they got a Roshan and they got a good fight, but then they found a pick on Spectre farming on their side of the map near yeah. their Twin Gate. And I just don't feel like Liquid can get away with carry deaths like that in the same way, because Gaiman have operated throughout the entire year playing, like taking advantage of space of carry deaths like that, having their win conditions be assigned to different heroes, whereas in Liquid it is Mickey who is the win condition. Well, we're comparing a little bit of stats. This is Durachi here, the Gaming Gladi. It is Carrie comparing the two of them. Did anything else stick out for you there, Rezo, with those stats? I mean, he's, uh, as you can see, like Miro's talking about, he's not playing that crucial role in that team because, like, he's kind of like a playmaker for them. And the ace is, like, usually the, the carry type or, like, uh, the, like the, they have way more even split between all of the cores. Like, as for Liquid, it's, it's, it's a bit different. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. That comparison, uh, not the stats one, but that you're talking about how valuable Mickey's deaths are and mm -hmm. sort of how okay Game and Gladiators are with Duraccio deaths, their hero pools are actually quite similar though. So they're playing similar heroes, but the way that everything else is formed around these is that key that you're talking about. But the Chaos Knight is similar between them, the Spectre, the Weaver, the Sven. 
What else kind of comes up there? The yeah, last deal is the big one, I, I would say, because again, okay. Gladiators, when they played against Nouns, they really did a good job camouflaging their draft, like which heroes are going to go where, because because they didn't have the, sec the last pick in that series, and also they wanted to secure the late game. You already had Dazzle, you already had this Lone Druid, which Ace is uh, very familiar playing from the offlane, so... And 23rd pick, Alchemist, they wanted to secure the late game. We talked about Tempo coming out from the gaming Gladiators, but they also want to have something prepared if the game goes post 40 minutes. But, I mean, we've seen a lot of games post 60 minutes at this DI, so they, they're no strangers to it. Mm -hmm. And those 60 minute games, that's where the scaling supports come in. I mean, as this TI has progressed, we've seen the importance of having supports that carry you into the late game and don't just buy utility items like the Willow and Phoenix. We'll see if any of those come out as after Roth, but game one is gonna happen now. Team Liquid versus Gaming Gladiators. Game one. All about tech issues sorted, the fabric fixed on Boxy's headset over there for him, Lacoste. And so now we're gonna see this draft. We'll see what is gonna be hotly contested between these two teams and what's gonna be let through. Ancient Apparition, definitely no real surprise there. They wanna build themselves up to pick a tanky hero for themselves on the side of Gaming Gladiators and Liquid love picking AA for Insania. Yeah, it's very interesting what teams are going to be, like, be leading through and like what do they have already prepared because like you need to understand how to beat that hero during the draft and in the game like you need to have a plan like you know Purge showed us like how do you go on the triangle how you block the camps for Bristol back for example I know for a fact that uh, Zai is uh, like if they let Bristol back ever through Zai would be the guy who's like calling you know we need to kill this Bristol back 10 times so he doesn't have a game so he doesn't have that you know tankiness ability to be annoying in the game so I'm really curious like what is going to what it's gonna look like in this draft. Ten seconds remaining. And the Primal Beast and CK taken out. I, it feels like you cannot give away Primal Five Beast to either of these remaining. teams, not just because of the really valuable players that play between mid and offlane, but just, just because of what it does in terms of tempo. I mean, that is gonna be the story of this game. Both of these teams are aggressive. They don't like to sit back and farm. And the CK being the aggressive carry we talked about, like Aoi mentioned, he thinks it's the highest value carry of the patch. Can honestly see why, but when you ban this ancient apparition out, uh, you're basically indicating that you want to open with either bristle or CK. So liquid just take it out. It makes a lot of sense here. I think Weaver is going to be the first big material for these teams oh, for because sure. they both enjoy it a lot. Muerta Weaver most definitely because both of these heroes are flexible enough, and if you're not addressing them as carries, you're putting way too much pressure just by first phasing these two heroes. Mm -hmm. And also the pairing I really like, something that we've seen yesterday quite a lot, was this Grimstroke plus Weaver, where you can't really kill the Swarm, you can't kill the Phantom, it deals a ton of damage, most of these tanky offlaners are melee ones, so two range heroes against them, you're, you do have enough damage, and there's where it is straight away. And we almost exclusively saw Weaver yesterday with Grimstroke, I believe, I don't think I saw him being run without it. I think yeah, right. they usually follow up with the Grim Stroke for this fever. Maybe once, but something As, interesting... Azuray had one game without it. Okay. That, that was the first one. Okay. Something interesting about that is Mew, after LGD beat Azuray, uh, he was asked about Weaver by Dove, and he said that he doesn't think that you can just pick Weaver and win the draft. He doesn't feel like CK in that sense. He says that if you're picking Weaver, you have to draft around it. It doesn't just auto-win games. Look, there we go. We talked about it. The Pogma, we talked about it in the pre-show. We talked about it just before we saw Draft as well. And Liquid is straight up going to yonk it for themselves. That's going to be their overall first pick. What I like to see paired with Pugna usually is, uh, so this Pugna can be flexed to mid, which is something very, very cool. I mean, I know that Topson loves to do it. He does it all the time, but Pugna just really elevates when he's paired with something like a Centaur. Oh, yeah. Centaur plus Pugna is one of the strongest lanes that we've seen this TI. And if you can pressure the safe lane to that extent, it opens up so much of the game for your team. I think the other offlane duo that can pretty much do the same thing is uh, Muerta plus Centaur. Also, the hero pairing feels really good. And also, Dawnbreaker plus Tusk. These are my favorite combinations of the offlaners at this TI because it seems unbeatable. You're playing against those lanes. It seems like you're just going to straight up lose it. It also feels like when you have uh, Pogna on the enemy team, you need to have some kind of jump to you know find him in the fight because otherwise it's going to be really tough to fight around it. And uh, the heroes are, um, I would be looking at it's like Earth Spirit, Pog, uh, maybe Ember Spirit, but Ember Spirit is not really in the meta. Yeah, even Shaker, Kanga, Pengo, all of Quinn's hero pool right now, I think it operates very well versus Pugna. True. Dark Willow was the banner for themselves. Uh, 
a little bit worried about that flex potential as well. Oh, for sure, for sure. The flex potential of Dark Willow as a carry makes it so that she can play against Muerta, right? There, there is something conceptually here where Muerta ulti is and Dark Willow just Shadow Realms, and that's a lower cooldown than Muerta's ulti. So she fares very well against Muerta as a carry, but it's also just her ability as a support to do so much damage and enable lanes that you're afraid of too. The oh. bands are so thorough. Like every 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 single band of, the, of it, like it's, it just makes so much sense the way I'm looking at it. Like people are just so like they know each other so well that they know like for sure what they're gonna like expect. And, okay. And so, so, so you're thinking that even off the back of the brew one, the brew I think band. So. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Why like, is that? The, the, the brewmaster is like uh, it's it's <clears throat> one of those heroes that just up the fight and like can go on the back line and like you know find this Pagna and uh, or like find the Muerta and uh, it's just like uh, a very strong laner as well in this current meta. And they banned Chen. We talked about this hero being super popular in the last couple of series that Gaming Gladiators did play, which leaves Enchantress in the pool. Also, you do have a dispel mechanic against the Cryptify, so you can mm -hmm. focus down those heroes. Muerta doesn't have a problem with that, but other heroes might seem to have throughout the game, and also removing one of the saves from this Pugna could be crucial, so definitely looking for Enchantress inside of Gaming Gladiators. Also, the Night Stalker is a very good pickup for both teams as well. I think like uh, people are showing it way more nowadays because it's it's one of those here that like you know showing you the whole the whole fight and get get on top on top of supports very easily. I do like the small rise of Night Stalker that we had yesterday as well. Here we didn't really touch too much on, but he is there. He got picked up in two games. Two three games, yeah. Two games I yesterday. think Spirit played it and uh, LGD played it. Yes, they're the two that are. Yeah, he's really good against all of these heroes that are very elusive. These uh, Pagnas, the Weavers, uh, uh, Dark Willows, Muertas. So he can get on top of them. And we also, something that Effie mentioned is these supports, they're not buying into support items anymore. They want to be scaling because the games are longer, so you're not going to see those four staffs and then Night Stalker is going to shine in those fights. Pagna, on the other side, he is that type of a hero that you know doesn't scale as much with the items, but uh, He's buying those defensive items, those Glimmer Caves, those four staffs, so you at least have something covered. They really thought about this second pick. I mean, maybe they were debating between the Centaur and the Weaver. They didn't want to give uh, either away, potentially, but they just placed the higher priority on the Weaver. But, I mean, if I'm going by what I saw from Azur Ray yesterday and what Neve said, you have to draft around this Weaver. I feel like if you can take away one of its combos, if you can take away the Grim, or you can take away any kind of, you know, tanky frontliner that supports it, like a Centaur, or potentially even an Earth Spirit, then Weaver is playing from a disadvantage. I like the center for gaming now because it's, it's it lanes very well against Fever. As soon as you get to Vanguard, it's, mm -hmm. you kind of like become untouchable in that lane. And you have to take it away too, right? Yeah. But I they're like also the thinking about it because they probably had another idea of this more time. It's either Tide Hunter or Centaur, right, on that spot. One of the reasons why I love Centaur so much is because you can protect your Muerta with the Stampede and you can also run away from Weaver relatively easy and also Stampede really good against Muerta. You run away and then you can disengage, come back into a fight when her ulti is off, so good call there. If they take the Grim here and this, I mean, so Liquid were debating the Centaur for themselves, right? But if they can take the Centaur and the Grim away from this Weaver and this Pugna, it, it just feels, it feels like the Weaver pick would be incorrect here. I think Ench is uh, more suitable for them, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's more of a celery hero and it's left in the pool and it uh, gives them these auras and like still like uh, push potential for these two heroes to shine. Yeah, I feel like if you pick the Grim, it's almost showing that the Murata probably will be pause one and that you're going to have a different pause four. It's going to be that Grim because you're right. Celery likes Enchantresses, loves Phoenixes as well for himself. Phoenix is pretty cool overall, like in this current meta, but the uh, li Liquid lineup doesn't really have that uh, that beefy beefy course. Uh, so there's like there's not, li not not a lot of purpose for Phoenix yet. Maybe it's gonna happen, you know, within next ne next picks. But for this time, like Weaver is like one of the best heroes to actually kill the egg as well. I, I agree entirely. I think a BKB Weaver uh, just runs at the Phoenix egg and he keeps Geminate attacking. He double attacks the egg. He has the move speed to make it. So if he eggs on a certain part of the fight, he tastes his way towards it. Well, they want to speed things up on their side. A little bit of uh, extra tower damage coming out. We saw Mickey that uh, his Luna is very fearsome in that graphic. And uh, this also means that position for Weaver is coming out. So they need something in front. Like these are all relatively squishy heroes. If you get on top of them, these heroes are going to die. Mm. 
I, I do think flexing the Weaver to four was a good idea here because they didn't get the heroes that would have enabled it in the draft to play an explosive kind of game, right? And Luna is a traditional carry that counters the Centaurs and the Tide Hunters yeah. and the Timber Saws of the offlane. She has really high damage, she out CSs them, and she provides uh, consistent damage output throughout the game where their HP isn't that much of an issue. They needed some, like, low cooldown catch against this centaur because X marks the spot really works well against the stampede so th that's a good one i was thinking about you know maybe some offlaners like mars that could pop into the meta uh these heroes are banned against you know, teams like team spirit but uh, yeah looking at two heroes from the offlane for team liquid unless they want i mean there's it's a still flex pick for them this conca they can put it on the offlane but uh, i'm mostly looking at uh, some of the beefier offlaners like tide hunter and maybe even dawnbreaker just that you have that extra heal and it's a strong lane when paired up with Weaver. Also, a cool thing about this Kunkka is that he counters the traditional uh, Quinn jump heroes that would have made Pugna's life difficult. So instead, they go for the Quinn Necrophos. I mean, having your eyes on this Kunkka may be enough to just enable this Necro pick to come out in the second phase. Oof, th this is a big one. Uh, Necro has been banned most of the time. The way they started the group stage was, uh, I believe they were playing against nine pandas or Virtus Pro, and they played Necro two times in a row. This is like, he's really good at the hero. I mean, you can still technically flex this Kunkka to the offlane, but you don't have to reveal your cards until Liquid, until the very end. When a Kunkka got flexed to the offlane yesterday versus Bat Boom, they just had their Monkey King follow it around and they countered it. But Liquid are in a position where they don't have to reveal their hand. If they don't want Kunkka to tank this matchup versus Necro, they can throw him on the offlane, but they, they, they also need, have last pick. I, I think that's, that's pretty much mandatory right now because you want to have some magical damage coming up in the mid lane. Lena has been banned out. I think the other one could be Invoker because of the dispel mechanic. You can call caught people off guard during, uh, you know, one of the better heroes overall against Myrta when she uses her ulti and doesn't have BKB on is this long duration tornado coming up from Invoker where you can buy like a good two, three seconds. Yeah, I'm sure Invoker is going to be banned here. I wonder if you're going to see some unique heroes like uh, Arc Warden or Tinker are going to be picked up like for Nisha this time because it's like been historically good against Necropos but I'm not sure if they're you know thinking about it or looking for it they already have a solid lineup though so they can pick whatever they want for Nisha that, that is uh, you know it's gonna have a good lane against Necro I want to circle back around while we're waiting for this last band to talk more about this pose for Weaver. You talked, Effie, how building it up, you need a really good combo. You need a good pairing for it, and that's how it's going to make it work as a pose one. But now as a pose four, what is his impact without one of those combos as well? Uh, that's a great question. So I think what Weaver provides to lineups that have Luna are very early in rush, right? Because Luna tends to group up with her team, with her auras, and Weaver pro provides that damage reduction with the Swarm. He's also a vision hero, so when he attaches his insects to these backline heroes like Muerta and Phoenix, you can always have your eyes on them. Also, now you have the Vessel Buyer on your team that you didn't have before, which is going to be great damage versus a Centaur. So the hero can definitely do a lot, but he does suffer from the issues of not having the traditional support spells in terms of any kind of disable or any kind of save unless you buy the Aghanim Scepter, which is an out of meta item for Weaver, to be honest. But he does a lot in terms of damage amplification and vision. Smoker is left in the pool, so probably Nisha is gonna choose, choose that one because he, he loves the hero every time he has an opportunity to have. And that's the hero I was looking for, oh my god. But I usually I usually suggested it against Weaver as a core, but against Luna it's not as, as hot, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's still like, it's, it, it pleases me to see that Dirachi is thinking about these aggressive cores and like thinking of, uh, outside of the box because people are usually not looking for it. They ran a healing strat uh, yesterday when they played and look at the amount of healing that they have. This Necro, Phoenix Sunray, Bloodseeker as well. This is gonna be like, I'm, I'm seeing problems for Team Liquid. Their damage output, uh, it, it's not there. This is position 5 Pugna we're talking about. They might shift Pugna to a mid lane now that there is, you know, Necro in the pool. Uh, that Necro has been picked. But, uh, yeah, I feel like Gaming Gladiators, that they got whatever they wanted in this one. This is the type of the draft that they expected to come up with, and they got the good heroes. And a cool aspect of this Bloodseeker that uh, we didn't touch up on is that it's a hero that can control this Pugna, right? Now, you mentioned earlier that this hero's stocks have risen up, and how you control Pugna is with that backline jump. But a Bloodseeker can rupture him and silence him and just get on top of him because the rest of Gaiman's heroes don't really do that right now. And there's the Invoker that you talked about, Reza. 
Yeah, there's an Walker. And uh, I mean, this and this lineup, gaming gladiators are not going to be able to be able to push the liquids because like there's no really mechanics to like get, go in the towers easily. So liquid is going to be the, the one team that's uh, pushing gaming gladiators this time. Okay, with uh, seeing all the lineups now, before we saw that last pick, Lacoste, you thought uh, gaming gladiators had the better lineup, but who ha who has Exodia out of the two teams now? I would still sell, say gaming because uh, they got uh, all the boxes covered pretty much. They have carry that comes online super fast and uh, looking forward to see what they're going to do with the Bloodseeker. Alrighty, we've talked about this draft. We're going to hear some words though from the coach of Liquid. It's Blitz and Slacks. Thank you so much. Yes, my friends, I am here with Blitz Dota. The crowd obviously loving you guys and uh, hoping for your best. How do you feel about that draft so far, boss? Uh, I feel pretty good. I think we got some stuff we wanted. They got some stuff they wanted. Uh, hopefully we don't lose in like 20 minutes. I hope so as well. Now, Gaming Gladiator is one of the most aggressive teams left in the tournament. They really value those laning stages. Now, what did you guys prioritize in your draft to kind of strip that power away from them? Uh, I think we tried to make sure that we had a lot of flex in our draft. So that's why like Zai's playing our Kunkka and stuff like that. And, you know, that's uh, ultimately what brings it all back together. Absolutely. Luna, uh, not the most successful hero at the tournament so far. Haters gonna hate, but was your team able to pick such a dynamic hero, you know, kind of shake off yesterday's losses? Yeah, uh, I noticed you're making a lot of Taylor Swift references. I'm not. Uh, no, I think, I, I honestly forgot the question because I was really just trying to catch those. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, we'll go over to game one to our casters. For the final time this season, we're gonna have Team Liquid versus Gaming Gladiators. It has happened 12 different times this season. This is gonna be lucky number 13, I suppose. And it's the first time that these two teams have faced up against each other in an elimination match that is not the finals. New territory? New is territory. that what you're saying? I mean, personally, I've never seen this matchup before, like you were saying, so I'm really looking forward to it. I think this is a crowd favorite for sure as we get our hands back on a major final matchup that has been repeated so many times, but like you said, never for elimination in a tournament that matters as much as this one right here. It's Absolutely. really gonna be for everything. No, no other matchup between these teams really matters at this point, right? It all comes down to this. It's a question of how much have you learned over the course of the year about each other? How much can you put it to use when it counts? And how many voice lines can you spam? <laughs> as you can see from the chat, Will Line already coming out and the little bit of all chat with these TU teams know each other very, very well. They matched in every single major finals this year and they matched up against each other in Riyadh, though that was an upper bracket match where Team Liquid you know, they finally managed to get one over the uh, Game of Gladiators team. They finally got there, but can they continue that with Elimination on the line? Shaking off a loss against Team Spirit especially. I mean, that, that had to be a bit of a rough one because not only did Team Spirit, in some ways, I think, prove that they're still the better team to Team Liquid, but they also managed to do it in, like, sort of comeback fashion. Liquid probably feels like they could have won that series, you know? At the same time, Liquid looked better against them than... I mean, almost any other team has in recent history, right? I think yeah. Spirit are being humble and they're saying they haven't only played eliminated teams, but damn, they look scary. So if you can compete with them, you're competing with the top three at the tournament, and that bodes well for your potential lower bracket run here, as both these teams are in the lower bracket. Still surprising me, but here we are. Upper bracket for bitches indeed, as they're going to try and prove everybody wrong and seal the deal. I like this draft. I, I think this draft's very interesting. I think both teams got a lot of what they wanted, as uh, Blitz was mentioning. I think gaming, they got their Necro counter pick, but they don't get it last year, which means Nisha has an opportunity to respond. I think they have tools to deal with the Necro with the Dispels, the Vessel from Invoker, and a lot of physical burst damage coming in later off the bug and the we the Luna Aura going through in the nighttime. Gotta remember that. You're contesting six and eight and 10 minute power runes against gaming. You have to bring everybody those runes. You have to be able to fight them. Luna helps you do that for that pretty damn good amount compared to almost any other carry. I expect a lot of clash around the mid lane here, and I expect that to have it happen fast, quick, swift, and here strong. it comes. Bounty runes out the field, immediately Liquid are gonna try and battle Gaming Gladiators, but it's going to be Insania who's looking close to dying first. Tofu, he barely managed to live long enough, holds on so Quinn can claim that coveted first blood. And even Boxy, who does have the Shikushi, yes, but they have the Bloodseeker. They see him, but they can't hit him, at least not yet. He's just gonna have to suicide though, I think. I, I don't know if you can play the lane with this little regen. The upside for Liquid, you give Quinn first blood here, but you did drain a lot of mana off him and... 
Okay, managed to dodge the dead shot, but again, still the vision from the Bloodseeker allows them to claim a second kill of the game. So not only did they get a two for one there, but they also managed to get the first blood. And they also walked away with even bounty runes. So big win for Gaming Gladiators right out the gate. Nice way to start the lane, especially when you have Bloodseeker. Any of these types of trades, you set the Equilibrium up in a way where people are already missing regen or they come to lane half HP. Duraccio is going to be very happy about that. And this is a lane where he can just dominate, I think. Kunko's not going to pose too much of a threat on him. I mean, you're building up some attrition with, you know, Tidebringer going through, but Bloodseeker's just going to heal through all of it. So I kind of expect Gaming's laning phase to be incredibly strong here. And I think it's going to become a question of where can Liquid make the moves with their supports, gain some momentum back, and hopefully get Nisha activated. Because I think if this Invoker has a really good first 15 minutes, he can take a lot of this early game over. I mean, the mana burn is going to be a problem for Quinn. The tornado is going to be a problem for the Ghost Shroud. And a fast vessel in this game to negate a lot of the healing could just win you some of these team fights with the back of, like, good Ghost Ship, Torn Storm in the mid game. Especially with Luna Oral coming through on all of it. It's a very strong five man group up from Liquid if they can get it going. Yeah, Nisha starts off really strong. It's four to nice already and a lot of damage onto the Necro. If he can keep that kind of pace, then it'll prevent the Necro from being able to get that regen. But it does become harder over time. They're gonna jump on his eye here, hitting their level two, while the Kunkka is still shy of that. Zai will manage to walk it off. They actually get pretty low here. Boxy's yeah, gonna he's take coming. advantage of this. He should be easily be able to pick up at least one kill. Celery pops very fire. Zai's coming in as well. Can he hit the swing required? He turns back to Jirachi instead. A torn to the side. It catches him. Boxy will now be able to finish him up. Yes, Jirachi can somehow keep himself alive from getting last hits, but no. Run down by the Shikuchi. Meanwhile, on the other side of things, Tofu picks up yet another kill, but Insania's already back into it, shows up with the Blood Grenade. They'll have their revenge, perhaps, but Mickey make Austin's awesome life because he's going to try and limp away. Ace, dive in the tower. Oh, Diving it's a bad much. dive. Now he gets a little bit of a stun underneath the tower. What a turn around. Liquid will manage to make up a double off of that when it looked like for sure it was going to be a trade-off one for one. These are just brawls of a lane, man. And already we're seeing this aura do work bottom. Pugna with such high move speed, such good attack animation, just kiting them around. This is the type of laning setup you want versus gaming. Do not give them a head start. Do not let them run away with it like we saw yesterday. However, Quinn pushing in mid. This is an oppressive laning hero right here. And we're showing exactly how much you can do with it. Quinn is not afraid to play this hero blind. That is a scary thought. Yeah, right look now, at he's, he's, I mean, this is insane pressure right here. He has fully recovered this setup now where he was low on CS and low on regen. Managed to get a bunch of last hits all in a row, and now he is commanding this lane and will probably continue to do so. He's gonna have to even TP back. He just got stuck. Remember, this is all thirst for Duracho, which should be winning you this lane as well. So the more Quinn wins mid, the happier his carry is also gonna be. That's why that kill was pretty valuable up top. Really good for Boxy's early game here. I mean, this is an interesting Weaver setup because they didn't want to play a core into the counters the game had, particularly the Bloodseeker. Even the Centaur can be a little bit annoying. But you put it on support, I like the idea that you have the Luna War to back him up in the mid game, right? A yeah. lot of bonus damage on a hero that at some point is putting out two, three attacks on everybody with Shard and Sakuchi through. Sounds pretty damn good to me. That'll help him threaten those backline supports. I assume that's what we're looking at for this support Weaver, right? Get to this Phoenix or this um, Muerta and just try and force them to use their ultimates to defend themselves. Just cause chaos if you can ever kill an egg too. Yeah. I'll be really happy about that team fight. Still gaming this lane phase. It's three lanes going pretty damn well for them. It's been hard to stop this tournament. And that has been one of the biggest problems a lot of teams have faced. I'm trying to deal with the early pressure. We'll continue to get stronger and stronger here, especially as they get the first set of items. And, and I'm once thinking about falls, right? That's, yes, that's that also a very big point. We have two levels of the Lunar Blessing already, so it's you one get that strike back. Yeah, that nighttime global. And that's why I'm saying these rotations. I'd like to see the Pugnan and the Weaver combine a bit on the map. Get some like ganks going, especially during this nighttime. Enable some of the cores. Either Mickey or Nisha, I think, is what you're going for. I think Zai, he's going to have a you know maybe slow game, but he's a cook. That doesn't really matter too much. But if you get these ganks going, you're really going to enable your supports. Bring some of the, the CS advantage back. Yeah. And Zai was well known for tanking a lot of terrible laning phases back when he was on uh, Secret, right? Like a lot of times they would just leave him out in some pretty rough ones. A lot of times he was playing like Dragonite, Kunkka here, very similar type of hero. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a Yapsor effect. And with that mobility, I mean, I love the fact that uh, Weaver kind of operates like a Monkey King when it comes to the mobility aspect of getting through those portals. So maybe he can link up with Insania like you were talking about. I mean, that's one of the strengths of support Weaver is the rotation capability. Like every one of his points just at level one is powerful in a, in a go on situation. 
The question is, I mean, if you can pressure Duraccio, you'd be happy to take that. But I love when you see. kill this guy and take him off the lane. I just don't know if he's going to get chipped hard enough, and it's going to be Celery making the first move to bottom. This is not what I expected out of Liquid. I expect Boxy to want to respond to this, or at least create pressure on Duraccio, try and bring him back. That's what they're doing. They're going for the kill on the Bloodseeker right now. Forced to TP away. Barely makes it. Meanwhile, here comes that rotation. But TP immediately coming out for the Weaver. So gaming gladiators may not be able to go for this dive as much as they want. Nice hits, though. Celery landing all of the fire spirits on and making it. And that'll finish him off. Boxy's going to try and trade out on Celery. But Ace is trying to protect his support. Staying close by until the dive is ready to go. Celery gets out. So kind of a trade. Like, would you rather in that situation be straight up dying as the, the carry and then TP back to lane instantly, or do you feel like Duraccio is not too happy about TPing out of the lane, missing so much CS? I mean, I think Duraccio is happy with that. He's not giving a, a lot of XP to his eye. It's the better of the outcome, especially when the Phoenix made the first move. These are going to be in some trouble. It's the hit with the silence, and that's enough. Lock him down with the Reaper Sight underneath those ghosts. And while Zai is being run down by Duraccio as he made his way back to lane pretty quickly, thanks in part to those phase boots. This mid lane, it's just been all Quinn. I'm surprised with how well he's done in this matchup. I mean, this is a matchup where Invoker generally has done okay, or at least okay enough that he can get into the point in the mid game where your spells are really good versus Necro. But this is a wide lead to open up, and of course, Gaming are going to take advantage of it with the, the quick roam, get the gang going, translate that pressure into experience for their supports. Do have that nighttime. Hitting full stride here, three points in the aura. So this is when Boxy's pretty strong on the map. Even Insania getting these extra right clicks in it, it does hurt when you have low armor heroes. Got him with the bugs, pulled him back in, but missed the torrent timing there from Zai. So once again, Duraccio takes some damage, but he will be able to heal up a decent amount with CS directly under the tower. You're gonna rotate your supports off the safe lane. Again, it's like you rotate three to kill Duraccio, and if you're not, you gotta create the pressure somewhere else. Seems like you're giving Celery a lot of room on the map right now, as he's just lingering bottom. He's just waiting to see if Mikke shows here again. Quid knows Still there's counts. a ward up there, but missed it barely off that sentry placement. Now is starting to feel the pressure. So this is where the trade-off comes through, right? You're gonna sit on the bottom lane with your supports. In theory, is not gonna get as much. How long does Mikke want to sit down here? Do you want to bait the dive with another box rotation? Nisha can also counter gank these plays. It's the strength of Quas Wex at this point in the game. Liquid should be happy to take these defensive oriented fights. Yeah, they are diving in so damn deep. In fact, they're still back there. Ace just feeling like thanks to his Vanguard and 17 magic wand charges he's built up. He's just chilling. Smart not to force it there. Liquid were pretty damn ready. You do not want to give Nisha some big turnaround kill in this game, right? Because that's going to give him the earn charges. Then suddenly he can go into the Midas or the Vessel, whichever one he opts for. Go ship used to no avail. Zoracho is still just walking off the pain. He's been left to the wolves. Tough trade off. I mean, the big question here is can you accelerate your Luna across the Bloodseeker? Yeah. You get Ancient stacks up, that's another route you can go here. If you're Liquid, just play a defensive game, get massive stacks up, put Mickey in a position where he's the number one leading net worth in the game, and we saw him carry some crazy games with Luna this tournament. Definitely not out of the question. It's a hero that can stand your ground with Butterfly Satanic timing, plus that shard in the late game. You could put Gaming in a position where suddenly they're the ones lacking the damage. Here comes Another the smoke gank on Anisha. Ghostwalk goes out, but they do have detection already laid down from the sentry. He's going to try and duck away into the trees. Man, to dodge the dead shot, cuts out a tree to be able to cut a path away to freedom. They're going to have to pop the stampede to make sure they do not get caught here on their way out. Another kind of poke attempt, another attempt that Boxy instantly responds to. He's so ready to take into these fights. I, I think he almost wishes they would dive. Like, please give me the cleanup opportunity with how hard I'm hitting right now. Yeah, again, because it's nighttime, right? Yep, and this clock will hit 10. So now gaming, they want to group up and push with the Necro and Centaur. I mean, the opportunity is going to be there. But look what, they're just holding the wall, holding it steady, farming it up. And the question is, is Nisha going to go for this full vessel? Is he just going to go for a Midas and try and scale? Like, how does he feel the pace this game is going? Sai makes his first move with a boat. Should be enough damage here. A lot of heroes, but Ace also has a lot of HP, and Game of Gladiators are coming in in force. Beautiful torrent that hits on two. Zai still chasing, but the rest of his team is backed away. Now that he's been hit with the rupture, Cotton place and Quinn, he sees his opportunity to get at least one kill out of this one. Immediate Reaper Scythe put onto the Kunkka to get that stack, and they'll call it there. Good enough for them. One kill for no trade-off.
Okay, I thought they had way more damage, but there's no like early swarm hit on the centaur and he just walks it off 1600 HP in the early game way too much without the extra spell damage from Invoker willing to make that rotation. I mean, you're not gonna bring five to kill Ace, right? It's way too hard. Upside is for Liquid, you did get this tier one top during all this mess that was happening bottom. So even if these towers go out, you're trading the map. It will open up some space for Mickey later off, you know, triangle rotation into that top lane. They have some room to play with here as game continues to get slowed down, which if you're Liquid, you're probably happy with. You know, if gaming don't beat you in 20 minutes and all of a sudden, will they beat you if the game goes to 50, 60? Stop yeah. in their wheelhouse at this event. That's where they've struggled. Considering the pace they took yesterday, when you're talking about the Spirit Vessel versus Hannah Midas, I immediately was like, please go hand uh, Spirit Vessel. Don't go Hannah Midas because we saw the way that got punished with Nouns. Right. It's just about how you feel. How you feel this game's gonna go. It's an instinct. Pure instinct read. Quinn will go for the bots first on the Necro. So we've seen him do this. I wanna say almost every game here. I think it's just a map mobility thing. Keep the farm up. Be able to join these plays. Continue to get the Reaper stacks. It just feels natural. It does make Great him a good He burns out Celery, but Phoenix operates without mana. And the siege will begin. The Pugna siege. Yeah, they already got that top tower earlier. We didn't really mention it, but. Now that bottom tower is going to die for Game of Gladiators, they're evening things out. But mid tower is under assault a bit from the Pugna. It cost him some time on Caraccio, who he suffered in that now, of course, because he got kicked off that top lane. You went yeah. for the trade. And this is where Mickey is going to start to pull ahead of him. So how aggressive do Gaming want to get to try and disrupt the farming pattern here? That's a big question. What is your timing that you're, is it like Blink Dagger on the Centaur? Ace is pretty close to it. Uh, yeah, it just has to be, right? But the, the thing about the Centaur Blink this game is, where's your what's your damage follow-up gonna look like? Are you bringing the both supports in that smoke? It's probably gonna be a bit obvious. It's hard to bring the Necro in there. And the thing is, the Necro also wants damage to come out first. So if you get some early sustain or healing on Liquid, they have the Pugna for that reason. I can see the burst not necessarily being that easy in this type of environment. Sure. Especially given the mobility of some of the liquid heroes. They just like stomp and then straight up egg, then you might be able to just run away from all that. Reset. That's why the calling is going to be a very vital spell for all these games. Rupture and Reaper Scythe is a deadly combo for anybody caught out like Zai is. He's going to use the boat almost immediately, see if he can get enough heals. There is going to be that boat buff to be able to help him out. They're going to pop the supernova. They go for the Reaper Scythe kill onto the Pugna instead and leave Zai for last. And they're going to have to dive him underneath the tower. Jirachu is pretty sped up here. Mickey is trying to help him out, but the Stampede is going to run over Zai. And they finish him off and run through all of this. Dead shot going to miss from Tofu. And now Nisha starts putting some damage back onto Gaming Gladiators with Boxy coming in from behind there's potential here but if they are fighting into the necrophos it's going to be pretty tough with all that sustained so they opt not to try and break gaming gladiators there losing two heroes not caught a little really too turn. deep but there's just no damage turnaround at this point in the game right you're still missing the vessel you don't even have the charges and mickey he's gone for the farming luna build here which you can't blame him for i mean this is standard but no eclipse that's coming out in some crazy turnaround so right now, it's gaming's opportunity to make I love this for Game Gladiators. Yeah. Keep the pace up. Straight you back. caught him out with two heroes dead. They probably keep it out the lane. And Nisha is going to be caught alone with no response. And they will quickly take that tower as a result of that pickoff. Ace dictating the pace of this game right now. He had a free lane, a free tower. And he has a very fast blink being guard that instantly went to work. We'll take another tier one off the map with the group up. That's that Necropho Centaur combining. That's It's going to be a problem to deal with at this point in the game. Which is way too tanky, especially with Sunray behind him. You have to fight into Morta spells, which have been problematic for a lot of teams until you get, you know, debuff immunity and BKBs or something. That's a far way down the road. Yeah. Lane Mail for Zai is going to be nice in terms of running in and tanking. It's also going to be pretty good versus the Rupture that has been going on him for most of this early game. It's a damn good Blade Mail game. That'll give you some fighting power. And definitely more, will, but. Nikkei takes pole position here. Yeah, he does. Barely over the Centaur. Ace, once again, just, man, he's getting so much farm out of every single one of his laning phases. It is doing so much for Gaming Gladiators. I feel like it's the, the biggest reason why they're able to take the pace, the super fast pace that they beat out everybody else at this Liquid. tournament with. They want to go on him. This is the tankiest hero on the map. They finally have the vessel. Just what's prompting this, and yeah, there's the damage, right? This helps by a huge amount. Suddenly, you're back on the board. You can open up some space. More charges for Nisha. It's going to propel him into the Midas. It's time for Nisha to strike back here. He, he's had a very slow early game, but it doesn't really matter on this hero if you can get some big core. Get a lot of vision. Oh. Boxy. Swarm on two. 
They have some magic damage to throw around. Tofu's gonna have some problems with that. Yeah, he's gone. A couple of Gemini will clean him up early. Medallion for Boxy. You need some extra minus armor. And as you get those kills, that'll turn into a Solar Crest. So the Minus Armor is really ramping up with this Luna damage. This 15 to 20 minute window is pretty dangerous for gaming gladiators. I mean, that's the big question. Is Liquid Happy just going ultra late with this Luna with all the buffs they have behind him? Remember, this is going to be a Luna with a Pugna behind him, a Boat Rum, Torrent Storm around him, and potentially a Lacrity to throw on. This is one of the best Alacrity heroes in Dota because it is a ranged cleaver. Pretty much only the Luna, the Gyro, and the Medusa. And two of those are not in the meta, so you'll take the third. But damn, does it start to hurt when those glaives start bouncing around with the extra attack speed and damage here? It's a great combination to go late game with, especially with the buildup you go for now with the shards, the Satanic, the Butterfly. You just become insanely tanky if you can't get the initial first damage out. At the same time, I feel like it is kind of a single core lineup where they've got two big percentage based damage dealers on Game of Gladiators. Tofu. He'll deal with that ward. Tornado is going to catch a mid stampede. A bit unfortunate there, but it looks like they're going to try and catch the invoke. Better they stop. Do. They got him from behind. Ace shows up, and Insania, there's no way he could do enough heals to outdo that damage from Gaming Gladiators. They will both die. Uh, every time Liquid starts to push back, it's Ace coming in, shutting them down with another two man stomp, setting up another Reaper stack for Quinn as well. He's already up to four. You cannot let Necro get to that, like, 10 territory, right? The hero just becomes an abomination of Dota yeah. with Ag's heart plus extra regen stacks. Yeah, you may have Spirit Vessel, but you don't have that much into no. And now Daraccio starting to pick up the aggression, as we expect from him. Just getting on the liquid side of the map. Not really afraid of the jump here, because what is the jump? I mean, it's going to be X. That's it. Yeah. It's simply more of a, a, a counter punch lineup, right? And I think that's mostly off the Invoker. It is. They try and jump somebody, then you get a Tornado. It's a great way to be able to respond to that. Easy jump there. Rupture plus Deadshot is a nice combination. That's the thing. It's, it's mainly just been Isha running around in ghost form, trying to make something happen. But the downside with Flosswax Invoker when you're the initiator like this is you just fall behind and farm. Yeah. And his net worth is plummeting down the chart here as all the gaming cores are picking up the pace. So you gotta go back to this Midas because it's the only thing that keeps you up there. But all the time you're looking for these ganks, it does delay it even more. And now it is gaming taking the smoke to you as they want to get Quinn involved yet again with this Necro. Doesn't even have the Reaper up. Just wants to abuse the shard while Daracho is cleaning up some ancients. Feels like gaming gladiators rarely miss on their smokes, at least when it comes to these lower bracket games. They've had a clean run. Six games in a row they've won. But this one will miss as Liquid do manage to get through the portal in time. Well, Liquid did leave their ops up there. So they have pretty good wards to smoke back to in the top lane. They can switch the map up again. Dude, they are just targeting Nisha so hard. He shows up again. Insania is behind him with the heals, but it's just not enough, man. Way too much damage. And again, it means Insania because he couldn't heal up his core enough. His core dies, and so will he. And this was Liquid responding. They brought Mickey. They brought Zai. They brought Boxy to this bottom lane to try and turn this. You talked about their lineup being a great defensive turnaround lineup. I mean, if you're not there, then you're just wasting even more time. Because once more Ace finds the opening, they clean it up with a Reaper kill. Stack number five, and that heart is almost completed here for Quinn. He is keeping pace with a Max or a Glaive Luna, who's had some Ancients. You've got some serious damage problems now that that pipe is introduced. With a heart completed on Quinn as well, you're, I, I think your mid-game damage is just out. You have to wait till the Luna really comes online. And this is what gaming have done to a lot of teams this tournament, right? Yeah. Create a situation where your EHP just outpaces enemy damage and you drive it down a lane. And if you don't have outspam, if you don't have capability to take the fight, you run it. Get that trouble. heart recipe. That's a big one. I mean, you gotta feel go so it, good. Right? Uh, do you see it? Does he see it? Oh, he, he sees it. He's gonna go for it. Does man to get it? So, no heart just yet for Quinn. That will buy. I'm not even sure if it buys him any time because I, I feel like gaming gladiators can still do whatever they want. I mean, it's a lot of effective net worth off the map, right? Sure. It's a big courier kill. You're buying time when this, this ball was starting to creep up for gaming. And hey, I mean, that's probably the happiest Liquid fans have been in this audience for a while. <laughs> that is you get true. the morale back on your side every little bit counts. Having a lot more fun in the road to TI than TI itself so far. Liquid, maybe they could change that narrative though. 2,000 net worth lead for Game and Gladiators. So it's not like they're falling that far behind. It's just the fact that all three cores on Game and Gladiators are looking strong. And of course, a single fight can just open up this game for Liquid, right?
If they get a good team fight where Mika gets to stand his ground with everybody behind him in the formation they want, or gaming jump him and he survives, you turn around with level two Eclipse, which is now up, and you translate that into a Roshan, all of a sudden this game looks completely different. That is always in the cards if you take a bad fight, especially with Ags on eye. It's a pretty fast Torrent Storm for an offlane Kunkka. Spotted Moxie. Love the fact he's carrying his own dust. Yeah. Time lapse straight back into the silence of the blood rights. Nowhere to run in this matchup. Absolute death sentence. Look at all this deep vision that Game of Gladiators has up too. Yeah, they even have the cheeky tier two ward bottom, which you know I'm still debating whether this ward is actually supposed to do this, but hey, it's in the game. It's in the game, why not use it? It's definitely Damn one of the most value wards out there. Absolutely. Open up this tier two. Almost no defense when you have this option. You can just see everything. Yeah, you get some sort of vision, some sort of support or something sitting in the bottom part of the tower. You have that ward up on the top part. You see everybody that could TP in. This is going to be Tormentor for Liquid. It's going to try and push Mickey towards his BKB. That's going to be the big go time for Liquid. You have BKB on Mickey plus this Torrent Storm. That's your team fight. It's all coming together. You can fight behind the Luna with the debuff immunity. You're going to be really happy in that situation because it is a lot of magical burst coming out on gaming. Yeah. Gotta pray you can hold your ground. BKB forced from Darachio. That is definitely a small win here. Even better if they can get the egg in time. And it looks like they've got it no problem. Oh, Ace! It was a good attempt. If he hit Zai 2, there was a chance for the Phoenix to survive. Another X and now. Yeah, he got him. Yeah, they're going to be able to get him off the vision from the Sun Strike. He gets him off the X. Pull him back in. Oh, nice he's going to land. Mickey pushed back by the dead shot. But Ace, he's going to be left alone. Gaming Gladiators cutting their losses. And I think it's a smart play. Liquid did catch them out there, and they accept that. That was a nice attempt at the stop. If that hits I, you maybe get something out of that engagement, but it's very deep, especially when Jirachi had to TP out of the top off the BKB. So you know the Bloodseeker's not connecting that fight. Yeah. That's just a green light for Mickey to join it. Gets the cleanup. This will push him towards that BKB flying out right now. Yeah, he doesn't have it, though. Yeah, where is it? He has pushed that tower without actually having that one. He's going to be in some zero trouble unless this Torrent can stop the Reaper side. But Quinn is way too tanky. He's not dying to this. And he does bring down Mickey. The BKB only works if you get it out of your stash and into your inventory. That is a big timing to give up right there. And another big Reaper kill to give away. Quinn's region just starting to get out of control. When he's under that Sunray with hard plus all stacks, it's like plus 140. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. I don't see you ever bringing this Necro down unless you get him in an isolated situation with the Vessel on top of everything else. That means the front line's going to be very strong here. Zai is going to take a poke at it. No, he's thinking about it. Once again, trying to pull heroes out of position. Game of Gladiators are not afraid of fighting under this. They have a high ground war. Yeah, he, he, does. he wants anybody but Quinn right here. The old scepter to hold Zai in place. Quinn, Spear Vessel put onto him. They have the Torrent Storm, but he gets away thanks nice to the fight. Shard. But they do manage to pick off that support. Tofu goes down, and they back away. They check for high ground vision. It's not there. Taraccio, he's actually cut, a, cut in from behind. Zai's already so low. The Volt's coming in trying to help him out. But I don't think Liquid can really fight this anymore. Too many heroes from the game of Gladiators. And yeah, they're going to be losing two off this one. Godlike spree for Quinn. He, the man is just absolutely untouchable. And Duraccio, his aggression is Very off deep. potentially here as he's going in so deep. Oh, no, that's too much, Duraccio. They will maybe still catch Nisha. Yes, the rupture holds him in place. Maybe he feels that's worth it. Maybe he's not the real carry. After all, Gwyn is the one dictating the strength of Gaming Gladiator in these fights. A little bit of a Duraccio throw. I mean, you got to have a little bit every game, right? Uh, just too far with the BKB down. Not respecting the Luna buyback. Not reading the timer there. Mickey just gets a free cleanup. Also not respecting the shard pickup of the Luna. That does add some yes. extra damage when you are in melee range of that Luna. It's dangerous. That type of fight over extension is probably what Liquid are looking for in general, right? Because their, their run-up burst is not great into the yeah. Sunray, into Necro heal. You're going to be fighting into a calling. But if you can bait gaming into an extended fight like that afterwards, Suddenly that turnaround can be very swift, very painful, especially once the BKBs are down. So that's like gaming have to think about how far do you chase in these scenarios? Do you clump up and give Mickey a really good fight? Because it really is all coming down to this Luna, right? Yeah. yeah. And he stand his ground, output the damage, get good eclipses off. Just do everything. Sometimes these team fights can be a mess, and it's hard to decipher what what exactly is going on. I think it's clear what game and gladiators want out of their their team fight, right? Jump in on somebody, burst them down. What does an ideal team fight look for Liquid, though? You 
somehow save that or like get BKBs off and get the supports, right? You take the Mort out, you take the Phoenix out, or force an early egg and kite it. That's the situation where you can draw gaming out in a long extended fight because the supports are dead. Suddenly the Necro's not as tanky. Suddenly your go attempt with Mickey manning up isn't necessarily putting him in a position where he's stuck in the calling after his BKB goes down. It's about kiting it, right? Find the supports, kite the fight out, extend it as long as you can, and then you're in a pretty okay situation. That's why gaming wants the burst here. They want to jump with Ace, get a Reaper kill on a big core, and set the fight up for Duraccio. Even if that hero does not die initially to Reaper, you're going to put the Bloodseeker in a position where he's thirsted so far up, he might just clean the fight up anyway. From my point of view, I feel like Tornado is like the biggest spell for Team Liquid, right? I think it's the only spell that really allows them to be able to reset off of the initiation from Gaming Gladiators. Okay. Tornado, EMP, the Ice Wall, all these control spells from Nisha are going to be huge. Just got to recreate that gap. Yeah, we saw that Ags on the Necropos completed. Man, he has farmed this game. Yeah, you can't kill him. And now he's outputting crazy damage with that Aghanim Scepter over time. I mean, Quinn is, he's shown he's willing to play this hero in basically any game versus any matchup. There's a reason why. It's looked pretty damn good. 9-0. It's a big streak if Liquid can collect it as well. And I think Liquid are recognizing the fact that a tough fight is coming their way. They're trying to cut creep waves. You can see Boxy's playing in deep while Zai's using some X marks and spot shenanigans. They don't want to give up this Roshan. That's the problem, right? Like, this is a great Roshan for Liquid with Solar Crest Swarm if you can get in there. So you're giving up position on it. It's going to be an egg Roshan contest now. This is pretty damn difficult because your opportunity to find supports on the back line and start on them is very limited around this pit. Celery deep in the corner. How do you get anyway. this guy out of here? What a four, four though. It's yeah. it. oh, three. That's beautiful, but immediately the BKB going off. They are doing a lot of damage. The Necropros is getting low. Can they finish? Oh, five. Low and he's just cleaning up with the glaze. And Celery dove on through the pit, but he missed the ages. He was barely outside of that range. <laughs> Gaiman, Gladiators, they thought we are too strong to be beat right now, but that hubris cost them a massive fight. Never a clump blind in the Roshan pit. If you don't expect it, you should have, because Zai just gets a three-man torn into the boat and cleans them all up here with a torrent storm. What a read, what a move from Liquid. That is not an easy Roche contest. They just believe they had it, and hey, they did. Even gobbled an Aegis at the end on Mickey. Three you can't ask for anything torrent. better here, honestly. Everything lines up. You even got, like, everybody stuck in this meteor trying to run out of the pit in the direction on top of an ice wall. Nisha just cleans house. I think the funny part is there is that Quinn pops the Ghost Shroud, but then that just leaves Duraccio and Ace getting shredded by Glaze. It just bounces between the yeah, two of them. There was no getting out of that the second that Torrent hits. Great timing for the Butterfly. Part of that, they'll heal up Mickey. So now we've got a little bit of sustain options here as well. But the Necropos isn't here quite yet. Gaming Gladiators may have jumped the gun, but they do have the Supernova well positioned. Liquid have to retreat, but the Rupture is preventing Mickey from doing so. And the Necropos is coming soon. Quinn's going to be here. They've got to start retreating a bit. You have a second life on Mickey, but that's it. Butterfly did get delivered, though. But he's damn strong right now. Level 20 talent as well. He's going to take down to pretty much nothing as the Coco run rum wears off and they have the vision of this too they got him outside of that thirst vision but gaming gladiators have enough of a read to know where they're generally at box is going to try and run interference while mickey have the goes Lord. to the escape and they get out they had vision on that high ground quinn was so close to being able to get that reaper's size stun in he didn't death seeker it oh maybe yeah. they couldn't get the gap close properly you know with stampede and everything but that was very close to mickey getting caught they're lucky to get out of there. Gotta respect this thirst and how low you get, right? Mm -hmm. That type of fight, it goes good for Liquid because they get everybody in there during the duration of the Bow Torn Storm and the BKB for Mickey, and they just line it all up. Nisha also just got to sit there in his BKB and right-click everybody. You get in these chase situations where you're low HP. That's a very different story. Formation means a lot for Liquid right now. With an Aegis, they perhaps did not expect to have at this point in the game. Oh, this is interesting. Definitely Boxy, sure. they gave him all the farm that's coming in bottom lane. He's building a Lincolns. So they're going to try and protect their Luna. Even more buff ups. You say, you know, you've got so much to put on this Luna. You start putting some item upgrades in there like Lincolns. That's uh, That would help do a lot to protect against Quinn. He just jumps in so deep there. The Eclipse is going to be doing a lot of damage to Meteor on top of that one. But a quick full heal. Mickey aiming to finish off that tower. The Reaper Sight is going to go off. But Mickey on his BKB. And Quinn is getting burned out here. They couldn't even get through the ages. And over 7 now, the Thieves, they're just diving up 
after Midgate, but again, he has the extra life. Even if they succeeded in that, it was still a fail plan for Gaming Gladiators right outside of their own base. And Ace left wondering, guys, on the initiation, what the hell are we doing here? It, it's just too, it's too much Ubis, right? You think you're too tanky, you think you have too much regen. But the BKB timings and the Vessels doing work here, and now they're going to drag you back in gaming. Full Celery out of position. Game is crumbling for he them very fast. He comes back down fast. to the Tornado into the Sunstrike. Pops before he can use the Supernova. All it takes is Ooh. one bad torrent to ruin your day here. As I just turned this game around, and now all of a sudden you're facing down the barrel of Aluna with Aegis, a Butterfly, Grovo looking for that Satanic and taking your racks. And this is where that alacrity starts to go to work. All of a sudden, Nisha, he's a second damage source. He can make Mika even more powerful. You have to think about the Glimmer on the Reaper. You have to think about the BKP on the Reaper. Not so straightforward anymore. This is where this ball lineup strikes really hard. And the problem's gonna be is Aegis expires in a minute. Liquid can get a lot in that minute of time, but then as the Aegis expires, he picks up a Satanic. So even if that second life is gone in 50 seconds, he will have additionally a second life thanks to Satanic. You gotta wear through this. You're looking down a second lane potentially. I mean, Mickey is just taking names right here plus Sun Strikes. Oh, and a man dodge! Stops Ace entirely from getting that initiation. They're gonna keep the pressure up with the barracks being revealed. They're gonna try and burn out Mickey from a distance, but Insania can keep him healed up, even if there are no heroes to life steal off of. And they're actually just gonna be able to walk away. There is a period of time here. The Aegis expires, but Gaming Gladiators don't have their full squad. Don't have any smokes either. Yeah. No punish available here for Gaming. That'll be two sets to Liquid. They just walk it off. Mickey, his item timing's got so damn accelerated off these last few fights. He is in prime position now. And, I mean, this just felt very casual, right? You can see the bait here. I mean, Quinn is incredibly tanky with Ghost Shroud Sunray coming through. Ace is here, but you're just in an awkward position because it didn't start with you going on a court and bursting them. And you had Aegis the whole time, so even if that happens, you're going to get stuck in a awkward engagement. And at this point, I mean, Dorachio is trying to clean up something that there's nothing to clean up there. And yeah, what the hell are we doing, guys? Hey, we've all been there in that moment. I think everybody in this stadium recognizes those emotions. Just a bad plan for Gaming Gladiators, which is, is surprising to me because I would have thought Liquid getting knocked down recently to the lower bracket. I thought they would be the ones perhaps with a little bit of main stage jitters with elimination on the line and such. Gaming Gladiators been playing clean through this lower bracket, but that was very uncharacteristic slip-up from them. Game has definitely fallen out of their control. Liquid, they did an immaculate job of bringing it back. They took the right fights, they took them in the right way. That's what counts on the TI main stage. Nothing else really matters if you can't clinch those big engagements when they happen. Right now, this ball lineup is clicking on all cylinders. Just so, a question of how much more you can get, right? Because now if you get this next Roshan and you're able to push that last lane, you might just close this game out yeah. before it gets into any type of ultra late game situation. Liquid to turn this game around. Let's take a listen to what their comms are like. I'm running a dangerous way, but fuck it. But fuck it. The boss of this game. You are the boss of this gym. Go, go. Wise words from a team, but fuck it. Yeah. That's an attitude to be able to take for this game because Liquid are in full control of this. I don't think Game of Gladiators can really take a straight up fight against them anymore. But we'll see whether or not that actually comes to fruition here. Nisha, he's trying to find a pickoff to make things a whole lot easier for them in the high ground push. Even forcing out Dorachio's BKB would be a big win. Dorachio holds it for now. He actually is running back into them. He Side wants to be able to play yeah. around this, this high ground area. And it'll be a smoke from gaming. So they're gonna take this fight. What they're looking for is a big core kill. Burst it on the jump from Ace into the Reaper, even through the saves. You gotta remember, there's a full Lincolns on Boxy. He can throw this out to block a Reaper or a Rupture. There's not much else to pop it here. And it might be something gaming are not ready for. If you don't find this Weaver, he's gonna protect the core on the front line, especially with Glimmer and the Suck coming out from Insania oh, on the back. Big wrap around, but Boxy, he ruins it. Shikuchi straight into them, breaks the smoke, and gets out. Gaming Gladiators, they knew they had to get something over Liquid. And it was going to be an initiation on the back line, but ruined. They're all TPing out. They're going to get caught. Close call, but everybody does get away safely. That was not a high ground you're willing to go up if you're gaming here.
Especially with two other lanes pushing into your base. Somebody has to go back at some point. It will relinquish all this map control, however. Looking at a Wisdom Rune. I mean, Tofu wants it, but... Yeah, no way you're getting... Oh, really? They're gonna try for it, Sally! He's like, oh, sorry, Brent, it's not there anymore. Dead shot to try and cover his retreat, but Ty has the vision thanks to the swarm. He's gonna be able to catch him on the side here, the opposite side of the barrier, but maybe with some of the range damage, Sunstrike coming in, he knows he has to use the Supernova, and Liquid is more than happy with that. Really good bait by side, baiting out the Yules, gets the Torn after. That'll force an egg off some really small plays from Liquid. Gives him another little advantage here. Again, this is all setting up for next row, Sean. There's no way you're pushing high ground without an Aegis on the Luna versus a burst-oriented lineup. And yeah, uh, Boxy gets to Ags, changes a lot as well. Now you have the Lincoln save plus an Ag save to deal with Rupture damage, to deal with Reaper Sight damage. And how much can Ace do, right? He's on a hero that, it's not like those Tidehunter games where he can just blow the fight wide open. You get one jump, you're a pipe, and that's about it. Yeah. Isha, tying him up. Spotted here. This is what this Invoker, I feel like, has been so good at throughout the tournament, is being in Viz, running around the map, and finding these heroes who are trying to find some... Duraccio! Oh, Duraccio, what happened? Gone in an instant, trying to help out Ace, and... Oh, it looks like somebody must have... Oh, screen bug. Well, at least it wasn't Duraccio. Yeah. No excuses there. Pause and look for him, but he ain't there. And that was very fast. He is instantly gone. I feel like Duracho's read of where the Liquid Heroes are in these fights has just been a little off, right? He's just been getting in very deep into these melee range, especially versus Mickey, and maybe not respecting that new Luna Shard that makes these man fights a different sort. It's a different beast. And the Liquid fans will fill out the pause with the chant as they can sense the end is nigh for this game one. Liquid in a great position, whether this pickoff of the Bloodseeker does it for them and they straight up go for the high ground from here, they're likely to still catch Ace as they've got him dead rights in so many different ways. The X marks the spot, the torrent to pull him back in. Yeah. By the way, that was double damage on mid game, so that's another oh. reason that uh, Duraccio just got shredded there. So oh, the upside is this was on top lane and not bottom, otherwise I think yeah. Arax is gone. The Liquid, that'll secure Roche for them. That was your Roche fight, right? Just gone in the blink of an eye here. They're respecting the fact that Game of Gladiators could have buyback. Better to just play for Roche, Sean. Of course, we know they actually don't, so Liquid could have ended the game right there, at least gotten Megas, but they're going to play it very disciplined. Get the have Aegis and Cheese. assume and... there's buybacks here. Yeah. Don't know where the gold is. And this Roche is just absolutely free. Make a full slot it pretty much. Give him an Aegis, let him go high ground, and throw every buff you have on him. It's not a bad strat here at TI. Even level 20 for Zai, just gonna amp up this Torrent Storm and the, the chaos in the fight. We're talking about the control that Liquid has when it's on a straight 5 on 5 when the BKBs go down. If you don't get that burst and shorten the extension of that fight, Zai's gonna take it over. This Quinn. The problem with Kunkka. He was trying to game. cut waves because he knows the final push is coming in, so he's hoping to be able to buy a few more seconds, but he's gonna get caught out here. He is 100% dead, but he does have buyback. So he's gonna have to use this for some desperate final hold from Gaming Gladiators. They can't afford any pickoffs, but if they can get a pickoff on Boxy, that would help delay things a little bit. The Lincolns, though, is gonna prevent the rupture, and he's out. Not today. Now that means. Rupture is on cooldown when this push comes in, and Mickey is approaching yeah, 55 it. 55 seconds. He is fully slotted out here. I mean, you're talking about this Necroz buy. When has 5,300 gold, he is buying another item. He just doesn't know what the hell he wants in this game. I mean, it's, it's got to be BKB. He's trying to get close on both. He could sell and get it here. They're going to wait for the initiation, the attempted jump from Ace. Once again, a man to dodge is able to get away from that hoof stomp, and they really cannot oh, seem to Quinn do got dragged. And, oh, he got pulled out from the tidal wave. Quinn's in trouble, but he does manage to use his shard to get out from the side. Still, though, Have buildings about are exposed. Building. You can reset all you want. Your buildings are still going to be in some trouble here, down to half health. But again, he has that Aegis, he has the Lincolns, he has Satanic to full heal him. Nothing is going to stop Mickey from claiming the Megas. You can keep going here if you're Liquid. You can reset, gain some resources as well. You have a lot of time. That'll be the BKB bought out from Quinn to not have it for that fight. 
Does that actually save him, though? Because Mickey's physical damage that he outputs is pretty intense. And part of the problem is how do you get through the saves now? Like, Boxy's itemization in this game with the Lincoln's Ags is closing in. You have the Glimmer Cape. You have another Lincoln's on Nisha as well. So this is double Lincoln's that can go through against Reaper Rupture with, like we were saying, not a lot to pop it beforehand. And these are long cast animation spells. You can honestly hit them pretty reliably if you're just looking only at that and not worrying about anything else here. Block potential is very high. Final push will come. Once more, rally around your Luna. Let him do the work. Let the Glaives do the work. And Luna is so good at being able to siege down Tier 4s with those bouncing Glaives. Getting pretty low already off that bit of burst. See if they can get him again. The Manta dodges. Mickey. he is so on point with it, but he does get burned out anyway. Second life. BKB and Cheese are going to be ready to go for this one. Immediately feared up, though. Does get off the BKB. Turns around, fights Duraccio. Duraccio has to get out of there. That's BKB down, though. Ace, he wants to punish it. He doesn't get the stomp, though. They what? need to be able to slow down Liquid, but Liquid actually going to turn underneath the Supernova, though. That one is going to be a little bit sticky, and Quinn jumps forward, takes his opportunity to the Reaper side, but no! The save comes out just in time. Back to full he goes. He gets the Cheese off, and now he's ready to rumble. Oh, what a time-lapse timing. Just when you think you're going to get a Reaper kill after all the BKBs and the Glimmers are down. No, Boxy is waiting for you. Turns Picks up that right back against you. just in time for Yeah, that was literally just blown in. And they'll get another buyback out of gaming here. Ace, the next to pay the price. Two cores on cooldown for five minutes here. Did take your Aegis, did take your BKB. Final push is coming in. Let's take a quick listen in on Liquid, though. Uh, just I'm, I'm just tipping. Hey, just run. I'm Giga Brave. I'm running in. Just protect me, guys. Yeah. Uh. Mickey understands his strength. Chad just wants to run in, protect him at all costs. And that's what Liquid did there in that, that push. Now he has a refresher. So this is a level 25 Luna with full six slots, double BKB, double Satanic, double Manta Dodge. You can get them both. I agree. Put everything on him and let him end this game right here, right now. He's got a little bit of window where there is no Supernova, even the BKB on cooldown from Quinn. But Liquid are a bit hesitant. What are they waiting for? Waiting for the call. Waiting for the op right opportunity to present itself, perhaps. Waiting for another Tormentor. Why not? Might as well take away those resources away from gaming gladiators. But after all, they're in no position to uh, be rushing things too much. They can take their time if they need to. Now we have the EMP pull in. So not only are you dealing with the constant torn storms, the tidal wave pushing you back, but the EMP is also dragging you away out of position constantly. But to see that attempt there, though always the Death Seeker ready to go for Quinn to get out. Just start poking him down. Create a situation where you force Ace to jump, and then Mickey's going to have a good fight. There it is. Pull him out of position. Hit him with fire. See if they can get that BKB out of him, but Quinn doesn't hit the button. Hold strong for now, but they are taking damage on their tier fours. The Mega starts streaming in. Nice torrent into the Cataclysm. A beautiful setup, and that's going to be Ace going down with no oh buybacks. And Mickey sees his opportunity now to be able to hit the tier fours. The Gaming Gladiators back away. The throne is going to be that exposed. Be Roger tries to come in, sliced and diced by the Glaives. No contest whatsoever. They can take down anybody they want on the side of Gaming Gladiators. Liquid will complete the comeback in style and take it at 43 minutes. And for as strong as that Necropose looked for a lot of the game, he doesn't even get a Reaper off in that last fight. Luna just outputting way too much damage for Duraccio to deal with. Gaming, their lineup, it ran out of steam. They hit a couple roadblocks. They got three-man torrented in the pit. And that was all she wrote, right? There's just no coming back from that point because all of a sudden, the paradigm gets flipped. You're the ones who lack the damage. Your Centaur is running out of the ability to, to create the initiations to give you the burst damage. Who's setting up for who, right? You need a Necro that needs damage to come in. You need a Bloodseeker that needs damage to come in. And the Centaur can't do it for you. This Pugna is causing you a lot of problems on the back line. Boxy with the itemization between the Lincolns and the Ags providing double effective save on these cores. It's just a nightmare to play this single burst lineup into. You got to imagine a bit of shell shock there from Gaming Gladiators. They looked the part two. They know that Roshan fight, that's going to be haunting them for a while, but they've got to be able to reset. 
Elimination fully on the line now. Since they've been here, they've been here to 2-0 through all of this one. But now they're one game away from being knocked out of the International. And they're going to have to clear their minds. And we're going to clear our minds as well as we head to the panel to break down that game one. Thank you so much, Cap SVG. Game one, absolutely dominant from Liquid. A strong performance for them, but it was only game one. We've had a bit of a change up on the panel as well. We brought in the big guns for this series for this showdown again. I've got Ali and Matu joining Effie and myself now. Matu, you didn't get to see Liquid win this series last night, yesterday, but at least they're one game up this time around. I mean, it feels great. Somebody was, T Gunner was already making a stat about like, liquid win rate without like Matu on the panel and with Matu on the panel okay. like zero percent so like I mean this feels great let's go liquid I love to hear you still cheering on your old team there but Owie let's break this one down because it looked like gaming gladiators game to win especially from the draft and in the first few minutes of this game they had that gold lead up until the first rush fight no, I think these types of games are actually sort of the hard ones to lose because you feel like you should have taken this game and you're not too sure like where I mean they know where it went wrong but like how what led up to that were the comms weird were we feeling off you could sort of see after body language after they lost like I felt like Eamon was uncharacteristically down even before the game I felt like Quinn looked a little nervous and that's not usually game in standard usually they're a very good strong mental team which is why they've had such consistent success it could be tough. I mean, it's the penultimate day. This is a lot of make or break for them, and it's going to be a long day for them, even if they do win this series as well. So a lot of build up for themselves. But in that game, in that rush fight uh, specifically, Aoi, did you see what led up to why Gaiman weren't able to be successful in it? I think people are like not... I mean, ev I think all the pros know this, but like when you take Roshan, it's about controlling the high ground. Like Gaming Gladiators, they sort of lost focus for a bit. They had five heroes on the low ground in the pit, and I don't know, it's just such a free fight for Liquid. They had no one scouting the pit, they had no one like prepping the fight with buyback. I'm not too sure what happened in their calls, but I think they're letting their emotions sort of get a hold of them. They're not like thinking about objective, like, oh, we need to break the smoke, they come, they can take this fight. We need to be ready, focus. I feel like they're just playing sloppy. Like they're, it's just bad play, you know, like, uh... Laning stage is mechanical and afterwards like th this is the first team that actual good team that they're playing on the main stage no offense to anyone but like Jeez. after getting out of the lanes you have to play like real dota and they're playing super sloppy like they're just making basic errors and giving back the game to liquid and liquid is happy to take it but there, there is something to be noted about the sloppy play because Liquid played very well. We talk about gaming Gladiator's mistakes, but I think only a team with very strong mental endurance could have come back that game. And honestly, it was the little things around the map even before that Roshan. I mean, the laning stage didn't go the way they wanted it to. The early aggression from GG looked very hard to control, but Luna was farming the entire time. Like, Luna's farm was not shut down. She was in the triangle. She was in both of our ancients. Gaiman did not play on that side of the map. And there were some really key pickoffs that happened, I believe, in the bot lane around minute 20. So I think Nisha and Voker forced the BKB TP from Bloodseeker in the top lane. And then Phoenix had a really aggressive dive. And then Zai just cleaned it up. They got the kill on Phoenix. They got the X on Centaur. And they were finding the kills wherever they could, even before that rush fight. The difference in the space that both of their carries were given and something we talked about too, a difference in win conditions between the two teams. But we're going to break it down a little bit further. It is going to be Purge on the sideline. Thank you. Yeah, the crucial fight of this game was that Roche fight. So I wanted to show you guys some of the crucial things that led up to that moment because that was an uncharacteristic mistake for gaming gladiators to be initiated on like that. So if we take a look at the clips here, uh, it's normal to set up for Roshan with an Observer Ward. Now, this ward is very important. Keep an eye on that and keep that in your mind here. Celery comes into D ward. They push out the creep waves. And over on the bottom side of the map, they even see Invoker teleporting away. So they know that that Liquid's going to defend this, but crucially, he doesn't actually have a BKB yet until after he TPs. So they don't know that he's got BKB. They probably think they're going to be able to fight. And Boxy's doing Weaver things on the right side. He's putting Observer Ward down. They see where Gladiators are. They know they're in the Roche area. He's going to cut the next Creep Wave. So it's just very, very obvious to Liquid that's going to happen. So we see them basically smoke into Approach to land the combo, which was a Torrent first, followed by a Boat. And, but they didn't react to it properly. And the reason is because, take a look at this Observer Ward here. This is the vision for Gladiators. This is what they see. They see him throw the boat, but they don't see him throw the torrent. So they just don't get a reaction time. And the reason for this was, was this Observer Ward vision. Look at how much it covers. It only covers this little edge right here. If they instead place that ward like 
here instead, the vision would be something like this. Then they would have caught them at an earlier time period. They would have been able to stampede, split apart, but instead it just gets them being caught by Liquid and losing the fight, and Liquid gets back in the game. Who would have thought just that lo small amount, millimeters between where you place a ward could have been enough to change this game for you. We can talk about it a little bit more because there's more to the game than just that Roche fight. Uh, there could have been ways for Gaming Gladius to get back in, but first, Saxon like Tsunami also all want to have a little bit of screen time. It's us and a bunch of people in the crowd right now. How we doing? It's day number two here in Climate Pledge Arena, and we are filled to the brim right now. And a lot of chants going on in the audience as well, Slax. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, we've been hearing it all series. All right, guys, we know that you know what to do. Can we get the, uh, the let's go liquid, please, my friends? Let's get it out of our system. At let's go liquid. Let's go liquid. All right, all right. All right. We hear that all the time. All the time. And I feel bad. I mean, gaming gladiators are here and they don't have a chance. In fact, I saw some GG fans over here. I feel like we need to make one for them. Hello, my friends. How you doing there? Huh? Oh, oh, put your sides down. You are blocked. Oh, good. No, that's all good. Sir, how are you doing? I'm doing good. All right, rough first series. Do you have any ideas for what we as a crowd can scream at gaming gladiators to get them excited? That's obvious. Okay, go ahead. Let's go, go, go! I mean, that was okay. <laughs> what do you got? Okay, okay, I have some ideas. All right, all right. Let's try this one out. Can you hold up my microphone right here? All right, check this out. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, uh, you died! No Stop trying to sneak right, liquid chair! Here we go, here we go. D R Darachi O! D R Darachio is here! D-R! Darachio! D-R! Darachio is here! Now, yeah, that could work. And if he's, like, not doing good, you can always continue the song, you know? He has no farm. He has no TP. This no, 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 wait, that, that's enough song. Okay, all right. Nah. Sorry about that. Well, the crowd's able to yell what they want. No problem. We won't control it. I do like the DR Duraccio, though. Isn't it going to be DY Duraccio? I can't spell Tsunami, but maybe our panel can. Uh, panel, how do you spell words? Back to you. <laughs> what, what sort of question is that? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I thought he was just going to take the Let's Go Liquid one, and he was just going to go Let's Go Gaming. That's what I, that's I, what I thought I he was just going to Let's Go Go Go. <laughs> I mean, you that sounded better. <laughs> <laughs> you like the Let's Go 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 yeah, a bit more? I mean, most definitely in sex. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, who had the, the better cheer, though, overall? The, the Let's Go Liquid is just nice stock standard. I mean, I love Liquid, <laughs> though I'm ultimate bias here. I can't really speak an ill word of him. Readjusting. Well, lucky for you, Mart, too. I don't know if you know the players that well, if you know much about the org, but we have a video for you that's going to fill in all the missing pieces of information you might have about Liquid. I think the TA that hurt the most was probably TA 10, mostly because I feel like there were there were a couple plays in that last series that, you know, just, like, really regret. And, well, puppy. Gonna get the disruption off, gets stuck inside the Bramble, pops the Ghost Scepter preemptively, but he's gonna die shortly after. Great oh. curse. Yep, that's a huge curse on the three heroes as Team Secret get RP from Collapse, and the right clicks are there from Yotaro. Triple oh kill for him, making an ultra kill. Will he get another Rampage at TI-10? Absolutely! We felt that we were good, and that we could go all the way, but we just, you know, we just got outplayed and we got beats and it's hard to take anything out of that besides ambition to get to get even better. No defender opportunity. They pop the cheese on jabs, but without a terror blade, there's really nothing left for talent. They're gonna call it here. GG, Team Liquid. To be a TI winner, I think a lot of things have to fall into place. I'd like to think it's a lot of it has to do with, with mindset and belief that you get to a point in the tournament where all of a sudden you have such like undying faith in your ideas that you kind of just go with it um, because then you escape all the, you know, what if they do this, what if they do this, you know, we have to counter this, they're gonna play this, and instead you're just like, oh, they're giving me this, it's free game, you know. You're gonna give me Wisp, you know, we'll win. I think that's something that OG proved, that kind of when they got their 
their things, uh, they're just cruising. That's when you're when you're really there. Uh, and I think everyone's kind of trying to, throughout the tournament, trying to get to that point where, you know, you figure out a couple of heroes that just really click for you. Uh, and once you have that, you're, you're sailing. You put a lot of time and effort into it, but I don't, I don't really think you, at any point, deserve to win it. So if I'm deserving or not, I think it would mostly just be because I've been through this a long time. And, you know, looking back at what I've done throughout the years, uh, it would be nice to, to kind of get the last one in and be able to call, you know, myself a tier winner. I'm not gonna lie, pretty emotional piece about Zai there. You know, he's always made it so close, but never actually in the grand final for himself. So this is it, he's in the lower bracket, but it could potentially happen for himself. It all starts with uh, this series going in a way of a win for themselves. Game one was it. And do you think that they've hit that state now, Owie? They gave Mickey Luna, and that was it. That was the, we got this hero, and now we can win this game. Well, I actually have a question for Matu. Oh, okay. Because you're in, you're in Liquid's head a lot. You played with them last year. So this game, I feel like they had a good track coming in. They tried to shut down Gaiman's offlane. They did that pretty successfully. But I would still say that Gaiman sort of reached like a winning position this game, and Liquid had to clutch it. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I also feel like that. I felt like Gaming got everything they wanted for the first 20 minutes, and after that, like, I mean, they threw the game. They didn't play good. They played quite literally shit. So <laughs> <laughs> if I were Gaming, I would just run it back with the same, like, same ideas, and I think like if they just like get their heads straight, they're gonna win the next game. Do you think Liquid would want to change though? Because even though they won this game, I don't know if I'd be as comfortable. Like I feel like they clutched a win that they didn't necessarily deserve. You're right. <laughs> they have to let it. <laughs> There's nothing left to say about that. <laughs> would you want to change like Liquid strategy though? I mean, I think they they should uh, come up with something. Uh, that would, I mean, it's hard to say, right? It's like they have their own idea, and I'm, I'm not quite sure if this was their idea of like not quite doing well on lanes. And after, like, when our heroes come online, we're gonna win the game anyway, type of thing. So, do you have an answer for your question, Ali? Like, if you were in oh, the. I, I have no idea. <laughs> it's it's weird. It's I don't, weird I don't when know you if you win, like, but yeah. you're not sure if your strategy was correct. I think you'd probably want to switch it up a bit, anyways, so that gaming can't learn. But, you know, who knows? I mean, in that sense, maybe they could just address the hero that they felt put them in that losing position in the first place if their laning wasn't atrocious. Uh, maybe the Necroflus, most teams didn't let it through. Maybe getting that Necro on 18 for gaming gladiators caught them off guard. And if they just think about the potential threats of these cheese heroes coming out, they can stick to the Luna. I know that you said that maybe it was a win that they didn't necessarily deserve for Liquid just because of how well the early game went for Gaming Gladiators, but they were still able to stay dominant in that later part. And now I kind of want to focus on that before we get to a Game 2 draft, because they weren't giving any space. Quinn's Necro still was doing a lot of work, but he even got picked off, he even got caught out. So what exactly was it about Liquid's late game that made it really impossible for Gaming to get back in? I think first I should say like deserve was probably the wrong word. Like That's they right. obviously played on them. <laughs> they have to do. We but all like, use the like wrong a, words sometimes. From a theory standpoint, like yeah. they weren't supposed to win, you yes. know. I think um, I'm not. I'm not too sure, Matthew. What do you think? Like, well, I mean, uh, it's hard to say. I'm not there, and they're both playing. But uh... <laughs> let's say we replace Blitz with you, Matu. and you're in the liquid booth now. I would pick good heroes. <laughs> like, let's start with that. That's really smart. <laughs> it's like that's what I came here for. I I came on to tell like good hero, bad hero, just pick good heroes and win. You know, simple simple math. Mm -hmm. I, I think put it. saying something like okay, the draft or the early game might not have gone that well anyways, but we still managed to clutch it. This game, we're even going to have a more robust draft and the game will go even more smooth to get on some confidence. I think that would go really far for Liquid because and these teams, they they played each other a lot this year. Yeah. And other than, I think, Riyadh, like, it has mostly gone Gaiman's way. You know, they've uh, matched up 12 times throughout the year. I think it's one of the biggest matchups that any two teams have had in one uh, calendar year of competitive Dota. So it's a massive, it's a massive matchup for them. And you're right, it is normally going Gaming Gladiators away in those 12 matchups. and. It's going to be a hard reset, but Effie, do you have any ideas for hero changes, band changes even? 
I mean, if I were gonna look at hero changes for Gaiman, I thought everything but the Bloodseeker looked fine, because Bloodseeker didn't give them that late game safety blanket. Earlier you asked uh, Aoi why you thought Liquid remained so dominant in the late game, it's just because their heroes scaled better, and they were at the point where they had the map control, they had their solutions to Necro, and Bloodseeker fell off. So if you can kind of, you can still play aggressive while also having late game security, that's what carries like Luna give you, so I would bench the Bloodseeker. Yeah. I had that one down as well. It's like, Bloodseeker, is there a reason we're not seeing it? And maybe this game is a pretty good example. Marty, you, you said you're here for the good hero, bad hero, or are you putting Bloodseeker? Bad hero. <laughs> okay, so don't pick it again. No. On I, either team. I mean, there's a reason why it's not picked very often. They're trying to find solutions for some heroes in Liquid's lineup. I mean, they're hyper-focusing on the lanes, first of all. They okay. see, like, Kunkka going off lane. They want to Bloodseeker that. It's going to be a really good lane for Bloodseeker. And hopefully, they're going to scale off just a good early game. But they just completely, like, whiffed it. You know, that Roshan was atrocious. Like, this is not supposed to ever happen in a pro Dota game that you go Roshan like that. You have to, someone has to be scouting the smoke and popping the smoke run out of pit and then take the fight and they just got blind torrented by three like on three people unreal yeah it's pretty unreal and we're gonna see uh, if they're gonna bench it what lessons they've learned for that game one and what's gonna let through in game two draft team liquid versus game in gladiators game two now we can get to the nitty gritty of the drafts, coining a bad heroes, good heroes, as Marta likes to put it. Pugna, where do we want to put him? And uh, is he now a first phase ban worthy hero? Omega good. Omega more, good? Yeah, more Pugna, more Luna. Is Mickey like undefeated on Luna? Let's see more of that. Okay. That's what I like. I want unfe undefeated heroes on my on my boys, yeah? <laughs> I, I think um, Liquid's idea this, like this series is going to be shutting down the gliders off lane. I think Pugna, as Matthew said, Pugna and Luna, they're probably like the strongest safe laners, right? Like I don't think anything really matches Pugna in lane. He's just really fast, he hits hard, there's a good nuke. And I think we saw last game, like when I saw them get the double kill onto Ace and um, Tofu, that's why I thought the game was like starting to go good well for Liquid. Obviously, Gliders made some really good rotations through the gate and sort of stabilized that lane, but I think their plan going in was really good. I just want to see Nisha have a good game. Like, he had a very big mid diff, as we like to so call it, like mid difference. Um, they picked <laughs> Thank you, Master. Yeah. <laughs> just to make sure everyone understands. Um, yeah, they picked Invoker in the Necrophos, and he just, lo like, completely got stomped on lane that lane. Ooh. They can fix that. They can maybe bridge the early game better. Let's be fair to him, though. You know, the mid diff, it, the lane matchup is really difficult ever since Invoker lost his Quas regen. Landing into a Necro who's constantly like, harassing you with his abilities, with his passives, it became a lot more difficult for Invoker, but he was able to come back after the mid diff, you know, have the impact on the Invoker, Matu. I, I never doubt my boy Nisha. <laughs> Best player in the world. Let's go! <laughs> This is a liquid plant on the side. Yeah, it really is, really is. I mean, you're you just more like gaming gladiators or something like that, you know? I have been very neutral. I well, not anymore, not anymore, okay? I'm coining that you're allowed to be biased towards gaming gladiators. Should, I, should I be the game and cheerleader? Yes. yes. I and mean, I find... Okay, go, Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Get amazing, your... <laughs> amazing. I mean, I, I think that, honestly, Game and are a great team, but I, I do wonder, Curtis was talking about earlier how he felt that the game was uncharacteristic of them. He thought that their body language coming out was very disappointed. And the thing is, when it comes to Game and versus Liquid, up until the Riyadh Masters, Game and were always in a winning position or they felt like they had their number. Starting off a elimination series one game down, I wonder how that's going to affect them mentally because we haven't seen Game in a lot of positions where they have to recover from situations like this, right? Mm -hmm. It's usually liquid or on the back end. Yeah. I think I'm pretty happy with how Gaiman are approaching this game, though. I think it's very easy to lose confidence in what I would say is their best strat, the Morta, after you lose a game. They see the Pugna, they think that... I would think from their perspective, like, they would even think they would do better in this offline this time if they got someone like a Morta Centaur versus the Pugna. And something else that I think is interesting for Liquid is I think that last game they felt like it was awkward that they couldn't ban the Necrophones in the second phase because they wanted to ban the Chen. But this time they've actually opted to ban the Chen earlier so that they're more free on the second phase to ban a hero good against the cores in the second phase. I like this approach a lot because especially if you're going to first pick a support, you want to focus your bans on the core slots. 
It's good that they don't overthink it. There's, they're quite literally sticking to their guns right now. Exact same first two picks, and like the game was going great, like last game. Do you think uh, Liquid are going to go back for that Weaver? Or are they hoping to maybe put Boxy on something he's a little bit more comfortable with? That's not to say he's not comfortable on the Weaver, but we have seen him do a lot more on other pods for heroes, and that that Weaver was supposed to go to Mickey and sort of fell apart, and they recovered it well. I would personally think they should go for a different route. I think that if you pick this Weaver, you're sort of committing on winning the lane on the Weaver. It was a really good matchup versus Phoenix, and I think they had the idea of putting it potentially safe lane, having a strong lane there. But I think um, the Weaver sort of made their post lane a bit awkward. I think Boxy is like a lot better when he can help his team move around the map, and I think Weaver's more of like an independent solo hero. Also, they did end up trading the Weaver for the Centaur on Gaiman, so I don't think that trade worked out for the favor of the Centaur. So if you just take this Weaver out at this stage, it opens you up to not have to consider the Centaur the way that you did in the last game. So now you can just even go for a potential sub double support opening with the Phoenix, which is still a really great hero for Gaiman. We know it's a salary specialty. It gives them team fight. It gives them map control. They just fumbled on it a little bit. We're going to see what Liquid are going to pick up for themselves. And we've talked about all these changes, all the different ban orders and what it leaves open for them now. So, Aoi, what would you like to see? Actually, no. Martha, what would you like to see? I just want to see this uh, Phoenix, like, answered, like, directly. No, like, roundabouts about it. I want something that kills the egg or some heroes that just don't care about the egg. Um, Liquid's last loss, like, last year's loss, they lost against Phoenix. They had zero answers. and. This hero is so contested that you really need to answer this support hero. Otherwise, the game will naturally just crumble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we often see teams neglect to not so much address the egg because they're busy trying to create synergy in their draft, and they, they do regret it. I feel like Luna is enough of a solution. I mean, Matsu said run back the Luna. Mike owned on it, very 100% win rate, so here we are. But it's a good BQB carrier. It can focus on the egg. Like, natural agility items are also bought for this hero. Um, on the side of Gaiman, they also had the, the Morita Phoenix backline, right? We talked about how Pugna is addressed through heroes that jump on it. So now you have these two potential backline supports with no frontliner to get on top of this Pugna. That really needs to be solved. Alone Druid, Matu, I see your eyes. There's a, there's a glint. Yeah, I'm, they're glowing. I <laughs> love this hero. I'm known for this hero. Yeah. Like, it always gets me excited that somebody's <laughs> practicing this hero and playing, because it's definitely not the most played. It's somewhere down there with the Chen. I mean, definitely Liquid having the Pugna and Luna, like just what I like wanted. <laughs> Maybe they heard me. Um, that makes me happy too. But this is one of the Ace's best heroes. Um, gaming drives through the lanes and it really fits the picture how they want to play and I'm a little worried for Liquid, honestly. Yeah. How does it fare versus the Pugna and Enchantress supports? Like, how, how do you think Lone Druid deals with them when they're pushing towers? He can just run his bear into it? Yeah, he can. It's, they don't really have any relation. Lone Druid is... Uh, he hates stuns, but these heroes don't really stun. They're just there hanging out, supporting their boys, so... It's looking good. Aoi, Aoi, you've had a, a little bit of time to think about this draft, so how are you liking the, the matchups of them so far? I think the Lone pick's pretty good. I think that Enchantress, he wants to sort of come from a winning lane. When you win your lane on this hero, you get to like go into the enemy triangle, start pressuring both mid and the safe lane. But Lone a hero that can put a lot of pressure on your carry, so you feel like you have to babysit him a lot more. I also think that this Pangler pick, Gaming Gladiator's Classic, um, they'll just see like two supports that don't really mess with his game. And I think they'll have a really good time on Gladiators. Their lineup right now, all they need is like for the safe lane to be stable, which I'm not too sure like how this Pugna vs Phoenix matchup goes. Uh, I haven't seen it that much, but I'd assume like it's sort of a whatever lane for both sides. And yeah, good Kunkka pick. If the, I feel like every time I see this hero and he has a decent lane, the hero is Unreal Emba, so we'll see how it goes in the team fights. And X is a super viable spell here versus the Pangolier versus the Phoenix, and. Uh, Quinn does get his pango. It is that backline jump to address this Pugna, make sure that he's not sustaining his cores. What happened in the last draft actually was they preemptively picked the Kunkka so that the Earth Spirit or Shaker pango options didn't look that good. But they just went for the Pugna, the Pugna here as, I mean, the pango here as early as they could, just so they could make sure that they don't have issues with the backline. But Kunkka solves it very well. The Torrent Storm is also just an excellent spell versus Lone Druid. It makes it to the bear. 
has a very difficult time hitting heroes, Matu. You mentioned it doesn't like stuns. Does it like being pushed up in the air for the entirety of the game? I totally agree. I'm, if I were a mid laner, I had a Konka, I see these four heroes, I think, easy game, guys. Just go next. Like, uh, job well done. That simple, huh? <laughs> that simple. simple. And, and it looks amazing. Like, you can't just deny it. It's like... It is a pretty good Phoenix game, though, right? Like, yeah. I feel like Phoenix is one of the only heroes where when Konka presses Torrid Storm, you don't have to panic, you don't have to spam all your BKBs. If you get a good egg off, like, you might be able to weather out the storm. I think this game, a lot of it is going to depend on Liquid safe lane. Like, how does Enchantress and Luna do? If they're able to free up the Ench a bit more and she's able to roam onto this Pangler, I feel like they could have a lot of pressure on mid. Uh, it's very rare that you see, like, Gladiator as a position where they're the one who's sort of going to be forced to do things on mid, and they don't have the best supports, in my opinion, to respond to this pressure. So how are we feeling about the where to flex to safe lane still, and then you just respond with a more active support to absolve some of the Enchantress pressure? It could happen, but I think most likely you should take a hero that's easier to leave alone. I think in your eyes this game, there should be like a lot of fighting with this Kanka and Pangler mid. The runes are really important. So if you have a Morta in the safe lane, I think she's sort of easy to rotate on. I think they'll end up picking like a melee hero that makes the lane a bit more stable and they can leave it alone. Also, using like the very last pick on the support, like you have to get a lot of value out of the support or like they have to have messed up against the core flex. I think I agree. Probably won't happen, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like... In theory, more to carry is amazing here. Like, he's super good against Luna, super against Kunkka, and Pagna, no cares. But I think gaming's biggest problem this game will be that they don't get ran over. Like, if they don't get ran over, they have a fighting chance. So, Morta carry doesn't quite fix, like, fit that picture, because Morta needs, like, five items to be used for or something, like, ridiculous. Like, they're, like, the ultimate hard carry of hard carries, so. <laughs> So if Alec gets taken out, you don't want to run back the Bloodseeker. CK is never going to be given in a pool, and there's no Weaver. What kind of self-sustaining carry can you put on this safe lane for Gaiman? I mean, Spectre is an option when you're looking at like squishy heroes in the back line, but we've, the Tidehunter comes out, so you can't Spectre anymore. So that's one of the only good options also taken out. I think... Okay, I don't really want to see them pick it, but I know they've ran Lifestealer in situations like this. Like, just someone who's going to sit there independently. I think the lane can be sort of not good versus Tide. Like, he's going to outform you a bit, but I, I could actually see them picking it. I mean, that hero is on my good bad hero list. Yeah. I'm not quite sure, you know? It's somewhere sure. in the middle. I'm, I'm leaning towards a bad hero. Well, I have a more right important now. question, though. How many good heroes and bad heroes are on each side right now? Like, each side? Yeah. I feel like Liquid... Just wait, like, good, good, good... Liquid good. has three good heroes. Three good heroes. Edge, not good heroes. Okay. Um, gaming, alone would obviously, good hero. Um, Phoenix, good hero. Murta, good hero. Is, like, Lone like, a double good hero, or, like, how does that... Uh, like, yeah, it's a double it. Okay. <laughs> well, for the sake of it, so... Just game, double the overall yeah, score. Gaming has four good heroes right now. Pango is not one of them. Not two. Void, is that a good hero? Faceless Void versus a Tidehunter? Do you hate it? It could be a thing. I would like something like really faster hero, like faster paced hero. But what's left in the pool right now with the Alchemist, Terrorblade taken out, the Spectre, I feel is not really a solution versus a Titanter. I feel like Curtis is more like qualified for this question, having coached Tundra. I honestly, <laughs> without, like, the, just without, the heroes, all without the heroes, around without the heroes, I can't function, but you need the honestly, screen. I'm happy with like whatever they feel confident in that can hold the safe lane versus Titanter. Like, I just don't want them to feel like they're collapsing to this pressure. Generally, the picks of Titanter, traditional, like Ursa, Slark, um, these heroes, actually Tidehunter doesn't have a bad lane and they have a Pugna as well versus Phoenix, so I feel like they're a bit sus right now. I think you just need to pick something that's stable in the lane that will sit there and allow you to go pressure the enemy mid. Oh! That's a fast hero, let's go. I like that. Yeah. I mean, for sure, this hero has eventual pressure on the Tidehunter. Like, it, if you find that you can leave it alone, you think that they won't rotate on him, I could see the Razor work out really well. He's a bad hero, but he's really... It's a bad he hero. Looks, yeah, he's a bad hero. <laughs> he's a bad hero, but he looks amazing this game. To be fair, you know? This bad is heroes, a really good Razor game. Yeah, it's like bad heroes can turn into amazing heroes given the right game. I think if we see the reemergence of the old school like BKB refresher build on this Razor, they, they could play on a very early timing and they could handle the threat of the, the Luna and he can outfight the Kunkka with the Torrent Storm and the, the boat debuff. But he's going to have to make sure to just win that lane. If the safe lane loses in any way, if there's any kind of sneaky twin gate rotation, it, it could be scary for a gaman. Alrighty. Well, we've had our drafts now. Thank you guys so much for all of your information for the good, bad hero rankings. But we're going to hear from the gaming gladiators coach himself.
Hello, everybody. I am here with CY from Gaming Gladiators. Give it up for the boys! You see this, sir? I have questions here. Uh, they're all gone after I see that last pick, Razor. Going down to the end of the reserve time, as Matu said on the panel, garbage hero, but pretty good this game. How are you feeling about it? I mean, I feel pretty good about it. Like, sometimes you can't fix, like, it's a good lane against Tide, also historically. Sometimes you can't fix these kind of problems with bad heroes. So I think Razor is an okay hero. It's not an OP hero by any means, but if Tide has a really bad game, I think it's, it's pretty good for us. All right, as Trent likes to say in the back, whenever he sees you pick Lone Druid, this is our uh, they don't want to lose hero. Is that how you guys are kind of feeling in this draft? Lone Druid is just kind of like, Ace feels it. He feels he's going to own with it, so we trust him. Okay, well, I'm sure the team trusts themselves very much as well. This might be the last time that we get to talk to you. I hope not, though. So any words on, out man. there? I'm not, come, come on, I'm just saying. Any words out there to the fans? This won't be the last time. It better not be! Let's go into the game as we take it with our casters. You're goddamn right. I hope it won't be the last time we see CY. We all want to see game three because it would be a shame to see the most dominant team of this season go down in a 0-2 fashion. Right, Avery? That depends who you ask, but I tend to agree, yeah. <laughs> I think I, the Liquid fans <laughs> behind me wouldn't mind, but... Yeah, there's a lot of Liquid fans in this arena right now, so they would definitely not mind. I don't it know, maybe be... we can test the crowd. What do you think? You guys want to hear a 2-0 or do you want to get a 2-1? You want to see a game three? <laughs> That's what I want to hear right there, but... Are Gaming Gladiators going to be able to do it, Avery? They picked up the Lone Druid. They trust in Ace. I feel like if anybody on this team you're going to trust to carry the game, I feel like Ace has been rock solid for them all year. Why not? Not a bad option to go to, right? Give them, like, actual carry here. They can push objectives, take the pace. You're looking for that defusal Harpoon build. It's going to be pretty terrifying in the fights if he gets away with it and just has his way. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with the panel's assessment. Like, this is another draft from gaming where if the lanes go well for them, if they get these solo matchups, the Razor versus the Tide, the Lone Druid gets a lot of solo XP, they can run away with it again. They're kind of just going all in on these, like, lane domination into the tempo, going high around 25, 30 minute mark. Liquid, they're going to present the same type of formidable ball against them. Luna back on the menu, and of course, Tide and Kunkka to just buffer up with a Pugna behind. It's a very similar setup, right? So gaming know what's coming. They're trying to address it a bit differently. Razor's one of these carries where we saw Duraccio suffer last game with the Bloodseeker versus the Luna matchup. I think Razor can do very well versus Hero if you get fast BKB, you just run in. Luna sometimes not ready for you. You suck all his damage away. What happens when the four protect one is protecting a one with no DPS? Yeah, I love the, like, I've always called Razor kind of an anti-carry in that regard, that he just latches onto the enemy carry and negates them entirely. Especially the way Durachu got ruined by the shard pickup of Luna. Those glaives were destroying him. Here, we've got a range hero, but also takes away the attack damage of the Luna. Uh, you make a good point. Honestly, I feel Gaming Gladiators have a really nice setup here. The panel definitely uh, focused on that, the fact that Razor may not be the best hero in the meta right now, but it is a good late Razor game. I mean, of course, Matu is on the panel, so you have to take a little Druid, you know, mm, get course. that bias in your direction. Doesn't hurt. But a lot does come down to the first 10 minutes here. And we saw Liquid go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Gaming in that game one. Now, Gaming came out a little bit ahead on Raggio, you can't be poor to, to die already oh. in this lane, but he does. That is not a kill I expect. This is a no. double range lane versus a Tide with Gush level one, and you just find a first blood that easily versus Plasma Field. Razor's not that squishy of a hero. The hero's good stats, decent armor. It's supposed to be the last pick lane matchup that goes Gaiman's way. So Liquid just immediately strike on these lanes, get a really nice start for Boxy, who is on that Pugna this time instead of Insania. So this is a hero that Liquid's very confident playing four and five. They just like the heals and the sustain the hero brings to the table. Not really caring about any of the counter matchups. And it had a Delary. decent amount of impact game one. He's going to take a lot of damage here too. The plasma field does keep, but well, it doesn't actually stop Boxy. Boxy's like, uh, I don't care about you, Razor. I'm going to chase down Celery to the ends of the earth if need be. And Celery, might get him here. Yeah, he's going to be routed a little bit. He's going to back away. Long does leave Hyde alone in the 1v1. And that's not where he wants to be. He does not want to pee in a situation where he's just a simple melee hero against the Razor, but Celery does get run down eventually. Boxy claims the second kill of the game. Already 2-0 for Mr. Pugnaman, and yeah, Zyde did get punished on the backswing. That's the downside. He also went for the fast boots here, which means a little less region on this bottom lane. Yeah, Gladiators is going to be enough. The final shot, not quite. Insania does hit his level two, and nature's attendance keeps him up just enough. 
This is a scary safe lane for Liquid to play going into that like five to ten minute mark. If they get a lot of XP on Ace here, I can see him kicking Mickey out, particularly off a rotation from the Pangolier mid. If Quinn gets some runes, it's going to help accelerate these side lanes a lot. That's normally what they look to do with the Pango. Oh, Quinn. Uh, double water rune? If he dodges the Torrent, he gets the second water rune. So that is a big buff for him. Almost losing his courier, but it's fine. Well, the creeps, they won it. <laughs> Does mean he misses out on one CS there, but probably worth it seeing as the Kunkka versus Melee matchup is usually a bit of a game of sustain. Okay, surely if gaming go out, not that I'm cursing them. I'm no, saying. of course not. Got a little bit of fight in top lane first. <laughs> if he goes out on Pango of all heroes. <laughs> you know Quinn does iron. not want to lose on a Pango. Yeah, I, I can assure everybody I will yeah. never let him live that down personally. <laughs> Be interesting to watch, but so far he's doing quite well mid. Yeah, the millions of dollars wasn't enough motivation. The uh, <laughs> public humiliation may not may be too much to bear. Never underestimate it. He's looking to punish Nisha for the lack of regen. Damn, this is where you wish you could just like roll mid early, but these silings are way too important as I getting pushed back again. He's had to buy his own salve. So he's getting a lot of regen abused on this lane. And while that lane looked great for them at the start, this is where that Razor matchup just becomes incredibly painful as you try and get to a ring of health. Boots first. I mean, it's great for dealing with the, you know, not feeding away kills to the Razor. It's not great for staying on the lane. So Liquid running into some regen problems on these lanes as the War of Attrition heats up. Gaming starting to strike back. You know, I want to talk about the uh, the versatility of roles here for Liquid. They, uh, You talked about the Pugna, they swapped it between 4 and 5 this game, but also the Kunkka, right? Three position for Zai last game, yep. now running mid. What do you think that, that gives Liquid uh, when they're able to have that kind of versatility in their draft? Do you feel like it gave them an edge somewhere? I think it's what Blitz talked about. Like, it, the versatility helps you the most in the draft, right? You get to hold these flexes till later, and you can see more lane setups. You're not going to get punished in matchups as hard. You make sure you're winning at least, you know, one and a half or two out of the three lanes so you don't get run over. I think that's a big core component that Liquid had to figure out over the course of the year playing against gaming in all of these grand finals, right? Yeah. A lot of those games, not everyone, but a decent amount, gaming just beat them in the first 10 or 15 minutes so hard that there wasn't any Dota to play. Yeah. So if you go even in that phase as Liquid and you get into that mid game like we saw last time, get a one good team fight, all of a sudden you can just win a game off that, especially with a hyper carry like Luna that they have shown can be pretty nasty given a lead. And that's what Mickey's gonna try and do here again. Now he doesn't have as many crazy buffs behind him in terms of damage. I really like that invoker pairing with it, just because I think the control and the alacrity does help you in that end game. But Kunkka and Tide, they're gonna give you a lot of extra sustain here. And he doesn't have to worry about as much burst. There's no big Reaper coming out on this Luna this game. It's just gonna be the Pango going in with a Rolling Thunder. It gives you maybe a better winning matchup, but maybe not against the rotation coming out from Celery. Quinn, he needs to be able to hit this Swashbuckle to finish off Nisha, but the regen is already kicking into play, so Quinn abandons that idea. This is just fighting for that six minute power rune. I like the fact that Boxy is not letting gaming get away with bringing more heroes mid on Nisha, especially when Nisha was falling behind in that region department early with the water runes. This lane is completely evened out. They're both very close to six. I think Nisha's gonna, he's gonna hit it off this catapult. Wouldn't be surprised to see him try and get a cheeky kill with this boat. And Quinn, even if he does get it off of one or two creeps here, he needs more mana. Oh yeah, they're looking for it just out of range. So he's in power damage. And again, six minute power room. No way Quinn gets this. They will get the boat connection. Pull him back in with the Decrepify, help him out of burst magic damage. They need the physical swing in from Nisha, and that's gonna be denied for the fire spirits for now. Nisha can't get swing in. And thanks to Tofu making his rotation out, makes things a little awkward for Liquid. Quinn just has no resources here. This is a three-man rotation for gaming without any mana on the pango. You just can't take the fight. And it'll be a uh, arcane rune into Nisha's pocket. A very nice one to pick up here. Mickey in some trouble. Fought for the Lotus. And he will maybe die for it. No, the Lotus is actually what keeps him alive here. Ace also has to rotate back because Boxy was cutting through the river with the other support of Insania. This is where that solo matchup just, it's a nightmare, right? There's not many carries you can stand one-on-one -on -one against Lone Drew. You need a very specific one. And even in these situations, as long as Mickey can get his XP and eventually retreat the jungle, he's going to be happy. But I do expect both these silence to kind of open up for gaming over the next few minutes here. This 5 to 10 period is really become a big nuisance unless you're bringing numbers to combat it. You see Zai, he's still continuing to struggle in this Razor matchup. I mean, he's just hoping he has some ancient stacks or something to fall back on at this point. It's not going to be one of those high lanes where you get a hammer and just start beating down the tower. 
Whisk First will be rotation, the rotation coming out from Liquid. Double supports, but at the same time, from behind, there is going to be this Pango showing up. If they can finish off Duraccio, it'd be worth it, but they can't quite get him. He's hidden away into the trees. Duraccio is out of sight. And now Zai gets bumped back. He goes for Insania instead. An easier kill for sure. And Duraccio is the one to claim the turnaround kill. It's just such a hard kill. Even with all the, the supports coming bottom for Liquid, this race is way too tanky. I do like the idea though, right? You want to bail out these side lanes in the one-on-one -on -one matchup by just bringing numbers, outnumber the core, create a situation where if you get the big kill on these tanky boys, you get a, so much XP back. Yeah, so they make to the get move on Ace. bottom, and if that doesn't work, make the move on top with Nisha. And Ace doesn't he's have his level six, so he's pretty squishy once caught by some disables. This is exactly what you want to do. Just find these cheeky core pickoffs because every time you do, you can leave the lane. Now you can leave Mickey top for some solo XP. He'll catch back up, right? And suddenly he doesn't have this lone Drew pestering him or pushing the tower. Meanwhile, you can just get boxy room mid. I like these rotations from Liquid. It's giving their cores a lot more breathing room in this early game and nullifying what gaming wants to do, which is isolate the one on ones here. It does come at a cost, though, because it means they give up control of the power rooms, right? And Quinn, well, he got an armor rune. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to use that quite as well as some other ones, like an arcane rune, but. It is still something to note that Quinn's rotation is going to be all the more powerful. Yeah, but look at this. Again, Ace again. round two. Ace hit his level six, but chose not to level up his ultimate. He's doing a lot Ace of damage. He has to back away. One versus three. Now they know the rotation is coming in from Quinn. He's to get it with the swashbuckle. Oh, clips Nisha. Not quite finished up. Mickey. They'll get the kill on Insania instead. Deep in, though, though. Courier spotted, and they know Nisha is still trying to get out of here. Unfortunately, he's just a bit too quick for Quinn. That dead shot almost hit Mickey as well. That is very close to losing the Luna and just translating this completely into a route on the safe lane. Gaming, they they read that pretty damn well. I mean, the move from Liquid, if you get another kill on Ace there, he has no resum. He's completely out of the game for a minute. So that is a lone Drew you have to protect. You have to smoke them. Make sure Ace can get this tower early. This is the game plan. Let him bulldoze every objective on the map uncontested because the Tidehunter is too poor to contest. If you set that situation up for Ace, he's probably going to run away with it. That's what they're trying to create as the pine cone. We'll send a seed Thank shot. You, buddy. <laughs> I appreciate that. It is. You waited a all year cone. to hear that one, yeah. Uh, Maybe. Dreams do come true here at DI. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> Nighttime is about to finish up, so that you know, a little bit of strength they get from the Luna is about to go away. Gaming gladiators also probably feeling pretty confident with the Pango. Pretty well on the Look at these stacks down. This is an unconventional place to have this many stacks. Yeah. Kind of cool. I mean, you wish you were an alchemist right here, but look at another round. There is this plenty is nice of stacks. For Duraccio. Liquid jungle, they triangle. They also have some, which is something Zai is probably going to need. Or maybe not Zai at all. Maybe Nisha's going to take it. Speed along to that Aghanim Scepter. Not taking a pit stop for the blade mail, which we've seen so much of. Why do you think that is? It's just not a great blade mill, right? You, you can't really reflect anything into this Pangolier that reliably. The Lone Drew doesn't care. The Bear's just healing. The Razor one's okay, but Razor's a fast BKB hero, so it's not necessarily that good for that long in the early game. Mm. I kind of agree here. It's, it doesn't strike me as a blade mill game, but it is just a well-rounded hero, or well-rounded item on the hero. Fast Torrent Storm could be interesting. You're not going to buy BKB on Lone Druid. And if you catch the Pango, he also doesn't buy one. So in theory, this Torrent Storm could do some work in the early fights, help you defend towers against the Lone Drew push as well. It's also an item that can sometimes catch the back line, right? You're looking at a Morita Phoenix lineup. If you can catch these two supports back there and take them out of the fight, even with a single Torrent. Oh, they cut it just before the Rolling Thunder gets off, but still saved by the silence from Tofu, and they could still try and chase down Nisha here. That Hit him with the dead shot, push him into the bear. The base boots chasing after him, slow him down, immediately got entangled, but he did have that illusion room. Quickly dispels that. Rolling Thunder on its way, the big ball. It's Nisha once, twice. Ravage, though, on the side, though. No follow-up to this Rolling Thunder. Quinn's gonna be left alone now as he's caught in the X. That magic immunity will not last forever, and he's pulled back into his death. See, he's just gonna push up here and, and give him the vision to maybe just push in the mid tower how much firepower they have, but that is a well-used Ravage from Zai. Very happy to clean up Ace with his start right. He gets the best start for gaming, gets the kill with the worst start from Liquid. It's a massive golden XP swing here. And again, gaming just overextending a little bit. They, they thought they were the ones that connecting, but Liquid are happy to bring everybody to these tower defense fights, particularly for this tier one mid. Because if gaming get that tower, it opens up a lot of the map for the Lone Drew to occupy, but when he makes that rotation and it fails, Ace gets shut down again on a big objective. And all of a sudden, 
You have the Luna and the Kunkka leading the pack, which is exactly where you want to be. Ready to take the defensive fights, continuing to get the economy going with stacks on your side. And Mikke, he's going to run away with it again. We saw him do a game one, right? And that was with a much worse start. Yeah. Here he's leading already and pretty early in the game. He has Mask of Madness. He has stacks waiting for him. I like that. Uses his own illusions to cut the midway, pull it to himself in a safer part of the map. But they're going to try and catch him with this three-man smoke of gaming gladiators. Still no defusal on the Pango. This is where your skirmish power is a little limited. You get stuck in these long fights versus the boat run, right? That's been yeah. one of the biggest problems here. Like, how are you dealing with the damage? Game one, you had a Reaper to just cut through it before it did its work. But here, this is a very deep smoke. Very important smoke for gaming if they can hit this. They are a little too slow. Oh, Mickey might walk back into or it are they? here. The greed. Perfect opportunity. Mask Man is going up, but Mickey cannot get far and away in time. The dead shot. Repositions him right into that, not even needing the Rolling Thunder to hit a few times. And Duraccio already made this rotation over, so kind of similar to the move that Liquid did earlier with uh, Zai. Came in with Ravage, they immediately pushed the tower. Looks like Gaming Gladiators can exert some pressure of their own. Uh, patience pays off there. Smith just wanted one more Ancient stack, and I'll pay the price. Also, I think the itemization on Gaming. It's interesting, because you went this Midas on Duraccio. Yeah. So this is, you know, not the BKB rush. He's not going to join some early fights. Another boat on Quinn with Decrep Amp and... Whew. See you later. There's a good reason for the Torn Storm there as well, I guess. When you have a Pugna amping up magic damage, that's that Torn nice. Storm can actually do a lot. Turn this hero into a burst hero. Yeah. That will take out of there. But they went the Midas on the Razor, and they're going Radiance on the Lone Druid for Ace. Okay. So this is a classic bear build going back to, what is it, TI3, TI4. Yep. Yep. It's very good at the farm acceleration. It'll clear a lot of the map. It'll help them keep the scale and the rate up. It's okay in the fight here too, right? The one downside is you get like a fast pipe on Zai or something, you're going to mitigate some of it. We'll see what they decide to do with the timing because that's going to be a big one for gaming. You get this Radiance on the Lone Druid, you want to take the fights into the Roshan and get that going as well as just clearing out more of the map. That tier one being up for Liquid is still a big deal. We'll see how much Gamian prioritized, but it looks like they're just giving everything to Ace here, putting everything into this bear and hoping it wins them that big fight with the Radiance Burn. Also, hey, we missed Chance for the Egg. Yeah. Never bad. The yeah. old Kuroki Radiance coming into play here. He's going to get that Radiance pretty damn quickly. Liquid seemed more than content. I mean, they're probably looking at this as a repeat of game one. Uh, where they just sit back eventually that Luna is going to get to a point where she can carry the game But it does feel like Gaming Gladiators with the itemization you pointed out They're definitely playing to scale better than they did in game one. Right? Yeah, a bit more security That's how, that's what I feel about it. Yeah. Like this is not just all in now They can hit that really strong timing push around the BKB on Razor and the ratings on Lone Druid, But it's not it's not like they completely fall off after that as double damage on Nisha prompting a liquid smoke looking for the Razor down here with the the duo that has bursted cores the whole game. It's gonna be an awkward angle. They should get it. Got him. Magic damage coming in. It's too much. Man, th this single combination between the decrep and all the magic damage. Very effective, very efficient on the map. You're not committing numbers for these ganks. Look for Mickey mid, get some mana burn. Quinn again diving very deep. Rolling Thunder gets off, but he's already at half health. He's going to have to run away, especially with Nisha showing himself on a double damage. Nice dead shot to keep him away. They want to make sure the X marks the spot, doesn't hit that Pango and get him pulled back after the Rolling Thunder. Instead, it hits Celery, but he immediately pops the Supernova. And they're actually kind of in a bad position here. The Torrent Storm does well, that's going to help him. Dead shot, push him back into the silence. Quinn's trying to limp away. That double damage is dangerous, but he doesn't have the attack speed to get the swing in. Big Two win. kills. Overextending in the river as Ace makes a backswing. Beautiful calling around the egg. That combination is deadly with the attack speed slow and Radiance right on time at 16 minutes here. This is really damn fast. They gave him so much ancient priority around that triangle. It's go time for Ace. He needs to take this game over in the next few minutes. Oh, the sentry in the corner. Boxy. No doubt, he doesn't know exactly where that ward is. He's going to try and get out of the way, but the Plasma Beetle nicks him, and the Radiance will burn him down. And that's a 3x streak, so more gold in Ace's pocket. Already back up to 1,000 directly after that reveal. That's just not a fight Liquid were willing to take because the Tidehunter was also taking a Tier 2 bottom. Oh, like, wow. Thai is your biggest team fight presence right now with Blink, Meteor, Hammer, Ravage. He took a Tier 2 bottom. He's really happy about that. You get it for free, but not if you're giving up heroes in the river at the same time. And remember, a lot of this game, to me, is about... 
the low Drew pace versus the top of the the fights. Blink gets disabled. He is tanky, though. Making his way back to the tier two. Nisha's here on top of that one. He's going to throw it. Oh, what a hit! It what hit a big damage! Oh. With the follow up of the bone, is it enough first damage, though? It's not quite enough. They need a little bit more. The heals start coming in onto Nisha. They prioritize keeping people alive while Zai jumps forward to try and finish up this bear. And the bigger bear, Quinn, rolling interception, trying to stop these heroes from pushing in, but they kill the bear and the big one, and they both go down together. Game and Gladiators will lose both their supports and this lone druid that they have funneled so much gold into. Two. That was your big Lone Druid Radiance fight, and it went horribly wrong as Zai just ravages your entire team into the boat in the Torrent Storm. Look at the damage output from this Kunkka right now. You were asking what that Torrent Storm can do. That is exactly what it can do. Yeah. Send you back to your fountain packing as the damage is just ramping up way too fast here for Liquid. And normally this is where gaming, they'd have a bunch of sustain, they'd have a Sunray, they'd have this big Lone Druid who's healing off, dealing damage to heroes. I mean, the sustain is not nearly enough right now as you just walk into a hammer. This hammer also hit on three plus a bear, by the way. That is some insane value coming out from Zai, who just walks it off and says, all right, team, I set the plate. Come and feast. I love the fact that he jumps back in. Bold knowing the fact that, you know, once he hits him with that anchor smash on the lone druid, it really doesn't do that much anymore. Not to the Tidehunter anyway. Another reason to go this Radiance build, right? Then maybe you don't care about the Anchor Smash as much. You have a bunch of bonus damage on the bear and you get this burn going through. Yep, yep. It's one of those matchups that's been played for a very long time. So far, I feel like Zai is doing so much with the start he's had to deal with. He's paid it back already. Itemization, early blink, doing some work. As Gaming will continue to look for this BKB on Duraccio so they can just man up in the fight. You know, that fight might be a different story if Duraccio is able to commit there, be in that engagement, and have his presence felt, right? Yes. But it's just how Razor functions. You need BKB to go into this fight. Otherwise, you're just stuck on the Torrent Storm with everybody else. Game and Gladiators not shying away from aggression, though. Now that the Ravage Zone's cooldown, they uh, continue to play on the same part of the map that they're trying that last fight into. Want to take down a Tier 2. They're still quite strong at fighting around Ace if the fight develops in the way they want, which is you know, a defensive egg, baiting some liquid heroes in. You get a calling around it. Somebody gets dead shot at somebody else is rooted or roared. There's a lot of team fight disruption pre BKB. The liquid has to deal with, particularly on their two big BK frontliners. This Sunray plus the Radiance Burn, it's going to add up, plus Pango poking through with some swashbuckles and the Mana Burn. This was a smart push. And you're still looking for Roshan in this game. That's the biggest objective for gaming to throw on this type of group up push lineup. When you take that and what you do with it, vital to your game plan here as the Liquid Ball continues to grow. And of course, Mickey is just having a free for all in these Ancients, man. He's continuing to climb the levels. Level 16 on this Luna right now, three ahead of the next on game. And that is the power of Ancient Camps and stacking them. Yeah, that one death early on. The only kind of action he's really had to worry about, Duraccio again. This is the second time in this series that he's picked up his BKB and immediately has to use it defensively. It's just not what you want. Trying to jump onto Quinn. Once again, the X stops the rolling thunder. The burst magic damage is so good against this Pango. They have just enough disables and just enough magic damage to finish him off. That was perfectly executed. You cannot ask for any better timings there on the X Torrent. Boxy. Not an easy kill either. And right around tier two for gaming. So if that, yeah. if that game goes wrong, it can go really wrong. Aggressiveness, paying off here for Liquid, and just so much space for the Luna. Absolutely untouched in this game. And Liquid. It felt like that, that Ravage fight earlier. Game and Gladiators, if they don't lose that fight, they take a tier two. Maybe they could take the Roshan after taking that tier two, but now it's switched over to the Radiant side here, and Liquid had that lane pushed in. They're gonna take full advantage of it, and Game of Gladiators, they know what's going on, but with Quinn dead, they just can't get there in time, not with their full force. Not a Roshan you wanted to give up with your gaming with this launcher timing. One Mickey is happy to take, a bit easier this time. Claiming that Aegis. Avery, this is looking like a Liquid who could hit high ground pretty damn soon. Yeah, they can. They absolutely have a lot of push power behind the beefy frontliners in the Pugna. That's what they like about this lineup. You can take the push to gaming, and sometimes these push lineups don't deal well with getting pushed back. It's one of their weaknesses. Unfortunate bit of RNG there. I think Gaming Gladiators would have definitely wanted the Phoenix to get the shard. Instead goes to the Muerta. 
But here comes that push, Liquid. Gonna start taking more tier two towers. We'll see how bold they are when it comes to hitting the early high ground. Maybe how bold Zai is in terms of willing to jump. Because you can let the Luna push these objectives, but you do kind of want to just blink Ravage and take the fight. Sure. You feel like you can burst a big core target. Nonetheless, they'll get a tier two. Open up more of this map, take outpost control, and see how far they press it here. Level 18 on the horizon for Mickey as well. Level three Eclipse would feel pretty damn good here if you're going to end up in a drawn out team fight. They'll switch to bottom. You can also just siege it up with Pugna, right? I mean, that is an option here. Yeah. Alpha Wolf giving Mickey even more damage as well with Pack Leader. This is a strong push. Catapult's gonna remain up. I mean, where's the poke? They're letting Liquid get a lot of damage for free here. No swashbuckles, no fire spirits. Luna Siege, it is all the more dangerous once your tier three is down and you start getting those bouncing glaives into play. Exactly. Away, trying to pull Jirachi out of position, almost got him, but he pushed a little bit over to the side instead. Harpoon pulling in the Kunkka. Now committed rolling. Follow this one up. He has no BKB, you gotta yeah, remember. Yeah, there's gonna be Nisha bursting. dying straight up immediately. Now Liquid left in a four versus oh, five. All he's all gonna stand his ground, but Quinn, what a hit on through with a swashbuckle almost finishing up. The Radiant's gonna run down Mickey on his first life. He's gonna come back and there's nobody left alive. No it's supporting cast. Disaster. Whoever of Liquid, they are absolutely gonna be losing four here and absolutely nothing claimed on the side of Liquid. What a disaster. Didn't even get to use the Ravage, didn't get Torrent Storm off, didn't use the Luna BKB because what is the point after everything? Everybody's dead. That siege went horribly wrong very fast with, I mean, Nisha just being too far up, right? Yeah. He ended up in their base almost on the high ground, stuck in a calling, can't really get out. There's no repositioning. There's a single four staff on Liquid. That's pretty much it. And you don't have a BKB on Kunkka. So you can't just man up in the front line and all these AOE control, especially when that bear just starts running at you. That is a nasty combo though. The calling on top of the harpoon. So Nisha really just couldn't get much off there. I mean, he has Arcane Room here, so he's like, I, I want to fight, but yeah, Harpoon drags him in there. He can't even move. That just sets the whole fight up. I thought this Rolling Thunder was a bit early, but of course, no BKB. You can just fully commit, and then you're all clumped on this choke point. Yeah, just a crazy. disaster on the back line for Box. He can't reposition. That's just an easy fight cleanup for the Pangolier with an Ags delivered at the right time in this game, giving you the extra damage, and all of a sudden, that's a like lot a board game network sales. swing. Yeah, that, is... that was big. Gaming have a lead, in fact, at this point right now. 1K up after that failed push attempt. Yeah. That's a big one to give away. This is a lineup that, uh, remember, gaming were itemizing and building to scale. This is a Razor that can be 5, 6 slot in this game and be a massive threat. And you're still playing a pretty much a single core damage lineup if you're Liquid. Yeah. It's all in on the Luna. So if you have anti-carry heroes in this Razor, in this worth of throwing down a calling, paying Galir, disarming you, whatever it is, it's not as easy as last game for, for Mickey to just 1v5 here. We've also hit, I think, one of the biggest uh, spikes when it comes to Lone Druid power. 25 minutes. That means you start picking up all these Wraith Bands for your hero oh, with yeah. double the effectiveness. You get a huge boost in armor for yourself and your bear. That Luna is not going to be able to deal with the bear nearly as well as she was just two or three minutes ago. Uh, things are aligning really well for Ace. I mean, he is still gigantic in this game, right? And the benefit of the Wraith Bands here is he already has his two big items completed. So it's not like he's hurting the timing of anything here. He just gets free armor and Agi galore. No, they're rolling thunder on Nisha. Nisha oh, goes for staff up to the high ground. Buffy, Helped out by the supports. They have the anchor on Quinn. But they don't feel good about taking this one, especially with Jirachio getting right in the middle of them with his BKB. This they want the Eclipse still, and Mickey is actually okay with fighting this one for now, but they retreat. Yeah, but look at Ace. BKB. Look at They're Ace in the pack. Away. And yeah, Ace sees his opportunity. He's going to be able to catch up to Mickey. Ace long down the Torn Storm, trying to help him out. Another four staff, but he won't get far enough away. The carry of Liquid is dead for 60 seconds, and they're on the run now. Two dead. Game and Gladiators playing some clean Dota now after a bit of a rough game one. Man, sometimes Ace is positioning on these team fights. He just comes out of nowhere. You don't expect him. He just cleans it up. You think you're okay. You get in one bad trade, and suddenly Luna off the map for 50 seconds here. Another fight where Mickey just doesn't get to show the true power of his hero right now with full Hurricane Pike BKB Eclipse. Just gets the damage pumped into Duraccio, and I mean, Duraccio doesn't care, right? He knows he has other damage sources in this lineup. As long as he soaks up the Luna BKB, he's probably happy with that exchange, assuming no one dies in a Ravage. And speaking of Ravage, when was the last one, right? It feels like that Ravage top was the last time Zai felt his big team fight impact fell in this game. Yep. We haven't seen one for a while, and the opening just hasn't been there. 
I mean, you don't get that kind of hard initiation. We saw what happened. Game of Gladiators, they saw BKB plus the, the Shard, the Moonclaves active out for the Luna. And they said, okay, we're not going to make the same mistake of like trying to commit on that hero like we did last time. Jiraichio right. learned his lesson. He said, kite it out, kite it out. That's all we have to do. Uh, if you get it to a point where the BKB is down for mid -gate, you don't have anything on the other cores, the Rolling Thunder becomes a big problem. You're just going through with this axe, burning everybody's mana. There's no control for it. We see Zai throwing the anchor out on Quinn. I mean, yeah, that's great when it expires, but only if you can punish him when it expires. The whole duration, it's going to be free. And Lone Druid, he's becoming a problem in this game. If you don't burst him off the Ravage, he gets true form off. He's incredibly tanky in these engagements. Yeah, two Wraith Bands before that fight. After it, he's now got four. Big, big armor upgrade. 27 armor now on the bear, and his hero has 25. So they're mitigating most of the physical damage coming their way. Double neutral item as well. Be big pickup. They need that initiation. We talked about it. Getting a jump on a Quinn would have been the best, but they know Quinn was a target. The support's protected. And they also know that this dead shot hit. Another thwarted jump for Zai, who did finish that pipe. It's a great pipe game. If you can use it. And the best way you use it is you push. But are Liquid confident enough to just push straight up right now? I mean, you're CG high ground with Pugna. This is pretty ballsy, especially with how that last push went. They don't even have Aegis here. Yeah, seriously. But they do do the damage pretty quickly, and they got the Glyph out. So now, Gaming Gladiators are put in a position where if they mess up this next team fight, they be could be losing one, maybe even two lanes of Paris. Oh, that was a value Glyph. Absolutely value here. Gaming, they're smoked. They want it to flank. They want it to backstab that push from Liquid. You know if they get on the back line, they're happy with the fight. You take this Pugna and Ench out. Duracho, he is just gonna run in. You Man does not give a damn. He gets ravaged. Or does and he? Person down in time. The Rolling Thunder is gonna try and stop things, and Duracho gets off his BKB. Now he's gonna be able to fight back. Mickey forcing forward, trying to put the damage onto Duracho, but underneath the Supernova, the Dragon's Eye back into it, and Mickey has to start running away, but the bear is on the other side. Clean it house. Sandwiches Liquid in this, and they are done for in this fight. They cannot stop the bear. Liquid, another aggressive engagement from them. Another utter disaster. They trade one for five. They don't need the Razor to hit high ground. The bear is coming to clean house. Oh, he's coming. That is just a clump that you did not want to have happen there. You're stuck in the calling, stuck in the sunray, stuck in the egg. Pango rolling through all of it. These choke points have been a nightmare for Liquid as the AOE is just fully controlling them. And that's why Taracho just runs in here. Didn't even get the BKB off before the Ravage, but there's no chain stun that comes out. And all of a sudden, you're stuck down this ramp, and this is not where you want to be if you're Liquid, right? If Vicky cannot man up and kill that egg, which he didn't want to because there's a drain coming out on this Razor, you're in trouble. You're in absolutely big trouble here, as he is not strong enough to fight the Razor through 90% of his HP and the Bear through potentially a resummon. Speaking of that Bear, that's going to be the casualty of this push from Gaming Gladiators. They do not manage to get the melee barracks, but obviously a massive win for them nonetheless. Tier 2 and Tier 3 go down. And soon, a Scotty on the table for Gaming Gladiators. That's going to make the Luna's life so much harder. We're already seeing that the damage is running out a bit for this Luna. You get hit by that attack speed slow, which is twice the effective on ranged heroes. That's going to be rough. The attack results have done work for gaming. Yeah. The fire spirits, the calling, stacking these up. Honestly, Tofu has been a big problem in the fight for Liquid. Just committing into Morta in these types of positions. It's deadly. It's very difficult unless you have multiple spell immunity. And right now, the pipe is just not keeping them alive long enough to mana versus the multiple physical damage sources. This is why this type of lineup for gaming scales a lot harder into the late game than the previous one. They're not relying on some single target magical burst. If you can deal with that, the fight becomes easy. You have to deal with three cores who are all scaling up here, have pretty good synergy with the minus armor coming through from Eye of the Storm. And potentially two bears if Ace can stay alive, which so far, they have not been close to jumping him and killing him first. His positioning has been very strong. Throwing Aegis on top of this. Might just be too many lives to get through. Can Liquid make magic happen around the pit once more? They're late to the party this time. No blind three-man torn for you. They're still gonna try and take a fight. 
Though it seems like Game and Gladiators are aware of this situation. They are going to be pushing it. I mean, it's all on die. Sword. You need a good Ravage jump on support. And he gets a green initiation. Phoenix. It's just the Phoenix and maybe that low druid. Got it. Backlight still got up the supernova. And now comes the rolling thunder. The, the, yeah, the egg dies. But are you going to be able to fight this one? Once again, they're trying to kite out this BKB of Mickey. Taraggio's in deep, though. Wanting to make use of this Aegis. Clear space for the rest of the team. Oh, that's Tidal Wave disarming a lot of them. And Torrance are bouncing off Game and Gladiators up there. dead. And this team fight is too much. Don't summon. The bear dies before Taraggio. Rachu's back into play. Well, they're running out of firepower. Mickey's low, but he's getting the heals out from Boxy. Is he able to stay alive here? Another tidal wave coming in, trying to help him out. The disarm helps a bit, but they realize it. They have run out of power. They start retreating. They cannot save Mickey. They'll leave whoever is left behind. It's going to be three down on the side of Liquid, but it was a fair engagement to them. They were trapped up against an Aegis, and they still managed to do okay. I mean, honestly, a pretty damn good fight for Liquid. They get a buyback off the, the Celery Phoenix. Egg went off, so that engagement started off pretty rough. You have to commit longer with your BKBs and just sit there while Duracho is linking you. And yeah, you get the Aegis off Duracho, so you eliminate some of that high ground pressure. Ace going down as well. Big pick up there. He did not have a resummon to take the longer end of that fight. And you got to remember, you're down to 10 or 12k going into this, right? It's just all Kunkka in that engagement. Torrent Storm did mad work. Problem is going to be is this fight. The end result is not good enough for Liquid to change the narrative of this game. Gaming Gladiators are still going to hold a pretty decent lead here, and still have pretty good map control off of just having enough heroes up. Duraccio, I mean, great Torrent Storm, better Tidal Wave. I mean, that was a sick combination. Yeah, I mean, Quinn also gets cheese off there, right? If he gets maybe hit by one more of those Torrents and goes down, that's a different fight as well. He might get out of there with Nick A. The fact Quinn gets a full second life, full refill here, and can take. Mickey down at the end. That's what felt good about it for gaming here. Two lives on two cores basically expended. But what can you do? You were not at the Roche in time. Which means you just, yeah. you'd rather fight here than at your base, right? Yeah. And you also took down probably the most important hero to bring down first, the Lone Druid. So even if you do lose that fight, it's not going to be able to take your buildings immediately. All they lost was a tier two, but Game and Gladiator still have the 13k gold lead, and now they have the Aya Scotty. They didn't have that one in the last team fight. That bear has become significantly tankier and much worse for the Luna to deal with. Got 5,000 HP with 26 armor here. Oh, yeah. He's going to harpoon you. He's going to slow you. He's going to provide the miss chance. This is the Lone Druid problem right now. Do you try and burst Ace off a jump, or do you just deal with him? Yeah, that win probability has spiked significantly after that Roshan. We're still looking for the next item for Mickey, by the way. This has been about 10 to 12 minutes. He's trying to build this butterfly. He is struggling. Yeah, he is. At this rate, he's going to get that butterfly. And we may see the MKB counter coming in from Gan Gaming Gladiators pretty quickly. Butterfly is here, though. So they have a window, perhaps, where... The evasion can come into play. You need to make sure the positioning is on point here when you jump with the Ravage, because the chain stun limitation is also something that's hurting Liquid on these goes. Like we saw there, they got an egg off, because what's your chain stun off Zai's jump? It's potentially a torrent if you can line it up and a Lucent Beam. That's it. Well, there's a little bit more chance of chaining that stuns with a refresher done for the Kunkka. So we're going to have double torrent storms going on. That's one way to control the fight. To get to the other side of the Razor BKB, there's not much else outside of the Rolling Thunder, of course. That's going to save these heroes in double Torrent Storm. Cannot underestimate it, but you need to make sure Mickey is up, right? You need to align the control with the damage here for Liquid. Protect Mickey, get him to a point in the fight where the Torrent Storm and the Ravage are controlling heroes while the Luna's hitting them. It sounds a lot easier than it is at this point when gaming can just run a frontliner in like Duraccio or Quinn and not care about anything. Of course, if you can find the supports, that's a big ticket as well. Taking this Mortar Phoenix out of the fight opens it up a lot, especially when you know Celery does not have buyback here for four more minutes. And he's going to try and protect that situation by getting an Aeon Disc. He's already bought out for it. So chance of you getting this guy before he gets off Supernova, I think, are pretty low. But we'll see. Nisha shows on a D-Ward off the gate. So gaming are aware Liquid are in the bottom of the map. Smoke will wear out as well. Triple four staff for Liquid, so they have some kiting potential. Yeah, and they're gonna need it. If they know that, hey, hit the high ground really, really quickly, and you can get some buildings before they can TP back in time. The range bear is the first to fall. Just let the bear do the dirty work here. Yeah. The bear is perhaps expendable. 
though it does give up 300 gold. They've got a second one. This is a little bit of a dangerous point, though. Worst por part would be losing your bear a second time, and then there goes 20,000 of your net worth. Right, you can't siege. Upside of taking that fight outside the Roach Pit as well, right? You got rid of this Mega Aegis period that would have caused you some high ground potential problems. We should mention, however, that Tofu has picked up a full BKB. So he has started his path towards true fourth core status, yeah. which I think is something that really cements these games in the current meta when they go ultra long. I'm not saying this game is going to go 80 minutes, but if it does, you know, having a carry Morta in your pocket, not too shabby. It certainly helps. And he's far. He's like 2K behind Zai here. Zai, who's about to complete a, uh, a Shiva's here pretty soon, so. Get some uh, attack speed slow on their own side. It's a very valuable Shiva's game. He's going to buy out for it. Martyr's played as well. Tied very tanky right now, but not if he just gets linked and gone on by the Razor. And of course, we saw Duraccio pick up the Refresher. This is the Razor dream right now. Double Satanic, double DKB going in with a double Eye of the Storm. He will absolutely decimate the fight if he gets away with it. How do you feel like this Razor scales? I'm looking at that level 25 talent. That looks so scared. He starts taking away attack speed too. I, I think he's scaling like a beast in this game. Yeah. <laughs> There's there is not a lot to deter him. If your Luna were ahead and can provide a big enough threat with something like Daedalus, a Refresher, some Ag since you're eating, okay, maybe you can you can take that type of fight, right, with multiple four staffs cutting out the links. Yeah. The biggest thing that deals with Razor Scale is survivability, either in utility or being able to stand your ground and fight him back. Lotus Orb is another big one here if Liquid can get it. But they don't really have natural Lotus Orb buyers. It's the downside of their lineup right now. Both these squishy supports don't really want to build it. The armor's not that great on them. And both these frontliners, they just need better items to be able to sustain the damage. So you're not ever reflecting Link in this game, which is, you know, breathing room for Duracho. He runs in, he links anybody. You're getting a Link. Just a matter of four staff potentially breaking it and resetting the fight. They'll continue to scout out the map here, try and get the lanes in. And farm it up. It will be that MKB for Ace to deal with the Butterfly on Mickey. And if you're Mickey, you just want at least one good fight out of this Butterfly. Yeah, but how do you actually get out there and do it? If Kings don't push your high ground, which it looks like they don't want to do without Roshan, then it's going to be that Roche contest, right? Yeah. Almost so, feels like Liquid are going to have to bank on a fast Roshan. Otherwise, that MKB could be done before the Roshan actually spawns. It's got 4k in the bank right now. Third Roche. It actually spawns instantly for them. So it is going bottom, however, is it's going to shift the daytime here. I mean, it's good for gaming with the buyback potential on the outpost, but they don't have it on Duraccio. They don't have it on either support. So there's some jump burst potential from Liquid. Take advantage of the lack of buybacks right now if they want to take the gamble. There is a double it's a damage gamble. on Duraccio. Yeah, there's also that looming in the bottle right now. And he's just ninja gearing in. Zai puts himself on the front lines there. Meteor, they're going to pounce onto him. Seeing if they can chase him down, slow him down, pull him back in as much as possible. They're trying to reset. He did manage to get a blink away. Good so they reset. are fully really resetting off this one. The refresh immediately puts you. It's Duraccio. Oh, he's it's a bad a fight. One fight against Mick A. He's going to be able to win it. He is. No problems there whatsoever. And he doesn't give a damn about your water park ride, Mr. Kunkka. He's going to fight through this one. Oh, the rap's coming up. He's going to maybe be able to get He gets a little bit of life going out, but Duraccio is still up. The last little bit of damage coming out from Insane. is not going to be enough. Duraccio this time he mans up this time he challenges team liquid and he is the one left still standing in the end puts mickey in the dirt with that second bkb no way luna wins that man fight in round two it was good kiting initially from liquid but the longevity here and the items the satanic and this Razor aggression has paid off in game two. And with a bear, they can end it right here, right now. Liquid, they don't have the buybacks. I no. think they're just hoping gaming gladiators don't actually go for the throat. Not even close to buybacks. It, this is a game two win for sure here. So we're going to get a game three between these two teams. An absolute beauty of a series right now as gaming strike back with a lineup that very similar setup in terms of the push power some sustain but they made sure they had a lot more scale in the back pocket and were prepared to take those 30 40 minute team fights in the five on five scenarios right and i think this game showed it felt a lot more comfortable for them and liquid they went with this luna for protect one type of strategy round two 
didn't pay off in the same way at all because Mickey just couldn't take those later man fights versus the cores. Yep. And you didn't have that big Roshan swing to regain a lot of the momentum for your carry. And dare I say it, Avery, a lesson from this series does feel like the fact that both times Game one, we had Game of Gladiators, they took a lead, they tried to hit high ground, they lost control of the game. Now it was Liquid who had the early lead, oh, yeah. they tried to hit the high ground, they immediately lost control of the game. It looks like in a situation where, unlike maybe some other series, this is one that cannot be ended quickly. That's a high ground push that's going to haunt you years from now, right? Like, what happens in that game if we play it slower, go for a Roshan fight, or just take that fight better? Because that is a fight Liquid can win. But damn, did they get punished on that choke point. All right, what are we going to be taking from this moving into game three? I mean, what do you feel like was the winning factor for both of these teams and their victories? I mean, honestly, I want to say it's probably going to slow down because I feel like a lot of times at TI, when teams go for these fast lineups, they fail the high ground, something goes wrong. They tend to go, okay, let's just pick a little more scale, play it a little more conservative, play to our wheelhouse. Maybe this third game is going to go the distance, so we don't want to fall behind in that regard. Both teams have failed with that tempo push, right? So that's something that's going to be in the back of your mind. But again, we are seeing some of these tempo heroes come out and played in a scale way like the Lone Druid for Ace this game. So it's not necessarily about the heroes. It's about when you're taking these objectives, how you're taking them, and making sure you're disciplined about it. Well, we can leave the rest of the analysis to the brilliant minds on panel heading into game three. I'll make sure that I ask them all the questions about why Game and Gladiators won this game number two and why we're seeing a game at number three in this series. Matu, you wanted the Pugner and the Luna for Liquid. They ran a similar strat to what they had in game one, and that was a win, but it didn't work for game two. It looked good until it didn't. So, uh, <laughs> got Aegis, tried to push high ground bottom, didn't quite work out. I mean, that was terrible. Um, nothing else to say about that is like, you tried, you failed. I feel like you shouldn't close out games like this in this patch. Like you should uh, take the advantage, retain it, farm the map more than the enemy does. And then when you're absolutely certain you can take it, you take it. What was a factor of that uncertainty, Aoi, that they couldn't close out that high ground push and that it failed so miserably? I'm not too sure if they didn't know that Quinn hit his level 15 in eggs timing, but I think that was just sort of them pushing into Gladiator's strongest timing. I think even if they didn't go high ground there, like Gladiators were going to look around the map for a fight. And it just happened that Liquid sort of gifted it to them. That is a bit unfortunate. And from that timing, so Liquid being set behind, was there just no space for them left in the rest of the game, Effie? I think the fights afterwards for Liquid just went unfortunately. Like this one that's playing right now, they ravaged the Razor, but they couldn't quite kill him before he could BKB and turn the fight. If they managed to burst Storaccio here, it might have looked very li different for Liquid. They, they could have won it, but they just fell short on the damage. And later on, we saw that there was this one fight where Luna's BKB got forced before they could actually engage in any kind of fighting. So they chased Luna into the high ground. There's a beautiful wraparound by Ace, and Gaiman just found the good fights when it looked really bad for them. I want to talk more on the Razor because, Marty, you were given the good, the bad of what heroes were. And Razor's normally a bad hero, but you said even a bad hero in the best game can look good. And it looked great. I mean, it was amazing. Um, if you find a one Razor hero, this, like, one Razor game during the whole tournament, it was definitely this game. Um, good performance, just going for the catch-up Midas, lane didn't go that well, but in the end, like, this hero essentially counters, like, all three cores on Liquid, and it showed in the late game. Yeah, event, especially when Razor got to that really critical point in the game where he had Satanic and the Refresher Orb. So if he wasn't getting burst on in these fights, he was BKBing, using the Satanic, refreshing, BKBing the Satanic again. Like, it became a very big hurdle for Liquid to burst down this Liquid because every time they want to take the fight, they have to commit all of Enchantress's mana pool. They have to commit the Luna BKB. Kanka does the, you know, the bulk of the team fighting when the rum buff is up and Razor just outlasted all of that. Is this what you wanted to see, Aoi, for game number two and game glad is you're a little bit worried about how they were looking at the end of game one and walking into the booth for game two? No, for sure. I think it shows the resilience that they've showed all year. That's why they won all the majors and all these tournaments. I think something that really interests me right now is I feel like in game one, Gladiator sort of had this game and they sort of threw it away. Game two, Liquid sort of had this game, they threw it away. And it shows that like the amount of pressure on these teams at this type of tournament, sometimes it makes you do things that you look back on and you're like, oh, what was I doing? But it happens. It happens all the times, even to the best teams. And that's what really excites me for game three. I'm excited for it as well, Marta. Do you want to talk about the Lone Druid, Aces Lone Druid? Do you want to hype it up a little bit more? Of course, Lone Druid, best hero ever. <laughs> I have no bias. I never played that hero myself. Double good, as I said, before the game. And it turned out to be triple good, quadruple. 
I mean, just bring keep it on. Keep it on, just, just keep multiplying it, it. Exactly. Oh, my God, I'm so happy. <laughs> Look, we might be seeing it in a game number three, but before we get that game in Gladiators, they clawed a win in this series. It doesn't mean that we're going the full distance. We'll be going all three games. So let's know a little bit more about Game in Gladiators. Game in Gladiators versus Evil Geniuses. Definitely a very interesting game. Also, the start felt a bit off, a bit shaky. I don't know if it's like nerves, pressure, or just the setup feels a bit off. The first 10 minutes were like a bit all over the place. We tried to get through with like our usual communication, how we do things and how we want to proceed. They're gonna try and go on ace here. The bristle back, try and shut him down early, and they do just that. The and Panda pick up a counter kill. It didn't really work out, and eventually the game got stretched into a really long game and eventual base siege. So you see EG be very patient about holding the high grounds going in these late games, right? It does look like this is gonna be a marathon. We tried to go high ground and they had the task kicks coming in, willow shooting, they had like some Earthshaker, Dawnbreaker, so whenever you get too close, you get super smashed. I think we failed like one or two attempts horribly. Then we had to try to, while progressing the game, come up with a plan on how to eventually end the game. We tried splitting for a bit, dreading, waiting for another rush, coming with another attempt, feeding again, waiting for another rush, and then we tried to let our bristle get kicked in with some pango rolls coming to create chaos so we can take one building at a time. Quinn was complaining, oh my god, this willow is crazy, it's like she's just shooting me all over the place, and then it's like, oh shit, how are we gonna do this? It looks like they may not even be able to get a single lane of barracks out of this. Skelly boys, meanwhile, are cleaning up a tier three. They're gonna take the tier three tower. Who's pushing who here? And then I don't know, it took us like four ages to eventually break through. Fifth Roshan of the game for Game and Gladiators. Their building is gonna be hit. But it's Panda and Because the P duel against Game and Gladiators as a full five stack. That is gonna be it. Evil geniuses will call it 69 minutes. It does feel surreal in a way. For me, actually making it there now is an experience that I wouldn't trade for anything else. The trials and tribulations of lower bracket, but also late game Dota there. I remember this game. We listened into their comms as well. And originally, pre the 40 minute mark, it was uh, Gaming Gladiators saying, focus on the heroes. Don't worry about objectives. That's not really going to win us the game in the long run. And then it stretches out to almost 70 minutes. And they're like, all right, let's just focus only objectives. And that's the change. That's the shift when it does get to that late game Dota hour. Yeah, I think what Gleaming Gladiators have done really well, like every time we hear the comms, is they're really good at identifying their win condition. I think we saw versus um, maybe Nouns it was when they were pushing out bottom. Quinn was just saying, oh, they need to run into us. We just need to stick as a ball. They're really good at talking about it before it happens, which leaves them more room for communication of fights to do the right thing. Talking, that's the key point here. And I know two people that love to talk. It's Slax and Tsunami with the crowd. Hello, thank you so much, guys. Uh, hello, how are you all doing after that game, huh? Game three? Fantastic, and we have a wonderful opportunity here. We actually got a chance to talk to the real team Liquid about that game. They're letting us listen to their comms right now. In fact, uh, we have an interview with Nisha talking to Insania. Nisha, uh, any words to Insania to cheer him up after that series? In game three, we're gonna hear Liquid are doing it. That's the most words I've ever heard Nisha speak in my life. Oh my life. God, Nisha, your, your camera presence has brought up so this much. This incredible charisma that we're witnessing right now. <laughs> Insania, you're here. You're supporting the entire team. What are you saying right now? We can do it, boys. <laughs> Interesting. A little bit more feminine than I remember Aiden looking, but it I respect so it. was so real. <laughs> it's, not, it's just like him. Boxy, what are you feeling, bud? Uh, my friends, I believe we need to ban the bear. Oh, very smart, Zai, do you agree? Cross your enemy. Whoa, don't show that camera angle, this is real. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Cross your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentation of their women. Wow. Oh. Wow. Nick, hey, fine. any last words, please? Quinn needs to learn a real hero. Okay, take it easy. 
That is not good team chemistry. I don't know. <laughs> That's uh, not great. Games seem a little bit combative here, but everyone loved the Inside the Pod segment, so we're getting inside the head right now. Yeah, there's got some big heads on this team, but no worries. All right, guys. Well, before we get into that final game, can we let everyone know what they're missing out on in this arena? Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for your game three? One more time! Oh, they seem pretty excited out here, my friends. Pretty excited. Back to you. I'd say that's a pretty overwhelming uh, response on a game number three between Liquid and Gaming Gladiators. Matu, you've been in positions before where you guys have your backs against the wall. You've been in that position. You got blitz, you got jabs, you got all four other players with you. What do you think is the conversation? Like, how, when you've been in this position, has the conversation piece gone? How positive is the environment? I mean, definitely there is some discussions to be had after a game like this. Um, essentially just fumbling the game away in a manner that wasn't like really close. Like this high ground push wasn't close. So now you have to make the adjustments. Were the heroes bad or was the play bad? I would come to a conclusion that the play was bad. Um, they did exact same thing that I scrutinized uh, gaming in the first game as well. Like you played your lanes good, you played the early game good, but now the real Dota starts. And what do you do with that? You go high ground with Aegis, minute 20. Um, no, you don't. In this patch, at least, uh, you gotta wait at least 60 minutes. That's like the unspoken code of Dota 2 <laughs> currently. Good, yeah. yeah. And you're doing all that in 15 minutes? You have to. I mean, you <laughs> cramp it up a little bit, guys. We play like shit, let's play good. That's it, that's the morale boost that you'd be giving it. Uh, but Ali, we uh, talk about the lane domination. Martin mentioned it, game one, it was... Uh, all for uh, gaming gladiators in game number two, it was for Liquid. So we've seen the efficiency in lane here. This is the rankings for this TI. And we're seeing no Liquid players, but Quinn is up there with uh, 0.89. What does this mean? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm hoping production is telling me in my ear because I don't know this stat either. It's like their chance of winning the lane, or is it like how many creeps they get? Maybe it's how many creeps they get? Uh, Ramsey cool. actually I got 90% so. of the creeps in the. That's crazy. Um, I'm waiting. I'm, you just got to keep talking while we're waiting for the information. Creeps to denies, maybe? I mean, efficiency could be a lot of things, but I would assume if it's a stat that can be measured, it's creeps versus denies. Let's just assume it's that. Yes. Let's assume that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think there's not much for Liquid to talk about after game two. I think it's, it's something that would be really healthy for them to do is say, oh, we threw game two, so what? Like, we're still in this best of three. All our practice is already done for us. All our learnings are already done for us. We just need to put into um, performance what we practice. They can reset like that. I think they were like on an upward trend throughout the games. They came back game one. They looked really good game two. If they can just pretty much ignore that this misplay happened, then I think game three will look good for them as well. There's some hardcore pros on this team. A loss like this won't phase them. I mean, they've been here countless of times, you know, Zai, like, Played more pro games than I did, so like I'm somewhat of a veteran and like just brush it off. Let's go game three. The pure number comparison of how many games these players have played, how many times they walked out on this stage is immeasurable. But Evie, we saw a similar strat for Liquid coming out, at least in the, the Pugna and the Lunar, maybe not so much in the rest of the supporting cast. Would you like to see them double down, triple down on that, I should say? Or is it like, okay, it was a, a tough win for game one, and it was a tough loss for game two. Maybe we look at something else for game three. And I think just approach the draft as it unfolds, honestly, because there's nothing in Liquid's draft that I would look at and try to change. Uh, like Matthew mentioned, there was some issues with the play there, but honestly, I can see why they did it. They had such an insane net worth lead at that point in the game, and sometimes you're just in that side of the map, and one of your players goes, guys, I think we can go high ground, and, and you just follow suit, right? But I, I do think the Luna looks great for them, the Pugna looks great for them, they wouldn't be bad at all if they ran it back. Whereas Gaiman, even though they just won game two, I think they definitely need to adjust the draft that they just played, because even though both teams in that last game were trying to make equal amounts of moves, Gaiman was just getting out-farmed, right? I, I saw I saw Gaiman make smoke plays. I saw them use their Phoenix. I saw them rotate with their Pango. It's not like they just sat there and did nothing. Mm -hmm. But the Tricor of Gaiman could not out-farm the Tricor of Liquid. The Tricor of Liquid just racking up net worth, even though Gaiman was making moves. So they need to correct that. I still think they need to fix their late game scaling. 
All right, well, the tempo was the question coming into this series. If Gaming Gladiators were able to hit the same style that they did against Nouns yesterday, and it's already been answered in these two games. So how much do you focus then on lanes for themselves, Owie, and drafting or that late game? I think game and lanes are important because they're very comfortable from the position that they usually end up after lanes, which is a bit ahead. Uh, something that I think they need to look out for is I feel like they've been playing with a bit of desperation. I mean, the fight that made them lose the lead in that game was when they chased a Tidehunter like a thousand range into his tier two, got four men ravaged and meteor hammered. This is not a play that you would usually see from gaming gladiators. So I think they should sort of think back to their practice, like what makes us the most comfortable so we can perform at our own peaks, it would be important. I think for them, that is having a strong off lane. I think that is like being able to rotate to the mid runes after they do on lanes. And is that why we might not see too many changes when it comes to bans between these two teams? Primal, Bristleback, Spirit Breaker not getting let through in, in either of those two games? I think so. I think the, the Pugna might be an interesting ban. We saw that Liquid in game two, they shifted the Chen ban up in priority because they thought that one, it frees up the ban in the second phase, two, Gaming might take it earlier. Pugna might also be similar because I feel like if Gaming want to have strong lanes, there's a support that sort of nullifies any aggression. Yeah, also the Kunkka, I, I feel that hero looked great in both games, even though it just lost. It, it just does so much by way of countering Quinn's hero pool, and it makes it so that Liquid always have this means to take team fights, even if they're in losing positions. So I think I'd like to see this Kunkka either taken or addressed. I am actually very surprised about that Kunkka, because he's been so disruptive in both games. The boat, especially in game number two, put that put them in that position to get Roche to try and push high ground in the bottom lane of Gaming Gladiators and even laid it down when Gaming Gladiators were up in gold lead, the Kunkka was still having quite a lot of impact. Maybe not the burst damage they needed, but still a lot of uh, impact and disruption to fights. Kunkka is great. I just hope they don't stack up heroes like Kunkka and Tyrander together. Like, essentially, like, there are two big circles. They create these stuns all around them, and they have two heroes doing the same thing. Ideally, you have, like, certain jobs for heroes and you don't really want to stack them because it's redundant it's like diminishing returns like it just doesn't work <laughs> yeah, i like that point a lot actually because at the end of the day if you look at their three cores if razor links luna you have zero damage but your damage is completely limited you're not going to touch anyone on gaming gladiators that's sort of what ended up happening the rash at the end as long as he got the link on luna he could literally run in 1v5 and kill everyone and there's just nothing stopping it i think if once you pick these tide hunters or kankas you need to make sure that the other core is going to provide a lot of damage as you already have the cc and the thing about that luna too as the game progresses is there's just so much non-committal damage coming out of Gaiman where Luna had to commit her defensive you know items and her BKB early on and then she just couldn't turn around like there were some fights that looked decent when Razor had the Aegis and they managed to burst him down the first time you felt a glimmer of hope as a Liquid fan right but then all of a sudden you're like wait why are they taking so much damage it's because the Phoenix is throwing out spells the Quinn is throwing out swashbuckles and shield crashing in and then all of a sudden even though they committed to a kill all of them are 30% HP. Well, let's see what's going to happen for game number three as it's popping up. Team Liquid versus Game in Gladiators. Game three. I'm so happy that we got a game number three between these two teams. It would have been a bit of a disappointment if we saw either one eliminated in a 2-0. So they're one apiece right now. A lot lies on this game number three if they're going to be able to keep their run alive in TI-12. Is the Kunkka going to get picked up again? Are we going to get a surprise Razor last pick? Or maybe Machu's favorite, Alun Druid? I hope they just don't tunnel vision this Kanka. I mean, it's a great hero, but it can be countered. No, Do no Dota 2 hero is ever that broken that you just like pick it and he has nothing going on. I mean, maybe sometimes, but this is not the case for Kanka. We're Kanka we're talking about. Let's, it's a normal hero, after all, so... Balanced, you would say? Balanced? I mean, Dota generally is balanced when Kanka it comes to TI. Kanka, it's like, it's a good hero. But only by like 5 or 10%. No, I mean, it's there's only two definites. Oh, it's a bad there's hero nothing or in between. It's a good hero. Obviously. There's no, double games. Like, I only one. Oh, I see, I see. I thought maybe it was like a sliding see, scale. We used to be pro players, so like this is what we know <laughs> that the audience yeah. doesn't. It's good or bad? Kinda. <laughs> there is no in between. 
We'll get in the inside of the uh, ex-pro player minds over there. <laughs> With these bands, nothing is being changed up at all, actually. Uh, they're running it back for game number three. They are in a position, though, where Dazzle is still in the pool unless they choose to ban it out themselves. Oh, they, they, they prioritize the Pugna over the Dazzle. Honestly, Nothing was wrong with the draft or play in that last game, so I can understand why they go back to this opener. One adjustment I'd like Liquid to make is last game they ended up with the Pugna 4 and Enchantress 5. I feel like they were pretty all in the lanes. Like, we're sort of sitting here and we're talking about the high ground, but they might have felt a bit desperate because you have Pugna Enchantress versus Morta Phoenix. I feel like the enemy two supports can fight your heroes with buybacks and more. Like, you just don't have any contribution mid and late game. So I like them, like, game one they had the Weaver, which scales a bit more than, like, some Edge or Pugma. I mean, it depends who's Edge, but... Um, I'd like to see them pick up a bit more, like, uh, scale on their supports. Are we gonna see more Ty again for gaming? Just stick to their guns? I would think so. I wouldn't yeah. see any reason not to. I mean, Tofu was 6-1 and one last game, he had a lot of impact. I think, again, to be honest, the lane went a bit worse than expected, which surprises me, because historically, I feel like Tofu and Ace have always done really well, specifically versus Liquid in their lanes. I think, um, I mean, so there was like the no smurf thing in Dota. So Ace yeah. started playing all his games on like a rank 1k account. And he was like struggling because it's like not the Dota he's used to. So that might have affected the synergy because I think usually they get to queue into a lot of games together and play a lot. And I think because of this no smurf thing, like Tolfo and Ace have not played together as much as before. It could have been. I mean, Ace is the cornerstone in my eyes for this team. Like everything revolves around this one hero. I, I mean, one player. He's like very specific type of player. Like he's very greedy. He wants to win his lane. Like, I mean, he almost has to win his lane. For... I think he has to. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like game, if gaming wants to win a Dota 2 game, Ace has to win his lane. <laughs> There's no... Which has happened like every single lane though, right? Exactly, that's funny. Gaming, like normally in Dota, you don't, you can't win three lanes. You have to make sacrifices. And most you usually expect to win two. But gaming always tries to win every single lane. And then they just play off of that. Striving for perfection, you know? Win all three lanes, hopefully the game is easy from then on out. Do you think that that's what they were contemplating then for that first pick? Do we go Murata or do we try and pick up a stable ace hero that is going to have a really good time in lane and they're going to have to try really hard to counter in draft? I sort of feel like they feel like the Murata force is the strongest laner. So if you're going to go in with this philosophy of ace needs to win his lane, you should feel like, oh, if Mort is the strongest laner, there's no reason for us not to pick this hero. We think it's going to give us the most stable lane. We think it gives us the best chance of winning the lane. Why would we not take this hero? I'm sure, I'm sure they were debating it, you know, like uh, the conditions to have a good game. Are we going to run it third time again? I felt like they could have won the first game, but Liquid did. Uh, Liquid could have won the second game, but Gaming did. And they're like, oh, I mean, let's give it to Chance. Let's just keep the pick same and let's place better Dota. That's I what like I like. It's the most confusing when it's sort of like that, too. Like, you're not too sure if you should be changing something because the games are like a bit wonky and you can't learn on the spot because you don't have access to the replays after the game. You have 15 minutes between each game. You need to reset, you know, use a washroom, maybe eat a banana, whatever. You don't have time to actually do real analysis of what happened. You just have to go with your gut. I love eating bananas. I know. Is that what you were doing in your 15 minute break? Uh, hardly, yeah. <laughs> Probably. Just half a banana and I'm ready to it's go. It's good. <laughs> yeah? yeah that's sugar, that's... sugar like decreases the amount of stress affects you. So okay. you need something with a little bit of sugar. I see you had the bananas on hand. Uh, well, Effie, all the way down there, you've been a little bit quiet. The Lone Druid, it's getting banned out. It's getting a little bit of focus. And the Faceless Void you brought up as a potential last pick for game two. And now it's making its way in, its, in bands for game three. I mean, it makes sense that the Void got banned out here because I, I think they were taking a while just to talk about this banning phase because if they were going to run back the Phoenix, that Void wouldn't have been banned out, right? But they decided to go for the Weaver themselves, which now you have two strong support into carry flexes in this Weaver and this Morta. And Zero got ignored in the last game, but it still fits into that hyper-aggression hyper of game when we talk about. But now that the Centaur is taken away, which is a potential with the Muerta, or it could have been the Phoenix opener with that Muerta, uh, the Centaur Pug Pugna is one of the strongest lanings you can have in this patch, and I do not think you can put a Muerta carry versus it. But that, that is the trade-off. Like, in the game one, we saw them trade the Centaur for the Weaver. It didn't work out for Gaiman, but we'll see if it works out this time. Something that sort of surprises me, I think, has Trian been ignored like all three games? No, he did get banned in game one, okay, got and then he got one. banned in the second phase for game two. Okay, well that hero's open. I think the Murta versus Center, that matchup, 
I sort of agree with you. Like, Centaur has a lot of threat on him, especially if someone starts taking the gate. But I have seen some angles or Centaur where, like, you go for, like, an overwhelming lane versus him, like some Morta Tuscar, maybe a Morta Trian. I think that actually could be something they can look at if they want to end up running this Morta carry. I think it's just a bit awkward if the... Because I'm not too sure where Weaver's going, because I think you should probably not put him as carry versus Centaur. He's very reliant on winning the lane. But then you have to put the Morta carry, and I think if you do that, you have to commit on the lane really hard. I mean, it could still be a double support duo. I mean, you, you could pick something like a Grimstroke to enable this Weaver on lane and potentially play for kills onto the Centaur. Like, that could be a potential option for sure. But I just feel like Pugna plus Centaur, no matter who you put them versus, they are going to find ways to pressure that lane. I like that they picked the Skyrath. I think the Pugna 4 for Liquid, it doesn't do enough for them. Like, it works really well for some teams. I think, like, VP, for example, they ran, like, Pugna 4 really well. Same for Batboom. But I think for Boxy, like, he wants more options of the map. Pugna's a very static 4. You look at the lane, you'll maybe look at some stacks, you may check the rune, but you don't have any real kill threat on your ganks. You don't really, like, make the plays. I think Boxy's important to Liquid in that sense. It also gives you damage to kill the Muerta, right? And now you have a Silence to potentially deal with the Weaver, and you can just chain into the Centaur stun, and you can look for mini plays around the map that don't necessarily involve these five-man team fights. If this is an offlane Wraith King, then this fits the description that you were talking about, Aoi, of how Ace likes to play. I think it, it's still, like, flex a bit. Like, yeah. a Wraith King can go to carry as well, but... Also, I wasn't even thinking of the offlane Wraith King. I think, yeah, that would be pretty good for them here. I mean, the lane would be rough for him on safe lane. I feel like Centaur's guy might just over-harass him and he can't really farm. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be that, really uh, depend yeah, on yeah. your first wave, right? Like, if you yeah. get the skeletons going, like, the Skyrath is really easy to kill, but I think... Like, Centaur Skyrath is one of the strongest lanes in Dota. It's not yeah. easy to just go in casually. You need to have, like, either an equally strong lane or sort of, like, a plan about how you're going to cheese the first levels. I'm super worried for this Sky Mage. Like, in paper, it's good, but I feel like in the game, like, they need some real, like, protectors, like policemen that stop the criminals from entering Skywrath Mages <laughs> and Pugna's territory here. Like, you need, like, just like uh, the security guards, the security big beefy guard. bloody exactly guards. Exactly what we Especially have here. All around, this yeah. weaver, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter if it's support or core. Like this weaver's gonna look to get on your backline this game. I think one thing that really helps is the center stampede. I've always liked playing these squishy range supports on the center. It feels like it's so easy to position in a fight. But I can really see a game where like, like you, there's like a very uh, thin line between like having a lot of impact in the fight and you're just too far up trying to have impact. And you just feed. Yeah. I, I was actually wondering why they would go for the Skyrath Mage instead of the Phoenix, which also seemed to be a popular hero this series, because I feel like Phoenix plus Centaur can accomplish similar things, but maybe they are just scared of Weaver's ability to pressure Phoenix early on. I think the Phoenix is not quite the same like boxy type hero, that's why. Like I think on another team, I can really see that Phoenix as well, but I think he really wants the ability to move towards mid and impact that matchup. Yeah, he... And we can see like the lanes are sort of set for game, I think like some uh, Weaver plus Furion and Morta plus Wraith King, but honestly, they can still make adjustments to their lineup if they think that the matchups aren't good. Do you think the Nature's Prophet is better on five just because Morta is a better four, uh, or a Weaver is a better four, or is it because uh, Nature's Prophet on a five offers more to the map and the rotations? I think it depends on the team. Do you have any idea, Matu? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are like teams that play more for the safe lane, and you have the fear on four, and you can really snowball that. Okay. Like the four fear on, I think it's a bit uh, less committal when you rotate mid because all players are more like set for being left alone. Yeah. But some teams, uh, I mean, my team was one of them. Like we really liked it on five, for example, because we felt like you could like pressure into the lanes that you wanted to pressure more, which is usually our offlane. I think something I'm not too sure they're going to consider is like if they can like flex their lineup to put this Morta carry against Terrorblade. I think that's one of the best matchups in the game when, I mean, Terrorblade does nothing to Morta and you just kill him in three hits. I would really like that. I'm like, just wondering how can they do it though? Like, are you going to have Weaver Morta lane? Maybe like Weaver 4, Wraith King 3, Furion 5? I guess you can't do it. It's like a scary lane, like Morta Furion versus Skyrath Centaur, right? I don't think you're ever running a Furion mid here. That's oh, for sure I, not Furion. Yeah, like, 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 it has to be a Queen hero last pick. So. Yeah. I'm just thinking about this Nature's Prophet, honestly. Uh, this hero has really fallen out of favor, and I guess when you look at heroes like Skyrath Mage and Pugna, you think that you can punish them very easy on with a TP into Sprout rotations, regardless of where you're laned, but as the game progresses, if Liquid picks some kind of jump hero on this mid lane for Nisha, something that can punish this Nature's Prophet, which I hope he does, the Earth Spirit gets found out, the Kunkka gets found out, but he heroes in that archetype, then Furion just doesn't really provide that much for a game Draft, so it feels like they're just all in on getting these early kills, or maybe they're 
kind of boxed in later to just playing for pushing lanes and trying to play them up with their Weaver, their Wraith King Skeletons, Fury on cutting waves. But to be honest, I don't like this Fury on pick. I feel like it threw a wedge into the draft a little bit. Looking at the last phase of bands between the two teams, Conker taken out now, Earth Spirit taken out, Necro. Any other big uh, Quinn heroes that are sticking out that Liquid really need to be careful of? Quinn heroes? Yeah. Oh, Pangolier, so... Um, yep, Pango, Necro. A lot of them have been taken out. I feel, I feel like we're going to see some wild picks here. I'm hoping uh, Dazzle well is banned, unfortunately. So TA straight into a TA band straight into a puck pick for Liquid. The mid pick is not easy here, I think, because they have so much magic bursts on Liquid. Like, mm -hmm. you can't pick any of these. I mean, DK is not really a hero in the meta right now, but the example versus puck that you think of. I mean, yeah. you could see it here because it's objectively it just here? looks good. Yeah, looks good. Yeah. I feel like they need a tanky dude that goes in and does damage, like all the other <laughs> mid heroes. For sure, you need pick. some fight start here. Yeah. I mean, this puck pick is throws a wedge in a lot of. Uh, Gaiman's potential last picks because Panga would have been a great pick versus the backline heroes of Liquid. It also would have been a way to pressure the Terra Blade, but Puck's coil makes it hard. And this Void Spirit is a Quinn specialty hero oh, yeah. from the days of old. The hero has fallen off, but in a sense, it provides the same burst that you need against the Sky and the Pugna. It can also pressure the TV early on with rotations, but I mean, traditionally, Coil also counters the Spirit hero that does counter Void Spirit. We'll see though. What are you guys laying with these two drafts now? Aoi, if you want to go first. I honestly feel like it's really hard for gaming to scale into Liquid. I don't. F I feel like this terrible is going to have a really free game, and unless like gaming do super on the lane, which they can, I think it'll be hard for them. All right, look, Mato, I already know that you're going to go for Liquid. So instead of asking your opinions, we'll let Litz speak for himself. Absolutely. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I am here with the Blitz from Team Liquid. Give it up, crowd. Come on, please. Blitz, it's been one hell of a journey throughout the entire year, and we've come to this moment. Of course, a game three between you and Gaming Gladiators. I mean, uh, this is how it always works out. But I do want to talk about your guys' confidence. There's a lot of flex picks happening, Muertas, Weavers, things like that. But your draft, this one, especially this game, very locked in to what everyone's going to do. Is that confidence in yourselves, or is that confidence against the enemy? No, we have a lot of confidence in ourselves. I mean, obviously Gladiators has had our number in finals, but this ain't the finals, so... Uh, I mean, I think it's gonna go pretty well. Uh, I just don't like making definitive statements, and I don't want to, like, lock in and say, oh, we're gonna smash these guys, because, I mean, I like them too, and I think they're good people, and there's no hate between either of our teams, even though we see each other in the finals all the time, so... All right, and uh, as you've noticed, you have a lot of fans out there in the arena, so I did want to give you an opportunity to uh, say something to the Liquid fans and everyone watching at home. Oh, I just want to say thank you for coming to support us, or if you're just here to support Dota. I think regardless of whatever team loses, we, leave, we live very charmed lives. Uh, we're super lucky to do this. I mean, I have a bunch of friends in there that I hope win, uh, but regardless, you know, there's a lot of family and friends to us, uh, a lot of management here too, just to support us. I mean, I think we're super lucky, regardless of what happens. Absolutely, and we are lucky to see this game three between these two teams one more time, taking away our wonderful casters. The 37th time in games that these two teams will match up against each other in its last one of the season. 21 to 15 is the current score to the favor of Gaming Gladiators. But like Blitz said, this is no finals. It is definitely not. And that means it's going to be a grudge match. It's going to get down and dirty. No way around it. Neither of these teams is going to want to leave this tournament yeah. empty handed. So. I'm looking towards a long game, some action, some pace, and of course, the jaws of defeat who can manage to escape them in this lower bracket elimination match. Yeah, because we heard from panel, we heard backstage, we've been talking about it. Game one and game two, that was not the best form of either one of these teams. The TI pressure cooker, man. It, it definitely gets to people. And these teams have both slipped up and lost control of the game when they had it firmly in hand. And uh, we'll see whether or not what happens in game three, whether or not they're going to elevate each other or if the pressure breaks these teams down. And who's going to remain the strongest in the end when they need it most? Ace is going to be in some trouble here, surrounded by Liquid members. And that'll be first blood to Mickey. Nice little positioning by Liquid. Five heroes to a rune can almost never go wrong. And I'm surprised we don't see teams do it more, because when you split up, 
You are giving a chance for that first blood. It'll go straight into Mickey's pocket. We talked after game two. What are these teams going to go to? I thought they were going to go to more scale. And I mean, what scales harder than a Terra Blader, right? This is one of the ultimate late game heroes. You have Puck to back it off. Back it up. A lot of pickoff damage between the two supports in terms of magical burst. And I kind of agree, like, the scale looks difficult for gaming. However, we have seen Weaver just decimate heroes in the late game, right? Yep. This is not the same Weaver you're used to seeing with the talents, with the shard, these Geminate hits come out, you get crits on them, anybody disappears. And of course, of course, avoid Spirit for Quinn. One of his signature heroes and a hero he goes back to in crunch time when everything is on the line. Deadshot gonna try magic and scare him away. Ace does manage to pick up that bounty rune. It is going to be a split. So we're going to see a situation here where, yeah, you gave up first blood if you're gaming gladiators, but they also found one of the observer wards, and they still managed to go 2-2 on bounty runes. So a relatively even start, particularly since Nisha wasn't the one to claim the last hit. That would certainly change how this matchup goes between Void Spear and Puck. This is a very non-one-sided matchup. It's very skill-based. If you give Nisha first blood here, he definitely would probably run away with it. But now, Quinn has a decent shot to just win this lane. This is a matchup that he's played a thousand times, I can guarantee it. He's very used to it. Had the block advantage to such a degree, it got under the tower, though. So this is going to push it right back into Nisha. We'll give him level two advantage, but I'm pretty curious to see how this plays out over the long run, because I would think Quinn can win it a little bit, but... Void Spear is just not a hero that's been in the meta recently at all. This is a hero that fell off very hard, got nerfed very hard. The Spirit Brothers are getting hit left, right, and center. He's like the, one of the last ones standing at this point as Ember has vacated the premises. He used to scale very hard, so this could be a Void Spear that gets to 60 minutes, can do some work, and yeah, Furion struggling on this bottom lane. I mean, we saw the panel talk about these side lanes for Liquid, right? They are very strong, particularly around those level two and three timings. If you don't cheese the early waves, as AUI said, these guys are probably just going to outregen you, particularly the Skyrath Centaur lane that has been a struggle for Celery early. No, he is surviving it. Of course, you had a little XP advantage off the first blood. Those things make a big difference over the long run. I want to go back to this mid matchup just because I think the, the story between these two is pretty interesting. Nisha, for the longest time throughout his career, he's been heralded as the best player in the world. Maybe he still is that, maybe he's not. But Quinn has been rising. His stock is incredibly high right now due to Gaming Gladiator's performance throughout the year. And he's long been heralded as one of the best laners, first in North America and then the rest of the world. He's proved it this year. So going up against Nisha, I think, is a, is a little special for him a chance to be able to take the throne away from the current best mid in the world. He's also talked about it. playing in Europe this year, gave him the confidence to go against these players and rise to that occasion. And we're seeing it here. The lane going Quinn's way in a matchup he's very comfortable with. 13, 14, and 3 to the 8 no on Nisha. So he's taking an early lead. This is what you want to see in this matchup. Be able to contest those power runes later on and deny the tempo away from Nisha on maybe the slightly stronger rotating hero here. I mean, if Puck gets a really good game here, there's not a lot to stop him, right? He's gonna cause problems for Duraccio in the fight. Ace can't guarantee have the lockdown for him with a Wraith Fire Blast. It's just not the best stun in the world. Yeah, the calling can sometimes be a little bit hard to hit. Dead shots unreliable. Yeah, I mean, the calling might be their best tool to deal with him if, if he runs out of, you know, Blink Johnson and everything, but this is a good Puck scaling game if it goes really late. The, both these mids can have crazy impact down the road if they get there with the, the true five to six slots. Good use of the calling to block out heroes from being able to grab that Lotus. Still, we're seeing Ace struggle up here, man. That first blood did work for Mickey, and I mean, Liquid are continuing to abuse him on the lane here. Wraith King, not the strongest level one and two hero. You're really looking for that three to five, and you really want to get kills or good lane pressure out of the skeletons. Just hasn't happened for Ace so far. Back gonna be in trouble here. He gets one last stomp off before he goes. Level double advantage. Yep, double range, both level three to the level twos on Liquid side. So Boxing's Eye eventually getting out XP down here. And I mean, this is a very strong lane of its own. Gaming decided to meet this aggressive lane with even more aggression. Sprout into Swarm. And to just go on you, slay you, send you back to the fountain before the Vanguard can come out on Zai. Double ring is solid for the armor, but there's just not enough regen. Yeah, Centaur starts with zero armor, so the physical damage of Weaver is actually kind of a problem here. Picks up the water rune away from Nisha. Quinn continuing to have Nisha's number. 
Box. Um, looks like they're going to go for this Furion kill and get it, but it's going to be a trade-off. Boxy gives up his own life, and Zoraccio is going to be happier for it as he puts the damage back onto Zai as he tries to get out of the way. Ring of Health is picked up, and he's got a healing sound, so he'll be able to stay in lane healthy. Oh, we got but Zoraccio takes away part of that healing cell. Uh, extra Gemini point as well. Opted not for Sakuchi cooldown. Just hacking the raw damage into Zai here and taking advantage of early Falcon Blade for some regen. This is a very strong start for Taracho, top of the board here. These extra kills mean a lot for Weaver in this early game in terms of a snowball carry. This is probably the best one in the meta. They're straight back onto Zai bottom, and it should be a pickup here with that blood grenade taking him out. It's a great read from Game of Gladiators. In fact, they get the kill on the top lane as well. Seeing the Skywrath Mage TP mid, they knew it was perfectly fine to be able to dive a centaur like they're doing, and now they're just trickling in one by one. Uh, Boxy underneath the towers being food. assaulted. They can't really do much about it. He's going to try and hide. Healing Salve a little bit just to stay alive. Long enough for the Centaur to get here, but it's too late. Zai cannot punish Duraccio. And the Creep Wave went past that Tier 1, so Zai lost the Flag Bear Creep. He lost XP on that double Salve down the drain. A huge amount of economic damage done bottom. I mean, it doesn't reflect in the CS, but Duraccio just took a 1,000 gold lead over Zai on this bottom lane at 5 minutes here. This is an explosive start for an explosive carry in this patch. And we also saw Ace use the Skeletons well top, right? That's at level 3 Wraith King timing. They found the opening there as well. So gaming once more, showing their prowess in the first 10 minutes here. One of the strongest laning teams in the world for a reason. This is the time to make use of it, right? They did not want to play these long games at TI. They did not want to play the 70-minute Midas Farm Fest. They wanted to use their strengths as a team, propel themselves to a podium finish. So far in this game three, it's looking solid. Power runes well controlled by Gaming Gladiators, it looks like. Top lane. Oh, that's a big room. Double damage. Quinn trying to pounce, misses out thanks to the face shift, but does manage to name him with the remnant and the dead shot from across the screen. Shows up for Tofu to get the last hit, but if they can get Quinn in return, Quinn knows he can't get away, so he'll accept his fate. I mean, he's probably happy to get the kill on Nisha, shut Nisha down. That's a big swing in XP for him that is unfavorable towards Nisha, but you know he would have liked that double damage rune. I mean, both these yeah. mids are really good rune abusers, so. That's what they're really fighting for here. Got the silence onto Duraccio. The burst damage isn't going to be quite enough. He gets off Shikuchi, almost killing Sai in the process, but he respects his own life more Just than the and kill. Falcon Blade Bracer. A lot of early tank on this Weaver trying to survive the burst, and it's paid off here. Duraccio continuing to have a solid laning phase, dealing with the aggression. And I mean, look at the levels of Celery. That's the other factor in this bottom lane. This Furion's level 5 before the 7 minute Wisdom Rune. This is a crazy pace for him. If he can rotate to mid, it's just pressure on all three lanes now for Liquid. They have to deal with this, get through this period to where their heroes hit that mid-game stride and the Terrorblade can join the fights. Speaking of that Terrorblade, close to the Weaver in net worth. Hasn't gotten the same number of kills that Darachi has been able to be a part of, but has done well in the CS. And one of the only heroes that really isn't being pressured in the lanes right now, though I'm sure Gaming Gladiators will change that narrative at some point. Man, Quinn just keeps on bringing the pain to Nisha. He does not want to let him have high resources on this map. He wants to continue to push the wave in so he can contest these power runes. This is what Void Spear can do in this matchup. You just spam the pulse. Very hard for Nisha to win these trades over the long term. Even the raindrop just getting broken down here as Quinn hunting. This next wave into the power rune. Tofu lingering around as well. I mean, this, this is one Liquid want to contest for sure. They're going to break both supports. They know this time is going to be coming, trying to pull him back into the calling. It was hurt. enough beautifully executed by Gaming Gladiators. Just as Insania and Boxy were making the rotation through the river, Plus it 20. could not have been better executed. It could not have been better timed. This is eight minute rune going into Quinn's pocket, unless Boxy with a heads up TP can deny it. No. So that's both supports rotating to watch their mid die and not get the rune. This early game shaping up to be very favorable for gaming. By the way, the whole time that happened, Ace just took your top tier one with some Skelly boys. So that tower's also gone, which will push Mickey farther into this jungle, open up the rotation to mid if Ace really wants it, which would not surprise me as I feel like he's gonna play this Wraith King like another lone druid. Go Radiance and hit the objectives. Yep. And I wonder if he's going to go for that Aghanim Scepter that we've seen a lot from this offlane Wraith King. That'll be pretty interesting considering how reliant Liquid is on Burst.
right? Their first four heroes we see in this game are all magic damage burst. They want to be able to get the numbers advantage. That Aghanim Scepter could ruin that entire concept. Coil underneath tower. Calling hits him a second time with the dead shot pushing him back in. Tofu is playing this Muerta beautifully. Showing the strength of it too. This is just not a spell you can dodge. And Nisha is struggling in this mid lane, getting outnumbered constantly, not winning the rune battles. Quinn outlaned him slightly and it created the advantage. Oh, didn't get the silence off in time. He got off the Shikuchi as a result. And now they're going to turn. Quinn's going to show up with the Astral Steps and catch Zai. Going for more now. Jirachu offering the high five as he picks up the Courier instead of going for the supports. Liquid supports getting routed on the map right now. They don't have the levels to fight back. They're missing the ults on these bursts on this burst duo that really needs him to follow up on the Centaur Stomp. Without that, you're just getting outpaced by the Furion and the Morta here, which have the XP advantage, have the gold advantage, and are just playing around Quinn. Mid-tower gone as well off that ace backstab that I feel was inevitable. This is this is shaping up to be a very one-sided early game. It's going to come down to if Liquid can bring the game back, you know. That 10 to 20 minute period can be very strong for them. They get the ults up, they find some quick bursts on the Weaver. A lot of squishy heroes on gaming side. So you build up these streaks, you give away a couple pickoffs. Suddenly, Mike, he's going to be in a decent position. Sai taking so much damage. The Vanguard plus the Chainmail. It's still not enough to protect him here. Tofu does get popped. Does Nisha pay the price for it? Managed to dodge some of that damage thanks to the phase shift. And there's a lot of heroes here. Quinn's going to back away with his haste. Wait till Duraccio brings some reinforcements. He's going to jump onto Boxy, see if he can burst him down. He does so beautifully with the Wrath of Nature coming in. That high level of Celery is finally going to be able to pay off. Even if they don't collect the kill on Zai, just maintaining control of this area could be big for gaming gladiators. This is also ancient control for Mickey later as Liquid. We're thinking about stacking up the triangle. I mean, this is the recovery farm for Nisha. You invade this early, take the fight. It's an insane amount of space for Ace, who's just gobbling up the map right now. But you're also just not getting punished for it. Haste rune, again, the power rune control, which has gone to Quinn. Really make or breaking these early fights. They are taking a significant lead here. As Liquid yet to strike back so far. You've seen momentum shift drastically in these games, however, so I would not put it past them. It has to be around these coils and the stomp, right? Your supports are not going to set up these big core kills. It's got to be around Nisha or Zai setting it up and bringing in the firepower afterwards. But you are still looking for level 6 on Boxy here. That's a big component. You need this Mystic Flare. Stampede barely gets him out. Boy, that Solar Crest combined with the Weaver burst damage was pretty tough to deal with the coil, but the orb doesn't land. So they're going to miss a bit of damage here, but it looks like they can run down Tofu all the same. He gets off the call and gets off a little bit of damage before he falls. 12 minute power room. Can Liquid claim one for themselves finally? Now you know Nisha wants it. You at least get a chance at the 50 50 tier, and he gets rewarded. Regen, maybe not the most powerful, but the one he will take right now. Particularly with a uh, Pugna, who can already refill you up. And Tarot is farming enemy agents here. No fear. Very aggressive build, making it work. A lot of extra gold in their pocket. More economic damage going Liquid's way as this Blink Dagger for Zai is a long way off. By the way, the Aether Red Net is going to be able to grab him. Half his health is gone. In an instant, Zai is going to be bailed out by Insania, though. These are the kind of plays that Liquid is going to look to be able to save a hero and perhaps push back against game gladiators. Got to make sure gladiators, got to make sure they do not overextend themselves again. They're just farming everything, though. It's more ancient stacks going their way. It's completely taking Liquid's side of the map. And the biggest ticking time bomb here is Ace, man. I mean, yeah. haven't watched him, but he's somehow more farmed than last game. This is going to be a faster Radiance, 13 and a half minutes here. In fact, 13 on the dot, he finishes it on the Courier. It's going to be crazy good timing. A pickup, they have okay. to get this. They committed so many heroes for it. They do manage to bring down Duraccio. Almost got Celery as well. Zion just barely outside of that range. That's that coil into Mystic Flare that they were waiting for. Mystic Flare delayed on Boxy, but the second he gets it, puts it to use. And this is a combo they can continue to use in this game. Gaming are going to be very susceptible against it until they have, you know, maybe second item round, especially for Taraccio on that BKB on Weaver. He dies every time in a silence from Skyrather Puck if you have the damage follow-up. So now it's just getting to Zai's, B getting to Zai's Blink and Mickey Scotty. 
take a fight around those items. Keep fighting the pickoffs with the puck off cooldown and stall this game out. Pickoff on Mickey here behind the tier two. Celery completes the TP, spots Mickey. Quinn gets behind him now. See if they can burst him down. They've got plenty of silences and stuns to make sure there's no chance at a sunder. And thanks to the skeletons, they can get some good damage on his tier two. Meanwhile, Jirachio dodged a gank attempt. So they were both gunning for the enemy carry, but it's gaming gladiators who succeed. Will result in a swift tier two for Ace, who has occupied this side of the map and is squeezing Liquid back into their triangle here. Another power rune did go Nisha's way, but it's an invis. So again, the rune luck. Continuing to be an obnoxious for him. This game continues and another quick pause. It's a dangerous moment too. You can see gaming gladiators. Yeah, they are ramping up, right? This is a cross map smoke. Yeah, they're they're moving. They're trying to cut across, see if they can catch Nisha, anybody in the triangle. And if they succeed, Ace will have gone from a 13 minute blink dagger to a, or excuse me, a 13 minute radiance to like a 15 minute blink dagger. He's very close. This is a deadly fight right now, if you give it up. Particularly for what Mickey is trying to do. He's trying to hit these timings on Terrorblade, and every time you give up a couple of these kills, it makes it harder for him to come into the fight and have impact because he can reflect this Wraith King back against gaming, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the Terrorblade can do some work, particularly if you can get a Sunder off in a fight if he's not debilitated by the Calling Silence here. Those are the things that have to line up here, which is why you need Zai and Nisha to create the initiation or at least take the brunt of the go. And the Echo finished for the Void Spear here as oh, that invoke. It's going to be a little bit troublesome. Breaks the smoke move and goes for the pickoff on a Tofu. It's not immediate. In fact, Insania, who tried to jump forward to finish him off, is going to be running into the silence. They trade out supports, though. Zai trying to find a target somewhere in this, only stopping up Celery, but Celery doesn't care. He's pretty tanky. In fact, he turns around. Mickey is going to be stalled up. They do manage to bring down the Wraith King the first time, while the Skyrath Mage is going to be left victim to Jirachio's aggression. Mickey now trying to get out, but too many heroes are there. A double kill for Quinn and a one for four exchange for Game and Gladiators. Morita continually causing liquid problems in these fights. It's so hard to engage into this calling, plus the dead shot reflecting heroes into it. And of course, Skeletons up for Ace that entire time did a serious amount of damage here. 3,100 pumped out from this Wraith King, just burning everybody down. Happy to trade that level one ult for a cleanup on that team fight. Only Nisha survives. If that coil hits on Quinn, maybe you can commit on him with the follow up, because I have decent positioning on the backside. But again, you're still looking for the Centaur blink here, right? You just don't have that stun initiation that brings your supports into the fight. It's a big component that's missing. They continue to look for it, and Duraccio continues his hunting spree. Yeah, he's got Decrepify, so he's going to be okay for Squishy a small too. window of time. The silence is lasting on to Duraccio. Oh, we barely got off that time lapse. That was a close call, but he does it, and because maybe he lives here, Still hit by the coil, a little bit more damage is all they need. The Shukuchi lasts so long though, he's gonna get another round off. They are gonna follow this orb, but it's not gonna be enough. Nisha's not gonna catch him. He gets away, Zai dies on the other oh, side of the map, and they still got that kill onto Insania. Gaming Gladiators are getting everything on this map and getting punished, not at all. Extra strength items for Duraccio paying off. Even that trusty shovel coming in handy there. Some oh, yeah. HP. And yeah, I mean, the amount of ancients they've taken off this map compared to Liquid is, a, it must be astounding, right? They yeah. took so many of their early stacks. They've been stacking their own side of the map as well. They have a Fury on cleaning up the side wave. So this is just max efficiency right now. The fact that he's taken so many ancients on the side of Duraccio while holding that safe lane tower for this entire game. I mean, we haven't seen a tower go down. Liquid has no. not been able to get enough ground off of a losing laning phase. And that's what's continuing to, to punish Zai here. Because yeah. Centaur is a hero that wants to open up this tier one off the back of early Vanguard and some lane domination. That is what Skyrath Centaur is designed to do. So when you're put in this position, there's nothing to farm for Zai here. You can't go and do Ancients, take it away from his other cores. I mean, half of those have gone to game in any way. Where is he supposed to go, right? Still looking for this blink. 400 away. That will be the comeback opportunity here for Liquid as they have found themselves down 10k at 17 minutes. This is going to be a mountain to climb. Two-man smoke up. Tofu and Quinn. Just like that last game where we saw the killing power of the Pugna plus Kunkka go to work, this combo has been equally deadly. They're going to try and put it to work on Zai once again, slowing down his blink dagger time and time again. The dead shot does not land. Can Quinn finish the job? He's going to jump in, but if you look at Zai, he's up and they over 
extension. Oh, he's got just a little bit left. Oh, he gets away. Dissimulate on out, and they cannot finish the job. Even Insaney on the other side. Quinn doubles back, sees the support trying to get the kill, but he dances away freely, and now Insania has got himself killed as well. 2,000 HP on a mid backline jumper. I mean, that is the Echo Ogre Club build paying off for Quinn here, and also just the delay and the timings, right? Imagine you get that connection four or five minutes ago. He's dead for sure. Yep. Imagine you had a few more levels on the Centaur, right? He's only got two levels of yep. double edge. The first damage just wasn't there. Size game is just, it's been decimated here. And we are feeling it as Liquid are also feeling it, trying to rally around these tower defense. And I mean, this is coming down to mid game, right? Oh, Mass CP spot the coil wasn't in time. Managed to get the blink backwards. They're going to have to just hope they get celery. But even that game, the Gladiators are showing they're willing to turn around and fight. And Zai's going to die again before he gets his blink dagger. The initiation missing and pieces of it will continue to be missing as they lose yet another fight on the side of Liquid. Now they are getting desperate. Nisha cutting waves like this. Uh, this BKB for Taraccio is, is coming out. That's It might just seal the deal in terms of you bursting the Weaver here. All these heroes just look so damn tanky. Yeah. You got a Mystic Flare and it has to connect. It has to connect big here. And soon for Liquid, or you're just looking at another early high ground because gaming have not been afraid to push the tempo very fast and go high ground early, especially building up the auras here. You're going to have a pipe from Celery. Gabe says, well, this game is almost over. You got a 3% chance. That's what it gives you, Liquid. Let me just say, though, I feel like I've won some games where I had worse odds than that. Yeah. Get the BKB out of Duraccio. And again, the third time he's picked up a DKB and the first charge is used defensively, but I'm sure this one feels a lot better because they're killing Zai again. Seven deaths in 20 minutes. That has to be one of the highest death counts I've ever seen Zai have in his illustrious career. This is a rough one for sure. And it's it's not going to be a pretty way back, right? You're just going to have to do it dirty and blink in, die every fight, and hope it's enough to carry it off the damage from the Puck and the Terror Blade. Yeah, that's the funny part, right? It doesn't get any better for Centaur when you're behind nope. like this. So he's still looking for that blink. He will eventually get it. It will be a glorious day <laughs> when it happens. I don't know. He's been hard <laughs> stuck on that 2K net worth for a while. He can sell some items here. It's okay. That's true. That's true. He has it guaranteed. Well, he can't sell the Quelling Blade. Got to keep that at all times. That Furion is going to be super annoying for him. But you're right. 50 gold away. It'll happen. As long as he doesn't die, he could literally just sit in his base and wait. No, he's, he's chill. He's farming. No. Farming some pine cones in the corner right now. Untouched. Blink Dagger is bought here hey. for Zai. He will finally get to it in this game. And now you have to do something with it. But that's step one. Yeah, that was step one of about, uh, I would say, 20 different steps for a Liquid comeback. Because Game of Gladiators, they've got, they're super tanky. They've got a second life on Ace at all times. Six reincarnation. Durachio has a BKB. So, yeah, you've got the initiation. But can you actually burst anybody before they get off their magic meter? Not if the fight starts with Ace just going in, right? That's the nightmare for Liquid. If Ace just starts to fight, you have to punch through him twice. It's going to make sure that Dorachu gets his BKB off and Quinn gets a guaranteed jump. That's what Gaming are looking for. And Ag's done for Quinn. This is extremely fast on top of the Echo here. This is where the Void Spear Puck matchup becomes almost unplayable, right? Like, yeah. what is Nisha supposed to do into this double pulse that's silencing him? Quinn's going to have his freedom. BKB also done for Ace. So one of those lives, he's going to be running around immune for nine seconds. But we did get the Scotty on Nick A, and this is one of the big comeback mechanisms for Liquid. If you can get a good fight with a reflection on Ace with Scotty just cutting out these heroes. Seller cuts him off. But, oh, 10 HP, he does die in the end. Meanwhile, mid lane, they Quinn. are fighting this one out. Quinn, one hit. once again, survives are just a little bit of damage. He actually went for that kill, you madman. The block, the shield is just enough. They get Celery out of it, but Mickey, he's going to be in trouble. As soon as Zai dies, they're going to turn all their attention over this guy. The answer is oh, He gets it just on the tip, Quinn. Survives and gets Mickey killed with his final touch. Liquid gets split on the map, and it just goes horrible here as they get nothing out of it outside of Celery Top, which you wanted this Quinn kill again. It's very close. Mickey shows up with the Scotty. You get the connection. This is what you're looking for with that Blink Hoof Stomp reveal at 22 minutes in. Still, Gaiman just outpacing you with the HP here. Your damage has continuously been behind, trying to up it up. It's just not there yet. And yeah, Ace, he's, he's going to start every fight if he can. 
that was one of those rare opportunities where you got a chance to go on Quinn. You got to make those count. Just seems like the laning phase has given gaming gladiators that extra bit, like 10% more HP they needed every single time, or almost every single time, to survive through the initiation. And it is beginning to snowball. Every single fight going worse and worse for Team Liquid. Now up to a 19,000 net worth lead for gaming gladiators. Yeah, it's out of control, right? And a lot of it's just on Celery and Tofu cleaning up so much of the map. Furion thrives in these situations where you can corner the enemy early off a good lane win and just clean up the lanes. I mean, full pipe solar crest on Celery. He's just gonna build every utility item in the bank, make sure his cores are unkillable. The Glimmer Cape on Tofu is what bailed Quinn out on that mid lane as well. These are difficult items for Skyrath to play into, which is why this deficit is so looming, because you have to have this Mystic Flare connect. And every one of these utility items that come out makes it a little more difficult. And the Terror Blade becomes even easier for Game Gladiators to bring down with a completed Mjolnir for Duraccio. Damage is coming, and it's coming fast. Two minutes left on the Aegis here. Do you go high ground? Yeah, I mean, they already Gaming, picked it down so, to half, so yeah. as well. You are going high ground. They can try, try and burst him, take away that age as quick as possible. Not enough. Zai dies for pretty much nothing, because Jirachi just shrugs off that damage with the time lapse. And the Glyph will only stall Gaming Gladiators for so long. Liquid, they are in desperate straits now. A little bit of heal put on to Mickey, but you don't have to worry about the heroes if you're Gaming Gladiators. You can focus on the objectives. Yeah, just wait for Ace to jump right. These reflections are what hurt. If Mickey yes. keep getting these off, this is what will actually deal the damage in the fight. That's right. That radius is. back around. Instant silence okay. under the coil. Is it enough damage? So once again, he's held in place, but he's too tanky. Mickey can't quite commit. Not with Gaming Gladiators. The rest of heroes surging forward. They got that one kill. Mini buyback though from Insania to hold this lane of barracks, and Gaming Gladiators will respect it. Just refill the resources here. No time lapse on Duraccio. Don't want to spend BKBs in a bad situation when you can just reset and continue to build your lead here. They Does mean they're going to be a little bit pushed for time if they would still want to use this Aegis. They got one minute left. So Duraccio, they just cruise straight down middle. They could still make good use of it. Yeah, they can. I mean, this AC is almost completed for Ace. He's one component away. So the next two minutes could have it if he just farms up the entire map. Do you feel like gaming gladiators? Also, is no there meta. A rush? to take this lane of barracks? I mean, no, but the opening's there because you know Mickey doesn't have meta, and yeah. there's no way Liquid are taking a fight without it, right? So how much do you take, then, is the question. It is the question. They, there is a, a welcome mat on the front middle lane. Nobody's home. Gaming Gladiators just walk right through the door, take the lane of barracks. There are no tier twos, so they can translate this into even more. Team Liquid will be forced back to defend at some point. Yeah, there's a wave in their base with the catapult. There's another wave coming in. They did not cut these. There's just a free double lane. I, there's no towers bottom as well. You're looking at Mega's potential. In a meta where the high ground has thwarted so many teams, Gaiman just stroll into a double lane here. No defense, no contest, as that meta is still 50 seconds off cooldown here. I think feels the worst like an part, eternity. it doesn't feel like Liquid is getting an item. It's not like, oh, we gave up two lanes of barracks, but now we have this. This will help us win everything. As, oh, Nisha gets caught up by that one. Face shift, is able to blink away. The calling's going to be a problem, but he does manage to blink, but straight into the arms of Duraccio. Easily takes up that kill and looks for more. Insania's going to be cleaned out. That's a dieback for him. Zai dies right next to the fountain. Game and Gladiators are way too strong for Liquid right now. And they're going to go for the killing blow by taking Megas in the bottom lane. Again, there is really nothing rolling in for Liquid. Mickey is desperately trying to farm up a DKB, but he's one whole component away. Ace, Ace right back almost in. Almost one-shotting Boxy. Ooh, barely even Prince. needed Quinn's help. Yeah, I mean, you've got to go with this meta. Five seconds on the cooldown for Mickey. Just praying he has enough time to get this, use it. Make something happen. And to grab him, dies again. Zai. Where's the team? They're all dead. I yeah, mean, meta. Mickey against the world. Ace immediately going to jump onto him. Anybody help out Mickey? No chance at a Sunder. And GG is called Gaming Gladiator. Will do it for the 22nd time this season. They will bring down Team Liquid. They've had their number all year round, and they will prove it on the biggest stage that Dota 2 has to offer. That is a very frustrating defeat for Liquid. I mean, this has been their nemesis the whole season long, and most of it's been in the grand finals. Here you're in the lower bracket elimination match. 
that game two, the game one especially, where those high grounds went wrong for both teams, right? Either of those games can come back to haunt you depending on if you win or lose this series. And as Liquid dropped down here, it's one of those series where you go back, you play that game a bunch of times, how many versions of it do you win, right? And I mean, a hell of a season from both teams here. They will Cheers. meet each other yet again. So much respect between these two. For one final time at this year's TI, we're going to say goodbye to Team Liquid, one of the most consistent teams, but never able to find that championship, and sadly it'll slip through their fingers this year. Gaming Gladiators, though, holding strong in that lower bracket. I mean, we set up the stage early on at, like, Riyadh. We talked about how this team was always going through the upper bracket, always taking the easy road to be able to get to the finals, but then they got knocked down at Riyadh. They get knocked down at TI. They prove that they're also a lower bracket run team as they do it against their nemesis in Team Liquid. I mean, resilience, it's a hell of a quality to have, right? And it shows itself here. It's showing them across the course of the year. This team has a lot of fans. They also have a lot of haters. It's, it's a mixed bag across the board. But damn, do they look good when they're winning and when they're building momentum. They are one of the scariest teams in the world. Absolutely love to be able to watch some more Gaming Gladiators game. And we're going to do it here at TI as we head back to the panel for some more series to come. A 2-1 nail biter series. Gaming Gladiator is now a top four team here at TI12. That does mean, unfortunately, Liquid, they're uh, a fifth, sixth team. Um, I mean, Gaming Gladiator is absolute championship worthy team, like, just like throughout the whole season, like, amazing performance. Like, shout out to them. Um, it's very sad to be a Liquid fan today. Um, I like every Liquid fan needs a beer right now. In <laughs> fact, I need a beer right now. So Liquid is out. So is Matu gonna be out? So. <laughs> That's it. Matu's done. Yeah. Fuck this shit. Oh, he's actually just. All right. Bye, bye, Matu. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate all your analysis. Oh, yeah, that's it. He was done. He was done. Once the, the support for Liquid was over, Effie, you're gonna have to fill in all the blanks now. I mean, <laughs> well, Matu. By the way, he actually left. has left. Matu has actually <laughs> left the building. Well, all right. Uh, that was just really convincing by Game in, in, in that game three. I mean, their draft came together in a way that none of us saw. I think that when they're owning, they're owning, they stomp their lanes really well. They abused the tempo that came out of the Nature's Prophet push and the Skeleton push, and it looked like there was no space for Liquid to come back in this game, honestly. But also what I want to shout out the most is that last pick Void Spirit. And this hero has fallen out of meta. Not many players would have picked Void Spirit in that situation, but Quinn had the read on it. He played insanely well versus this puck, and he made it happen. Owie, because we don't have Matu here anymore to build up the Hyper Liquid, even though they do bow out of their TI run at 5th, 6th, there's still a lot of praise to be sung for them, maybe not so much in Game 3, but at least throughout this series. No, I think they played their hearts out this series. I mean, it always sucks. They're, you know, there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser. I think, especially for a team like Liquid that has come so close so many times, it's hard to like be able to reset and be happy with what happened, but I think there's nothing to be ashamed of with their season. What was the hardest thing uh, about the lineup to execute? The hardest thing for their draft to be able to come online? Honestly, I felt like they're a bit reliant on their offline doing a bit better. I think this game, a lot of the reason for gaming's victory was how well Salu and Durasio played the safe lane. As soon as Zai and uh, Boxy Sword got shut down, I think the game looked really hard for Liquid to have some tempo in. Yeah, also the thing about Skyrath Mage is if he's not winning lanes and if he's not comboing with his stun hero throughout the game, he doesn't have impact. He's not a big team fight support like Phoenix can be or Undying can be where they can just find a fight, do a supernova, tombstone, turn it around. Skyrath does not do that. He's yep. very dependent on how well his cores are doing to set up for him. Look, Matu might have left. He's going to go and console the broken hearts of all Liquid fans and the Liquid players and team over there. But Rezo, we still have a full panel. You're joining us yet again. You're here this morning. Hello. But did you enjoy that three-game series between Liquid and Gaming Gladiators? Well, the third game was amazing. I didn't, I didn't think that it, it would be the, like the way that it went, like because purely on the draft, like I didn't really expect like this domination from the gamings, and I, I really thought that Liquid Draft was way better. But you know, Zai, like he had like such an such a poor performance in this last game because like he couldn't really he couldn't really get his timing. He he got blinked at like 20 minutes, around 21 minutes, and like it was their tempo. Like you know, for Liquid, it was like the guy who needed to have a good game in order for them to make moves and like to you know to to have a mid uh, go into the mid game have a, like a solid. Game. Game. It was a really tough loss for Liquid, but 
Gaming Gladiators, they were able to bounce back. They lost that game one, and they were able to come back at game two and three. They won this series, so of course, we get some words with our winners. Absolutely. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Because uh, during the draft, last game, I want to throw up, and my team is asking what we should draft, and I'm just, I'm just looking at my keyboard. I'm feeling bad myself. I'm not responding, and just doing like this. Pick Weaver, pick Weaver. <laughs> You thought you were going to throw up? Why? Because uh, I got sick yesterday, and I feel really bad myself, but we won, and I'm happy. Okay, well, fantastic. Sorry, this guy's just sitting here laughing. I'm with Duraccio. Hello. No, a hell of a series you guys played. That was a wild one. Again, Team Liquid, game three, the same thing, and you're here once more. Whew. You thought you were going to make it through with uh, this one once more? Mm. Versus stick with him in? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like, to be honest, I didn't think about the game at all uh, before the start. I have no stress because I'm, I'm just feeling bad myself. I want to survive. I tell my boys if I'm going to die, like, see why I have to play. So I'm not, like, I'm pretty confident before the games and I thought we we're going to win, but, like, I didn't have stress like yesterday. I see. Now, a lot of the teams these days, they're really counting on their off laners. They're counting on a lot of people to make momentum. But for this team in particular, you seem to drive a lot of it. If the Weaver's doing good, they're doing good. Uh, if the Razor is doing good, <laughs> we can get there. Does it feel like that on, the, on your team? Does it feel like you have a lot of pressure? No, I don't think I, have, I feel any pressure. I'm just doing my job. I'm just enjoying the game. I'm doing what I want. And like, I don't care if I'm going to die or like what's going to happen. So I'm just doing to get fun from the game. <laughs> well, it is a hell of a lot of fun watching you. Absolutely. Well, congratulations, you know, on your way to another grand finals once more. You got some more work to do, though. What are you guys going to do now to get ready for the next one? Choke some medicine, sleep uh -huh. uh, before the next game. Okay, well, that's uh, fantastic. Well, I hope you have a wonderful time. Ladies and gentlemen, can we give it up one more time for this demon who had complete gremlin mode in that series. <laughs> Thank you. You Thank feeling you. gremlin yourself? Yeah. All right. Can we see the gremlin thing? I, I watched the stream. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I have to chill. Okay, okay, go chillin'. Thank you so much, my friend. It was a pleasure <laughs> seeing you. Thank you. We'll throw it back to you guys. Thank you so much, Slag. Well, Roger, maybe that's why we saw uh, Game of Gladys walking on with a little less body confidence than they normally do. Dorachi was just a bit sick, and so the energy levels were conservative. They were a little bit lower there, Aoi. Yeah, honestly, I think when you look at that team, I think Dorachi is the one that keeps the team's spirits up. So it makes a lot of sense if he was feeling a bit off that mm -hmm. they weren't in their best like mental form. But honestly, they still performed anyways. I think that sort of speaks to the resilience of the team. Yeah, it was very impressive. And now it'll be a trial of endurance, right? Because they're going to play the last series of the day, and one of their players is sick. So I, I hope they can find this time to recuperate. Well, I just want to say that no team that has ever won a TI has one TI starting from the lower bracket. Very first round. So if Game and Gladiators actually pull this off until the very end, if they manage to get a TI win here, they will have made Dota history in a way that no other team has. Like, not a single team starting from lower bracket mm -hmm. from playoffs has made it this far. It's super impressive, the fact that they're even able to make it to top four, but at the end of the day, we don't have a top four, we have a top three, so they will be playing again, they're in that fourth series, and it could be up against uh, either Azure or Bet Boom. but if you have this long of a break, Rezo, I asked you what position you'd rather be in, that first series or that second series. You said second series, so if you are in the first series playing up, I, would you do the same thing? Go for a nap? Try and reset? Let the draft thing happen to your coach? I mean, for, for the right show especially, I think it's the best thing he can do right now because he needs to gather all the energy he has and like re get ready for the next series. So taking medicine and taking a nap, it's, uh, it's an amazing approach, honestly. Oh. I want to build up uh, Team Liquid a little bit more. It is the final time that we're going to be seeing them. We're not going to do all the talking, though. We do have an exit interview. Tsunami is joined with one of the players. Thank you very much. Yes, I am standing by with Zai, who I think you've got to be probably the most successful player that I have to do with this with so frequently. On any outsider's perspective, you have had an incredible year. Obviously, it didn't end in any championships, but like the consistency and the heights that you reached, most people would kill for. But I know you're a championship-minded guy, so how's your year been for you? I mean, agreed, yeah. Like, uh, performance-wise, it's, it's been pretty good. Uh, obviously not winning anything per se, but consistently performing and, and doing good. And I think 
you know, looking back, top six at TI uh, in this one is like it's not the worst of, of performances. But of course, we would have uh, we would have liked to do more uh, even in this one. The road ends here, but your entire journey, I mean, like top six here, you've had a lot of many podium finishes at TI. This is your mainstay. You're an icon here. So what's going to be your takeaway for, I guess, uh, this whole competition season? I mean, I've definitely done, I've done better and I've done worse, you know? So this is kind of banging on the middle, which is fine. Uh, you know, it's, I think the saddest part is maybe that this third game, we, we kind of we kind of shut the bed and didn't really perform as we would have wanted. I think game two, we could have could have done much better, but uh, you know, life goes on. Life goes on. And I, I know that going out into the crowd, there are a lot of Liquid fans, but there are also specifically a lot of Zai fans. Is there anything that you'd like to say to them who are out there in the crowd or at home or anywhere in the world? Well, actually, after this game, William kind of looked at me and told me I had to go after that center performance. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think I'll most likely uh, I'll follow his lead. Uh, and probably this, is, this might have been my last TA. Uh, remains to see a little bit. But I think I'm uh, going to take a little, little break uh, and see what's up. And uh, what that means for me, I'm not quite sure. But uh, 1 in 11 or 1 in 10 center doesn't cut it. Maybe not in terms of gameplay, but Zai, you're an icon. Everyone has been enjoying watching your gameplay from the beginning. I remember seeing, watching you quit competitive briefly to go back to school, coming back right on top right after that. It's been incredible to watch your journey throughout this, and best of luck with whatever happens in the future. Back to the panel. Thank you so much, Tsunami. What a, a little bit of a roller coaster of an exit interview that one was. There's I saying that he's probably going to take a break from competitive Dota for a little while. And it's not just the journey of this year that has been impeccable for himself. It's sad to go out on a uh, 1 in 11 central performance, but there's years of amazing performances from him. So uh, just as amazing exit interview from him. Any quick words, Aoi, if he's still listening for, for Zai and your other fallen comrades here at TI12? No, I love Zai. I remember watching him like TI4, he'll play some support Wraith King. I think he's always been someone that everyone watches to learn from. And, you know, it's going to be sad to see him. I don't know if he's done, he's yep. going to retire, he's going to get a break, but the scene's obviously less without him. It's going to be tough, whatever happens for him, but he's not here in TI-12 anymore. Gaming Gladiators will be progressing. They get that 2-1, and they're going to wait for their opponent. It's either going to be Azurae or Bet Boom, which is our upcoming series. So let's start talking about it. Azurae, this team right here. Effie, I know you love the China region. Come on, now let's let's have a little bit of a hype about these five players and their coach. Dude, watching Azurae play at TI is so exciting because it, it just kind of came out of nowhere. There was no build-up throughout the year where you're like, oh, they're going to have their journey, and they're going to grind, and they're going to get to TI. No, there, there were just a bunch of, you know, retired players watching street, watching games together on their stream. They were like, hey, we kind of like this patch. Should we make a team? And then they made a team, qualified for Bali, and here they are at TI with just a few months under their belt. But, Khan, these are legends. Are you kidding no. me? This is, this is the old LGD roster. This is the LGD roster that dominated, dominated TI7 and dominated TI8. Like, these players are namesakes, not just in the Chinese Dota community, but the Dota community overall. I mean, if you, if you grew up on Dota, you yeah. know who Somnus is, you know who Chalice is, you know who FY is. Come on, they're in so many montages. I mean, this team is exciting. They are, and they're coming up against Beboom, which in the Eastern European region, Rezo is seen as this uh, sort of powerhouse. They were that team that came together after TI-11 that everyone thought would just clean sweep a lot of events. Yeah, it's a team of five stars, I would say, and like they had a lot of ex expectations on them during the season, but they didn't manage to perform well. I mean, I was part of the reason they were not performing well <laughs> because I was there standing a few times. <laughs> but overall, overall, uh, I think they managed to deal with stress way better on this tournament specifically, and the, they're showing it. Like they managed to like win 90, 90, uh, you know, 90 minute games, and they were looking confident in those games. Like they're always finding those little pickoffs, those little moments where they can, you know, turn the game around into. Their their favor and they're really good at team fighting same as Azure like those two teams are like super super insane at like how they're casting spells especially like GPK and Walker you see this guy performing like sterling like every game and he's barely making any mistakes it's a bit of a tough question to answer Aoi but which team do you think has progressed the most in the past month in our road to TI Bet Boom or, or Azure and who's going to show up today 
I think Azure Ray came in, like, I really liked the progression through the qualifiers. I watched a lot of games, especially their series versus Extreme, and I learned a lot from them. But I think BetBoom, they've made a lot of progress mentally, which I think has always been the weak side of the team. I'm really excited for the series because I think it's like sort of a clash of identities. I think Azure Ray's post lane is really good, and BetBoom are a really strong laning team. So we see how those two mix. It's going to be a lot between these two teams. See the growth, especially for Bet Boom. They've been coined as a team that has struggled when it comes to LAN, a team that has struggled in late game to remain patient. And it's time, though, to see how they go for the second time on the main stage as we do welcome Bet Boom to the stage. run they've had to face so many different opponents to make it to main stage and then they showed up yesterday and they were able to keep progressing they've made it to top six but they're not happy with just top six they want to make it all the way and the team that is standing in their path in their way right now is Azare. so let's welcome them Pressure, a pressure of being on main stage and in an elimination match. Well, I'm sure these players are very familiar with the pressure because they played for such a long time already and they showed like insane performances during the past years. And uh, I mean, my theory still stands because the game, Gaming Gladiators, they went from the lower bracket, they had three series before and they managed to take down the Liquid. So right now, to me, Bad Boom seems like the team that, you know, coming from three series already from the lower bracket, they have more experience and they're coming here more confident than Azure Ray dropping from the upper bracket. Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see that angle. But Boom have just been on this huge momentum grind. They've gained so much confidence. I, I really feel like Bedroom conquered their demons uh, that day that they beat Talon in such a spectacular fashion because that series was so close. But ever since then, they've felt confident, they've felt secure in their identity, and they've just been playing so well. Azure Ray, on the other hand, I think this is an incredibly high-skilled team. Their series versus LGD yesterday, if they had time, could have taught them a lot because Something Aoi said is they're a very strong post-laning team, which they are. They're excellent at spellcasting. They're excellent at looking for fights. But in that series versus LGD, they were also a strong laning team. In both of those games, they came out of lanes with a net worth lead. They completely dominated that early game. And they took a few bad fights. They made a few miscalculations where they threw their leads away. So if they had time to sit down, reset, prepare, and learn from those mistakes, then we're going to see a stronger version of Azure Ray today. How far back would you go, Aoi, in prepping for this series against Betbim? Because Azure and Betbim were in the same groups when, uh, two weeks ago, right? Meta has changed quite a lot. Playstyles may be only a little bit. So how much reflection would you take from your Betbim series that you had as Azure compared to your LGD series, which only happened yesterday? I mean, I think you have to include as much of both as you can. But the thing about when you play these teams from other regions, like you don't know that much about them. Like you watch the replays, but you don't get a feel for them until you actually play against each other. I think the last time they played, like generally, I think right now the Chinese region, the reason why it hasn't like been winning tournaments as it used to is their laning phase is usually weaker, especially compared to the European and uh, Eastern European teams. 
So I think this game, if they come in with a game plan from their last uh, matchup against them, and they're thinking about, oh, how can we nullify their lanes? How we can we get to, to the point where FY is combining to gank our safe and stuff like this, they'll have a good shot at the series. Would you say the lane weakness is coming from a drafting perspective or an execution perspective? I think it's like a, sort of a bit of a product of like gaming gladiators. Like if you don't have strong side lanes versus team, if you don't contest every single CS, then they're going to snowball the game off that. Um, the Chinese region didn't get to play some of the DPCs in the last, uh, like during the COVID era, and then um, they don't get to match up against these European teams as much. So it makes them less focused on this and more focused on getting more like uh, positive heroes for like rotations. Like I see, I find some cl um, clockwork, the five on invoker stuff like this, and combining. But if you lose your lanes, oftentimes you can't make these moves. It also seems to me that uh, even if you have a good draft, like in terms of uh, team fighting, right, you have like good heroes with it. Like even you lose lanes, the items matter like so much that you're not like even able to get to that team fight. You're just getting like constantly pressured and there's no like, there's no coming back. So the lanes are super important in this series, like overall in this, in this tournament. Yeah, and also I have to reiterate, I don't think their laning is bad. I mean, yesterday they showed me really, really strong laning, and they looked different from when I watched them in the qualifiers, and I feel like they have evolved throughout this game. It felt like a lot of their mistakes, at least in the last series, I can't recall their the last time they met up with Batboom because it feels like so long ago, but there were execution issues when they were looking for those fights, when they were coordinating those smokes. And some of their drafts may have come off as very wonky. So I hope that they've come up with a different plan. Based on what we saw yesterday versus Vetboom, I do feel like the easiest way to approach any kind of draft versus Vetboom is shut down Pure. Take away Pure's hero pool. Don't make that offlane snowball. Don't give him those initiate initiator heroes like the Centaur or the Spirit Breaker. And the game changes. Yeah, that was the big uh, contributing factor to game number two between Beth Boom, Virtus Pro, that's the one you're referencing there. We do have a graphic on our screen, so some more stats, some more numbers for you, Owie, of uh, average Roshan kills per game. Beth Boom in the lead there. And Beth Boom has played like three, like a thousand minute games, so I guess <laughs> they, they can kill a lot of Roshans in that, those games. I think it's uh, also talks a little bit about Beth Boom's stylistic approach to the game. Like, they're very, like, we want to play ideally, make no mistakes. If there's, like, a 99% chance we'll win, we'll even take the 100 away from the next Roshan. Honestly, I think that's not bad for Azure Ray, because I think there's, like, a pretty high chance that Azure Ray will out-team fight them as the game gets later. Like, I actually think the later the game goes, the more it favors the Chinese team. Wow, so you think the safe approach of Bet Boom is not going to be able to withstand the team fighting of Azure Ray? Like, Azure Ray's weakness is if a team is chaotic and very aggressive. I personally think so. I just okay. think, like, stylistically, like, Bet Boom want to snowball the series while having, like, a win condition still and then, like, play safe from there. And then if Azure Ray can reach, like, a point in the mid game where they feel comfortable in fights, then they're going to be really happy. Would you also agree, Effie? I know that you're uh, <laughs> the inside outs of Azure Ray. They have 600 pings a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Oh They've actually That's just cool secretly stat. got each other muted so they can't hear the voice chat, and it's all just pings. <laughs> I, I bet at least. 40% of those come from GPK, they just have to. No, but I, I absolutely agree with uh, what Curtis said. If Betboom are going to take the really safe route this game and go for these ultra late game win conditions, play for every single Roshan perfectly, then they're going to give a lot of space to Azure Ray that have a lot of strengths in picking and choosing their fights. Like, if you've watched LGD or Azure Ray, you know that their strength is fighting around objectives, setting up around Roshans, you know, setting up to invade triangles or take stacks. This is where they do excel, so I think Betboom should try to play a more aggressive type of lineup. I like the Centaur a lot for Pure. I say it again and again and again. But if you can take away Pure, who is their playmaker, if you can limit his hero pool, then you have GPK and Nightfall, who are safer, more slower paced players. And it makes it so that Azure Ray can play at their own speed. You know, I'm just throwing this one out there while we are waiting for the lobby, while we're waiting for the draft. How do you feel about Night Stalker? It came up in a couple games yesterday. I feel like this is something that could be really good for Bet Boom. They've played it, played it before in, in many other tournaments, and it just kind of makes sense with the style of Nightfall and uh, and Pure as one and three on this. Yeah, I think that here is really great for them because they can flex it on one and three. They mostly played it one before on a uh, Nightfall, and I think it fits like the the way that uh, like how aggressive they want to play as a team. And you know, this hero provides you a lot of vision. And it's like I, I like to see in the drafts like this little broken mechanics, right? Because Night nice you use ulti, you see, you know, every team. Uh, and uh, for example, like last series, Azure played against LGD. LGD had like this Magnus Muerta, and even though they had Bristol back, 
they always changed the position in a way where this Bristol was isolated from the team. So I, I want to look uh, towards like more of that, like you know, this broken little gimmicks. Like I'm, I'm sure uh, Curtis likes to explore that in in your draft too, right? Like when when they played against you, like you had this Naga, you like it was a patch of like summons, and you exploited re really well. And like I think for this for this specific tournament, there's also like things like this. Yeah, I think just in general, I agree with your read on uh, Night Soccer for Bat Boom because I feel like that team will function the best when they have the most information with the least chaos. And Night Soccer is a hero that does that. I think maybe one thing that they can plan for that they did in a group stage was they would play the Night Soccer versus the Brewmaster offline. I think Brewmaster is a hero that um, both the Chinese teams really like. They play really well. And we saw. Um, sorry, I think LGD's Brewmaster was actually the one that was like, I don't know, like some 20 minute Radiance AC. But I've seen Chalice like sort of have. So yeah. Sort of similar, sorry. Yeah. Sort of have a similar like impact on this hero. So if they bait that out on Bat Boom and you come in like planning to counter a really uh, so-called Imba hero, I think they could look good in the draft. We'll keep our eyes peeled. We'll see if that Night Stalker potentially comes up. As I do know, we have draft ready. Azure Ray versus Bat Boom T. Game one. Bat Boom. Let's see, <laughs> I got so distracted, someone in the crowd just shouting out Ben Bristle. Apparently everyone wants to have a go at Coach here, whether it's the Bet Boom or Azure. We're also putting some ideas out there of what we want to see them pick up, what we want to see them ban out. And I don't think it'll sway too much from Ben's that we saw in our first series. Do you feel, Owie? Um, I think there'll be, be a bit more targeted bans. Like you already see from Bet Boom that they want to get rid of the Nature's Prophet. I think Nature's Prophet is one of the heroes that it's sort of like a wild card in lane. Sometimes you can sway lanes that are completely supposed to be in your favor. One TP and all of a sudden the laning stage will break down. It's a bit chaotic and you can't focus on what you want to do. Centaur being taken out. Uh, Effie, I know how much you wanted that one for Puro and Ben Boom. Yeah. Azure did their research. They know what you know and they aren't going to let him have it. it. It just really feels like with Bed Boom, they're so dependent on their offlane snowballing so that when these fights, these skirmishes break out after the laning stage is over, because Bed Boom do try to extend their laning stage quite often actually, um, when these fights break out, they have Hero who's already pressured that offlane tower, who's got that early blink dagger, he's enabling these fights, he's letting them go in and out. But when we see that Pure has that bad game, when he's playing Spirit Breaker, which is still a great hero that they won with yesterday, but he gets shut down in lane, all of a sudden, Bed Boom have to slow down their entire pace. Nightfall doesn't have space in the map, and GPK tends to play greedier mid laners, right? They've been playing a lot of Coddle plus Storm. They've been playing a lot of Invoker on Bed Boom. These aren't the type of mid heroes that rotate to these side lanes the way we see Earth Spirit or Earth Shaker or Pangolier. Ali, with the change to the drafting pick order, how much is a first pick, well, when you're second pick, right? Uh, how much of it is a reaction to what your enemy picks as their first pick? Or how much is it, hey, we came in with this idea, this is what we're going to kind of first pick no matter what? I think you sort of prepare for both scenarios. Like you see like, oh, if they leave center in the pool, then we need to make sure we ban these two heroes. So they have to do like one ban into center. The drafting phase is a bit different now just because there's so many like banned into picks. Like here they get to ban the Morta, which we saw from gaming a lot into the Pugna, which you saw from Liquid a lot. So maybe they're watching the last series, they're like, oh, the Mortal's a problem for this Pugna. Otherwise, we think that, oh, CK was in the pool. And Spirit Break is also in the pool. I was wondering if they were going to go for this one or, or CK. I mean, they, CK is one of the broken heroes. They can right do a now, CK right? into Spirit Breaker even, right? Like, I feel like in this setup, Azure is sort of forced to, like, ban, use one of their bans on Spirit Breaker. But honestly, they might be thinking that we can give the Spirit Breaker just because a hero is, like, more susceptible in lane. We don't care about the scale as much. We feel like we're going to be able to fight into it. Maybe if it gives Bat Boom a weak lane, this gives us a higher chance of winning. You know, Dazzle is also in the pool. Just yep. uh, throwing out all the meta heroes, <laughs> nothing of value. <laughs> Kunka might be a good band for Bad Boon too, just because it's uh, it's annoying to play as a as a Lucian and CK like with the, all the torrents happening in the fights. Yeah, Kunka looks like a great hero for them. I agree. Um, I would like to see something to address this CK. And historically, the heroes that do best against CK are these heroes that have this uh, ability to out damage him throughout the game and kill his illusions. Like we've seen Medusas in the past. We see Lunas who have good lanes and can snowball with their team. They can deal with CK very nicely up until it gets to the late game point. So I wonder if Azure are going to go for the route where they address CK carry to carry or if they're just going to try to shut him down through their offlane. The thing is though, Bat Boom actually flexes CK. Pure has a lot of games on CK and pubs. Honestly, I can't remember how many officials he played on if he did, but 
I played versus offline CK and like, I don't know, he's just carrying the game. He, so I think that might be something that Bedroom look at, especially versus a Pugna 5, if they end up doing it. CK is one of the heroes that can sustain versus that hero and provide kill threat, which is what you want for some support Pugna. Yeah, I personally love the CK offlane as well. Like when I was playing, I was I was loving this hero on the on the on position three. Uh, also, one of Chalice's most played offlaners is the Dawnbreaker, which I feel like CK does incredibly well against. So it kind of block picks one of the strategies that Azure are used to playing with, having that global presence from their offlane early on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, they know how much the audience is loving this techies pick right now. I'm actually thinking they did it for the audience. <laughs> we're like, they might won. have. We're here for the content. Who was it that was saying it's all about the content? Wasn't it uh, Toronto Tokyo? That was him. Saying? Saying longer games, yeah, more longer content. Yeah, longer games, more content. Techies pick, more content. For sure. I gotta say, Techies, it's not the same. You don't get the, the content games. Three hours long, <laughs> the map is exploding. But, you know, the hero is one of Safe's classic heroes. It's one of these heroes that I think Matt Boom, they feel like if we pick one of these fours, no matter what we have as three, we're going to pressure the lane. What do you guys think about Terrorblade as a, as a good pick against CK? I is think CK's favorite work? was Terrorblade. I think Terrorblade struggles when you have to deal with illusions because you're very, like, single target focused. You don't have any AoE. Mm -hmm. But I think you do have, like, you do have some timing. Like, if you start getting to these really tanky items, the CK can lack damage for you. What about the Tusk pick? We haven't uh, talked too much about that one. Just most likely hit the two supports coming out as the first picks for Azure. The nice thing about Tusk is he sets up for potentially a ranged safe laner, which is what we talked about when there are ways to address the CK. Like you potentially look at this Luna, Tusk makes it easier for her to do her job. I mean, Tusk is just a very high value here right now because he, oh no, they went for the Dawn still. I think um, the matchup for CK and Dawn changed it actually because I was talking to some carry players on CK, like what actually lanes for this hero. And Dawn is one of the only ones that you can sort of fight through and sustain, like you have enough damage. And then later on, when you use your Q on the illusions, you actually full heal your team. So I think they might have some angle with it where they feel like if they draft a strong enough lane, which you probably have with the Tusker Dawn, that you can actually fight against the CK lane. And is he... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I just think that's very interesting because when Saberlight was on the panel the other day, he thought that it was a really terrible matchup for Dawn to play against the CK, but you are right. When you have this Tusk, if you have this kill threat, if you can isolate a support, it changes things. Reza? Yeah, I mean, as you can see, they have like three uh, three heroes that are already like kind of saving from the initiation on the bed boom. So they have like Pugna, they have Tusk to save, they have even Dawn Breaker to reinitiate. And uh, at this point, like bed boom, they they need to figure out like how to start fights and like you know kite the enemies because they're they're gonna be saved. Like you know, I do like this approach for them with the Phoenix. Though one of the counters it saves is there's like sort of two ways you can go about it. Either you can have like a lot of long range poke, so you're not committed to the saves, or you can have overwhelming team fight where even though they save them, it doesn't matter. You're saving into some. I think that's what they're going for. Even with the techies, you know, it's very easy to do a lot of damage, so you force out the save, and then there's a Phoenix egg there. Like, are you going to save it and take a fight? You decrypt it, so on. But beside the egg, they're still going to die. For sure. I love these high damage supports. Like, I think it's way easier to play when you're aggressive, and, uh, and it's up to enemies to, like, make mistakes when they're defending, you know, because there's too much pressure. And at the same time, like, uh, Azure lineup doesn't really have that much of an initiation right now. They need to figure out, like, how to get it from the next two, two heroes. I really like the idea of taking the Kunkka for Batboom, because you guys were talking about taking the Kunkka for Azure, and I think it sort of prevents them from getting against that CK. As you guys said, obviously, really good against the CK, stuns all your illusions. And something else is, I think it's a pretty good flex for them. I think one of the things about, um, second pick in this uh sorry this draft setup is that if you don't have a flex for your last your second core it sometimes gets really awkward like imagine they couldn't flex this kunkka as they slam down the monkey king he goes mid versus him he'd have one guaranteed lane it's like very simple for them to play but instead now this kunkka like you don't know where it's going it's always gonna have impact as soon as it gets eggs i think it's a good pick yeah, and we saw, the, we saw that happen actually the other day when the Kunkka got picked on the 17 but was flexed to offlane when the Monkey King chased him mid. But then they had the issue where the Monkey King followed him to the offlane too. But I don't think that Azure are in a position to do that here simply because if they pick something like a Monkey King to punish Kunkka on the offlane, they're playing into a CK carry. It's not a good matchup. 
I'm still waiting for some unique heroes. Like I already mentioned in the previous game, that uh, you know, to counterpick this Necrophos, you might, you know, find something like Arc Warden. We were talking about it before, right, Curtis? Yeah, I think uh, Kiyotaka, he played a lot of Arc Warden pubs and he was like ready to bust it out, but it never ended up happening. I think I really like like pretty much any range here over Snekro because the melees tend to be hard, but I think like some Pugna does okay, Volker does okay, like Lina does really well, but then you have a Lina who's... Honestly, I feel like GBK might pick Lina. Like, we'll see what the last pick is. Right now, Azure Raid, they're gonna pick two lanes that are good versus Kunkka. They're gonna pick another uh, carry that's strong versus it. And then you don't know, like, even though you're flexing it with Batboom, you don't have a good lane for it to go into. I'm surprised Viewer is still untouched. It might be a good pick for the Azure Raid on the last. I could see that. I think it's a pretty good lane versus Kunkka. Kunkka's sort of like on the offline. He, he doesn't actually have any spells. But you want to go up and splash away, so you can play really aggressive on him from an early point in the lane. He can sort of start snowballing, where he's the one who needs to start cleaving out the creeds to burn your regen in order to win the lane. But if he never gets that chance, then, you know, the hero is sort of useless. And the Lincoln sounds like a really good pickup for him as well, this game. Like, if you get Lincolns, you're kind of untouchable already. Yeah, they actually have nothing to catch him. Like, you'll be going off one techie's... Uh jump yeah and you just like have to That's hope it. that you i don't know you can't even chain torrent on on a weaver i think you have to press the torrent before you jump even i want to point out that there's nothing to address the phoenix yet i mean even though necro is a strong pick here this egg can do so much in a fight and i feel like the carry has to be something to solve it either the weaver or the bkv or even a troll warlord could be good here because i feel like trolls got a pretty good matchup versus ck as the game progresses even though the hero fell off I could, I definitely agree with your point about Phoenix. I think they need something to address it. Ooh. I mean, that like this pick? I'm, uh, I'm not a big fan. I don't of think it addresses like Phoenix. I don't think you hit fast enough. Oh, and the Templar assassin. Yeah. I love the bed boom draft. Uh, I feel like I think it's superior. I feel like I don't even know if Lysia is going to do that well in Kunkka and Lane. Like I think that's really dependent on skill, and I think it can swing both ways. But I'm really confident in bed boom's laning right now. I think this TA pick is near perfect. Now they have a way to deal with this last pick lifestealer. Um, none of the heroes on the side of Azur Ray deal with her very well. She's gonna have a strong lane. She's gonna be able to farm undisturbed because the playmaking from Azur Ray comes out of winning lanes and it feels like Batboom have strong lanes drafted for themselves. What about yourself, Rezo? I, I agree. I think they're gonna win two to three lanes on the boom, boom this uh, this game, and uh, I think their draft is like just way more solid. I like they, their supports have more damage. They're winning lanes, and I feel like they have better team fight, right? Yes. Like usually it's yes. one or the other, and I f like I mean it's not like Azure has no angles, but honestly, I I'm curious to see what they want to go for in this game. I feel like you uh, took the question out of my mouth because I was like, we talked about how much Azurei might have to start leaning on lanes. You don't really like that lane. So even team fight, late scaling, that's still none of it in favor of Azurei? Unless they're going to perform and like save everybody with all of their saves that they have like insanely well in the team fights. I don't really see like a lot of opportunities for I, them. For this I think game. if Chalice snowballs, like this is their best chance. Like if he starts having a good lane, he they can actually sort of run out of damage versus Dawnbreaker heals like if they're far enough ahead, but honestly, I'm not too sure. Like, I just don't know enough. Like, the Chinese teams play a very different meta. I don't know enough about their heroes to say, like, what they think their win condition is this game. And the way that Tiles plays this Dawnbreaker is he tries to play around Somnus after he wins the lane, or maybe just get for kills on the side lanes, and they, they play to Snowball just by running heroes in. They don't necessarily look for initiations. They just have a strong hero that kind of absorbs the enemy pressure, and they react to it, which is what they're doing with this Necro here. But I feel like TA has a free game. All right, you guys have convinced me Bet Boom have the stronger draft. Let's see if their coach also agrees. He's joined by Slacks. Thank you so much, everybody. I am here, of course, with Maelstrom again. And Volk, welcome back, my friend, to the stage on Bet Boom. Finally, an interesting draft. That is what I'm talking about. Very exciting. Uh, what do you think about that last pick, Life Stealer? Очень крутой драфт, наконец-то интересный. Что ты скажешь по поводу Life Pick Life Stealer у ваших оппонентов? Хороший герой. Молодцы, что выбрали его. Well, it's good hero and it's good for them. All right, last time that you faced off against this team, it was uh, not at your full power. You guys super confident now that you got the whole squad. Are you feeling confident after that draft that this will be easy? Вы в последний раз, когда с ними играли, у вас была неполная сила. Ну, если ты понимаешь, о чем я. Но сейчас вы в полном составе. Насколько уверены в себе? Последний раз мы играли на этом турнире в группе. Но если вспоминать про Бали, то Мы хотим их выиграть так же, как и любую другую команду. Well, the last time actually I was uh, here uh, during the group stage, but of course we want to win as uh, against uh, every team. 
All right, well, we will see if you will win. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our techies to the main stage of TI as we draw into our casters. Thank you so much, Slacks. Always excited about the worst of things sometimes, but we're granted with uh, one of the better things. Gunner Hello. joining us here on the broadcast. Trent, we, yeah. uh, we're always excited to have him. Yes, we always want Gunner here. He did a little too well this year, and so it took a <laughs> while to actually get him on the stage. Thank now. you for joining us, Gunner. Yeah. Yes. Happy to be here for a Techies game. I'm actually really excited with this Techies. Uh, I think Save is probably the best Techies in the world. I would say is the best Techies, but Fair. you know, Sir Action Slacks is up there. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> be respectful. Oh, uh, no. But there's really cool interactions with Techies. Uh, the W now does a dispel, and right. you can click it at any time, like Inkswell with Grimstroke. So you can purge the Decarpify, you can purge the Necro Ghost Shroud. So there's actually... Uh, I think pretty Saves, good, Gunner. Saves one of the few guys who probably knows this, because it doesn't even say in the ability, I think, so... I'm Dilly, looking Dilly, forward Dilly. to how they kind of use that in this game. Hidden techies tech here. That's good. I'm Coming mean, out on the main stage. If there's any hero to be, like, sort of... Uh, subterfuge and sneaky and that mm. type of stuff. It has to be techie, surely, uh, as we get into this game number one. And again, uh, playing at this point for top four, Bet Boom, Azure Ray, what are they going to be able to do and pull out in this one? Uh, in terms of the draft analysis, uh, you two were talking a decent amount during it. Were you just kind of on the same page as the panel, feeling that uh, it was Bet Boom that were coming out on top? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. They have Phoenix. I, I think they Phoenix do have Phoenix. Very, we talked a lot about Phoenix today. Yeah, very strong hero. They have two strength cores, and they're against two two also strength cores, which I think Phoenix kind of always wins with the more strength cores are in the game. So it kind of worries me how they're going to deal with this hero. Yeah, and then, of course, at the end of the draft, you immediately point the screen and said, Templar Assassin. And then she just appeared out of thin air, you know, as she, as she does from her meld. Why, why did you like the TA so much here? It's one of the better lanes versus Necro. I think the hero has been really scary. Quinn's been tearing it up every game on the hero. Even with the Invoker kind of pick in the last series, it was still really good for him. And I think it's one of the better matchups for his life series as well, because you actually have the ability to man fight him. Mm. It so it's, I think it's just overall good for their draft. And they also, both of their cores in the side lanes have abilities to start fights. They have catch with the Kunkka and the CK, so it's not really like you're going to feel bad that your mid is just a AFK farming carry. Well, that's true. We don't get a lot of those anymore. You know, the, the mids tend to be pretty active, so. Be nice to get it. And then TA, of course, does have a little bit of playmaking once you get to the shard, which yep. is looking great this game, by the way. That silence is uh, kind of nasty here. And the new build is now pretty much just Dragonlance into shard or blink shard. You don't even go this like Dessa Rush, like the old school or anything like that. So it's uh, more of a team fight hero. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if anything, a pick off team fight kind of gives you a lot of vision with the traps. So I'll be interested to see how much they focus on stacking and kind of playing around the map for them. Uh, the crowd very happy to get this game underway as it looks like the trade off of bounty runs actually that boom able to sneak away three of them there just a little bit too quick to get there for Tommy could get into position but we'll take a beating from the pug that got the little green man is everywhere he, he's been looking pretty freaking solid <laughs> yeah i think his value's gone up right i think he was in every game this morning right so well, now he's yep. now fourth game straight here that pug is going to be on the main stage Always supporting everybody here with these decreps here, but like uh, Gunner mentioned, has the option here of the techies to try and deal with it. Uh, but another hero we saw quite a bit earlier was that Tusk, and of course, it's yep. FY. It's the Tusk King. The Tusk King. You don't pick Axe versus this guy, so thankfully, Bet Boom, no Axe this game, but mm, smart. it's still a really good Tusk game. I think this hero provides something that a lot of supports kind of lack in this meta, which is a lot of damage. There's oh. so much HP and Nightfall. Oh my god, he's taking a beating down there. I mean, this is another one of those combinations that we've seen a lot of times is that Tusk Dawnbreaker and trying to deal with, uh, I think it was Aoyo was talking about, the amount of damage. CK can't actually last through it, unlike a lot of other combinations. I feel like if you want to take any duo right now into your pubs after watching like some pro Dota, it's this duo. I feel like yeah. Dawn Tusk is just super fun and very active through the mid game and just completely crushes in those first couple levels. Yeah, I think it's probably the best blind offlane duo before picking. It's kind of like usually a combination of Centaur plus one or Dawn Tusk. And I think I prefer the Dawn Tusk because it provides so much just different things. It provides save, BKB stuns, just anything that you can ask for, Tusk will kind of provide in the draft. And that's limited supply these days, those BKB piercing stuns. So Tusk having that is really important. Then, of course, the kick late game. And we, we're going late game a lot. So it's nice to have a really good Aghanim Scepter. You're not wrong. I mean, that has sort of been the thing that we were joking about, too, is, you know, I, I feel like at the start of every game we're backstage and watching, I'm just like, is this going to go late, too? And the answer tends to be yes. This time around, though, in this particular matchup, um, you know, the Lifestealer is one that I feel like we haven't seen a ton of. Uh, and I'm curious what his role is going to be. The best plays later on both for saves as well as for maybe trying to move around the map effectively uh, could be something to watch for. Yeah, the important thing when you pick Lifestealer is making sure that 
The most important part about the game for the hero is never being kicked out of the safe lane. So either Bet is pretty much going to try to either force all their heroes to go bot, maybe even the Chaos Knight will end up rotating there to kick him out. Because if you let him sit there for too long and he farms a Radiance as it's like the normal build on the end of Radiance. Nightfall. It's a back out. Should be fine though. But yeah, Radiance everywhere. It's yeah. For him. And the Necro, I was, that was kind of the build at the start. I think it was like the Radiance Necro just do a lot of damage in AoE, but people move towards more of a heart Agus build for the passive damage. Yeah. I mean, you can see that even a CK can be pressured by this dual lane, but once the, the hits come out here and the life steals there, you also see why CK is so powerful right now, because he's one of the few heroes that actually withstand this pressure right now. He also builds heart. Yeah, yeah. Very good, good item. item this patch. And he also does have the physical damage to kill these heart heroes. So he kind of checks all the boxes that you need from a carry. And when you pick it into lanes versus, like, you know, the Dawn Tusk, it's really nice to have a carry that can sit there and be happy. They don't have a lot to deal with the illusions this game either, it feels like. You know? There's not some, like, big AoE control or something. As long as they're getting the, this disabled, like, this uh, dispel, rather, onto the, the Necrophos and the Pugna. It looks pretty good. You know, just in terms of mentality for these two teams, I kind of feel like both of them just have so much confidence coming into this matchup. Uh, both of them, you know, have at various stages been, like, one of the tops in the region. Obviously, Bet Boom can competing with that with Spirit, but the, the potential is there at the very least. Um, and I, I feel like this might be one of those where we're seeing the laning stage really even. I don't even know if they're going to try it. Do you think they need to like mix anything up at any point, or is it just going to be kind of a farm fest through the early goings here? Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, right. what you feel, I think this will be a slower game. Uh, both drafts kind of, their safe laners want to sit in their lane. Both mids want to sit in the mid lane, so there's not really going to be much rotating. I think the biggest thing will be whether save goes to the safe lane or the Phoenix comes to bot, kind of this bot pressure to kick the lifestyle out. But outside of that, there's not really much that either team is, both teams pick their drafts with the idea that they're going to win the game at some point. Okay. And to not stress. And these lanes feel... Oh, oh. Dominic and lower, he dies to the techie's cure. Manages to get the TP out, understanding what was going on right there. So that is first blood. A little bit late at four minutes. But we'll see if they can uh, make another one happen here in a bit. Yeah, it took a while for that one to finally come out here. And uh, everyone's staying, as you were saying, very stable in these lanes and not offering a, a lot of opportunities for those earlier stacks. I feel like leaning up into TI, so much of the game was about stacks. Yeah. And just like trying to control these Ancients, trying to get extra XP for your support players, especially through that. And as you know, we'd started the road to the International, now TI itself, the stacks just feel like kind of ignored in the early game. Oh yeah. Well, there is that rotation, at least from the side of Azure Ray, as they come top and try and mess with things a little bit. It is going to be a walkover to steal away maybe a bounty rune or something. Um, yeah, Kami's just going to head back through the other side, I guess. Yeah, the nicest thing about the new map is the gate. You can kind of just rotate to the other lane as a support, see if there's a kill. If there's not a kill, you can walk away, or you can kind of sit there, and you're always off the map. You oh, doing speaking something. of which, through. Instead, wants to find Nightfall, Snowball in, a couple more hits. He's going to get away, Chalice. Needs to back out as they force some deck. FY is going to fall. Save involved in another kill on the map. That's Chases, awesome. connects, pulls him in, brings him down. 3 0 bet boom. The save the techies. Save techies. Wow, that early aggression, right? Two points into the blast off. Really nice TP. And something we haven't mentioned yet is the Phoenix versus Tusk interaction, I think, is really bad for the Tusk. All we want to do in the lane is tag team and kill, and the Fire Spirits kind of eliminates that threat. So one of the reasons why there hasn't really been a kill in the top lane has become uh, because the Phoenix, specifically. Just yeah. being able to slow the attack speed. There's not really much aggression you can do. And now this lane's, like, really stable. You can't bring heroes to it anymore, I think. And it's so hard, too. You can't, like, whittle down CK and eventually yep. get this, like, oh, he's weak, we can go for the kill. Because he just gets a single wave and he just regens to full. And now he's actually pressuring at the Lotus Pool here. They're going to get a kill on the Chalice. Looking for it, chasing, and brought down. Just like that. Well, the rotation's coming in for from FY, they want to get a bigger kill on this side. So they chase GPK, Shard's going to connect, Samus moving in, good nice snowball dodge from FY to get out of there, and the Reaper Scythe takes him down. It's a really big kill. They had the slight mid lane advantage, he got level 6 before the TA, they used the invasion to pressure, and something really important is the 6 rune control, it's such a big timing with the catapults coming out, and just getting the power rune at that time, and now the tower might even go down, which is going to hurt Bet Boom a lot. Yeah, this catapult is still just swinging here. Seven minutes. I mean, you're just trying to get a little bit of XP here as techies, and that is a lot harder without a tower. Huge. Takes it down. Seven minutes, tier one tower. Like you said, we have not seen a ton of that throughout this. I mean, sometimes when it turns oh. into a stomp. Oh, Tian Ming, though. This oh, is the price you pay. Sneaky. He's waving. See you later. And save? Actually, I think has to oh, back out. 
Okay, kind of got baited there. This is now really scary for Templar Assassin because her ancients are exposed now to any random ganks from this Pugna and the Tusk kind of grouping up together. Oh, and there's nowhere to farm. Her body block. Oh, gets across the bridge. It's, for a, a, it's a wide bridge, you know, uh, two lanes. The torrent's gonna come through. One and more hit. They bring down Yaming on that Pugna. You're a trusty. It's been a bit of a tough one for him so far. Everywhere it goes, he feels like he's dying. Zero three. Dilly, dilly, dilly. Yeah, it's a really good lane setup, I think, for Bepum. I would say they're kind of advantage in all three lanes. So they're kind of proving that in this slight network lead that they got. But this mid-rotation, I think, if anything, is saving the game for them. Uh, being able to take the tower, getting the map control. I I think the game would look very dire if they didn't make that move. Yeah, it feels like they're running out of space pretty fast. Uh, they are still struggling as well. At least, you know, Lou's just hanging out down bottom. That is good news for the life sealer, doing his thing. He's Second doing his job. Assets. He's going to yeah. sit here. Bot. He's probably not going to leave the lane until 15 minutes and just be happy sitting down here. Oh, and you can see that in the mid lane, FY continues to make these rotations, get Somnus a DD, and TA is, like you guys are talking about, very much in kind of a weird spot. So it feels like they've come up with at least a bit of the answer for the early game. I really love this tower pressure from the Pugna, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like that's something that is lacking a little bit uh, with the Pugna draft sometimes. Maybe you get into a spot where you don't feel super confident uh, moving on to the lanes if they go a little bit poorly here. But he's just, Tao Ming's just like, yeah, I, I can get in here. You know, if I die, I die. But I, I want damage on this tower. Kind of scary versus a Kunkka with both, yeah. though. The interesting dynamic right now is that Azure Ray is really comfortable sitting in all their lanes as cores. The Necro will be alone mid and be really happy. Dawn's obviously going to be top, get solo level 6, and then want to ult away from her. She doesn't want the action to come to her. And Life Seer is Life Seer. So it's kind of on Beproom right now to either say to themselves, oh, okay, we're happy trading three lanes of equal farm with each other, or make the moves themselves. Well, a bit of a move here with that ward helping out. Looking Chalice in no man's land. Slowed, but gets away. It wasn't slowed, actually. So close to that level 6, but recognizing the danger, will manage to escape. 9 XP away here. Oh, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. Walks into Toronto. Hello? Toronto, Tokyo? Spots him, maybe? Not sure if they did, yeah? Nightfall is still chasing. The illusion is there. <laughs> so they take him on a long oh. walk. Finally, only a one second stun. I mean, they're going to. The supports are coming, but they're pretty far away, you know? <laughs> it's... Well, goes for it. The blast off connects, and this is actually turning out to be a nice kill. Chalice still not getting level six online. Stun and done. It feels just so sad. You know you want this kill so bad, but you take he probably missed a full wait for that. But yeah. still really good that they force it just wastes time from everyone, so the, at the end of the day the T is still farming mid, the Kunk is still farming bot, so Wow, two seconds stun onto FY, saving that snowball. He should be okay as he went for the step back, but GPK making the move mid, finding and killing that Pugna. So seven to one. And the other thing that's weird about this is while the kills are going pretty heavily into the favor of Bedboom, towers are dropping across the map. They've lost the bottom tier one tower too. I think it's mostly on the hero matchups. Bedboom have the strong lanes and farming, whereas Azure Ray have the strong like sit there pressure and keep walking into you and you can't do anything about it because of their HP pools. And so it's not too surprising that Azure Ray is kind of leading the map advantage, but it's going to be more important to see if they can actually continue this forward because I I'm worried that if they don't continue this and they keep pressuring and the TA actually gets items into a Roshan that there could be some group of death ball like we we'll see a lot of Phoenix teams end up doing. Yeah, it feels like you want to maybe use one of these Solar Guardians at some point here soon, but then you're also kind of waiting for like level 6 on FY, so he has that big burst damage to come out and help assist with these kills. A lot of waiting. Yeah, I mean, speaking of waiting, I mean, I don't know if you guys heard when the game was starting, but there is an absolute powder keg of fans here for Azure Ray, and oh, they yeah. are just desperate to cheer for something right now. I feel like every last hit, they're all waiting on beta. Yeah, <laughs> it's 7-1 to one right now, like they're just screaming as the game starts. It's just going to take one here, you know? They want Chalice to escape, he didn't quite make it. They've been killed in all these lanes, but if you get a couple plays going for Azure Ray, they're going to hear this crowd light up. And so the surprising thing is uh, Azure Ray stole both experience, but both their subs are still not even level 6. And I think that's just because their cores are wanting to stay in their lanes themselves and not really giving this lane experience up. You so it kind of is feeling really bad for their early momentum pressure because neither support can make this rotation for the Dawn to ult. So yeah. everyone's just kind of waiting for each other. Just maybe the subs are asking for a little help here and there to get experience. And we'll see what happens when they can actually get level 6s up. It is crazy to think that they still are not 6. I imagine they didn't get the Wisdom runes, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, there's a, a real possibility of that. And still only 5.5 for FYS. He just watches Lou take the enemy Ancients. It's like, please help me. Any experience is good with that cool set that he's got with the weird, like, after image thing. That thing's gnarly. This is the scary map setup, I think, for Bepum. Now, if you lose your Ancients as the Templar Assassin team, you feel really bad. All you want to do in the hero is set up traps, stack Ancients, and clear Ancients until you hit your timing, which for him, it's going to be Blink Shard. 
He's got the blink. He skipped the dragon. That's actually too. I think he wants to be able to fight earlier because he's yeah. feeling a little weird about the map, and he can't even farm his ancients. So now he's gonna get pulled into his chaos knight, and the territory is just gonna start like slowly slipping up until Azure decides to take the tier one tower top. And they're looking to snowball too, right? With save having that spirit vessel build, so try and get involved in these kills with GPK, get across the map, and as they try and bully Lou out of here. I mean, that's crazy. He just came up and stole two of the Ancients, took the hard camp too, and like you said, this area feeling very much constricted and something that Lifestealer can definitely do. There aren't many heroes that uh, can sort of feel that comfortable walking into that area without getting punished. So seven to one, still sitting pretty, and a smoke up now comes out as level sixes, I'm assuming, are just online. Wait, yes. it's time. They're going to be twin gating it up here by the looks of it. The I like the call to make, Yeah, I like the call to make the life sealer come. Lou is going to take the gate with him as well. He wants to be involved in this fight. The Phoenix is six. He could kill it with the rage. So this might be a really nice connection for Azure. They are not even stopping for the tower. Just rolling straight through. Looking on to Chalice save. Able to connect the fight. Going weird for Bethlehem though as they realize there are people behind. Can they quite catch up to Nightfall though? Snowball, shards, well, ready in a moment. Long chase. BK showing up. They turn say, fine, we'll fight you. You want to fight? But then the Dawn will be coming through. Hits on all of them. Nightfall is going to die. There's a nice the slices coming from GPK in fast snowball. They don't have any more left. They're going to get the Reaper Scythe. Find the kill. Somnus hitting big. Lul chasing for more. They lost the Tusk, but they got the kills that matter. Oh, Great there are the Yules too for the clutch. As they run them down, Toronto, Tokyo in the dirt too. Yeah, they, oh, they, they got what they were waiting for. Finally something to cheer for here for Azure. They, they got the move. That was I, I think this was a really good timing play. They get the armlet on the life sphere. They know that there's not really a point to keep just continuing the game state and just change it up. Go take this top tower. And again, when this top tower dies, that's when it's way easier for Tusk to find kills with the Donald. It's way easier for the Pugna to pressure the tier twos kind of casually. Yeah, and FY is ready to take out his vengeance here on his cores. He's going straight for the Midas. Okay, you oh, guys just stayed in the lane the whole time. <laughs> it's Midas Tusk time. Oh, I love that. He wants the eggs. The Gotta blink ags late game type. Love that. I mean, it's interesting too, right? Because you see this moment where Azure is grouped together as four heroes, and you got to imagine there's got to be something that can come out, some big AOE spell, but a lot of them had been used. I mean, the, the ghost ship, all the rest of it, it's also a problem fighting into Lifestealer with that natural built-in uh, debuff in there. That was a great ship too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's crazy to fight everyone. someone that well. Like, the egg was pretty solid as well, but just too overwhelmed. I think the Lifeser has too much health right now for Bethlehem to chip through. The TA probably needs this other item, whether it's the Shard or the Deso, to really like do the physical damage. And the Chaos Knight is really going to be weak versus the Necro, I think, in the early game. And the Lifeser, he can't man fight at all. So yeah. Bethlehem is in this really awkward position where you feel like you have the superior team fight, you have the Kunkka, you have the Phoenix, but you can't actually take the fights when you end up getting them. It's a tough spot to be in right now, and uh, that damage is coming soon for GPK. He's about a thousand gold away from finishing up his Deso. You have Nightfall sort of retreating in the top part of the map here, farming through with the armlet and the Echo Saber, so the BKB will come relatively soon. Also, shout outs in that one to Necrophos, uh, getting the early Yule Scepter, like we were talking about. Has, also has the Death Seeker, um, was able to make sure that they could get that Phoenix kill. Not often that you see that one get taken, but a good answer for Kunkka plays, too. Yeah, the, for the, the Kunkka. too, maybe, you know? Yeah. Also, the cool thing about the shard is you can dodge the X with the shard, as long as you're kind of like flying, you're, you know, phase shifted or whatever you'll call it, while the X gets you pulled back from the Necro. So. He's, it's going to be really hard for the catch. I also think he'll probably end up buying a BKB uh, to stop himself from getting purged, to stop all the Phoenix damage, the Kunkka yeah. X. So he'll probably just get one more item, maybe the heart that is very common in Necro, and then just a BKB, and they might just try to end the game around them. Feeling pretty solid. Currently, oh, purchasing of a plate mail, actually, even to tank up a bit. Thinking about a Shiva's guard, that's a nice choice. Yeah. Very good versus uh, the TA and the CK. And save with all these early kills that he's been able to get is actually just about completed uh, the spirit vessel. So yeah. that's another one of those things that you gotta watch for uh, as the Necrophos. And to be honest, any of these heroes, there's a lot of healing on the Azure lineup. Yeah, more value for the Yules. True enough. There's also the Shiva's is going to be really good versus the Phoenix to kind of prevent the Sunray heal. So I like the Shiva's pickup. There's so much physical damage on Bet Boom that just having armor will kind of give you that threshold for the Pugna to heal you. Maybe the Tusk saves you, the Donald. They have so much different like ways to save that as long as you can make your time alive just a few seconds longer, it's good enough. Yeah, and at one point, Chalice even had an AC queued up like mega early. I was even oh, considering yeah. that as well, but then went for the uh, the blade mail into the, the eventual BKB. But another big timing here for Lou. The Radiance coming out here soon. Everything just being checked off on the list here. 
The other big one coming up, which is that Midas completed as Toronto Tokyo <laughs> is going to run into Chalice. He can't really hit that bird at all. Um, but yeah, that's going to be something that we can uh, see. A shard already done on the Phoenix, too. Um, we have seen Toronto Tokyo be willing to go for these early Midases also. This could be another option for him after the shard's done. I mean, GBK's got the blink, got the Deso. Like, do they want to try and make a play with the Techies? Does he want to wait for the shard? Can they set up for Roche at all? It looks like they're setting up for Roche. The Kunkka TPs to the outpost top, and they're kind of all around here with the Dire Roche on. And I think they need to make a play yeah. at some point. You can't constantly keep playing the game like, okay, guys, dodge, wait till the next item. Okay, guys, they're a little scary now. Let's keep waiting. You, at some point, you have to just bite the bullet and go for the fight. For now, it's kind of a light push here on the top tower, seeing if anyone jumps out of position. Maybe they can go for a quick X kill or something, but nobody takes the bait. I mean, this is really the Bet Boom Classic. We saw that match the other day against Virtus Pro. It was a similar type of story. Uh, worked out for them in that instance. We'll see if it does in this one as well. But right now, they're trying to make a go. Catch on to Chalice. Bow, egg, everything. He's done. They managed to find themselves that easy kill. Will Glyph the Tier 1 tower up top. But this timing is uh, pretty strong for Beppo. Toronto Tokyo likes to use the supports where you don't have to think about the itemization, right? Tree or Phoenix, just buy Shard, right? right? That's it. Maybe Life's good. Yeah. And Midas, yeah. Hey, if you buy Midas, you can be able to core. It yeah. was very used to being a core in the past, so it's, you know, just getting the muscle memory back. Well, save. Tries to get out. The Infest, the runaway. Drops down a couple of mines on his way out, but they will manage to find that kill. Ooh, chasing down the techies. Radiance is now complete for Life Stealer. This is the scary phase of the game where Bepum is really not going to feel confident, I think, to make any moves on the map. And they're also not going to hit this Roche timing that I think was really important for them to do. Yeah. So their only move on the map right now from an outside perspective is to constantly kill the Dawn. If you fight away from the Dawn, the Dawn ults in. So your yeah, only choice news. really is to go wherever the Dawn goes and hope he's alone. While trying to farm up GPK, like he, now he's going back for the Dragonlance. He still doesn't have his shard. He's going to be thinking about this Radiance too in these fights between the refractions and just the evasion and everything. Very frustrating. There's also a Decrep to save. There's the Necro. So there's, it's a lot harder than it looks for him to actually hit the heroes. Even if he has the damage, he might not be able to get it out. But further reason why you focus Chalice in these fights. Doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of net worth. Now the Torrent, the pull in, the stun, the combo. They're getting him brought down. There it is. Decrep. Oh, Tian Ming gets his buddy out of trouble just then. No infest. Get away, no infest, and rage wears off, which means come on back, say hi. That, that was the disco. Almost immediately after that decrep, just took it right off there and kept the damage going. And, and Tian Ming just vanished, by the way. Like, he decreps for like one second, just gone. Uh, that's a one hero that GPK can knock down. Also, one of the cool changes with Kunkka, now you can X through the BKB, and as long as you do with like, you know, less than four seconds remaining, you just pull them back, which yeah. is a massive buff for Kunkka. I think that's one of the main reasons why he's been like so heavily valued. I mean, that, that sort of that change to debuff immunity affected a lot of things. It's seen even like the Tusk being able to make sure you can get snowballs off against yep. BKBs, all the rest of that. We're still figuring a lot out, I feel yeah, like. Exactly. It comes to that too with a lot of heroes. The Alchemist being able to stun and not always yeah, stun yeah. himself. It's a weird one. That's how it goes. So Shiva's now finished. He's got the heart keyed up. Just get the HP. All you need on this hero is to live. You do damage by being alive. And so. For Azure, I think the game is just smooth sailing right now. You just keep farming, keep playing the map, just wait for Beppum to go on you, and just pretty much hope that you have enough HP. And it looks like they have enough fight. HP right now. And they, they do look pretty tanky. And Azure, they are instead going to go for a little wrap through, see if they can find any of these heroes farming out the top side jungle. There isn't anybody there, though. Uh, right now, you can see Beppum playing much more statically together. Uh, on this side of the map, and they're instead going to make a play themselves with this Agnum Scepter done on Pure. Oh, TPing back in Yules. on Pure, uh -huh. the Yules. Does he manage to land in time? He will. So he will get out of there. They need to wait a second longer on that, but still, Tier 2 Tower done. Seems like he had a general idea what was happening up there. Oh, yeah. It's a good effort. And the one thing is this move top now, maybe it opens up to take the Roche. Yeah, they knew immediately. The, the scan already happens. The tier one tower is still up. It's a really fast teleport rotation if they know that this is happening. The gate's also already coming out. Roshan's dropping really fast. Yeah, they know. They're getting ready. Walking in. I mean, oh. this is into egg. Ready to jump. In the boat. Can they do it? FY throws the short save. Jumps That's in, great. but immediately gets ulted. Ooh, is there. And they get the Aegis and starting to get out. Toronto Tokyo dives away. Wants to TP to get out of trouble. And you know what? 
That's a pretty freebie as long as, wait a minute, wait a minute. Nightfall there for the chase. BKB got a run. Pure drops the Torn Storm and tries to get away. Do they have enough to escape Shards? with Nightfall? Shards uh... is going to catch him. Nightfall in trouble in the Dawn Ultimate. Comes out. They take down Nightfall. As Tusk, you know, you don't have this just free BKB TP, so he has to run it off. And again, that ability to go through the debuff immunity coming in huge. Nice timer being put in the chat for the Aegis. Love that. And Very helpful. They At least they got the Roche. They got the Aegis. He kept it alive, so they'll have it for the next fight. But I don't really know if in the fights that the TA is dying, it's going to be beneficial for them. Because he needs to be alive the whole time doing damage. So I think, if anything, this Aegis will more be a deterrent to hopefully make it so the enemy team doesn't get Aegis and they can delay the game. They All need right. to hit this next set of items for Bepum, as, and that's when they really start doing the damage. Well, speaking of which, they did finish that uh, Midas on Phoenix, so I still on the prize of trying to push this towards the later stages of the game. I mean, so right now, it definitely feels like Azure Ray have a strong command uh, of the map. They can move wherever they want. They're farming up where they want to. Do you think they they want to push the tempo faster and put like a, a sort of really big uh, burst in the side of Bedroom? Or do you think they're more comfortable with it just sitting around? I think you always want to, but High Ground is so scary now, especially to the Kunkka with all the random spells that he has these days, the Phoenix. It's just so hard and you feel like you can, that's where you lose the game. It's yep. going high ground prematurely. Right. So they want to just make sure that it's much better to make the game go late than to lose. They find one. That's the Pugna. Tidal Wave pulls him in closer along with Lil. They start to burn him down. Stun also connects now onto Lifestealer. He's down so low and gone. How did that happen? And now the turn on Asomnus. This is not the way the fight was supposed to go for Azure Ray. Save lives. It's Asomnus in trouble still. They pull him back in with that X. Got him caught and killed. They were just kind of poking a little bit there. And, and suddenly they just caught this huge fish. I don't think they were expecting it. The, I think that was the Kunkka Ag just randomly caught him with the torrent, and they just got chain stunned for like five, six seconds, and he just went down. Oh, that's got to be so frustrating. I mean, one, one of the massive. few downsides, I guess, to Life Stealers, you really don't want a BKB. That's six seconds, you know? He has a queued up. Yeah, has up. Said that. Yep. Yeah, he realizes, like, I don't get to live that life. I mean, it's also one of those things where, like, any type of status resistance, maybe, or something like that, and maybe you can, you know, survive through it. But if you randomly get caught by that Torrent Storm, it's dangerous. And yeah, and you can't even status that one. Yep, it, that it one's just, it, oh, it right, ignores it. That's a good point. Watch out, Spirit Breaker players. Dangerous. Don't, don't fly into the Torrent, you know? It's a spooky one. And so Bepum's kind of getting in line with their fight. I would say the Kunkka Ags is one of the strongest team fight spells in the tool. Just yeah. the water park everywhere. And with the Phoenix, it makes it really hard to hit the egg. Even just to kite away from the egg, it kind of ruins everything. And GPK is starting to really hit this damage timing where he can kill everything. And again, he is safe to dispel all the just random ethereals between the Pugna and the Necro. And he had that shard still queued up for a while, but then after a huge fight like that, he wants to grow a little bit larger here. Go towards something a bit bigger in the nullifier. Obviously, very useful again for all the same reasons where the uh, the techies dispel was going to be solid. I'm trying to help you out versus this Necropos, the Pugna, all the saves they have, and now even the Orchid to perhaps deal with some of the saves that FY has. Try and lock down this uh, this Tusk, but we do have a Manta nice and early on Lou, so he's not like immediately targeted by the Orchid. Right. He's probably worried about his damage. I think in the early game from the TA, because normally when you go the shard, you want to have really high damage on your team, be ahead, get kills constantly with the silence and all the vision you get. And in this game, since it's more of like farming, you want to spend all the gold you can on the damage and the scaling rather than this early game team fight. I mean, your conka's got shard and eggs, right? Yeah, you can control people. You're fine. You'll do the damage. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I, I think the other thing, too, is that in that sort of chaotic midst of a team fight, you're not going to be seeing the Tusk saves, which is what you're really going to be waiting on is that life stealer. And they are getting set up again. It feels like if things are all even and set up the way they want, it's going to be hard to kill the Azure hero. It doesn't look like Azure has the Aegis, does it? Like the way, the way they're like running mid here. No? I'm sorry, that uh, Bebu has the Aegis. Like, they they kind of feel like they're the ones feeling this pressure to try and push a little bit with their Pugna. They draw back some heroes and they immediately just go back to farming. Yeah, but now even this whole Aegis, they're up 4,000 gold. So they kind of swung the game 5,000 gold by just having this Aegis taking that one mid team fight. And actually getting their items is what's going to make this draft really strong because they still have the Phoenix. I think every game, if you have a Phoenix, you have the damage to kill any hero that you want. I mean, it's a terrifying hero for a reason. I think back to the, what, like, 2015, 2016 days of Phoenix when it was just Sunray. It's a good hero. Just uh, Sunray. <laughs> now it's everything else, right? I mean, like, now Sunray has a blind on it, so you just miss half the time you want to hit the egg. You can refresh that when you click That's the egg with shard. appropriate. It's hard to look into the sun. Don't do it, everybody. It I know you don't eyes. see the sun often anyways. We're all yeah. gamers, but got to be careful. 
And now it's kind of up to, it's still up to Bepum, I think, to kind of make the aggressive plays. Azure still has these really strong heroes and the Dawn with the global. So they can kind of keep splitting up, the Dawn can keep farming, and they got they can keep playing the map, thankfully, even though they're, I would say, a little behind on the gold now. But Bepum are the ones who, they're, they're still feeling forced to make the moves, I would say. I, I think Chalice has done a very good job of that this game, too. It's like not getting picked off too much. Farming in some of these safer spots here, and now moving in towards that shard as well. So it's gonna help out a lot in these team fights. Yeah, the one thing about Dawn oh, is I say that she cancels. Yeah, Chal says I need more damage, like this TA. It does already. Right. I mean, it's it's tempting. It's too hard not to take it. There is a damage issue when the Kunk compresses boat and there's a laser. It's just so much damage reduction and healing that it's really hard to kill. Probably the CK mostly is gonna be the one in the front using the Kunkka. It's so it's kind of on you to be able to kite the fight. I think if Azure can survive the long fight, they win. Life Seer is amazing in the long fights. Necrophos is amazing in these long fights. And Bepum kind of have this one really, really big round of spells where they yep. click everything. Meld, you know, CK, Poland, just yeah, explosion. Yeah. Can I also just say that I love that you call it laser instead of Sunray? Because that's, that's it feels much more appropriate. Sunray does sound kind of friendly. I know. You know it's, catching some rays, it's like a, you know? It's like a healing. That's probably the healing side. Oh, okay, the laser is for enemies. It's you know, two sides. Laser and Sunray, a smoke up now coming from Azure as they want to find Bet Boom down on this bottom side of the map. And I mean, there's good vision. There's a mine up on that high ground, which should reveal their positioning if they walk that way. Under they can burst the Phoenix. Now. Somnus finds one. That's a good one to get, but can they burst him in time? The, the Orchid Tusk. Great play, catching that Tusk and killing the Phoenix. So one for either side doing well, but Somnus now in trouble. He doesn't have the help from the Tusk. He can't get there, but he doesn't need it. Back and away. The Infest was there for the Life Stealer. Nightfall, ooh, barely gets away. That Snowball could have been good, and Pure also in trouble. This is a fabulous fight for Azure. <laughs> Nearly got saved there, too. That was a really quick Orchid on the Tusk, but the Phoenix didn't get the egg off. No. He got, he got stunned by the Necrofossil and just 100 to 0 Yeah, no opportunities there. Even on the big dive, couldn't find a solid spot for it. And you saw, even with the Chaos Knight using pretty much the entire fight to try to kill the Tusk, the Dawn just ults and saves him. It stuns the CK through BKB, it does all the healing on the Tusk, then he can stun him again if the Tusk has punch. And so it's just so much kind of like delaying in the fight that it was hard for them to win the fight fast like they need to. And they weren't particularly close game. Psalm he just finished off the heart now too. So I don't know, like 700 HP or so here. I mean, this Necropose. is the thing too, right? Like these long duration fights are gonna start feeling super weird because uh, on the one hand, like obviously if you can get like a really good Sunray, that's amazing, but he's gonna have two in the fights. If Phoenix can survive, I'm really not sure who I'm gonna be favoring in this one. It feels like the fights could last multiple minutes. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> that sounds exciting to me. <laughs> or it could just be over in a second if Necrophos gets a good ulti. It does feel like that's the, the big one, right? You yep. just mock someone down just like that. And... They also don't really have save. They don't have a Tusk, they don't have a Shatter, even an yeah. Oracle, kind of this like anti-Necrophos hero. He just gets to press it. Just hopefully it's on Refraction. That's the only thing he's worried about. Yeah, save, maybe the Glimmer can possibly save you. Who knows? But Glimmer, even these days, is now just a solid, like, number shield. Yeah, it's just right. a 300 yeah. block, so it's not like the old days where it's just magic Fing resist. Fingers crossed, you know? Yeah. Hopefully the 300 will be enough. Yeah. Oh, you know what we need? Phoenix Aghanims. That's the real play. That That is a save. It's such a terrifying <laughs> item. <laughs> Does anyone ever feel good using that item? It's so risky. I would love to see him buy an axe. They don't have the best egg killers. They don't. No. It's only the life no. Yeah. yeah. Just the guy who has BKB immunity and 83 <laughs> attack speed. Yeah. Just, just keep it away from oh. him, maybe. Here we go again. Another smoke heading through the exact same area where the last fight happened. This time during day. Nightfall catches sight of FY. Oh, Stun. Nice. Big blink. Oh. Blink back. He's too good. Oh, the Tusk King. And Pure, now the one that's chased. Lua right there already popped the Enrage, though. And now the X, the late X, pulls him back in in a moment. No, he infests inside. Gets away. Chalice keeps his buddy safe. And just like that, the fight is going to be discontinued. I mean, it's still a DDTA. GPK's feeling it, though. Oh, and that's a quick Roche, too. Relatively, at the very least. Azure Ray head down this area, and they're going to see if they check that it's spawned. They're holding the better position at this point in the game. Chaos Knight and Kunkka used the, both of their ults. So now Bepum is down two ultimate abilities for this fight, whereas Azure kind of has everything. They didn't click a single button, they just blinked away. And so it's really scary for Bepum to just walk headfirst into them. Nightfall is really not true. He's like, I got to blink that. I'm way back here. Smoke. Can't Still figure out there. how to get into this one. Looking, Chalice starts to beat away at Roche. Do they realize what's going on? Radiant scanning, thinking they're coming from the left. Nightfall. This is only oh, half HP row. Spots FY. It's a terrifying 
takes over the Watcher. Okay, good play there. They should know that they're right on top of him. Still has that blink ready if he wants to jump in. Save also ready for a jump. They have it if they That's want, but it's going to come a second too late. Right, nice they'll get fire. stunned, but they manage to get out. Now the Water Park, they do drop the Reaper Scythe. Pull off the techies. Do they have more? Trying to find another. That's going to be a Tian Ming falling. He dies. Somnus backs away. FY chasing the Dawnbreaker ultimate. Coming in for the turn. And with that, three of Bet Boom will go down. Just again, great positioning here from Azure and just confident knowing that they can take this and there's no good options. Like they're down those ultimates and they need them for these fights on Bet Boom. It's a really fast decrep. There's a null fire now, but even just saving the Tusk, kind of delaying the fight, everything they can do to make the fight last just a fraction of a second longer for Azure matters so much. Yeah, and every time they're using another disable, another save, that, that's what helps get Chalice at the backside of the pit, right? Able to survive, then goes for the Solar Guardian to absolute guarantee the kill and the saves. No concerns for them finishing that one off. So we take a look at this fight again. It looks again like it could have been good, but just a couple of seconds difference. Again, imagine if he queues up that, that blast off uh, and is able to steal away the Aegis. Unfortunately, did not happen for him. You can see the glimpses of the Kunkka title, or the water park. I don't know the official name of it. The Kunkka Torrent Egg. Nobody does. Torrent Storm. There it is. Uh, just kind of like crushing the fight. And I think if they're able to actually win the fight, get the egg off in a, a better position, I think the egg kind of ended up being in the middle of all the cores and it instantly died. So if they get a better combination hit on it, I think it'll help them out a lot. Cool. Well, another big item here, though, the big damage from this Necrophos. The Agnum's complete. Oh, God. So, you know, has the, has the talents for the Heartstopper, has the Agnum's for the Heartstopper, just needs to live. Yeah, if he gets a single kill and he gets this, like, 200 health per second, oh. that's when everything just, it's a domino effect. Fight, fight just falls apart at that yeah. point. So now Bet Boom is kind of asking themselves, how do, they, how do we take this fight? Is it high ground? Which I think Kunkka is probably one of the better high ground heroes in the game. And... They still, I think they really still need to farm up their course. They can't be trapped in their base and just hope for the best and wait for the push. I think the TA and the CK really need to get out, farm the lanes, get the, cut the waves, do whatever they need to do, maybe get some pickoffs. Uh, oh, save. Close to being spotted by the Shiva's guy, but just not quite here. So fast. Active and TP out after the Glimmer. Save will manage to escape from that one. But yeah, I think like we've seen and when these players and teams do get stuck in their base, you, the, the net worth lead just starts expanding massively. And to be fair, as we get later and later into this game, it's going to matter less that net worth uh, lead. But um, the problem that I'm seeing is that it just feels like Bedboom hasn't won a fight in a while. They're still farming good, but this type of a kill, it can't afford to happen. Azure Ray, get a cleanup. And immediately just want to run down these lanes as much as they can. But yeah, it's, there, there's not a whole lot of pressure to just immediately go high ground. Uh, what you want to do is like find these picks, right? Picks like that. They want to be catching one of the big cores if they could as well. Try and get down some solid vision to, to see into this area where they think they have this safe farm. The map being really big is a blessing for both type of situations in this, where if you have the mobility to cut the ways and farm the map really safely, it's good for you when you're behind because you can always farm. But I don't think Bepum really has that luxury. No. And so Azure Ray gets to farm everything yep. now that they're ahead. And that's how, why Bepum, you see them all sitting in their base. They have the techie set up. You know, a very fun game we might have coming in for us. And they can't really farm because anytime they're out, they might get caught like the Phoenix just did. Yep. And they get maybe 10% of the map is theirs. And they have to hope when the waves push in, they get that. And everything else is Azure Ray's territory. Just like TA traps are their hope, really. They're like trying to will down some of these waves as much as they can. Still no silence as well, so it's hard to just create like random pickoff opportunities there. Techies players, however, do thrive here, right? Yeah, I mean, yes. Save is an expert. He loves playing this hero. Oh, he's and ready. They've griefed many games. They're kind of used to sitting up here on the high ground for a really long time and just laying <laughs> mines everywhere, right? This is kind of like, now Now you're in my turf. Exactly. Yeah, anything, maybe more Midas's? True. For Bepin? Yeah, we've only Play for the Techies, well. play for the late game. Tried to go for that tidal wave to pull him in, but couldn't quite connect oh. there. And it does mean that for Azure, you're even less likely to want to go up and do anything at all. Um, they will still have this Midas on the Tusk, keeping them nice and uh, built up and scaling in this game, most likely queuing up the BKB next. 6,000 gold behind the Kunkka at this point, but the Kunkka did finish the Sheep Stick. So they have extra forms of control. It's just about can GPK deal that massive damage along with that CK uh, to take him down. They're doing the Dawn Smoke. They're going for the Dawn. The guy who's going to be alone, try to ult in, and it's uh, going to be a Hex reveal, hopefully. Can they get him, though? Chasing, find nice. him. Hex is there. That's exactly what they needed. Two seconds stun. He's done. And now on the rest of them, Azure, they have to back away. FY runs in, confirms there is a ward there. Oh, yeah. And then has to quickly retreat, so he's not the next victim. 
And that's going to give a lot of space out here on the map. 70 seconds, no buyback on the Dawn, so they don't even have the chance to kind of bait a fight into a buyback goal. They just have to give up all the farm they need. Well, definitely a boon for Bedboom fans as they manage to reclaim some farm for themselves. And again, that entire period of time, they're only down about 2 to 3k. So they're not, they weren't losing out on a huge amount of it. Yeah, we're making the game, I feel yeah. like, seem really, really scary. But the gold lead's been pretty small the whole game. Oh, yeah. That item has had a big lead. I think it's more in terms of the momentum of the map. Whereas the item timings that they have, the ages, you know, which towers they can take. And honestly, it's really close. Yeah. Neither team has a really massive timing, I think, coming in the next couple of minutes. So it's based on who starts the fight, I think. If we see it like there where they start on the dawn, it's going to be really easy for Bedroom to take the fight. But if they get a good kill on the Phoenix, a good fast Reaper site, something like that, Azure gets to take the fight. And I think that's where we kind of get this idea of, like, it just looks easier in these fights, I would say, for Azure Ray. Like, because of the multiple saves, like, you have to get that blow for Bedroom or it looks like a disaster to me. But, you know, those blow-ups do get a little bit easier here as we're kind of hitting this, like, peak damage before the peak, ta peak tank ability on some of these heroes, like like that Dawnbreaker. Well, and the other thing, too, is you got to be careful with your positioning on Chalice, I feel like. Uh, he can't afford to get caught out like that again. If that type of play continues to happen, it's, you know, a little bit rough. But one time, you know, it happens. Happens to the best of us. Absolutely. Mm, yeah, and yeah. the most important thing for Chalice right now is to make sure he kind of balances between farming aggressively and shoving the lanes in because it's really important to take the farm away from the other team, but also not dying. So he might be a little more cautious now from his own ancients, from his side of the map, but he's probably going to move up at some point, maybe with a ward to protect him instead of just nothing. Yeah. Yeah, for now they have a little bit of vision still down bottom of the ancients as well as that tormentor, something that they definitely want to get on Bet Boom because they already have shard on Kunkka, Techies, and Phoenix. So the chance to get it on the TA or the CK would be great. But yeah, both cores have really good shards. The, yeah. the CK one I think would be slightly better for them at this point. Just getting this more damage on the burst yeah. will really help them with science. I don't think it will really matter that much. There's so many Mantas and Yules and just random dispels. BKBs on the Tusk, I think, is about to be finished. So. Feels good when you hit a support, though. That's, you know, oh, yeah. catch this, like, random Pugna in the back. He's just silenced. It's a bad time. Yeah. The other thing that I love about this is that when you get to these later game scenarios, you start to see stuff that, like, you haven't just seen before at all, I feel like. And I'm, I'm, I'm guaranteeing that at some point this game, we're going to yeah. be seeing this Phoenix Aghanims. He's giving up a sheep stick. I'm still thinking we're going to be at Ags eventually. The way that this one is going. We had this discussion actually on the uh, the bus ride back last night about what happens, right? You know, you, you can practice Dota because every right. game you're going to play the first 10 minutes, as you yep. said. But when it gets later and later, you know, things get a little bit wild and you're kind of in new territory. Oh, Toronto, Tokyo. FY ready to initiate. They jump right at the start. Can they blow them up this in time? Oh, yes, they will. Even through the sun ray, it was more than enough to take down that TA. Save, TP's out. Manages to escape. Really good pick off. There's no buyback on the TA. We're probably gonna see them push. They have really honestly easy push between the Pugna and the Life Stealer. Just you have a free oh. BKB to just poke, you have the Pugna to constantly push the tower, and that's a crazy. massive opening. I mean, he's got a cheese too. Yeah, I mean, again, getting no TA at all. They're just gonna enrage Pure. Now in trouble, they're gonna try and pull him into the mines, doing some damage, but not a ton. But with the X marks the spot, has the Yule Scepter to keep Samus alive a little longer. Stuns are there, but he is just not dying. Nobody is dying, and instead it's going to be the racks that are going down. They're, All it takes is that one kill. Their nullifier is dead, so they don't really have a way to kill him. He'll get decrapped, he'll get ghost right off. Oh. There's nothing they can do to kill him right now. And they keep going for more. A second yeah. set of racks, still 40 seconds. No TA at all, but the stun, the pullback, the stun. Oh, why? Oh, but he blows up on the second round. Tries to get away with that Yule's Chalice steps forward. You never want to go high ground, but maybe AR, they can do it. FY gets healed back up. The life drain, but another tidal wave. Pure pulling him in that much closer. Somnus, he's going to get stunned. Three seconds on that one. Save looks for more. The Dawnbreaker ultimate coming in and hits there and finds the kill on to save. A second hero gone from this. Disarm, backs away. Snowball Pure, he's low. Is he going to survive? The both up, it's not enough. The buyback is there, now looking to take down Somnus. He has dealt with so much damage in this extended fight. They will finally kill off at least one on FY, but Azure Ray getting the adoration from the crowd. Taking the full set of racks in the bottom lane there and then cleaning up a couple more in the mid. Yeah, they lose some, but it's a 10k lead now, finally opening up a bit of a gap here in this match. Roshan is up. Yeah, that's, that's going to so be the prize. Maybe is going to be able to kind of steal it, but that was looking really scary for Bepum. I think if they didn't get that burst on the life there, oh, yeah. uh, on their tier fours, they would have just lost the game or just lost pretty much everything before the game. <laughs>
And now they have a chance. They have a chance to take this Roche fight. There's no Tusk. Maybe they force a buyback. They buyback scan. happens. They know. They're going to come and contest. Oh, that is tough. I it's mean, you scary fight. love to be able to get this one, but it's too hard to do. Yeah, and I mean, that's the thing. The, there's a couple moments where there's nothing happening in this game, and then a, in a flurry of about seven minutes, the entire thing is bro broken wide open. So or. Phoenix has Refresher. He has two eggs, four Sunrays, and they need this fight to, like, they need to survive the fight for Bepboom. They need to make sure that the, like, all the CK illusions are alive, that the Kunkka lives for the whole fight, and they need to really kill the heroes that they jump. The saves are kind of too much for them right now, and I don't really know how they deal with it besides just doing more damage. Oh, good scan here as well, though, from Azure. They are missing their gem. Drop that in the fight when FY went down. And level 25 on Necro has been achieved. We saw in that last fight, too, is 8,000 damage done by the techies. This is one benefit of Betboom being able to sort of hold an area is that lets him get set up on save and set up for a lot of uh, the extra damage I mean, that they... There, there were, like, kunk up pullbacks and everything, too. Oh, yeah. Catch people into the mines. There was a lot of synergy that you can achieve on the high ground that's a lot harder. Definitely doable near Roche, but... It's harder quite... when you're late. They yeah. have some TA traps to get vision of the Roche, so they constantly know what's happening, but they can't really enter. They have to constantly replace them. Maybe they get jumped on the TA. And they're going to try to smoke around, but... Or are they just going to try and take it? Fine. Let's go on in. That boom. Can they get there in time to contest this? So much on Toronto Tokyo now. So many possibilities in this fight. Phoenix. Pure. He steps in the torrent. It reveals. There's one stun down to half HP. Almost gone. He, he is going to fall. Kallus does have buyback, though. Have to be careful about that one. Roche at about a third HP. Toronto Tokyo has already used one round of his abilities. But can they go for more? Has the refresher at the ready. Pops it now. GPK beating into Somnus. Somnus has taken so much damage in this game. I can't tell. He's always full health. <laughs> yeah. He's tanking through a whole this lot This is here. a scary situation. The egg outside the pit is really hard to fight. They into. jump. They there try to is. find him, but the snowball save is there yet again. Will it be enough? He's getting them pulled far forward. FY, they buy back onto two. Nightfall. Die back. Die back. Chalice, if he goes down right here, this is it. Chalice gets separated, though. And there's the Reaper sight. Available for the turn, but still Chalice and FY are dead. So are the CK and the Techies. They have to back away from Lul, but Pure, what else does he have left in the tank? Samus is still just at full HP. GPK knows there's no sight here, but how much pit? can he go for? They have it, thinks about the oh. go, takes him out with one shot. There's the tidal wave, but the rage is there. Lul, he says, no, you're not stealing my Aegis. They take down Bet Boom team again. And somehow, after all of that, it's a 1K gold lead. That's it. All right. <laughs> Everything evening up here. And let's get a little bit of chance to farm up with some of these heroes. But how much can you actually pressure with just these three heroes and Aegis and a cheese? They probably can end up pressuring mid. But I think the safe thing is right now just wait. They're confident in these fights. And you see here, it's just, it seems really easy. They have the buybacks. It's a Radiant Roche, so they have the advantage. That's why that's where all their gold went, just the buybacks. But they win the Roche fight, and that's all that matters. And yep. I guess he couldn't pull him in or something there. It looked like it was a snowball save, but FY didn't actually get him. Must have been a little too far distance. The fight looks really scary when Bepum does win this fight really fast. Yeah. They got a really bunch, a bunch of kills, Chalice diebacks, the Tusk diebacks, but there's a second round of lives. I mean, there is a condition, enough. though. Obviously, you get back into this game now. They're at the middle racks here. They're still missing a couple of heroes, but they are pushing. But there is Life Stealer and no buyback, right? That, that's definitely one thing they can be hunting for. They have this big burst damage. We've seen him go down before. If he gets caught inside the water park, that could be an, an opportunity here for Bet Boom. And, you know, they definitely have a little bit of push. I mean, is Somnus actually going to die? I don't I don't know. This this <laughs> is huge. He's 10, 1, and 8. They're going to try and jump right. on him here, but he's just healing through it all. <laughs> they actually are not doing enough to him. I don't know what you do against Somnus now. He is a problem. I think your goal is just to avoid him. Just every time you see him and you hear someone say, guys, kill the Necrophos. Just say to yourself, like, no, no, guys, someone else, please, like, kill the Pugna, kill the, the Tusk, anything that's not the Necrophos, you have to make sure that no matter how good it looks to kill him, you just don't take the risk. You need yeah. to give him your Bristleback oh, treatment. Okay, he's going for the infused <laughs> Aghanims as well here. On Moves Sonic. in, one, two shot, but the heal with the life drain is ready. There's also a BKB now finished and uh, delivered to FY on this Tusk. So mm. huge for the saves and trying to not get caught inside of Kunkka's Whirlpool. It's got to be so stressful, too. You're on the verge of getting even further into this tournament for Bedboom. Would love to be able to come away with this one with the first game victory. And Azure A seemed to be in position to keep this pressure and momentum going.
So they send their sights up towards the top side of the map. Ob sentry combo here. Jump. We'll find Nightfall. Finds him. Good damage. Good damage. Is it enough? Yes. <laughs> just lurking. Waiting for you to step out just the tiniest bit from your base and immediately punished. And that is no buyback again. 800 gold away. This is another huge moment. These cores of Bedboom getting caught without buyback. Little though, can they do something Imagine. without him? Maybe they don't need him. All right, that's ages. That's field. ages. Can they do it again? Somnus standing on top of his buddy, ready for an infest if things get dicey. Well, that was kind of free. That's near that raw. You know, I mean, you need something like that right now for Batboom. Put a bit of gas in the tank here. They're going to lose their ward on the outside of the base there, trying to keep an eye on them. I've never seen that hammer tower. That's crazy, the distance of the Dawn W. Especially if it's a TA, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so you just cancel the blinks, just maybe catch the Phoenix off guard, slow him. The range is insane. <laughs> oh, man. Chalice drops the hammer and takes the tower. So it's going to be a slow burn push. The Pugna, Pugna just presses his Q off cooldown, just slowly whittles it down. Life is going to slowly whittle it down. And there's no rush. They're, they're hanging out. They're having a good time. Well, apparently, Chalice says there's a rush. He runs in, finds the Phoenix, forces him to back away. And they go for more. That's already the melee racks down. Somnus stepping up. They're going to drop the water park. Hits onto one, okay. but the snowball save there again. Nice snowball. Nicely done and gets over to where the dead creeps were, too. Why not? And CK's just coming back oh, up right now. But can they get out? Yule Scepter looking pretty fine and going to Death Seeker to the low ground. Azure Ray gets the whole set of racks and they get out. He's really hard to control. Very difficult there. 13,000 gold lead. First time that like, uh, it's been this big in the whole game. It's it was a really close game, but after these kind of roach fights, all the buybacks, it just seems so hard for Bepum to actually take a real fight for themselves. I mean, it still is sort of evident of how you know strong they feel like the Bedboom team fight is that they're not willing to go for the all-in-play for this other set of racks with all these mines that are set up and the rest of it. It's got to be annoying to try and play into, but you got to imagine now controlling this map. They're going to continue to build up this lead and get themselves into a strong position. I mean, you've seen your strongest core just vanish in an instant. Oh, yeah. And the fact that if he does die one more time, Lou's just gone for a while. So yeah. kind of terrifying. The cool thing is, so Lifesaver got the Ags from the Roche fight bot, and it's another way to oh. BKB to disable a hero. So he can jump the TA when she BKBs, and it just disarms her through BKB for the entire duration of the infest. Oh. About five, I think it's four or five seconds. Yes. Yeah. So if he gets that on the TA, She's just stuck there doing nothing with her BKB. And when Tia doesn't have BKB, she can't fight into Azure. That's a really good point. Yeah, I forgot about that. The infest could be really strong. And it's got decent range now, he even too. even picks up a blink, a swift dagger. Yeah, yeah. So. He just got the blink, too. So can immediately just jump in when he's needed. And As no Lincolns, I think, on anybody from Bet Boom. So that is a really frustrating situation for them. As long as he doesn't jump the TA with fraction, she blinks backwards into Founder or something. Oh, yeah. Anagans. That, that could be an issue. Everything will be OK. Well, now that you've said it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what's going on. Or, you know, happen. into like 10 mines. Yeah, it well, something scary. Yeah. Yeah. It does last for a while, though, to be That's fair. That's true. You're in there for a cool minute. But, you know, you get blink back. We got Reality Rift Pierce and Spell Immunity. You're being pulled all over the place here. Suddenly, there's an Earth Spirit kicking you into the well. Just appears in the game. It's like one of those side characters. <laughs> we are getting to the point where you should be able to just buy another hero. This game's oh, yeah. going pretty long, you know. I like that. Would you just make someone with like the coach micro it or would it just be one of the players? Oh, that would be high. We could have their music play. They come in. Oh, they purchased Blitz. And he just like comes <laughs> to the stage. Dude, look at those mines. What is happening? Taggies, baby. Oh, well, this this is going to be an interesting one. This is going to be an interesting one. So many people are relating to this right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he has, like, the sort of orientation perfect. It, it is very nice. This it's is pleasing to look at. I like that. Oddly satisfying, you know? I unfortunately have to agree that this is a nice, like, uh, nice visual. Yeah. Well, I don't know if Azure Ray are going to quite feel so confident. Extra rage duration. They also have BKB on low, so he, he is just debuff immune for a very long time. And he's almost got his Ex Machina, because, you know, we're... Almost. We're nine minutes away here. Oh, well, hey. At this point. Good call, good call. Well, this is the other nice thing that you can potentially do is just sir, shove out all the Sir, you, you have one of those already. Oh. No, no, he's, he's made a mistake, Gunner. He, he has two hearts. Oh, jeez. Sounds like a little fun. That's oh, easy. no. <laughs> the health region doesn't This is that. where we are. They have a tusk kick, too, now. Looking for anybody. 
I don't think Somnus is going to care. Not Somnus. Even if, <laughs> even if like they lose this game, Somnus isn't going to die. That's just the reality. Send in. Look, at, look how confident he is. He's just walking into every single hero. Dude, he does not care even a little bit. That's disgusting. Daedal is finished with a TA, so that's more damage that they have to hopefully burst. Yep. Brings it over. They're out of the base. There's the Tusk Punch, the kick back. Oh, the to blink. find them. Can they get away? At least I for the moment they will. It's on to Tusk, though. He's starting to fall. Heal is there, but safe. He hits the good jump with the blast off onto two. And already starting to die on Chalice with the Sunray out. They're actually destroying them. Oh, Somnus. Where are your hearts now, boy? Ooh, well, I thought with the green guy, his heart would, like, grow, but his heart shrunk this day, you know? Oh. Way, way on down there. That is tough. Two hearts, and you still blow up in about a second? What happened? I, they, they, I don't know like exactly. A, like a lot of damage. They all did damage. The water park was doing absolute work. Like yeah. I saw life stealers just like spinning around, getting controlled up, get hit by the boat. He got silenced by the trap because the shards up there. A couple torrents connected, and then it's just a big boom, you know? 800 damage from TA, 800 damage from CK. They're stacking it all up at once, and he's just gone. Great timing for that Desil or the uh, Daedalus, that's for sure. It looked like a really good initiation, but the TA got the blink off right after the kick, oh, so they don't so really, they kind of kite this kick out. The Tusk doesn't get his BKB off. Oh. He just gets bursted by the Torn Storm, and I think after that, oh, Chaos also gets stuck. Too, yeah. And then Hex. They all drop just so quickly. And I mean, this is really the problem, right? You're talking about late game Dota, where one fight and suddenly they're up on your high ground a lot of time on these respawn timers. Uh, a plus sorry comes on out. Not sure what's going on there. Some tips from the other members of Bedboom, but this is the full set of racks in the throne. Oh, you're thinking you're about it. A little bit here. I mean, you got to be careful. If you're as your raid, you decide to buy back right now. This is a tier four tower already starting to fall. They have 38 seconds on this life stealer, but they're going to back out out of bet boom. They get the glyph reset. FY, FY. setting up, sir. Oh, this nope. guy's mad. Okay. Okay. Right. He's going to relax a little bit here. Just wanted to burn his TP cooldown. Roshan is up, and that's a big thing. Yeah, they got a so minute late. left here, too. This is going to set up for 60 minute items if the game doesn't end after this ages. There's an Ags, which is really big for anyone. The TA can get the Ags, kind of move around the map. The C can get the Ags and just have so much physical damage. So if Bedroom gets his Roche, I think it kind of swings the map or the whole game state into their favor. Yeah, and it should be very fast. I mean, they're starting to move here from Azure. Getting there as quick as they can. I mean, the crowd has been cheering as much as they can for them. The, the air kind of gets sucked out of the building in that last fight. Oh, you're not They want to come back alive right now. FY, they're scared. Scanning Toronto so Tokyo close. up on the high ground. They already are in there with Lou, but GPK, he gets the Aegis. Chalice shows up, able to steal the Aghanims. Okay, that's a nice win, but Chalice is going to die for it. And that's... dead for 100 seconds, no buyback. That is kind of sick, though. And it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's... feels cool. Yeah, I don't know He's how close to his buyback. Do. I think FY is going to get a bounty right now and get buyback for the Dawn. Oh, that's huge. Okay, not so bad then. So it's not as scary, but. TA does get the Aegis, they get the Roche, they kind of stop it from Azure getting it and try to close the game out, so a good a good timing for Bepu. Well, this, I mean, that's the thing that's interesting, is now it definitely feels like the fight is just kind of reset, um, and the entire game has in a way, because you didn't get that Aghanims, which can so often, like, start snowballing the lead even further, or at least regain control. The Aegis on TA, it matters, but it also feels like there's a lot of great ways that Azure have to set up on the TA after the Aegis, you know, she comes back to life. Yeah, again, okay. yeah. I think uh, for Bepum fights, it really has to be fast. You saw in this mid fight, they got a kill, they got a kill, a kill, it was like 10 seconds, the fight was over. And Azure, all the fights they win, it's like, oh wow, he's half health, oh, is he gonna die? No, we're gonna snowball, save, heal. And so for Azure, this Aegis doesn't really matter because you want the long fights. If you kill the TA, the fight's probably gonna keep going long and you'll keep winning the fight. And so for Bepum, you don't really want to be able to have this slow burst fight where one of you dies. And part of the problem is that we saw all this ability to defend the high ground from Bet Boom. There are similar abilities here for Azurei, most notably the kick, of course. So we have to be very careful how they use the Kunkka X. Well, yeah, the they did it immediately. And nope. he actually, oh, he gets Snowball because of that. Oh, FY. Did not maybe see that X, not sure what happened. Will Snowball a second time with the Torrent Storm going out. Not easy to take this fight. They will kill one, but can they kill another? This. They pull him out of position. Yule Scepter lift up. The boat is going to not land on him. So they are able to survive with Chalice not buying back. But FY, wait, he bought back! FY, does he have enough to stay alive though? The stun is there, a long duration, but no, he's gone! Just like that one! GPK stunned for a little while, Chalice still there for the control, but he's out of position! Three seconds stun, starts to fall and gone!
Can they find more? But there's the Reaper Scythe. Oh. There for a turnaround. The fight, it's lasted too long. This is where Somnus shows up. Gets the blink away. GPK managing to escape. Oh, we're thinking about wait, something here. Wait, wait. A little crazy. Yule Scepter. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Can they do it? GPK wanted to fight, but is it actually going to work? They're all lined up. Pumpkin starts to fall. He goes down, but he's inside. He infests. He's disarmed. He's disarmed. He the right click. It's enough. Yule takes them down. Two seconds done on the side. Oh, he's trying to back. get the kill, but he transfers it over. Gets the cheese off in time. The Lotus, not sure what it was, it's but now he's time. over to the side and Som is still living. Somehow, someone. Oh, He's gonna do it! Triple kill for GPK! Oh, is it enough? Can they do it? They take him down! GPK trying to run, but no! Somnus is too strong! Oh, it's so much damage just everywhere. They're buying back, they're boxing back and on top of each other, trying to finish this game. There's creeps in the mid, the catamult taking down the tier four, but it doesn't matter. And there's two big cores, no buyback. Phoenix, no buyback. And Somnus is already in the base. Boots traveling in. He's in the base. He's dropping the FE voice lines. It does not hit that hard, but it will keep going. They don't have a way to deal with this guy. Not enough left in the tank. Somnus, he has stayed so strong throughout this game, and he is going to right-click these buildings down. 50 damage at a time if he has to. Chalice shows up now as well. And with Lil also in tow. Azure Ray, what more do you have? Do you have enough to finish this one off? Safe tries to stop it, but it's not looking like it's gonna be enough. Techies is going to fall. Azure Ray takes them down bit by bit, building by building. Another blast off, almost enough to kill Chalice, but he's barely surviving. There's the infest play. GG is called. Oh, that big green health bar didn't go down very well after that fight. The two hearts was looking a little scary, but in the end, 5,000 health is a little too much for them to kind of chew through at the end. Two hearts? I, I was a little concerned. Not, you know, not oh. going up at the very end there to get the Wind Waker, but committed for the second heart. Lost one fight, did die, but clutched it out there. Man, the damage that he must have been outputting in that fight. Unbelievable. So much. 16, 2, and 13. Throughout the course of that game, he took 124,000 damage. All the rest of them did too. They were just big old meat bags getting punched in the face over and over again. And they did it just about perfectly. Crowd appreciating what they saw from that Azure Ray lineup. And I mean, you gotta ask the question, how do you deal with these big tanky heroes? They picked Phoenix for goodness sakes. They tried, I mean, they had their burst, they got the items that they could, trying to make the plays, but didn't quite get it in time, right? And they had to be perfect. Well, just like that, the crowd liking what they're seeing. We'll see what the panel liked it as well. What a beautiful game one. I mean, the fact that it was only game one between Azure and Vet Boom, and that's the display we get. This game was so even, and Ali, you didn't understand too much about uh, the draft, what the idea was going on for Azure Ray, but we see it worked for them. Sure, it was a nail biter towards the end, but they did really well in the early game. No, I think they really did. I think how they played through the Lyser, I didn't understand how the matchup would go. It makes a lot of sense if you think about it, I guess, so I don't know why I didn't, but I'm stupid. <laughs> um, but they were able to play through that lane, they were able to deny TA Ancients. That, in combined with the early rotation from both supports before GPK hit six, was really big. TA never hit a point where he could come to the safe lane and kick the Lyser out. That's typically what happens when you have a mid TA versus Lyser, is she's the only one of the only mids that does enough physical to kick a Lyser out. But, you know, Azure Ray, they played it perfectly. TA never had to that snowball and they were able to control the entire bottom side of the map. It was a phenomenal lineup. Sorry, Evie, you go because I know that you were hyping up a lot of the players, especially Chalice's Dawnbreaker. Yeah, I mean, that was just sustained for days. You had the Pugna Life Drain, you had the Dawnbreaker, you had this Necro later on in the game with the Double Heart and the Life Stealer with the Infest. In these fights, the ones we're watching right now, it feels like Bedlam did not have damage to take out any targets before they could even get to the point where their heroes were strong enough. Like we mentioned, T never got access to her Ancients, she never got to kick the Life Stealer out of bot lane. They were just running into Bedlam's heroes without any damage for them to fight back. The T was not strong enough soon enough, and it was great to see. And again, again, I have to point out, Every time Bedfoom does not have a clean initiation hero on Pure, their games go to minute 60, their games look like this. It feels like they fold over in the early game and they just have to take some time and farm back. I, I feel like the best course of action they could have taken was probably get an earlier Blink Dagger on the CK and try to fight around that, but what happened happened, Roman. 
Well, you just said every point that I wanted to bring up. <laughs> wait, wait, I've got, I I've got, I've got a question then in, yeah. instead, because Nightfall, we've talked about it time and time again, every time we see Bedboom play is, not that he's playing for his KDA, but his KDA always looks fantastic at the end of a game. He always comes into fights and he's coming in at the perfect moment. He's using spells in the perfect way so that he is ending games, you know, 22 and whatever. But this game, it felt like he had those uncharacteristic deaths on Chaos Knight, that he was getting caught out, that it felt like he wasn't playing the same way Nightfall is expected to. I mean, I think this is their weakness of this team, this when Pure or GPK doesn't have like their best games. Like it's to rely, like they rely so much on the Nightfall, like having this Blink Dagger and like being active in this game, but he wasn't. He still goes for the safe play, like for the safe items. And this is what they needed this game for, like to, to make stuff happen. Because this pure hero, like Kanka, he's the follow-up. He can't really be initiated, especially when he's playing against us, Dawnbreaker and Pagna, you know? Like it's already very hard for him. And considering the TA lane didn't go so well and, you know, her, her farm is so low, like they needed some other hero to, to be able to do that. I mean, this fight was absolutely crazy. It, ca it could have gone both ways, either way, like, easily. Yeah, because I felt like Bedfam had found a way back into that game. I mean, when they used that refresher on Phoenix to get the double supernova when Azure were pushing mid, like, the signs of life were there. They won the team fight, they got the Aegis afterwards, and they started to apply pressure of their own. But this fight that we're watching right now, it's just a matter of experience, you know? It's buybacks versus buybacks, teams taking risks versus teams taking risks, and Azure's experience paid off in that long fight we just saw. Yeah, we're having the post-game stats here on the screen. Ali, the double heart as well coming out from Necro. We weren't too sure what the payoff was going to be in the long run, but it won them the game. I mean, I guess on Necro, like, you have the egg, so it makes heart a DPS item, and you have one of the best items at the patch, so you just, you got two of them, and as uh, Effie was saying, like, they have so much heal. They have Necro heal, they have the Lysir Infest, they have Pugna, they have some tough saves. Like, it's not easy to go into this lineup. I think something that that boom need to look at in the next game is like using their timings a little bit better. I think there's a point in the, this game where they had the Agnes on Kanka, they had the nullifier on um, GPK, but they sort of like they took a fight where they didn't even get to use Egg, and like Azure was the one hunting them at the time. I think uh, it looks like as the game gets later and later, like if they don't have this clear in initiation that Effie was talking about, it's a little bit more chaos into their game. They can't go for their strategy. Yeah. Well, we want to hear a little bit more about it as well. Not that I don't value your opinions and what you guys have to say. I just know Purge loves to go into great detail about certain aspects of the game. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we were scratching our head a little bit about the Life Stealer, a hero who hasn't been picked very much up in this tournament, but I think it was a perfect circumstance once we get to watch it back. If we take a look at some of the clips, some interesting things the Life Stealer did. Great laning stage, pressured this Tier 2 tower at 19 minutes. He did die this time, but he's got some really good advantages against some of the common heroes that we're seeing a lot in this tournament, namely Kunkka. In this case, the X actually does secure his death, but once he respawns, he TPs top, he runs all the way back, and then they secure this two, Tier 2 tower at a really early uh, position and this means that when they take Roche on the radiant side of the map it's harder for Betboom to get there without them noticing and ultimately one of the biggest advantages he had is rage against the techies this hero here is someone that was really strong six months ago because he jumps in and then he can protect himself easily. But with Rage, it's just child's play to kill him in the team fights. That hero's taken out instantly and he can win the rest of the fight as he wants. And here's another crucial moment, 28 minutes into the game. This is when TA picked up the Nullifier. And this is an item that really counters Necrophos here because it removes his defensive mechanism. And then we get to see him infest. That's giving more HP to one of his allies who's dying. Heart is good in this meta. Well, infest gives you a similar amount of HP. So if you can keep your teammates alive in these crucial moments, it's going to win you team fights. And on top of that, he's doing percentage-based damage. Again, tanky heroes are popular. Percentage-based damage is very good. And this just culminates with his nice open wounds uh, shard talent, which gives a nice amount of life steal to anybody in his team that's killing heroes. That's what pushes him over the edge. And a lot of these team fights lets him frontline for his team and secure things to eventually win the game. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Purge, explaining a little bit more on that lifestealer pick, the fact that it's something we're not seeing very often, but it can be a massive answer to issues that other teams are currently facing, Effie. Yeah, and to have the confidence to pick a hero that a lot of teams may have abandoned or overlooked at this stage of the tournament says a lot. I mean, we see this with this life stealer for Azure Ray. We saw it last series with the last pick Void Spirit with Gaming Gladiators. But the teams that have faith in their ideas and just play for the game itself, 
they're, they're just very impressive to watch. Yeah, but Boom have an idea of what they want for the game as well. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for game one, but we're going to learn a little bit more about them and one player in particular, Toronto Tokyo. Bet Boom trying to push. Good luck, you know? We got some luck yesterday. <laughs> No, absolutely. And it's so difficult to push into this Willow, into this Marcy catch, into the Ench, just throwing impetuses with huge damage from range. Pushing high grounds in this patch is impossible. Give me your, give me your best take. Okay. How do you push? How do you push? Yeah. What's what? How do you get to place all five Bed Boom heroes perfectly? Let's say they can go wherever they want. If enemy team has the like goal to defend their base. They can do it forever, I feel like. How are you okay. going to place them? Uh, Nightfall up front and center. Okay. Which is tough because Pudge has the Aegis, um, because he does not buy back. You have Undying right behind him. Willow is ta ta tagged onto him there. And then you get the double hit because Willow's 25. But no! Instead, you just step up, and that's already a tier three tower gone. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. The hook, the connection. Q, he's in trouble. Oh, Bedroom, have you actually done it? If you have any opportunity to end the game, you will try your best. It's quite inspiring, honestly, for Bet Boom to see this happening. Okay. I fall back. Well, oh, yeah, I fall kill, get out of there, but the cheese, the, the like, same like, come out from the aisle. Pure. He's in no man's land. One more damage there. Look at the desolator. The hit's coming in from the aisle. GPK comes out, goes for the disarm, and then the back away. Our plan was I had the agonims, and I will spam them, and then I will go in with blade mail. And also we had a bad buybacks and they didn't. Tricks of the trade, chasing, they're waiting for Makoto, wants his moment, and they find him! Is it gonna be enough damage? Yes! They take down Makoto! Can they get any more though? Nightfall, the hook, again, pure, he's on his man, can they bring down this Willow? Goes for the to walk away, and the damage coming out, the Aya was doing so much of it! Save and Nightfall doing it all together, but they managed to kill off that Muerta, now the buyback. Looks for more Toronto Tokyo with his Ags! Yeah, it was really good staying behind Pio, he's destroying the base. I like that. On this Undyne, 10 <laughs> I really hate losing. It's uh, for me. It's like impossible, and I love winning. <laughs> <laughs> I want uh, to be in the history of Dota 2. I want to be like one of the greatest players in the world. But you know, it's competition. Sometimes you lose. It's okay. It's uh, not easy to win. All all I want is to face Spirit and Grand Final Finals. It will be really hype. <laughs> that would be a pretty much hype. Hype matchup. <laughs> Stumbling over words, just thinking about how hype it is. And we had Team Spirit and Bet Boom in the final. I mean, Toronto Tokyo, he wants to go down as one of the greatest players. He's already won an Aegis as a mid laner. He could potentially win another Aegis as a plus five. He already is one of the most impressive players we've seen in a very long time. They're the Team Spirit's TI 10 win. We all saw True Sight. We all watched it. That call, that final games draft call, came from him. This is a player who has a lot of ideas. He has a strong voice and he brings it to the team. So his transition to position five from mid just felt so natural. It, it just felt like he fills the leadership role in a way that a lot of other players who may switch roles couldn't. How do you feel, Aoi, about this transition for Toronto Tokyo, especially when we see his heroes? I mean, we saw a recap of his undying, how unkillable it was, and then his Phoenix in the most recent game. I think Toronto Tokyo's strength is that he has like unending confidence in whatever he does. I remember after TI-11, he just came up to us at the after party. He's like, I'm going to be the best five in the world. And he, he was believing it. He, he wow. spoke with full confidence. He's like, all the five suck. I'm going to be the best. <laughs> and, you know, he, honestly, he's, he's playing really well right now. I think it sort of goes into the game. Like, when he's able to show that confidence, you see him running into these undyings, hitting buildings on plus five with 10,000 HP. Like, it's something that is a very positive, unique trait, I'd say, about him. Do you think that uh, transitions into all the players on the side of Bet Boom Reserve? 
What? What? Do you? The the confidence that. Uh, I mean, for Toronto, like it's it really helps that he has all these like skills from the times he was playing mid right, and right now this transition to the supports, like all the supports right now, are having such a big impact in the game. So it helps like that he know he knows how to find those farm. You know, sometimes like on this undying, like he's he's running around with fifteen thousand HP, like, like get to play this insane undying, like he he used to from the mid like heroes right now, and uh, it it really helps. You know, having having that experience from the mid lane and we see the teams walking up on the stage already yeah there's a lot of fans for both teams here Azure, bet boom game number two some changes i think that you really want to see for either side either for azure to double down on and get the win on the series for themselves or bet boom to make it another game three I think Azure's plan worked out really well. The Necro looked so good for them. When I watched Azure and they impressed me the most, it's when they have that frontline tanky unkillable core, whether it be a Bristleback or a Necro, and they just play around it. They don't have to take fights by initiating or smoking. They force the enemies to fight into them because their laning stage is actually quite strong, probably the strongest out of the entire Chinese region. Mm -hmm. So it's not, they're not one of those teams that you can break in the laning phase. So for them, you just respond. You don't necessarily have to run back the Necro, but to be able to, for example, pick the Dawnbreaker into a Chaos Knight, we saw how bad that lane was for Dawnbreaker, but still win the game, still have an effective performance, nothing to change from there. Was that lane bad for Dawn last game? Yeah. I feel like his lane was completely fine, no? He was like 2.5k net worth behind. Yeah, but the Tuscar left to play with the Lightsteer, and they rotated on mid, he was left alone. Because I think, like, this is how Azure want to play. Like, they want to be able to leave Chalice alone. I remember watching them versus Extreme in the qualifiers. He had timing. He was playing, like, some off-lane 5 Invoker, and he would rotate with F-Play around the map. They killed, like, all three lanes. I think they're really happy if you can get out of the first part of the lane and then start roaming with the double supports. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that Azure is a team that ends their laning phase a little bit earlier, or they're just more active in that early compared to a lot of other teams that we've seen so far at TI? I think they're really good at identifying like which lane they want to play through and like moving between that. Like we saw in the last game, they're, they identify mid, they have like a weak point, our Necro's level 6, we're able to punish that, take mid tower, and then they just sat in the enemy triangle and kept pressuring through the slicer. I think how they do that is really good. And for the bad boom, I think the small adjustment that they could be thinking about is that picking pure hero early, like they did before in the previous series, where like you know the spirit breaker was untouched uh, during the first phases, so he they could easily take that instead of taking chaos knight. So that the the road that could be taken for the next game. I know throughout this year, as you stood in for BetBoom at some events, do you think this is a similar team to the one that you stood in for? Is it a very different team when you look at them from the outside as a panel member now? I think they're very different. Like, yeah. I think they're improving with every tournament, and uh, it's mostly, it's, it was never about skill for this team. It was mostly about the psychology and, like, how uh, how they think of themselves, right? If you think that you're, like, you're number one and you have to perform to that level, then it's, like, it's very hard to, to, to have that pressure in the game and deal with it. But uh, I think right now they're very more chill in that sense and uh, I mean you can see that they're playing till the very end and they're not giving up when I was playing with them they kind of give up <laughs> in a few games. You can say, you can say, you know, that, was, that was past bedroom. This is a whole new bedroom Yeah, this is now. a whole new bedroom. Yeah, 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 yeah. They conquered their demons, we've said they, they seem to be different. But going into this TI, uh, Toronto Tokyo mentioned that he expects a top four placement for his team. Oh, at wow. least that's what he sees that they're capable of. That's what he thinks that they can do. And I really feel like throughout the year, you've seen them progress as a team, right? Not just in terms of the way that they play and shaping their identity, but just in terms of determination. Because I recall there was the Bedboom Dacha tournament of, uh, a month ago or a couple of months ago, and they got eliminated early from that tournament. And that was their namesake tournament. And a lot of the eliminate eliminated teams opted to stick around and just enjoy it. But they left early. They left their own tournament early just to practice for the upcoming Dream League. Well, here they are. They're one game away from potentially being eliminated. Game two. Turn to ban. Oh. Azure Ray's turn to ban. Azure Ray versus Bet Boom T. Game two. We've got some cheers from the crowd there. They're just hyped to see some more dough to keep the action rolling here. So, a game or two, we've talked about some potential changes. Straight up, Bet Boom don't have first pick, right? They're going to have this reaction for themselves. It is going to be Azure. I would expect a few changes in the bands for themselves then, but hopefully what you keep talking about, Effie, is that they're able to get that initiator. Someone thank you for pure in the off lane as their first pick. W would you want to do that? 
I mean, if it's one of the highly contested meta heroes like Centaur or Spirit Breaker, then absolutely first phase it. But if, if those heroes are taken out of the pool, I think they should just go for the meta picks that are still available. But you can have more creative initiating heroes for pure. I mean, we saw Team Spirit very effectively play Axe. We saw them very effectively play Night Stalker. And those two heroes do fill the same vein in leading the tempo of a game. And Pure is a good Axe player. He's not a bad Axe player by any means. Yeah, I really like what Effie said there, actually. I think if you get a meta hero, you can pick it early for Pure. But if you don't, maybe you can wait a bit to give him a better matchup. And you get these matchups on like these NS, the Axe. Like, these heroes are a bit more greedy. The reason why they're not as meta is because they're normally easier to punish. But if you pick it a bit later in your draft and you commit more resources in a draft to it, then you're going to have a good lane for Pure and then they'll be able to pressure that way. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this as well. Like, they decided to go for the road for with the Chaos Knight as well, like for this game. And uh, I mean, it's looking pretty nice because they banned the Spirit Breaker and Centaur. So there's a, there's an X and an S opportunity for sure. I think right here they can think their second pick right now. They've got the CK. I think they should leave their off lane and carry flex to the 24. And then you can sort of see, because CK is a hero that does what FPL's talk about. He's tanky, he has a strong lane, he can be a pure hero from the off lane. And that way, they can focus his next band for GPK's hero in the second phase and sort of play with the idea that they're not going to know how to counter the CK. They overcommit in the off lane, we're just going to put it in the safe lane, stuff like this. I wonder what this Naga ban is about. I think it's generally just a CK counter from carry. Like yeah, if you have a carry or offline CK, the Naga illusions are pretty good. And honestly, Naga's a really high DPS hero. CK doesn't have any AoE for her. Makes sense. They banned it in the last game as well after picking up the Chaos Knight. So it seems to just be a response if they're able to get that in the, in the first phase picks for themselves. So Willow finally comes out. I mean, Willow is a hero that's been popular throughout the entirety of the road to TI up until now because she's so strong as a support and now there is the flex to carry that we see which is really potent against Mur Mur Muerta whose flex is still open but even let's say this were a CK Dark Willow side lane if this were the off lane for Bad Boom this is a very high kill threat off lane so even if that's revealed early on I, I do like the adjustments here made from Bad Boom. All right Rezo so just hypothetically it is Muerta Tuss safe lane what lane would you want to play versus this? Because I was trying to think the other day about like what beats this safe lane, and I could not come up with a single thing. I think it's pretty pretty hard. I think uh, the only way I can see, like not even winning, but uh, managing to deal with it is like picking some dark lane and just keep cutting waves, and you know. But you're trying play. to split them up, like, like make sure they yeah, can yes, use the tag yes, team. Yes, yes. I think it's just way too hard to straight up win that. I was lane. thinking like whether you could like try to pull waves and stuff, but the thing is like Tuscar is sort of annoying when you're trying to pull waves. Like he starts tag team and hitting you, you take a lot of damage. If you get some and of can connect, right? Yeah, Murta's Crazy. really fast to connect. And you just can't fight into the safe lane. I mean, a lot of teams are not putting in the safe lane, but it's just like when you have these two heroes, you have the option. Again, with the Dawnbreaker Tuscar, another very stable lane for them, I think. Um, I think this lane just gives them the option, from what I've seen, to play away from the off lane. Like, Chalice is one of those players where he's actually pretty happy if his other two lanes are going well, and he's just, like, doing his own thing. Dawnbreaker lets him join up just off level, so he doesn't have to have too much farm. And, you know, that frees up FBI's game, who I think, from what I've seen, is like one of the best roamers, I mean, as always. But he's been roaming really well through the qualifiers and this tournament. Did Azure play ever, like, position 5 Muerta? I think it's pretty strict that uh, it's going to be the carry, carry hero, right? They have played it uh, plus 5, 4 and 5. They have? This tournament, yeah. Oh, wow. That's a really good pick for them, then. Every time you add these flexes for a hero like Muerta, it just increases the value. Because, like, look at Betboom. They're trying to draft a hero. They don't know what they want to counter right now. They feel like... Okay, we can put the CK versus Dawn, you know? Um, Nightfall is probably happy with the, how the lane went, you know? He has good farm, but you don't know what the next hero you counter is if you have this, you know, this is supposed to be one of your stronger picks. But on the other hand, for Bedroom, you get this Phoenix plus Willow, which I, I believe are the two strongest supports in this patch right now that you can build into your draft early on. Like your team fight is going to be impeccable. You have scaling all the way up until late game. You have catch with the uh, Willow and the Chaos Knight, who hopefully gets an earlier blink based on what we saw last game. And you also still have the flex potential of that Willow open. So I, I do like what Bedroom have, regardless of Azure's flexes being open. I think they would be able to respond to it accordingly. These are two strong sideline supports. 
I can see what you said with the blink on CK. Just something like CK with a blink or a mid hero or offline that like actually forces a fight. I feel like the shortcoming... Yeah, Void does it really well. I feel like the shortcoming of this Kunkka in the offline is the fact that like X is a very slow initiation. I think you mentioned, Reza, like this is a follow-up hero. You don't want to start the fight. It takes a long time to get into position, to get their saves off, etc. If you have something to force this into the Phoenix and Willow team fight, then I think, you know, they just added to face Void. There's a lot for Azure Ray to fight through. And this Void is really cool to me because uh, if this is a Tusk plus Dawnbreaker offlane, Void is one of the heroes that can play into that, right? If they use their combo with the tag team plus Dawnbreaker, you time walk off the damage. If you get trapped in shards, you can jump out of it, and you have a strong support in Phoenix to back you up. So all of a sudden, this really scary lane in Tusk and Dawn seems countered. And of course, you have this massive team fight potential coming out with your egg into Terrorize, into Chronosphere. You also have a way to play into the Muerta because when she ulties her BKBs, you can just Chrono her and opt to hit her team instead. Yeah, as you can see, the Bed Boom values uh, GVK here way more than Pure here, and they kind of decided that they don't really need this flex to be the very end, you know, to keep it to the very end. I mean, for the Dawnbreaker, there's like a one build that I enjoy uh, when I was playing him against the Void, which is like just Russian Aghanims, you know, or like uh, going like Reeves Aghanims, and it uh, reveals a lot of like, you know, this Void aggression with Phoenix. Has already taken a long time for the last pick, trying to potentially decide how much uh, of this Murder Flex they want to reveal. I, I think it is just like sort of your most important pick for first pick. It's a pick that's like your strongest. You have 18 on the draft order, and they go with the Luna. So that means it's probably a Murta, I would say probably Murta 4 and Tusker 5. Not too sure. They could flex the supports a bit. But I think Luna has sort of shown herself as like a very stable laner. We saw the Liquid Gladiator series both times that Meke picked it up. Like he was able to do really well, like even against really strong lanes. It also gives them tempo, right? If this Luna has a good lane, they can just play around their Somnus hero, whatever it is, and just take buildings. Similarly, what did what they did in that first game, they forced Bad Boom to fight into them. However, though, this time around, it seems like Bad Boom have much better tools into fighting into them. Like, if they do decide to 5-man really early with this Luna and go for an objective, all of a sudden, you're worried about the Chronosphere threat. You're worried about the Supernova. You're worried about the Bedlam coming out from Willow. But I think this time for Bad Boom, they have slightly weaker lanes compared to the first game. Because uh, this Luna Toss seems like a very strong lane, I said, like especially Dawnbreaker and Muerta. Uh, I think it's a very good matchup against Void as well and uh, Phoenix. Does that mean that both teams right now look into mid laners to round out their drafts to bring it all together? Who uh, who's going to be revealing first? Azurite as well. They're going to be after picking out of this spanning phase. I yeah. think they'll look for a hero that lets them set up the Dawnbreaker LT. They just want somebody to start some fights for them. Um, is Earth Spirit in the pool? I think Earth Spirit can be good if they have enough bands. Honestly, like the Dazzle is still in the pool, so it makes a lot of these melee heroes uh, hard to pick. And there's also the TA. These are the two heroes that it's hard to pick melee heroes against. But honestly, I don't think TA works that well with Batman's lineup, so they might be able to get away with banning Dazzle into picking one of these melee initiators. I love the Dazzle suggestion, actually. I think they, it fits the uh, Azure lineup very well. They, they, yeah, actually, they could do Dazzle themselves. The hero doesn't really lose many mid matchups, right? Oh, oh, the puck. It is a hero that sort of sets up for the Dawnbreaker. Mm -hmm. It is, from what I know, a bit susceptible to some counter picks this patch, because the hero has start, starts with zero armor, it doesn't trade that well. But it's, you know, I think it's one of Solomon's and Siggy's. He's going to have a lot of impact with it and scales really well. I wonder if TPK saw the Quinn's game and thinking about Void Spirit now. Looks like a pretty good awesome. idea. You know, Voice one of the builds that's been happening for Puck is like they get the Maelstrom eggs into Mjolnir late game. And the hero will actually carry fights really hard with the Aghanims. He does. It might be something that they look into this game because they have all the temple from the Luna, the Dawnbreaker, all these heroes, but they will get outscaled by this Faces Void unless you have more scale. I mean, once again, Azure Ray lineup had like two saves to protect their Luna. They, uh, they have like a very good timings to push the high ground with the Aegis. And for Bad Boom, they need to, like, I think they need to find a way to catch this puck and, like, uh, make make some stuff happen on the, on the map. And because I like, those two cores are going to be farming. I like Earth Spirit or Tiny for Bad Boom. Just some Whoa. kind of a melee stun hero. I mean, the DK, we forgot about him, but that was the classic puck matchup. I, I think that if you have some strong frontline hero to set up for these chronos, and, you know, suck some damage to yourself and just have a stun to play off of with your team, all of a sudden, you're not so dependent if you're at Boom on these really long cooldowns, on these supernovas, and on these chronospheres. And this is a traditional counter pick mid, so it I is. mean, I, I do like the DK. We were talking about this in the Gladiator's Liquid series, right? We are like, oh, they could go DK, but no one's playing him. 
what do you know? And then the Asian game, pick the DK. I think usually what this hero suffers from is usually a lot of the fours and fives have too much damage from early. Like imagine like Bat Boon supports playing DK against this. But the supports on Azure Ray are actually not that high damage for a long time. So he's gonna get away with doing this DK unless Chalice gets a good ulti on him. I love this DK pack as well, and because of their supports, like they have such a good damage just to follow up, and they have like these three heroes that can run around and do, uh, do, stu do stuff in the, in the game, and they have both cores and the silence like, just free farming. Yeah, for me, both drafts are quite even. Like I, I see the strengths of them and the weaknesses of them, and the weaknesses of bed booms are, you know, like Roman mentioned, the side lanes are weaker. They're a little bit cooldown dependent, and DK can get bursted on early in the game, but they have overwhelming team fight. The team with overwhelming team fight mm -hmm. on main stage TI, I can never bet against them. All righty, we got another coach interview to ha to go over to before we jump into game number two. Hello, I'm sure you heard this joke before. A Spanish man and Chinese man walk over to Lanham, the well endowed. Let's ask him about this draft. Lanham, last game, everyone was in the edge of the seats. We didn't know what was going to happen. Were you feeling the same or were you confident in your team's abilities the whole time? Uh, <laughs> It was the same for me. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, uh, I've been learning some of the Chinese memes, right? So, last game, it looked like a max muscle kind of game, yes? Is this game gonna also be a max muscle game for you guys? It depends on how our players uh, are going to play it out because I think uh, last game the opponents kind of uh, made a lot of mistakes as well. Okay, okay, okay. One last flex as we send it over. We're ready for this game. Can we hear the stage roar for China? Thank you so much, Avo. He tried so hard. They got there in the end. I like how uh, Jin was able to, you know, translate the, the what the flex was, yeah. uh, by the way. But we're here, game number two, uh, a very different draft. Lanham playing against DK this time on a TI stage. Oh, the memories. It happens. First nice DK game with a TI tournament so far. Ooh. That's right. And surprising, it's a tanky hero that sits in the front. You know, you think like hard yeah, blade yeah. mill. Why not pick Dragonite? And it's mostly because he has that built in. So. When you buy the heart, it kind of is like redundant. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't do anything special that like a Primal Beast or a Bristleback does. They do a lot of damage. And Dragonite doesn't do the damage. Oh, in our last game there for Liquid and Game Gladiators, we had the Quinn Void Spear come out, which was a classic puck. counter to the puck. And now again, we're having the DK come out as a classic counter to the puck. And both heroes that we haven't seen a whole lot of. As you said, this is the very first DK pick. So, uh, But the reason why that we're seeing here, it is an absolute classic. You go for this instant stun, as we call it there, on the Dragon Tail, something that is very reliable when it comes to controlling up this pesky puck. And Somnus is going to be playing a very different game compared to the previous one. Necrophos, you're just constantly in their faces, and they, they're sort of like dealing with you and trying to damage you the whole time, and you're just healing through it. Somnus now has to play a little bit more of the cat and mouse game of just don't get caught. Yeah, one, one catch and he's dead. All three cores have a way to stun you for multiple seconds and chrono and stun from the two other strength cores. And the subs have really high damage. The Dark Willow has damage on the DK stun. The Phoenix has Sunray for damage. So anytime he gets caught, he might die. If FY's not there to save him. Well, the other thing oh, that FY's I can uh, sort of talk about here as well is going to be, um, you know, it, a lot of people talk about the new type of DK build, and people thought that it was you that ran it first, Gunner, uh, but you told me that it was actually Mu. This was originally Mu's build, the Manta Aghanims. Uh, do you think it's a good game for it here? Yeah, it was something that we cooked up together, and so he told me to buy, and I bought it first, so, you know, we both take mutual credit for that. Okay, and, uh, I like it. The Manta, I think, is really good for how the meta plays out right now because it's very slow. It's hard to oh, hit high ground. Lane. Oh, 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 oh. Very far. Not even okay. close. Sorry, observer. It's okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah. Keep them on their toes. And so... Oh! That oh, <laughs> is on you. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's debatable. Somnus is going to go down. Level 3 DK finding that kill. Interesting. This is looking hard. The puck game where he got kind of picked earlier is also really bad. The puck also died, I think, three times. About okay. in the lane stage to ganks to the Void Spirit. So the puck, I think, has started to get more value because of the Ags build that people have been cooking up. And now that it's getting countered with, you know, the standard counters from back in the day, it's kind of one of those things where when you counter the meta with the off meta here, like Puck, you feel really good because people are still picking meta. But then when they adapt to it, 
it might not be as strong. Mm. Interesting. Now, it's a decent point there as well if they're having to make that adaptation and it's oh. still working out for them. And so far, it's absolutely wrecking mid. Perhaps the most terrifying adaptation is seeing the confidence of FY to give someone else Tusk in yes. this game. I, I mean, surprised that, me. That's so I much pressure on Tian Ming. That. Like, can you imagine? Being FY is just like, you will play Tusk. You miss I, a snowball save? Yeah, you, you miss one. That's, that's it. Yeah. They're off for forever. No, FY wanting to try the new tech, though, on that Muerta. Um, which, uh, to be fair, I feel like if you're going to give a lot of net worth to somebody in this game on the supports for Azure, eh, I'd want to be the Muerta. That hero seems ridiculous at various points. Yeah, FY, Muerta as well. He plays pretty much like a carry. He ends up taking over the map in the early game. He goes like Atos, constantly gets uh, gets catches across the map, gets kills. And the second that you feel scared of him, he just farms. And then he gets a Gleipnir or Shadow Blade, and then he starts becoming just a right click carry. Well, up top in trouble. Gonna go down. Like I said, two well played. Uh, two kills already at this early going. Pure did take some damage from that one, but so far, things going better for Bet Boom, particularly these mid lane matchup where, God, Somnus is just taking a beating. GPK is in his face. That's a bit of a tough one there. And now the Muerta doing work. So looking on getting some scaling there. Helps out Chalice for the kill. And likewise, though, of course, they do have this Willow for save. So it's a very, very similar idea heading into that late game. We have scaling fours that can get this crazy amount of damage where they suddenly become another ridiculous core in this match. So you uh, don't necessarily feel super great. Oh, oh easy. Wow. Going late to for either team, in a sense. You know, oh, there's no. terrifying sure. things on both sides. Yeah, both supports can buy a Midas. Oh, perfect. So we can have a fun game incoming. You love that for them. It's great. Oh, see, now that's one thing. The Tusk Dawnbreaker doesn't care about Shadow Realm. Luna, uh, not so lucky. Nothing you can do there. That's a good point. It's something that will be an issue for them as this goes on. Nightfall, somewhat low in this bottom lane. Needs to be careful about a salvo of skills coming out if they manage to find the calling in a good position with Chalice. Uh, it could be a burst potential, but obviously he'll be aware of that in playing. Uh, measured and pretty far back, I would imagine. I think the first big move we're going to see is the Tusk probably will rotate on this five minutes each bot. They'll take the gate, kind of, you know, do a little wraparound on the Phoenix. Oh, well, go on the Phoenix early. The dead shot's there. It's not enough for the kill. Did use a lot of the mana there from those heroes. Somnus is getting bullied mid. Yeah, that is really feeling like the story of the match. Doubled up on CS. 11 denies, too, is the one that really hurts. And level 6 already yeah, to level 4. Level 6 to 4 and a half. Oh, yeah, that hurts. You, I mean, we saw this tower go down really early on. And I guess this has kind of been, uh, you know, the, the turnaround that they're hoping for. Give GPK a better lane. And the nice thing is the supports on Azure Rate don't really have the damage to chew through a Dragonite in this early game. So even if they come mid, they don't have the coil, they don't have the damage, so he can just hit the tower for free. Oh, nice play. Double Bramble and then pulls him into another one. Tianming low. Will it be enough for the kill, though? Slowed oh. and needs to get range, needs to get vision. Hides behind it. Now the keeps him alive. Instead, they turn onto Lul. Find him for a one-second stun. Tianming doesn't die. Oh, oh wait. wait a minute. Oh. I have spoken too soon. He doesn't die, but the Luna did. It's even worse. Yeah, there's he tries to help his buddy out. Of Ramble left too. Oh man. The big thing for mid, the six rune. Covering it already. GPK there. It's going to be an invis taken away, so no refill for Somnus. Uh, he's just trying to farm these waves and not die. Ever so desperately. I'm so scared for him. Got him. He loses more than half his HP from a single stun. Every stun. Oh, up top. Actually, trouble and dead. Saw it there on the picture and picture. Managed to find the kill on Tianming in the end. Lul has to run away. These Chaos Knight lanes, every time, it just he has so much sustain, so much go, just a stun, he has a pull, he has everything just built into his kit in the early game. And so last game was kind of nullified because he was versus such a strong lane in the Dawn Tusk and he was in the safe lane. Now he's the off laner and the carries are always weak. Look at this though, they have them where to here with the Phoenix in behind, 3v3. Making a move, anticipating this and Pure, he's in trouble, but still, they lose low and Pure gets oh, away. Gosh. Oh, this is not what Azure were hoping for. More people brought in from Bet Boom. And every early move has been into their favor. And this is on the top of GPK. He's taking this tower at seven minutes again. Yeah, not I mean, even six yet. Yeah, the kills went the way of Bebum in the first game as well, but oh, it was not this devastating the blood grenade. Lane. Dude. Just swipes him down. GPK is having a hell of a game. All right, first DK game of the tournament, but hopefully not the last, it looks like. Looking that way. 
Yeah, but... Great game. He's going to get this Blink Dagger online. The uh, Dark Willow will probably get to take mid now. He'll probably rotate top on the Dragonite. Dark Willow takes mid, gets an early six. And then with the Bedlam and the Blink Dagger, they just get kills across well, the map thing. off cooldown. The last time he was meta, she couldn't just put Bedlam on top of him. You yeah. know, that's pretty cool. Nice new combo that he gets to try out here on the Dragonite. Yeah, it provides so much damage without committing the Dark Willow. And you can just pre-click it on the Blink, have an instant burst, and every hero will die to that in the early game. Especially this poor puck here. Especially the poor puck. Needs to figure out what he needs to go for. Because right now, Puck has queued up Treads because he's that far behind. But then the Witchblade, too, which is obviously what we've seen a lot from Puck uh, when he gets played. But in this game, that's going to be a long window where these instant stuns uh, can wreck him. So Somnus going to have to play around some dangerous territory. Well, it certainly feels like a lot of space is going to be opening up here for Nightfall as well. You know, his last hits aren't too ridiculous or anything, but it's going to be very hard to try and pressure him and also give Somnus some sort of a game. Dude, he shows for a second and GPK walks over towards him and says, yeah, you're not getting any of these last hits. I do like the switch that they did in the draft on side of Bepum, where instead of the CK just tanking this Dawn Tusk lane, uh, they move the CK to off lane and they pick a Void, which is even better. You have pretty much no pressure, so the Tusk moves to five because yeah. they know they can't pressure the Void with the Ice Shards. And you know the CK will have a good lane too. So now pretty much instead of last game where I would say they had two losing lanes or an even lane and a losing lane, now they have two winning lanes. Mm. And so their lanes are so stable now that even last game they were at the same kill score they were six to one at this point in the game but they didn't have this gold lead yeah and they were the ones losing towers yeah you know you had this pugma just running around knocking things down and now they have the dragonite yep so everything's kind of flipped in the side of bet boom i would say except for the kills the bet boom still have the kills so everything just going bet boom's way right now well, they have this chrono here too so kind of threatening a bit, but in behind is Tian Ming on the tusk. They go for one, tries to find Nightfall. He's, ooh, has a jump. Minute. Still manages to get some separation there. And with save showing up, it should be enough to run down Tian Ming, who does get rooted again. The they don't go for it. Yeah, Kyrie doesn't want to commit in. Didn't have actually the time walk back up anyway, so no options here. And now Somnus, maybe with some weakened heroes, could find something. Has an arcane rune here too. This Desperate would, times. would be exactly what he needs to get involved in this fight and but, make something happen. But I mean, that's a Treads Blink Brazer DK. Yeah, it's like, not if you happen. don't know where he is, you're in so much trouble. Dude, you don't even kill him if you know where he is. Yeah. What the hell? And he already has the glove for his Midas, too. He's so farmed. Yeah, now I think the Dark World is also level 6 already, this so they can big. take a fight. If they get him, that's what they needed. Nightfall goes down, dive away, but then the turn looks for one. The heal is going to be there from the Dawnbreaker, keeping him alive. Somnus in far. It's going to fall. Managed to bring down that pesky puck, and Chalice is in no man's land. Nice. We'll try and go for the kill on the Toronto Tokyo. Manages to find him. GPK low on mana, but uh -oh. with Pure moving in. A big DD fear pulls him back in for closer damage and another kill eight to three all right well chrono goes down and not too successful there for nightfall but they get the clean up there as the mop and bucket of dk and ck show up some stampeding knights coming through well and of course the big winner in all of this is going to be lul on the other side who, at least on the side of azure that gets some free time to himself still feeling a little bit tough for this squad in general save up close I think that yeah, Azure just making sure that they can farm somewhat safely in this area. I mean, some stacks there for the Ancients as well, of course, with Luna on the team. I'm not sure if GPK has scouted those out yet. Assume he probably did with it being daytime. Coil. Snaps it. Wants to run away. Chalice is there. And with help, that is going to be saved going down as he steps a bit too far. So Azure, another kill on the board. These are really important. The mid lane, once you lose your tower, is really scary. You have to bring heroes to push the lane out, because if you don't, it's so much vision that you lose, so much farm that you lose. And so they do bring the right amount of heroes. They bring three heroes, they kill the Dark Willow, who's playing too far up, and it's actually allowing them to continue the map. I think if they didn't do that move and the Dawn just went bot like normal, everything starts to crumble for them. Yeah, they have some defensive vision there as well, to sort of like help out and try and keep this puck safe, because they, they want to keep an eye on this DK, knowing how frightening that can be. I would like to see GPK make an aggressive move at some point to the top tower. I think they have the ability to take it for free almost, but he's choosing to be a little more defensive. He wants to farm this Midas. He wants to you know pair up with the Nightfall Midas for yeah. the two Midas timing. And I think they they do feel confident going late. They have three carries effectively on all of their lanes. So the Dark Willow, we've seen save also go carry mode in a lot of their late games. So they're not worried. They can go late game and just don't need to 
give these kills away so for the book. Here's my question. What's a lineup where bet, feel, bet Boom don't feel confident going late? I don't I think feel like I, they always draft for late. It, like, that, that's the key. style. They pick three cores in all three lanes that are all carries. Save also ends up playing a carry. Maybe, yeah. you know, he was techies, right? Yeah. Can't really carry on techies. Dark Willow, though. You can carry. Oh yeah. So, Toronto Tokyo play some like mega scaling support. Treant or Phoenix. Yeah. Also buys a Midas sometimes. Yep, yeah. So. Gets his eggs on tree. Here's the move. GPK smoked up. Just about to be done with that Midas himself, but still willing to get a little bit active. Lou shows himself. Shows Lul immediately there. Has it on top. The heal coming though. Will it be enough to keep alive? Lul, no. GPK kind of in no man's land. Snowball able to dodge a couple of spells. Oh, Somnus the is there. Do they have enough? The Chrono connects onto everybody. Not sure if there's actually that much damage to throw in. They drop nice the coil fear. and then the fear connecting, trying to separate. Chalice dropped down low, killed by save. And bet boom. They take down three, not a single hero falls. Everything just in sync there, coming through. I mean, GVK, kind of a risky rotation in the sense that he had like no mana. He had to wait for wand charges to sort of get, like, get off his second spell and that engagement, and then perfectly timed with the chrono coming through. Just everything in sync for Bedboom. Really nice rotation, taking the gate on the void, so he was able to get a really nice chrono. It looks a little weird because he chronoed a lot of his teammates, but it breaks up the fight. A nice fear from the Dark Willow just pushes everyone back, and they have so much HP. The Dragonite just so far ahead, the Chaos Knight's also far ahead, but this limited damage, I think, from Puck and the supports of Azure is kind of really showing in this early game. As well as having like a Luna, right? Yep. You, you know, you don't have this like, Eclipse ever early on since you're going for this like, farming build. And so even if you had to manage to get off like before the Chrono or something, it's just, it's not enough. Like, the, you can just feel how weak the coil is. Oh, this. Well, man. Not surprising that if you're stunned once, you're dead. I mean, and again, he's still just trying to finish off that Witchblade. Like, it broke as a joke doesn't even begin to describe it for this poor old Puck right now. I mean, he's still going to be able to make things happen if they can be the first ones to get the jump, but that just hasn't been what's happening. And Tian Ming runs in to save, will get rooted there. I mean, he's going to have a snowball to try and survive a bit longer. But with no help nearby, this is going to be the rundown walrus punch. Well, no. No, 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 no. Unless. Barely. Oh, 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 maybe. Tian Ming running. Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> Looks interesting. Made them work for it. Yeah, you know, more space for the cores. Get, get maybe one more camp out of that juke there. Thankfully, again, they do have the Dawn, which I think is one of the better heroes at collecting the whole map because you can always show up to any fight. But I think they really need to find a way to connect the puck and the supports on a solo hero. They always end up finding, like, taking a more defensive fight where they get jumped first and they have to make sure they survive before they can do damage. And I don't think that's really going to work out for them right now. But if they get this jump, they get a coil on a solo void and the Dawn ults in, they yeah. have the damage to kill these heroes. Yeah, it just has to be coil and solo guardian for sure. It's like the only way. And the, the walrus punch, of course, will be very helpful. So that's probably what they're going to do right now. He's got two smokes in the tank here on the top. So hasn't pulled them out yet, so maybe not. Oh, I see. Got to do a little bit of bottle work here. Got to help oh. out Somnus. Witchblade's also finished, so it's like their, I would say it's their peak right now. The next like five or so minutes won't really give them any more strength. The blink on Puck won't really change anything. The Luna's going to keep farming, so they really need to get a kill in the next minute or two, I think, before the Dragonite starts to get too big for them. Yeah, Tammy does sneak a ward down mid. Just runs on through and gets it down. Not spotted, so that's pretty huge for them. Also there is more. vision for Bat Boom here, though. Tammy goes through. And again, going to be left behind. With the Kobold, de-warding, doing work. Makes the work happen. They're actually going to leave him to be and instead kill the Kobold. No. I mean, is that, is that like a sort of BM kill? They let you go and they come and take your Kobold instead? You don't want to get him to turn, turn around. Wait. Oh, he misses the dead shot. That they needed. That one hurts. Somnus was so oh, close as well. Now we stunned up Somnus. Oh my goodness. They're going to find another. Tries to jump away. FY there to help his buddy. But oh. no. Nightfall comes in with the Chrono. They're going to bring down the Muerta to boot. Three heroes dead. And maybe even a fourth. Chalice is caught. They're dropping the egg on the low ground. Nothing is going good for Azure Ray in this game number two. Oh, I love that he doesn't even give him a chance. Just drops the chrono, catches on two. Easy clean up there with a double. 17 to 4 right now for Bet Boom. Bet Boom are coming in with a lot of action in this game, too. It feels like whatever problems happen in the draft, game, this one they've completely solved. Is it just the laning stage that sort of uh, changed it up, or is it also the team fight towards this mid game? Well, as a serial puck hater, okay, uh, you know th this is the problem with the hero, right? I mean, for sure, if, if you do get into a bad match, I begin a situation where you're just you can't do anything on the map. You just feel like this giant liability. As the hero, over time, the damage hasn't scaled with the overall tank ability of all heroes to the same level. So, like, you just need way more help on this hero than maybe you used to. 
And when you don't get that help, or if you struggle so much in your lane that you're the liability, then the game just gets really hard really fast. I would also say Bepboom is probably one of the strongest laning teams in the world, if not the strongest. So when you give them all of these counterpick lanes, you have a CK in a free lane, you have a Dragonite in a free lane, you have a Void counterpick lane against a Dawnbreaker. Yep. It's like, what more do you want to ask for as this team? Like, you're going to win your lanes, you're going to snowball the game, and if they keep the momentum rolling, this game might not last long enough for Azure to have a chance. Uh, but you know, these games, they have tended to manage to last long. We can't count on anyone. We have seen larger comebacks in several matches so far at TI, where I, I look at the screen like, oh, this game. This game's over. This I'll game's not looking good. Yeah, I, I take a walk around the arena, you come back, and it's swung 14K the other way. So uh, those are the kind of hopes and dreams that Azure will be aspiring towards here. Well, and it does feel like oftentimes those have happened off the back of solid team fights or an overextension or something else like that. And maybe that's a situation where if, you know, Nightfall uh, whips a chrono, then you can look for some smoke play or something from Azure Ray. Uh, but will that even need to be dropped down for the team fights to be won? Definitely feels like it's a little bit of hide and seek as Azure Ray tried to set up to claim this bottom tier one tower with Desso done on Chalice. It should finish rather rapidly. We've also seen a lot of Luna games where the early game is a little slow, but she hits some point where she doesn't die. The new shard is really, really strong, and I think it's honestly undervalued. Even yeah. in the games, you don't feel like it's going to do that much, but it's damage reduction, and it's also just constant right clicks in a circle around her, and she's versus three melee cores. Assuming, you know, Dragonite's a... Oh. I'll call him a melee. Yeah. Look at that. Now that is an interesting decision, as they're going to sneak right on in, and with FY Pierce the Veil and... Uh, of course, tag team Roche down to half HP already. No idea. These are the exact kind of sneaky plays you have to make, right? Oh yeah. If you want to get back in the game like this, because it's not so much about you having it; it's about them not having it. Even the gold from it just matters so much. Being able to like have one core, be able to farm a little more aggressively, and they scan it, but it's a little too late. Azure claim the Aegis for themselves as Toronto Tokyo finishes the Midas, which, by the way, we're at three now. Okay, and they're all in one team. And the other, the other support has a, uh, a Philly stone. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot coming online. They're gearing up for the late game, even though they already have a substantial lead. Well, as they start moving forward here with the smoke as well, Pure, of course, having this Shadow Blade, as well as a Yule's initiation here from Save Two. So anyone can be caught rather quickly. They just need to find any hero. It. Yeah. Oh, oh. Fy shows. On a wave, that bounty rune, it's gonna cost you your life. Two seconds, stun, he done. Void might find something top if Muerta's not a little careful. But FI will be fine. Hey, we gotta, gotta grab the Lotuses, you know, stack them up, get that block of cheese later. Well, Gunner, Gunner, is it gonna happen? Are we ever oh. gonna get a block of cheese? Have you ever even mentioned it in one of your games? Has anyone ever been like, yo, guys, a gold block of cheese? I think we were the first team in DPC to make a block of cheese in a game. Oh, okay. okay. All right, that's good. I don't know. I don't want to quote that, but we made it in one game. Right, in one DPC match. Yeah. I don't think we've had one on land yet. No, we, I don't think so either. It's it, it just hurts too much to be able to not want to use them. Oh, that's true. Because yeah. using them matters a lot in these fights, especially for the supports where you don't want to commit everything and they pop the cheese or the lotus and you feel like you just wasted everything. So it ends up just being unrealistic to save your lotuses for that long. Dude, and when the game crushing dreams right now. Okay. I know. Yeah. It's so Yeah, guys, give it like 10 more minutes and we'll get like three of them. All right. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Thank It'll you. be appreciated. Yeah. Just It'll lie to fun. us. Yeah. yeah That's right. what we want. Okay. All the lotuses. Um, by the way, we are now going to quickly be approaching a fourth Midas on Bet Boom. Uh, save okay. had it had forced to have queued up and decided nope we're going the other way. He just clicked around. I know. I saw his allies like oh you guys are doing that huh? All right, I guess that's the play. But another objective knocked down here. Nobody dying to the tormentor as well. Very well played by Azure. Okay, also they got the experience room. Yep. So you know it's usually in these situations where a team is really far ahead. At 20 minutes they'll make a move. They'll take tormentor, take your XP, and that's when the game feels almost over. Yeah. You lose so much, you lose all the gold experience. You have nowhere on the map to go. They're outside your base. But thankfully, they actually take those objectives for themselves, so they keep moving the game forward. And that's what they need to do. Just make small steps, keep playing the game. The longer until you lose, the more chance you have to win. And it has felt like it has been like it's almost fine. a little passive there from Bepboom in some of these moments. Like this idea of how long GBK spent farming just the Midas in his own jungle, not rotating up top, and then not going for the super aggressive play of like trying to punish the Tormentor in the Wizard Room at 20 like we have seen several teams do. 
It is really interesting. Like, they kind of just like controlled. You're seeing them buy all these Midas's. Feels like they kind of have this mindset of just like chill. I really don't want to give them any opportunity here on Azure. Oh, yeah. Well, and the other thing, too, is that, I mean, yeah, it's an 8K gold lead. In terms of fighting strength, with zero Midas's on the side of Azure, I wonder if there actually is going to be a window where they take like a solid fight with Luna Aura and all this other stuff where they can yeah. actually win it. Yeah, you're down on Midas gold in, in that sense. And they have an aura. Oh, no. Oh, oh. Whoa. Whoa. They didn't see it. Oh, Nightfall oh. knows. Nightfall. He knows. Atos, leave me alone. I don't want to be here anymore. FY tries to jump away. Here's the, the veil. Okay, meanwhile, down bottom. Oh, they try and turn this, but the fear, the timing of that one was so nice, and they run in with the tusk, immediately gets stunned. Yeah, FY just leaves. They have the perfect answer. Somnus tries to get away, but save is all on top of him. Pure tries to run out also as they focus their efforts onto Lul, pull him back in, kill that hero too. But FY lived. FY did live. FY so, We're going for the, the positives here. He forced a 4v4, and they tried their best. And no chrono. Yeah, yep. some opportunities. Unfortunately, not able to uh, connect on what they needed, though. And it's immediately back into just choking out the lanes and, and pushing up here as GBK is closing on Aghanim's extremely close. It's like 300 gold away now. It's also going to be perfect timing with level 18, which is re when you oh, really yeah. want the Ags, because before it's okay, you get the Frost, but once you, oh, feels uh, terrible. Yeah, once you get that level 4 awesome. Dragon, that's that's where it starts being really strong. Right, giant guy, he's ready. About to have it done at that Aghanim Scepter. And of course, the other thing to watch for here is going to be that next Aegis. So three minutes until it's capable of respawning, still a ways away. Uh, to know what it's going to be, but yeah, it's just been all bet boom this entire game. It's felt like, and Chalice, Chalice along with Tian Ming decides to go for the easier kill, and he dies very quickly. Bet boom, keep it up. Where do you go for Azure? It's it's really hard to find a really nice location to go just to farm. You don't you don't even want to fight at this point. You don't yeah. want to, you never want to say like we can kill this guy. You can't. So it's how to find ways to farm so you can kill people. I think FY is honestly doing a really good job at still being on the map, forcing out heroes, farming, but... Oh, he's fine. Surely, he's fine, right, guys? Yeah, oh. he can farm in his tier two. <laughs> Jeez. What could go wrong? Gonna have to start cutting some waves, it feels like, maybe, for Somnus. It's so scary. You cut, you have to cut waves versus three different cores who can kill you from the fog. A support who honestly might be able to kill him from the fog and save. Yeah, with the so, evils, so... Are you gonna? You just gonna risk it, and you probably have to. Yeah. You have you have to do these moves that are just risky because if you don't, you just kind of sit back and let yourself. Lose. And look how fast they're just on this as well, like coming back, checking out. There's a sentry. The shadow blade. Yeah, they know. So yeah. maybe it'll be okay. Somnus. With his invis rune. Oh, they're bringing numbers. They want to set up onto pure. Interesting. So if he sticks around, this invis rune might actually end up making the difference. Okay, or it won't. No, or it really, really won't at all. They force rotations and then everybody runs away. If he had have gone the, the other direction though, like he goes off to the east mad dead, like they they probably just clean him up. Would have been pretty cool for him, but not going to be the case this time. Backs out, going to jaunt away. And then the call is maybe push down mid a bit. We'll see if they get the D ward onto this one. Yeah, they're gonna move in and get it. Now yeah, they're trying to get sneaky though. Luna Shadow Blade, Shadow Blade out next for uh, FY as well. Doing their best. Maximum creep cutting available. And yeah, you can see the item that Somnus has queued up next. It's going to be that Lincoln Sphere. He needs a way to not just like immediately die. Yeah, and so the second Roche is coming up, as you were saying earlier. And the second Roche is the really, that's like the game closing one. If right. you're going to end the game before 50 minutes, it's on second Roche. And so Azure did a really good job at taking the first one. It's really sneaky, but I don't think Beppum will let them get in that situation again. No, and they obviously like cleaned it up nice and early too. So you yep. kind of get this good timing. Yeah, they're going to get this one. like 27 minute Roche probably around. And that's a really nice timing. You can chill for two, three minutes, and then you go to the 30 oh. minute siege. Oh, he's going right for Lou. He's not, he's not even stopping. All right, All right no, no, stop. stop. Yeah, he yeah. sees the shard. He's like, okay, never mind. you know. Meanwhile, Chrono, it's up. He's hunting Nightfall. Wasn't able to get anybody. Yeah, Chalice went up to the high ground instead, so they get some separation there. Lula's still staying farmed on this Luna. He's, you know, right along lines with that Faceless Void, but it's the rest of his squad that just doesn't really do that much, and Puck in particular, Somnus, that 
has had a really tough time of it. It's so hard to recover on this hero. I feel like when you see pucks maximizing their net worth, it's because they have full control over their own jungle. They can do all the little double orbs where they're like hitting every single camp constantly over and over. They're stealing the enemy camp, so yeah. even if their net worth is the same, the enemy has lower. So right. it just looks like they have more gold. And this game, he's not really able to do anything. I think the DK pick really shut him down. Similar to the void we saw earlier today, where they just pick these heroes that go on the puck and don't let you play the game. Six deaths, not something that you see that often for Somnus. One, nine, and two right now on the Tusk. And every time we see a DK, the crowd goes wild for some reason. They love, they love it. <laughs> this was a really fast Roshan. I yeah. think it was a six second respawn time. Oh, so I imagine. Are they going to go through? Well, they're thinking about it. Imagine. Mid lane? No, they're not going to do anything there. Somnus is still hanging out. Gonna try and cut oh this wave, goodness. but they're actually gonna is. find it. So one thing Azure is doing really good is they're still farming the map. FY is getting his gold. Everyone is kind of getting what they need from the map. It's not as much as Bepboom, and it's not as much as they would like, but they are, they're not letting themselves loose. They're doing what they have to do, and just Ooh. constantly oh, farming. Here, the great positioning. He jumped, he jumped. Is he dead? He's in yeah. trouble and gone. Three heroes caught by the fear, but there is not enough follow-up. They jump in with GPK, tries to get the stun, the damage in. Chalice there for the heal. Manta dodge, not going to be enough. Godlike from Pure as they chase down Chalice. He too will die. They get one kill, but it cost them a lot. So Azure Ray, they will lose for Bet Boom. Clear path towards high ground if they want it. Man, this is exactly what Bepboom did in their series versus uh, Virtus Pro. It was the exact same thing, right? Like, where they have this lead, and then you think, okay, you know, they're going to make this good play. They get this snipe, and every single time is immediately punished. Like, they're always so ready to back each other up in these games. Also, you just know that it's the right play, that you have to punish the guy who's jumping the wave. You, you can't just let him get away with other things, but it's not enough. Yeah. They all just die, and now their base is getting pushed. Just like that, GPK on the high ground, taking a tier three tower. The ultimate is gonna wear out pretty soon. And you can see the amount of respect that Bet Boom are having for the potential of Azure. And I guess also the, their confidence going into the later stages that they know we don't have to take those risks right now. Yeah, and you can see some pings starting to head towards that Roche pit here as it, it's almost 30 minutes. So it will be rotating down bottom relatively soon. There's also a DD in the river. Gonna miss that one though. I also think there's probably some level of, in the last game, I feel like Bet Boom was, it was really close between the two teams, the whole game. Like, less than 2,000 net worth for the majority of the game, but they kind of got outscaled. The fights were really hard for them to take, so, you know, they change it up, they buy all their Midas's, and they're not going to let themselves get outscaled. They're going to keep farming and make sure no matter how late the game goes, they have more gold than you, and they can win the game over you. Not to the Midas's say. Save, trying to get towards an Aghanim Scepter for himself. Azure, they see GPK, decide to jump on him to start, make him less tanky, oh, no. but the chrono for the turn, and the deeps being thrown out and ripping them to shreds. They didn't stand a chance. Where to? You're gone to. Can't even get GPK. Oh, baby. Well, they don't head for the Roche. They just head down the lane right now. I mean, he is too freaking big. You think you can take him down with that Silver Edge? It's just not going to be enough. Oh, wow. FY's back there, just firing as much damage as possible on the support Muerto, but it's not there. It just can't be enough. I mean, did bad work, that's for sure, but... Taking it down up the lane, trying to put the nail in the coffin right now. And I mean, after using the chrono, there is a, you know, a window where that's not up, but they're taking the buildings through backdoor protection. Still willing to stick around and, I mean, <laughs> honestly, I don't think that there's any reason that they have to leave at all, but they're well, still going to play it safe. You know, they glyph, they're coming back alive, and they got Midas's. There's a Roshan. There's a, yeah, you know, Midas to hit. Yeah, the gold. There's probably Tormentor as well soon-ish. You know we're in there. Oh, man, look at this. How quickly this could have turned, but... What a chrono. Just gets it off right in time. And wasn't able to quite get the finish there on the GPK. I thought maybe even the Luna Shard was going to do enough to take him down at the end, but... It's just too freaking big. Just the Sunray. It was a perfect line. All four dire heroes in a line. Oof. Dragonite also in the same exact line. So healing all the heroes, damaging all the heroes. And Nightfall just got to sit there and hit them. And they all just die before the chrono's over. Nightfall, you know, maybe he's playing some Phoenix or something. He's helping out. He's just yeah. like trying to tell you, look, I got him. Like, I'm lined up. I'll just chrono my own teammates. It's fine. Into the pit they They're go. Sneaking it. Trying to take it down. GPK says, hey, how you doing, everybody? BKB tries to run out the root, the damage, the Sunray. It's hitting on the Lu, and there is not an answer in the world for that. 
They take down the Tusk and the Luna, gonna claim the Aegis. FY, oh, tries a dead shot, two is gonna go down. This is not for you to take. They're gonna also find Somnus, who will attempt to escape, but the Terrorized chase down, blink away. Charles to farm some creeps for a moment, hides behind the tree, but the stun is there. And GPK, as he's done many times in this one, is gonna force Somnus to retreat. No answer at all. Aegis on the faceless void, and GG's called. They've had enough. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, go for one last glorious attempt there. You know there's no chrono at that exact moment in the pit, so they try and find something, but they, they kind of knew. And this game got out of control really fast. This one, I mean, at five minutes was when the big swing happened, if you can believe it or not. Ten minutes were at like an 80% win probability or something like that. It was just a devastating beatdown from Bet Boom. I really like how they did their lanes this game. I think they had winning lane matchups for all three lanes, so I think the draft was really in their favor. I would say, you know, how the game looked is how the draft was going to play out. Yeah, not a lot of surprises there. Wow. Getting a little bit of love from the crowd after that impressive showing in Pure. The young player feeling a lot of it right now as we head on over. I mean, this again, you think about the mentality of a team. That's been one of the big criticisms for Bet Boom for a while is their inability sometimes to come back from a loss. Uh, sometimes they maybe would get a little bit tilted, but it feels like on this big stage, when most pressure is on them, they were able to stand up to where they needed to be. Do you think in game number three we're going to see anything remarkably different? Is it the same type of dynamic? I think they're getting pretty fired up. That's what it looks like to me. You know, Pierre there, he's coaxing up the crowd here. He's feeling yeah. good about it. If anything that I would expect to see change, it should just be straight up better lanes for Azure, right? right? Like you feel like they're going to put yeah. more focus into that, maybe just focus a little bit more on the idea of flex and the possibilities of the matchups that could occur. Right. And, uh, you know, probably yeah, I, such a bad puck game. I think giving the puck gets counterpicked, Dawn gets counterpicked by Void. That's all yeah. the number ones. It feels like they got really counterpicked in those lanes and Chaos Knight's probably strongest laner, just blind pick right now in the whole whole game. Yep. And yep. so they give that away too, so they don't really have a response to the offlane Chaos Knight. And it didn't feel like they had any responses. They just kind of picked their best heroes, and it didn't really work out. Support duo as well. You know, That's you can how it goes. and finish. It's nice stuff. Tough stuff indeed. We'll see if the panel can come up with some more answers to strengthen up those lanes a bit as we head on back to them. Thank you so much. The series is now tied one apiece. We're going to be seeing a game at number three for our second series. So Bet Boom, they were dominant in this game. They actually took game one personally, and they said, we are not going to get 2 0 This is not how we are going to go out of TI. So Owie, Bet Boom coming in with a fire in themselves, and this lineup just snowballed. There was no stopping it on the side of Azure. Yeah, I think they played the lanes even better than we on the panel expected. I think, like, I mean, no one was expecting the DK to do this well over Solomon's puck, right? Like, he just completely took over the game from the middle lane. He had, like, I think double the CS, 10 more denies, and he just, everything flowed from there. And there is no comeback mechanism really for Azur Ray. You look at these heroes, Luna needs to farm, Puck needs his side lanes to win so that when he does rotate they can get kills. And Don plays as a hero who needs a side up, right? Typically somebody who's doing an okay job on one side of the map will start a fight, Dawnbreaker will ult in and then you can go from there. But none of these conditions were met for Azur Ray in this game simply because of how well Bedroom played those lanes and of course the solo kills made by GPK. I mean, I love these little tricks on the lane. GPK brought the blunt, br blood grenade and uh, he killed the puck with it second time. Like minute like six or something, clutch. right? It was very clutch. Yeah, I've never seen this before. That mid player bringing that blood grenade and having that opportunity to like finish the hero. It's it's amazing. Yeah, and I mean, he performed like super. Like he outperformed like anybody else like in this in this particular game. But also pure like he was very very stable, uh, getting all the pick offs, like playing like 12 to zero or something. Like it's it's. it's a very solid gameplay from all of them all around. It was the first Dragon Knight of the tournament that we were seeing as well, GPK. Not only that Blood Grenade... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, Reza? You know, uh, the Blood Grenade trick. Trick. Yeah, yeah. I knew you'd know it. <laughs> but he did. It's a Dragon Knight first time. Ali, you already talked about how in the draft phase, you didn't understand why people weren't going for it, that it could have been this counter. Now we see it. It's pretty big. Is it still a very situational hero, though? I think it is situational. I think they're able to pick at this game because there's not really any damage on the supports of Azure. Like, Murta will eventually get damage, but honestly, that's way later into the game. Her spells are just, like, good team fight. They don't do that much. Also, I feel like even this game, like, it performed above expectations. I could even see a game where if he doesn't dominate mid so hard, I saw some Mortas, they would rush, like, a Veil of Discord first item, not even any boots, and he could play on Puck, and DK could actually die to that. But because of his lane dominance, like, there was no angles at all to fight this DK early. 
I think a big reason for the decline of DK in general is he's usually really popular in metas where sl spirit heroes are popular, when you need that instant stun. And though Puck has made some appearances, this uh, TI, he's not that popular of a hero. So if you don't need that instant stun from mid lane, if you're not hard countering anything, you're just a DK. You don't do that much damage. You're not as tanky as you used to be, and you are dependent on your team. But that was perfect conditions for a DK to be met. Anything else that really stood out for you about Bet Boom here, Reza? Because this game, we've already said it, was a very stomp sort of game. Is there much more to break down I mean, and talk about? The only about hope it? they had is like killing the Nightfall two times in this game, but other than that, they had like really no chances because of the, their their lineup. As Mira mentioned, doesn't have really like a good mechanic of coming back, especially after using uh, you're losing your lanes this hard. Yeah. We have a little bit of a content piece for you guys, Azure. We got to talk about uh, everything that makes them a team. 呃,天使你對我來說,在小時候可能會非常難受吧。I, I followed FY closely. Man, how's this guy so good? Because he didn't play for a relatively long time, and when he came back, he's just like FY God once again. I think the and the is very important. And I think the to the so... You just ask me to 当然人生中也有很多遗憾 FY, I think that he's one of the players that I think probably the Dota community at large would most like to see win a TI in the future. Uh, FY, I mean, the dream is still alive. He wanted to prove, he wanted to climb higher and higher in FE. The Chinese Dota fan that you are, how much would seeing either LGD or Azerite lift the Aegis B? Oh, dude, that would be so emotional. <laughs> but I mean, especially for Azerite, there are a lot of names on this lineup that you feel like should already have an Aegis at this point. You're looking at not just FY, but Somnus, who many people regard as the best mid player in the world, or they yeah. thought he was for a very long time. So in terms of who's deserving and who's not deserving, I mean, that's a big discussion. But these players have been around forever, and they're so good. And you know, to see them get their desserts at the end of the day would be very cool. How do you keep in, in form, Aoi, if you're this player that you're in that middle zone, you want to still reach high, you still want to play competitive, but you're not sure if everything's in it for you, if you're taking a couple months off and then you want to come back for qualifiers and then into TI making it top six? I mean, I think these players, like, it looks like they're super talented, and they are, but I think under all that is, like, just a special ethos where they're working super hard and they're putting everything together. How they'll approach pubs, they'll always take something from it, learn. I think FY is one of those players. He's always sort of on top of the meta. He's always like looking for his opportunities in every lane when he's looking to roam. I think it's a lot about what he puts into it more than like some, you know, uh, special talent or something. But still, it's a team game, right? It's yeah. the, like there's a lot of players that deserve that. Like, for example, Zai is one of them. Like, Artizi is one of them. Maybe me. <laughs> but you could throw yourself in there, isn't it, it? It is a team game. There's like so many things that go into the win. I mean, Curtis sure knows of it more than I do. He was there a few times. But uh, like, it, there's so much stuff in the world, right? There's luck as well. There's team chemistry. There's a meta. There's understanding of the heroes. It's just like too much. And just like, then just having like one good player performing super well. You mentioned uh, the meta, knowing hero matchups a little bit. Do you think that Azure Ray fell too much on comfort for heroes in game number two, Effie, and that Bet Boom are such an adaptable team that, that those changes between game one and game two are going to now give them an advantage for game three, unless Azure come out with a strat that we haven't seen yet in TI? I think depending on who has first pick or second pick, um, 
it, it'll change because that last pick, DK, completely caught them off guard. That dismantled their draft entirely, and it made it so that there's just no entry point into that game. So they're definitely going to be conscious if they have... Uh, if they don't have over a last pick of the GPK hero, because if GPK gets a winning lane, like a winning lane that is that heavy of a counter pick, then it could be a very difficult game for them. That's now two, sorry, Ali. I think both teams are sort of on the idea that like pure win lane, game good for <laughs> Betboom. Pure like having a rough lane equals Azure is going to control a lot of the map. I think mm. this is what the next draft is going to focus on. We'll probably see bans on the center, the spear breaker again, but I think they'll put more emphasis. Like I think they should look at the CK as well. Like they should, Honestly, if I were them, I'd just battle all of Pierce heroes in the first phase. I think that's the best way for them to go. It's tough because then Primal is still in that pool of, again, what you said, it depends on who is first and, and, and second pick to how many bans they're going to get for themselves. But Centaur, Primal, Bristle, Spirit Breaker, that's kind of rough now. And you got to add CK to the pool too. Yeah, we're at the stage of TI where we figured out the, the 10 pool of OP heroes and you are forced to give away a few every game, regardless of what. So it just depends on which team you're playing against, which player you want to focus in that first phase. And, you know, we've seen the story. We've seen the story for days now. If you ban out Pure's heroes, but Boom has to play until minute 60, 70. They have to play to scale and sometimes they don't get there in the cleanest way. So take it to that turf again. Yeah. We are not really seeing Primal. Do you feel... Rezo, that he is in that realm of being hard to counter, hard to break down, or, or have people played so much emphasis on the, him that maybe it's time to let him back into the pool? Maybe we need to see if he's still a broken hero. I, I don't think so. I, think <laughs> I didn't even finish should, my question and you're already shaking your head. I think the hero should still be banned. Like, I mean, we've seen a video about the, how, like, how broken heroes are, and like, a lot of people mentioned the Primal Beast because it's, it's really hard to, to play against that. It's, it's the meta of like, uh, Blade Man Haro Tarask, and he's uh, excelling at that. He was the first one who was like, yep. you know, doing all of that at, for, at the first place. What would you want to be letting through, Ali? Um, honestly, I would like them, if they want to try something, I think playing versus Spearbreaker wouldn't be the worst. That hero is sort of OP though, so I'm not too sure. I don't know, Dota's, when it gets it this late in a tournament, it's just so weird because we're both seeing like all the OP heroes, but we're also seeing like some new picks come in at the end. Like, you get to more refined strategies and niche picks. We saw a Razor in the Liquid Gladiators. We saw like the DK here. So I just want them um, to sort of innovate a bit on their picks on Azure Raid. Maybe they have something hidden, something, you know, we saw Necro already kill some tanks. Maybe they have something more like that. And to me, it seems like the team that is doing this innovation is actually on top of the, you know, on top of the game because, uh, like, you see this DK, he's, he won the game for them, like, like almost alone, right? So you see this Razor as well from the Duraccio, like, he was doing such a good job in this game. So whatever teams like this, and it's also like those heroes are coming, like, from the flow state of, like, you know, drafting. You're not, like, preparing for them <laughs> specifically, but it comes, like, to the mind, like, that, like this, and it's in, in this state of flow, it's just, like, it's really br brilliant ideas. Yeah. I mean, we, we saw yesterday as a Ray are definitely capable of that innovation that their region is famous for right now, but they did run a mid snap fire with a support clockwork and they had a really great early game up until the lead was thrown. So maybe they'll go back to some of the more interesting mid picks. I think for sure they need more damage, right? On a two, four, five. I feel like this last game, they just, they didn't have any play options. I felt like they were even like clutching every opportunity. They stole Roshan, they sniped Tormentor, you know, they clutched two kills on Nightfall, but there's just not enough. It's too hard to do these moves. I completely agree. This is the meta of like high damage supports and they need to be looking for that as well. I mean, unless FY is playing really sick task, which he did in the first game, I think they need to be looking for the more damage on the supports. Well, our players have now walked out. They're in the boots. They're going to be warming up. They're going to be trying to think about what they want to do for this game number three in a best of three. And while we give them a little bit of time, let's have a closer look at Betboom. Betboom always has their ups and downs, but overall a very young and talented roster. Yeah, they're, they're a strong team when it comes to like small details of Dota, you know? Like, I, I can feel the energy he puts into these small details, and that's, I believe, what they're extremely strong about. They usually have like farmy side lands that carry like known to not die and not pressure too much, like rarely show, but be there at clutch moments. And usually it's their mid and both supports. So you know that Nightfall has the highest pings, you know, on the map, right? 
And I remember when they were playing the official match, Toronto Tokyo making like slightly bad move, like, you know, it's just like maybe one centimeter or something. And I already see Nightfall is pink, like, bro, bad move, bad move. You need to right click this guy. Specifically, the scariest off lane. I think all of them are really good laners, but I think the pure lane, the pure save lane is really terrifying. It always feels like they kind of like kill their lane at least once a game, if not multiple times. And so it's always worth that team, like make sure the safe lane doesn't, isn't a disaster because there's a lot of games where the safe lane just a disaster. A strong looking team and we got to hear from other pros, other people playing at this TI, just how strong that off lane is. It's a narrative that we keep pushing, but more importantly, apparently Nightfall is the, the ping master on that team. We thought it was going to be GPK. It's Nightfall all along. <laughs> but I mean, I, I guess it makes sense. If you hear from any pro player talk about Nightfall, talk about playing pubs with Nightfall, they say that he's communicating for the entirety of the game. His mic is just open mic and he talks and he micromanages his entire team. Well, look, I'm already. We've got to get this series going. We need a game at number three and we need a draft for that. Azure Ray versus Bet Boom T. Game three. It's elimination on the line. It's the difference between being top six and top four. So these teams want a win for themselves. They've proven that they can do it. Game one and game two. Game three, though, this is where it really matters. We're already a little bit along in our draft here. So our first phase bands are done and dusted. And I still, actually now I see this like Chaos Knight. That importance has been placed on it, but still a central band out. Also, Super kind of pool. Yeah. Also, what you were talking about, Ali, about them lacking damage, they fixed this with the Phoenix, right? Uh, they kept going for that first phase Marta, but it just wasn't working out for them in terms of a support that scales. So do you like this adjustment? Yeah, I think the Phoenix is for sure a good adjustment. I think they need something like that in this series. I feel like when you have heroes that have damage, you just have way more options on the map. And the, right now, how the map sort works is it's so large that if you have to bring too many heroes to do, like, kill one hero, it's not worth it. Like, you either bring a lot of heroes or you want to make plays with just like one or two heroes. High damage supports generally let you do that, and then they all scale into the mid late game. Yeah, you guys were right about uh, targeting the viewer. First four buns are dedicated probably to him, and uh, they were taking all their his best heroes. But I do want to mention, like, about Nightfall as well. Uh, like, I've, I've been with this team for a while, and uh, this guy, like, he generally want to help his teammates excel and, like, be better. So he's, like, very active, and he's, like, very smart about the game. And he's not looking, on, looking only from his perspective and from his role, but he's also, like, trying to help his teammates as much as possible. So I think, like, he, he, he was talking a lot with the Pure and, like, sharing his, uh, his experience from the offlane. That's why Pure transitioned to the offlane this, this fast, right? And I have to say that role swap between Nightfall and Pure, where they decided to just put Pure on offlane and Nightfall back on carry, was the best decision they could ever make. Because um, what you want to see from your carry is like stability and dependability, and you know that clutch potential. Whereas from your offlaner, you want someone who's explosive and willing to take risks, and that's characteristic of both of these players. They were just playing the wrong roles the entire time. Yeah, I think it's genius too, but it wasn't like uh, like I don't think they're they're thinking about like this long term decision, like how it's gonna end up, but. Most of us like, I want to play carry. <laughs> do, do you want to keep playing with us? All right, <laughs> go to the off lane. <laughs> it was more like that. Wait, that happened because Pure missed out on Berlin Major, right? So Nightfall had to play carry, and then they played with a they played with an off lane sub. Yeah. I forgot who subbed for them, but I think after Nightfall played carry again in the Berlin Major, he, he just felt he just felt his calling. He thought to himself that this is where he was always meant to be. Berlin Major. I was there. I was going to say the person came <laughs> right next to you something. And she doesn't remember me. <laughs> that's, that's the nuke. He is very forgetful. So, Aoi, um, I just want to know more from you, actually, about Clockwork and <laughs> I, can I Can I leave? Like, you can go like, Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving. Walk out of it. I'm sorry, I'm just <laughs> back. I was just joking. <laughs> I do want to hear, Aoi, because you mentioned specifically the Clockwork uh, about some of their last drafts. You wanted some innovation. Is this the innovation that's going to end up in a win though. I think Clock is a really good counter pick to Enchantress specifically. Um, you're really good at blocking her camps, you're a good kill threat on her, and honestly the creeps don't bother you that much. I think this is like a very classic Azure Ray pick actually. I think they play it on both four and five. And 
what Clockwork excels at is also what I think Azure Ray's strength is, which I really like, which is after the laning phase sort of breaks down a bit, you know, between five to eight minutes, he's going to meet up, whether this is FY or Qingming uh, Clockwork, they'll meet up with each other and they'll go for kills on any lane. Mm -hmm. And also, it just opens up to enable that really long-range damage output from things like Phoenix or potentially even the snap that they ran yesterday. Uh, I, I like it a lot, definitely. It also just enables the rune security and maybe a bit of a means to shut down GPK. But now that this Brewmaster has come out, which is an Azure Ray specialty hero, I wonder if Bad Boomer are eyeing that Night Stalker, because a lot of teams have played Night Stalker recently uh, into Brewmasters, into Weavers, into Muertas and Phoenixes. So. For me, it's looking pretty good right now. Actually, I like the Weaver that you just mentioned. That sounds really good to me. I think the Night Stalker, it can work, but the matchup versus Phoenix can be weird. Like, sometimes you spot the Phoenix, you kill him. Sometimes he presses R, it's daytime, you're pathetic. <laughs> but generally, I think, honestly, I think that match is a bit overrated for Phoenix's side. I think Night Stalker actually has a lot of angles. I can see the NS and the Weaver here. I want to see the Night Stalker. We talked about the start of this series two games ago. And I'm just like, surely this is a bad boom specialty, especially with the rise of it being picked up. But instead, Morphling. I mean, Morphling has been looking pretty underwhelming, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I didn't really see a good games with it. Like, even 23 Savage, he was losing with Morphling. Yeah, I have the same impression of Morphling. I mean, I think his, his Aghanims is completely pathetic now. Like, this Ags does nothing. The Illusion dies instantly, takes 400% damage. So they sort of took away what made him so strong at the, like, Bally Major Morphling uh, tournament. However, I think it is a hero that can be very hard for Azure Ray to kick out. It's a hero that if you want to leave Chalice alone, like Morphling will get 4 CS and denies every single wave in a hard camp. And that can punish someone like a Brewmaster who, you know, Brewmaster, we've seen this tournament at first, it was like super high value, first pick, everything. But teams have started to counter it with like these Weavers, um, Night Stalkers, heroes where you can't just ulti and kick them out. I think Morphling might be one of these heroes as well. I actually agree with that because I remember during the Riyadh Masters, Faithian was talking about two carries that he thought would enable you rotation to mid lane, which are Morphling and the CK. And when you have supports like Enchantress who want to leave you alone, these two do, they fare very well in terms of self-sustenance and being able to see us on lanes. I think they chose to go for the LSC here just because they're afraid of the PL, which already like, uh, you know, they play PL against Morphling, it was pretty free game. So this is like the preventing the PL from the Azure Ray's side. Block pick, basically. This is like one of Pure's best heroes. When he first transitioned to carry, I think he was playing like LC pretty much every single game. It's very low pick this tournament. I don't know what it is now, but I know I was doing my draft prep. It was Only like two pick, picks. yeah, two games, <laughs> yep. yeah, and I don't, I think it went 50-50. I'm not sure, might have lost both, can't remember. But it's actually a hero that kills a phoenix egg pretty well. Yeah, I think something we've seen as this tournament is like, there's this weird like choice, like, oh, do we want to counter the phoenix egg? Oh, I don't, I don't know if I want the snap for support. I don't know if I want these like heroes. They're not as meta. But Legion Commander is another hero that sort of used to be one of the big counters. I think we don't see him as much just because of the supports that are in meta, like the Pugnas and Shadow Demons, and those heroes are really hard to play against as a Legion. But this game, they already see the supports, so it's a, it's a pretty good game for LC already. Usually he's quite committal against like these hard blade mills as well. Legion's typically like you dual zone, you burst them, and then you look at the fight, right? You want to be able to burst that one guy. You can't really do that to these hard heroes. But honestly, with a Morta and a Morphling, like you will have damage for this eventually. But more than that, I think they're pretty much just playing for their side lanes here, right? Like they just want to have as strong side lanes as possible, stay in three lanes and pressure. I think we'll see like them picking a really strong laner for GPK. Again, they have the second pick, so they'll have the last pick here. What is going to come as a carry? Like there's a, there's very little heroes that left that is good against LC, right? Maybe there's a Luna. Luna's for sure not bad. I think. I have a you got your list. heroes on it. You have no more excuses, Howie. Yeah, but I still don't know. <laughs> Give me the best option. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I would Maybe still consider crazy. the PL, to be honest. I think other than LC, it might be... Oh, no, never mind. They have the very last pick on the bed boom as well. It's going to be too hard to play PL. Don't you think Weaver could lane against LC pretty easily? Weaver can do pretty well in that lane, I think. Also, Lincoln's by your run, and it's not, the hard, it's not the most easy hero to counterpick when you have 23 like Azure does. I, I think Weaver is amazing. Yeah. It's a pretty good suggestion, for sure. Also, on the topic of you guys saying why LC fell out of meta, don't you think that in these longer team fights, something like a Brew could be very disruptive to the LC duel? Because like the cores that are currently showing in the Kunkka, and then of course the Brew that's going to be split, are not going to be easy to take down if you're an LC. Yeah, it's just really hard with this LC to commit to these spells, right? Like, he'll think, oh, I have to deal with a Brewmaster, and then there's an egg, or I have to kill, like, deal with a Phoenix, then you're dueling a support, and there's still the Brewmaster LT. 
yeah, honestly, it's like there's a lot that he has to, to deal yeah, with here. I'm honestly not sure why Legion is so underpicked, though. I feel like the hero should be pretty decent. I think it's like pretty high win rate in pubs, like maybe like 53% on track or something. Like, it's not a bad hero. Uh, is man kicking the... Oh, no, never mind. Yeah, man is not in the pool. Yeah, I think the standard bands when you have the Kung Kumit are like the Monkey King, the Necro, and then people sometimes look at the TA with um, some meld build, but I'm not too sure if it... It Honestly, Bet Moon might do it, but I'm not too sure if it suits her lineup that much. Oh, Invoker into Kanka. A little bit shook there, Ali. It's just usually picked the other way, but I think it can be a skill matchup. Like, if GKPK is really comfortable in this matchup, he feels like Invoker is a hero that's going to allow them to fight later on. And, I mean, he has had really good Invoker performances this tournament, so I'm excited to see that. Also, I feel like he might go, like, 2-2-0 and then start getting Sunstrike and yeah. have the dual Sunstrike, maybe even earlier, and then that could be really interesting. I think that's the logic they're going for, because when you were talking about how it doesn't feel like LC had enough damage, like, maybe with the Muerta it is enough, Invoker corrects that with Sunstrike, even if he has ha is having a hard lane. And if he's having a hard lane, they have the self-sustaining sideliner so that Enchantress can rotate in and maybe help the Invoker play into the Kunkka. I actually think Invoker is going to go cross X because they need this Vessel and Ryan around here because uh, those both sports in the side lanes, they're going to just farm and they need this active hero and they can't really afford to have a Sunstrike. But I do like the Bedboom lineup with this Invoker pick a lot. And it's game three. You come out with your signature heroes, right? You bust out the LC for Pure, you bust out the Invoker for GPK, and you hope for the best. Azure, on the other hand, they're doing the same thing. They got their Brewmaster, they got their Phoenix, they have good team fight, they have their Kunkka. They're also confident in this game three. Well, look, if you're going to get eliminated, at least do it in style. At the end of one of these, at the end of this game, one of these teams is going to be eliminated. We'll see if it's Bethum or if it's Azure. As we head on in, it's game three. Unbelievable, right behind us, there is a crowd that is screaming out a lot of things and got some great signs there, too. That one was amazing. My goodness. Yeah, they're battling now with about eight Bet Boom fans who will go to the <laughs> section next to them and also scream as loud as they can. And let me tell you, there were only eight of them, but they got heart, okay? The signs aren't as cool, though. That's they true. have moving signs? Yeah. They, they Azure, got, I don't know, that's a big they thing. They got, like, the LEDs going yeah. on, you know? I like it. No, yeah, it's they had cosplayers down here, too. It's a, it's a big contingent back there cheering them on. Well, and I will say that also this is one of those drafts where I feel like it could go either way. Um, was there anything that really stuck out to you? The panel really seemed to focus in on this Legion commander as maybe a, a, a pressure point where they could run into some issues. Do you guys kind of agree? What, what's the thought here? I honestly think the three cores for Bepum were all a little strange to me. I think the Morphling instead of Weaver, which we've normally seen as a brew response, Legion in general, this patch has been kind of undervalued. She yeah. hasn't won a game at this tournament yet. And the Invoker into Kunkka, which is generally when you pick Invoker, that's the first year you ban. You yeah. ban the Kunkka for this lane matchup. So it's okay. something I think they're trying to go comfort is what they talked about. The Voker is very comfort, Legion is very comfort, Morphling. So they're just doing their own thing. And they don't really care about what Azure is doing, and they're just saying, like, we're going to outplay you in the lanes, no matter what right. we pick. Oh, yeah. I think the, the Morphling is interesting because it does check off a lot of the same boxes of the Weaver. Like, it's a similar idea of you're going to have this overwhelming damage, uh, mostly later on versus the Pandas. Like, I kind of picture that point in the game where, like, Pandas, like, in between, like, 12 and 18, and you just, like, split, and the Pandas just die. Because yep. Morphling just, like, right-clicks them all down, which is pretty brutal. Uh, but the laning stage itself shouldn't be as bad as what the Brewmasters have been experiencing versus the, the Weaver. Yeah, the big thing with the Weaver is you're able to kind of dodge all the slows from Brew, dodge the Cinder Brew from just ticking you down, and constantly just go on the Brew as well and poke him. But the Morphling doesn't really have this ability to have like a disjoint tool. You don't want to use the Wave from off cooldown. It's way too much mana. So I think the laning honestly won't be that good for the Morphling unless, you know, there's a... I, you know, the Toronto Tokyo on the Enchanter yeah, yeah, that's true. Does well, this thing. One of the things that I think about, you know, sometimes there's these iconic moments in Dota that kind of happen, and one of the big things that always stood out to me was Somnus saying the word Kunkka as his answer to the Invoker that tops him yep. pick all the way back at TI8. Now picking that Invoker into it, the, you know, Aoi was talking about, the panel was talking about this entire dynamic. We saw GPK put together really solid performances against Kunkka before. Is it the universal change that's made this matchup better? What do you think it is? Yeah, Universal plays a part. Now you can buy Wraith Band on Invoker, which gives you armor to kind of stop this harass. I also think just in general, he has more damage. You can buy Bracer and Wraith Band, so you have more abilities to feel stronger in the early game. And I also think that people have gotten better at the matchup, just better at hitting the Kunkka, better at dodging the cleaves, and just overall, I would say it's again, it's like a skill-based matchup, okay. like uh, AUI said. So. I'll be interested to see how GPK gets out of this lane. He's shown a lot of skills on Invoker, that's for sure. And kind of had a couple of deathless games there where he was dominating yesterday. Uh, one deathless game and then immediately died in the next one. They tried to punish him, but 
We all know he's got a mean invoker here, and he wants to bring it out on the main stage whenever he can. Somnus also goes for the double gauntlet start, which is the build you go on Kunkka when you feel like you're going to crush the lane. It, it, it makes your bottle or bracer like really slow, but you have so much damage for denying and harassing that when you do this, you really want to win the lane. Yeah, and, and you so want to clutch up every he's very time. confident about just how this is going to play out for him. So far, he's doing just that. Four and three versus one and one. This is not how that Invorka performance went the other day. We'll get a couple of CS there with that Tornado, uh, but could be a bit of a tough one for him as this gets into the later stages. Uh, the other things to sort of keep our eyes on are going to be a couple of heroes that we haven't seen a ton of, uh, at least so far, and that's, again, the Legion Commander. So uh, Pure needing to deal with this early pressure, although there is already some good damage out. Gets hit by the Blood Grenade, and oh, the overwhelming odds almost enough, but the Stick Charge keeps him alive. I feel like we've almost seen more Clockworks now into the main stage than we did in, like, the Road to TI, you know? We, we've had a couple now popping up here, and uh, you can see kind of a rough matchup versus the Muerta. As you're, you're like level one, especially, you're always trying to batter yourself as much as possible. Oh, and the call in, the chase, the oh. push back. Oh, low, but not dead yet. Silence. Just barely able to get that separation. But you can see how aggressive you're capable of playing as Pure keeps on hitting these multi hero overwhelming odds. Just dropping his items and regening. He knows he feels very confident here under their tower right now. Really getting the most out of this hero, which is what you need. Again, a winless hero here at TI, but if you can find the right situation, maybe this will be it. But you gotta imagine a lot of that power is gonna be in the early game, because heading in later, sure, there will be damage. You, know, you got Morphling, you got Muerta, you have an Invoker there too to try and juice up even further. But we've seen how tanky these cores are able to get to, and just choosing your dual target looks really hard in this game. Just how long fights are. It's almost never like a dual kill one hero, keep going, keep going. It's a dual, hope this guy dies. Yeah. Oh, he's only half health, guys. Let's see what happens now. But now your guy doesn't have an ultimate, so. I'll be surprised to see what they do with it. I think Invoker, they talked about going Exhort, but I think Exhort's kind of weak right now, especially when you don't have stuns in the lane for early setups. So they will probably just go the standard Quas Wax and play to just kill heroes with the vessel. Well, we'll see if he can even get to that position. So far, we talked about the need for Azure Ray to win their lanes or at least come out a little bit more even. Mid is definitely winning. He is 17 and seven versus 10 and three. Somnus wanting to get some retribution after what happened to him in the last game. That puck performance, it was painful seeing him get taken down at those early levels. It's so much confidence going to this matchup that we've seen, you know, counterpick so many times in your elimination game on the TI stage. Like, he wants this invoker that badly. There's definitely a level of confidence where someone will, you'll ask for a hero in a matchup that everyone else knows is bad on your team, and you say, I would invoke her, and they're like, don't they have Kunkka? Don't you always ask for us to ban that hero? But <laughs> uh, there's definitely a level of confidence, especially when you're playing on these big stages where you just don't really care, and yeah. you know you're going to own no matter what, what the situation is. So he probably even feels that if he loses the lane, he has the right hero for the game. Yeah, fair. That's going to be the big thing for sure. Oh, and in the meantime, down bottom, they do manage to find a good dead shot on save. And that's going to be first blood. It's been looking great on the dead shots so far. I think every single one's connected so far. Yeah, making that Always nice like and easy. the right angles, too. To push them either back or farther away from the Legion when he's battery assaulting. It's just been really nice to watch. And, you know, yeah, that's got to be the biggest pain when you see this more to supports, right? When they yeah. miss that, it's 120 mana. The mana flow is pretty weak. You're always seeing them, like, with the clarities and the mangoes. So every time that you're connecting, it's just so huge for keeping this pressure up on the laning stage. Yeah, we're going to see this mid gap, but just going to keep growing. I think this matchup doesn't get any easier for Invoker as it goes on. When Kunk hits level 5, the harass is just it's like, it's kind of almost too much. Invoker doesn't have the old healing he used to have from Quas, So all his healing pretty much comes from Cold Snap or a Bracer. So once he gets to this half health, he never will go back up unless he buys more regen. And it doesn't look like he's doing it. So I'm honestly going to be really worried for how they kind of play around the mid, because I think they can collapse on mid with the Phoenix and the Clockwork at some point really fast. Good job forcing him back with the cold snap there. That's one of those moments where if he gets uncontested behind your tower, suddenly you're also eating Tidebringers while you're right there. So a little Tidebringer to secure the CS, and GBK doing a good job of keeping his distance, at least for now, after the Tidebringer spam starts to come out. Although, just to be careful, he might think about chasing there. Save and pure, we're kind of thinking about with his dive. They force the tower. It's just good pressure. Yeah. Now pure, a little deep. Battery salt, but won't be able to do that much more, I don't believe. Save takes a lot more. Much less tanky hero on that Muerta. And you can see that there is a lot of potential aggression, and Tidebringer will really bring down that Invoker low, but likely won't be able to find a kill unless they get some type of a X play with a TP rotation or something. We even talked a lot about bottom, but down here, things going great for Chalice. Again, like this idea of the counterpick. 
it's uh, it's not a super pressuring one. Morphling, a very hard hero to kick out of the lane for sure. Oh, oh Toronto Tokyo. Tokyo. This is big. They make the move and the Hellbear Smasher. It's going to be enough. That's so huge. Toronto, Tokyo, that's that what, is what they needed. That's Inch, right? You know, that is what you need. Perhaps taking some notes from his uh, his old captain there, Poshka, right? I keep seeing those videos, Team Spirit. He's like, I told you Inch was good. Every every video was the same answer. Right. You're not wrong. That, that one uh, showed the power of that hero. And GPK, after getting that little bit of help, is trying to finish off that urn. And kills like that matter so much. Now that the Voker, you got a free wave. He'll probably get another free because it pushed him so much, and his game's kind of reset to some extent. And he's going to not feel that bad. The lane matchup, as long as you're able to kill the guy who counterpicked... I say counterpicked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a self-counterpicked, yeah, self counterpicked but he's able to get out of the lane. And once you play the game, matchups like this end up not being that bad for you. So he's going to get into the game and feel comfortable. Wow. Uh, super comfortable on Chalice with the Centaur chasing him. It does actually look like... He's going to be able to escape. The urn finished for the Invoker now. Morphling not able to apply any more pressure there. Does have level 6 on Somnus. Not easy to get in range for a, a boat kill with X. Are they trying to go now onto Pure? Gets some separation. Gets caught Those now cogs. in the Cogs. And no, he walked back in and is just going to die for it. Yeah, Save was busy grabbing the Wisdom Rune for a little bit there. So Pure all alone trying to get some safe XP and not so safe. It was really good cogs that split him from the creeps, so the creeps couldn't take the battery assault, and he just went down because he was completely alone. I don't think he was expecting that to happen like that. Toronto Tokyo may be thinking about another move in here. Does have Chalice in his sights. Hadouk! They move in, a couple more hits, an easy bring down. Enchantress, very strong hero. And FY now gonna be chased by the Ench and the oh. Seder. Well, the X marks the spot, control is on to Muerta on the top side of the map. Still dropping low, save is gonna fall, but FY tries to dive. Again, Hadouken is gonna be back up. Can they manage to quite hit in time? No, he's gonna TP out of there. This is really good pressure though from the Enchantress. He's kind of, he saved mid, he saved bot to some extent. And now he's kind of having two comfortable lanes and he can kind of choose what he wants to do. Usually with Enchantress, you have two plays. It's either you constantly pressure towers with your creeps and just keep going forward, forward, or you farm and get greedy. We've seen Maposhka at this tournament destroy games on his Enchantress, like going carry mode pretty much. And just Did he get a Rampage or just, I it felt like he got a Rampage. Yeah. And so he can kind of do whatever. He's freed up himself and his whole team to just exist in the game and be happy. And when you don't get these plays in the lane stages, and it just feels so much worse. So really impressive stuff here from Toronto Tokyo. Oh, yeah, good the hogs. Able to get him just in time, not able to hit for the calling. And with the boat down, that is going to be a kill. So Somnus, bottom then he went up and now looking for Chalice, they bring him down too. So a one trade apiece. And that's closing in on the level six here. Only a little bit of XP to go for Pure, so. Could try and get something. We talked about this duel being maybe a little bit uh, not super solid in this game, but in the earlier parts, you know, when, when these heroes aren't super tanky, sometimes you can catch people off guard. But again, there's not going to be any sun strikes. We are still just cross waxing here on this invoker. I also like that he's going to finish the vessel before the Midas. We've seen some invokers go the greedy, where you go to earn it so you can tell your team, like, I can rotate, guys. It's all good. <laughs> but then you go back to the Midas. I think him going for the vessel is really going to matter if he wants to kill the Kunkka, if he wants to kill the Brew or the Phoenix, even just there's like heals and so much HP that they have in the early game that the vessel will let them kind of chew through that. They have a ward in behind on the tower here. Just giving them full vision. Okay. This is just a low meta. They want us out of range. There's no way that he gets away from this one. Surely, Tiro's good, but is it going to be that good? The well, Meteor is down. Somnus will fall. GPK not going to be caught by Tian Ming, who's running through, and now he's also in trouble. They have FY in the area. The Icarus dive does do some pretty good damage. And with the Hurricane pullback in, FY he went too far. The duel is there. Ooh. First one claimed for Pure. Very nicely done. Don't see that too often. They're really early dual kids in the mid, uh, kills in the mid lane. So, well done from Pure. We see the the confidence with the Invoker, right? They kind of knew it. I think they probably knew what they wanted to do with the Enchantress of so bringing her mid, bringing a creep mid, pressuring the Kunkka, not really worrying about the early laning stage. And now, his game is great. It's pretty much he's evened up with the Kunkka. He's killed him twice now. He has no worries in the world. He has his vessel. And oh yeah. Just play the game now. That bone, definitely getting what they need out of this one. And 10 minutes in, you have really yet to put any type of meaningful pressure uh, onto Nightfall for this Morphling. I mean, he just hit, he's level eight and a half and Chalice just hit six. Yeah. 
And uh, again, much like the Weaver, I mean, I don't, I don't think you're gonna solo kill on a, a Morphling here. You know, this is one of those carry matchups that you can't really threaten, especially when he's two levels yep. up on you. So, kind of a hard situation here for Chalice to figure out what to do, because your Kunkka is also just trying to finish up Blade Mail. But I mean, he's got the boat, so looks like that's gonna be. The, oh, they have Hook Shot too. All right, so some things are coming together here for Azure. I think even killing the Enchantress, if they get it, is a good kill for them. The Enchantress killing spree, so they get the little extra XP, but yep. it might just walk right past her. And also, you know, there is waveform here, too, so it's not even a guarantee. They see the rocket flare, and now they oh. go the Enchantress while they're also going on the other hero. Well, it didn't really look super clean, but it should be enough to take down Toronto Tokyo in the end, I would assume. Us? Although, wait a minute, wait a minute. The dead shot does a good job, but the nice. Tidebringer hit. Nicely played by Somnus. It's going to be Tian Ming dying. Lul makes the movement over a tornado EMP combination. It's going to drain all the mana from these big strength cores. And in the end, it's just going to be support for support. They can't take the fight anymore. Kanka has no mana, Bruce no mana. So they bring all their heroes bot now. Five heroes, even the carry Luna comes to the bot lane. But they have to walk backwards. And this is kind of one of those things that feels so bad when you bring your whole team and you have to retreat. Yeah, you're getting the call there is the Luna who you know, has two points in the Lucent Beam, no Eclipse, you still have to show up, and now your Brewmaster, no mana for a play here, no stick or wand, and no hope. Hoping to get away, Sunstrike hits. That's enough. Nice try, Nightfall. Almost, almost got the kill. Yeah. Pure? Do they have anything to follow up with this on? A lot of TPs. No, as a matter of fact, he is probably going to get dueled here. The duel, the turn, a couple more hits, a dead shot, and another win for Pure. Oh, this GPK Invoker. 4 0 and 3. Oh, that's a counter pick matchup anyway, right? True enough. Who needs to win the lane? Yeah. Just, just need Toronto Tokyo on Enchantress. It's a team game. That's no, right, that's right. trusted his support to gank him mid, so he was going to win the game I mean, as a team. Toronto Tokyo was a mid player for a long time. He knows how important that one is. He knows how to keep his mid player happy. Right? Exactly. And that's what's important. That's true. Keeping the mid player happy. Okay, you can agree with okay. that. That's good. <laughs> Greatest lesson of the day. You guys are like the rock stars, you know? With the front. Well, 9 to 4, 2,000 gold lead. Again, in this elimination match, I do kind of have the wondering at this point if you're sort of, as Azure Ray, feeling compelled to push the tempo. You know, I look at their, their lineup and. Uh, Luna going late game can sometimes be a little bit dicier playing against Morphling, which is already a scary one. How concerned would you be right now for Azure? I think they shouldn't be concerned right now. They should be concerned about five minutes. The Luna still wants to use her, like, flash farming ability to actually get the items to take the fight. And I think just bringing her to that bot fight really hurt their game. They should okay. let her get a bunch of gold before these fights. Wow. Oh, nice. Trying to run away as they're going to lose another one. Tian Ming is just right there killed off Toronto Tokyo, but they weren't able to find Lul, which was probably the kill that they were looking for. Yeah, it was a good smoke break. So he actually protects his carry. They're now able to farm the other lanes because uh, so many heroes showed top. And it's, you know, all this is to delay the game. They need a delay, I would say, until like this 15 to 18 minute mark is when the Lunas usually shine. They get the Manta and the Shard, and they become really tanky. They can take towers, they can uh, take objectives. And before then, I don't really think that they should make any crazy moves. Now, Bad Boom, we're going to keep it up, though. Already purchasing up another smoke there for save. Let's try and keep up this aggression, and Chalice desperately trying to get back in the game there with that Midas. I mean, so much of this game, you know, looking at this Brewmaster. Will he ever become this big Brewmaster? Who gets the Radiance? Who, who gets the Manta? You know, is that something he can even hope to achieve in this match? Or is he just going to be struggling this whole time trying to lift up his Luna? I think that's always the worry, is that Brew is... Even though he he's... People go greedy because he has such a strong team fight spell on his ult. And you can't use items during his ult. So it doesn't really matter what you have as long as you get it off. And that enables people to go this really greedy Midas into Radiance. But the issue is, is sometimes you just lose the game before you hit that timing. Yep. And your Brewlings will die. I think, it, like you said, they have so much damage to kill the Brewlings in this early game that it's not even that easy for him to fight if he gets it off. And so it's a little concerning that they have this really slow draft and Betboom has so much early game pressure. Well, and that was very much the recipe for disaster uh, in, in game number two, it felt like, for Azure Ray, was that Betboom just got everything that they wanted early and then also had those tools to close out a game. Now, Chalice is going to get... Well, he's in the area here, Massive but they might gates. try and wrap on him. All of Azure is gated behind Nightfall. They scanned it though. They know they're back there. And he's immediately going to try and run away. Doesn't have a more. Doesn't have a point for it either. And they go, go for him. Oh. Nice play, Tian Ming able to get him. And just like that, Azure back into it. Wow. Even with the scan, could not escape. That that hook shot, I think, was blind. If I'm not mistaken, too. The flare was a little bit further to the right. I mean, that flare, you know, it got nerfed. It's hard to see these days. 
Also, a really good read for Bepuma, I think, to cancel all the TPs instantly the second he goes down. We've seen a lot of times, or especially around the safe lane, that they TP to try to save the guy who's getting dove, and they all end up dying, and it's a horrible, horrible defeat. But here they lose the morph lane, they lose the tower. It sucks, but they can keep playing the game, and they can keep feeling strong. Still only a thousand gold separating these two teams. And while there is no tier one tower in the mid lane uh, for Azure to protect, you can't really allow Betboom to just step really aggressively forward and deny out farm. Lo still has not been sort of forced out of the Ancients yet, but a boat. Oh, this would be huge. Does it get any time? Yes, they do. Somnus, when they need it the most, comes out with a clutch one. Oh, the back to back kill. Oh, but wait, will they get one in return? GPK stepping forward. Chalice wants to get out of here, does not have ulti. They're a little bit too late, but with a little bit of help, maybe they can get a return kill. Tokyo's the there, hook. they have the egg, nice. but the hook, hook shot comes in, stops that from Pure, oh. able to interrupt with a battery assault. Just like that, as you're ready, they're streaming forward, oh, wanting GPK. to find the kill, and they will. Save, trying to do what he can, but also with the ultimate coming out on this Luna, they've got him under fire, going to fall. Oh my goodness. Unbelievable stuff here from Azure. I gotta give it to Tian Ming. Like the way that he's playing and stopping these ganks on the Luna, allowing Lu to stay in this game, getting this little bit of disable on the end, and then the hook shot to Ooh. save the egg, like and then another, another one. one. Uh, like he can do no more. Tian Ming making the plays when his team needed him, and Somnus is able to catch there on to Toronto Tokyo. The last couple of minutes have been disastrous for Bedfoom, and it's Azure Ray who are benefiting. It almost feels like these two morph kills matter so much. He dies once, they lose the tower. He dies again, and now Bedboom feel forced to like want to take this fight. They're like, oh, they went on a morph, they use boat, we have to take this fight. We're getting picked off all across the map. And now they take a fight 4v5, and it goes horribly. Yep, and then it just chains further, because after that second death, now we're come all the way back around where the splits back up. So Charles can feel like he can pressure in, and suddenly like what looked like kind of a pipe dream of this Radiance is just getting closer and closer right now. Well, and in a way, if we think again back to what has been sort of the, the question for Betboom is can they keep their composure under these moments? Can they sort of stop the bleed from happening when things stop going their way? We'll see if they can recover over these next couple of minutes, but it's got to be scary territory in this elimination match with it all on the line. Got to see who it is that's able to step up from Betboom to make well, the moves they need. If they're going to fight back, it's got to be pure. Having that Blink Dagger coming out here on the Legion Commander, you imagine that uh, that's probably how you're going to enable it. Currently, though, I think, what, two points Exhort still on the Invoker? So, you know, the Sun Strikes, not too spooky quite yet. Yeah, I think it's definitely really scary, especially when you reverse these, like, timing drafts that they can just end the game at some point. You reverse a Luna and a Brew. And I would say that if they get this Roshan and the Luna gets, like, this next set of items, they can just end the game. They can just walk down a lane, the Brew will split if he needs to, Kunkel will bone save, and the game will just end. And so whenever you're in these positions and you start to kind of throw away these early game leads, it gets so scary because you know that this timing is coming. Yep. Very quick snowball possibility here, and Somnus recognizing what they're after, Xing just even small distances from the Tier 1. Does not want to give anything up to Pure. They probably know this Legion Commander's on the hunt, and they look at the mini-map, they, they don't see her around, so... Yeah. Do you see Tron Tokyo, though? I mean, you can see how contracted they're playing right now, but they are... Trial Tokyo, microwave. Gonna run through. Blind, gets so caught. They all gated on the side of Beppu. But can they catch this afterwards? They already used the split. The egg is down, and okay, now Pure, he's in too far. They wanted to make a move, but they're gonna be the ones that get caught. They try to bring down Tian Ming. The heal is there from the Supernova, from the Phoenix. Pure turns, tries to go for a duel. That was not how that was supposed to go. Oh. That boom, what's going on? It's just getting dual damage. Okay, plus 28 for FY. So FY reacted to the Legion blink dueling him and egg during the animation of the duel. So then the Legion kind of got stuck in no man's land and just gets cut, like, cut down. That was an amazing reaction. Oh, and look at this at the 20 minute mark as well. Are they going to go for this? The Are they doing the down. ultimate ender? They're trying. I mean, look at this. They, they got themselves so many heroes here. It's so easy with the Luna. Oh, the ultimate snowballing possibility. That's big, and that's the one that FY wanted. This is huge for Azure oh, Ray. Of course, of course. I mean, we saw that FY piece right during the break in between these series. He was saying it's that final step that he wants to take as a player to make it again, win a TI. Got to get through Bet Boom to get there, through the lower bracket, a way that he's not used to going to the Grand Finals either, if they can make it. But we'll see. It all has to come down to this. Can Bet Boom stall out this pressure that they know is going to be coming?
It's definitely going to be around this Aegis timing. I think Luna is really going to want to call for an Aegis timing, uh, like a Roche kill in the next minute or two. And if they can survive that first Aegis, I think that they have a shot back into the game. And so it's basically dependent on, do they get pick-offs with the Legion? Are they able to cut the waves with the Invoker and the Morphling? Is the Enchantress able to, like, drag waves? GPK, they see him chomping. Oh, the tornado! Interrupted! As an interaction I didn't know about. Cog's not going to connect. Still hanging out. Oh, he goes through and gets the duel! Oh, not this time. All right. Pure. Taking a little bit of retribution for himself there, and now finding safe Tian Ming. This is the kills that Bet Boom wanted. The back and forth that's happening between these two squads. They're very strong together, but you start breaking them apart, get them out of these auras, right? We've also seen some of the Luna lineups where they're trying to go high ground a little bit too early. That's being punished a bit here, so it is very important <laughs> that they get this sorted the right way. And look at that, GPK gives the tip over to the Clockwork, and they're gonna be the ones to steal this pivotal Aegis. Try and slow down that tempo that Azure Ray is playing with. Yeah, this is going to hurt Azure Ray a lot, actually. And this is, again, I think this was their big timing in the game. They had to group up, they had to take this Roche and control the whole map. And they lost the entire chance now. They have to, they're going to have to wait about like 10 minutes just for Roche to have the ability to get in their hands. And they are now on the defensive. They can't just pick off the more for free like they've had in the past. And it's going to slow down the tempo a lot. They have hit some pretty big items, though. They have that Radiance finished up on the Brewmaster. There's a BKB done for the Kunkka as well. Somnus then going to comfortably head towards the, the Water Park there afterwards with the Agnum Scepter, Torn Storm. So they, ha they have some good solutions coming in the future. But yeah, this idea of just, oh, we're going to like break the map wide open, crush these Tier 2s right now with this Aegis has been removed by Betboom. And now they just gonna have to try and lick their wounds a little bit here, and, and Betboom does indeed get back into this game as the, the BKB also nearly complete here for Nightfall. Oh, a little short. It's okay, he's getting them anyway. <laughs> As they're going to claim this uh, Tormentor here for themselves in Azure Ray. So That's we're talking one. about the need to kind of sit back and chill a bit, but do you think that uh, for, for Azure Ray, there is any temptation to try and make some type of a, a pressure play for a few of these Tier 2s, or do you just strictly stay on your side of the map and yeah, farm? I, I definitely think, I don't know necessarily Tier 2s, you don't need to force it that hard, but they, they can take the fight. I don't think the Aegis matters. The Brewmaster is really strong with the Radiance timing. Luna is really, really farm, so they can take the 5v5s, five and they just doesn't matter. It just they can't do the extra step where okay. you take everything from them. They're gonna take you know 80, 90 percent, maybe hopefully pick off some heroes and take some fights, but they have to do it you know reserved. A sun strike there scouts out Chalice, and uh, perhaps they have an idea. Oh, is this player gonna hit them lurking? Oh, no, okay. Nah, he's just pushing the wave out. But, I mean, they I, have been waiting here a while. Right. I think you know at this stage, if you're Azure Ray, that they're waiting on a high ground. So they won't go for it. Now, there is instead a smoke play coming down bottom. Luna Illusions pushing that pressure. Now, Toronto Tokyo is probably not the kill they're looking for here. But if they make it through that gate, you're going to feel really safe on the side of Bet Boom. Now, instead, they're just going to push out bottom. Maybe they are going to be going for it. Well, they better hope they don't come through that gate. Some bad news for Pure. It's probably just going to be a chill tier two push. They, they're in this ball, so Betboom doesn't really have a reason to go and fight them. They can just take this time to farm all their other items. They are behind in gold. Even with the Aegis advantage, they're down 7,000 gold. So everything is still for Azure Ray. But again, Betboom can't hit their timings. They have so much damage in this mid to late game between the Morphling, the Voker, even the Legion duels, so that they just need to keep kind of farming their items and avoid this Aegis timing. And we'll see uh, how many more Midas's we'll have to count. For now, it's just safe looking at on the Moira stuff. Uh, Azure has won, right, on the Brew? Oh, yeah, that's right, yep. It's currently a one Midas advantage for Azure. It's an important thing to keep track of in these ones. Also, BKB timings, gonna be something else to watch for. They've already got it on that Morph, the Invoker, Legion Commander, everybody going for BKB, including Toronto Tokyo. Interestingly enough, he's almost got his done too. It's really important versus Kunkka. Everyone goes Ags on Kunkka, and it's pretty much unfightable without a BKB on any hero. So Enchantress goes one, you know that you have to buy one. Wow. Somnus, Ooh, just off the mark, the silence is there. That's enough to get save out of trouble. Are there any interesting uh, morph choices here in this game for like end so turn target? Into? Yeah. I mean, there's kind of like some escapes of the Phoenix sometimes, you know? Yeah, I have to like bail out on one. Um, probably if he buys the shard, he can turn into Luna. Oh, and then use true. your shard and go back to morph. Yeah, that's nice. That's probably the best one I can see. Um, Morphling, yeah, you generally don't pick him for the ult anymore, especially after the Ags change. The new Ags could the new be eggs. cool. It could be cool versus Luna. 
Oh, okay. It's a it's a hundred percent damage taken and received yes. illusion of the Luna that can cast spells. That is yeah, and all her basics. I mean who cares about her ulti anyway? Plus you would get the shard, right? You would get her shard, you get all her items, so pretty much the more farm the Luna is, the more farmed your illusion is. That's pretty cool. So it could be something we see. Yeah. Also, it's really cool for split pushing because you can change places with it. Uh, the, it's like, like the good old days. Yeah. yeah so good old days. Like, yeah. Good old okay. I don't know. We call that more like the good old days. That one was a, a tra travesty, honestly. No, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think they're ever going to be getting the freaking Morphling Agonims. I don't know. That plays what it does. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard many, like, coaches and, like, players be like, I don't know what it does. You know, it's like Muerta's eggs. They're just like, I'm not, what, can you use that spell there? I'm not sure. Well, this it's is the like big spell to get if they can bring him down in time. And, in fact, they will. Chalice just gets blown up. That is oh, the dual kill. Well, he actually X himself, unfortunately. Maybe he's going for pure there. Bit of a misclick. And now Tian Ming, he's in no man's land. Has a hook shot over to FY to get some separation. They're going to keep chasing shortly. Nightfall is there, has the alacrity ready to go. Tian Ming in trouble. Good cogs push back onto two, trying to get everybody out. The dead shot, the torrent not going to connect on Tokyo. He's too far forward. Wow, look at the standing tall of Azure Ray. They're saying, go ahead, keep chasing us. Well, this could be good if they can burn through the mana. In fact, they will right away, but the Sunray is out, trying to heal him up. Is it going to be enough to keep him alive? Trying to survive, but it's not going to happen. They take down the Luna. Somnus tries to TP out. Will manage to do just oh, that. Right, keep him alive. But Beto, they're there. They find another kill. It was five seconds, guys. Come on. The duel. He wanted Pure that. needs to get a few back here, okay? He's giving one up. So Nightfall did do, he morphed into Kunkka, so he, that, that's where the X was. Oh, okay, there it is. So there's the one here he could turn into, you know, X, X and Torrent, pretty good spells. Yep. To steal for free. Um, and I think that all kind of boils down to the Brewmaster getting caught before the fight. Yeah. He matters so much for their team fight, and they also waste the boat trying to save him. So they don't have the boat for the fight, they don't have the brew for the fight, and it's kind of a 4v5 without a Kunkka ultimate. Yeah, it's the ultimate dream, right? If yeah. you can pick any hero to blow up first, it's definitely going to be that Brewmaster. And now knowing that, actually assembles right away the Aeonis. Doesn't even try and go for the Interesting. assemble play, you know, potential. Do any of the stances really help out that much in this instance at all? The Void one? The Void okay. gives you status resistance, especially if you have the Brew talents and you have the W up, I think it's 80%. I mean, that would so be huge. If he gets that off before he gets gone, and it helps him out a lot. Switching over instead. Uh, for anybody that hasn't played Brewmaster in a while, just don't. It's, <laughs> no, no, it's ridiculous. No, dude, he's fun. <laughs> he's crazy. He's really hard to play right now. But he's also awesome. Uh, if really you can cool get away with it. Just have to read a little textbook of exactly. the ability. Yeah, study up. He is one of the cooler heroes now with all of those changes. It feels so, like a fighting game with all the stances you can switch into. Somnus picks up his shard, so he kind of hits his peak for spellcasting on the Kunkka. He has Ag shard, he has the BKB, so constant spells are going to come out from him. And again, I think Azure Rage needs to make sure Brew lives at the start of the fight. They can, he can, anyone else can get dueled. The Luna will survive, Kunkka will probably survive, but the Brew, if, even if he doesn't survive and he doesn't get his, his split off because his mana gets burned or whatever happens, it's bad for him. Yeah. So just make sure he lives, make sure he doesn't get gone on first, and just take the fight from there. Yeah, of course, it's going to be a little bit tough for the Brewmasters these days, because you don't tend to have the Blink Dagger, so you're not really, like, lurking. You're, you're just kind of there. you got to be in the front now. Yeah. Right. It'll be a bit tougher to handle. And maybe that'll dissuade them from doing anything too crazy until they actually go back to that Aegis, because the early spawn time is coming up rather soon. Only another 30 seconds away. Yeah, we'll see what that timing actually ends up being. It's okay. going to determine a lot of where this goes. I'm channeled in this time. Okay. I think TI main stage, I get it right. Are Tell me, where do, what's the timing on the right. Aegis? 53 spawn? seconds. 53. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I'm very confident. We'll believe. Yeah. Two minutes and 17 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you want the long one. Yep. Already we've had two games there, two series that have gone to three games. Long Roches and... Oh, you were close. Oh, five off. Someday. Someday I'll get oh, it. That's a win. Right. It's a 1-180 one, one chance. So one thing I really like how Bethlehem is playing is pretty much any time they get a small advantage in the fight or the map, they constantly keep looking for more. You saw after that fight, they get the brew, they kept chasing. They after Even after the fight, they chase the top, they go on the Phoenix top, and it's like they're constantly trying to make more than what they get. They're not really sitting back and being like, okay, we got a small win, mm -hmm. let's accept it and move forward. They're constantly going for more and more and more, and I think that's the way that you win these games, that you're, it, it's a little hard to play. And as a Ray, at the same time, though, they've also done a great job in terms of just, like, staying focused. Like, I mean, maybe it didn't work out that well for them, but the idea of actually staying pumped on just giving up was kind of crazy. Well, this is going to be a scary spot right here. They walked underneath a ward for Azure Ray. So Azure Ray, aware of where they're at. Roche oh, is going to respawn on this one, too. Arcane Rune Kunkka. 
Got to be careful. They see Pure right away. He wants to chase. Pops the BKB. That's a good one to get out. He actually has the X2, but will wear off. Now oh, that is early split. You need to get oh, used just... very early. Okay, now do you just like rush the Roche? Thinking about it. Maybe they find a way. Wait a minute. He just walked up to him. Toronto Tokyo didn't see Tian Ming and gets caught. And now can they find more? Looking for the lift up Pure. He's caught. No but stays down. This is what they wanted. Azure oh. Ray on the hunt, but he gets the blink away. Quick fingers on Pure and Bet Boom. They outlast that Bruce split. There's still a couple heroes in that area. As Nightfall is chased, they don't manage to quite catch with the Wind Panda. But Roche is up. It is up indeed, and GBK also feeling forced to just TP a little bit further back. Don't want to get caught by anybody here. Save also nearby, just farming up the Ancients. So if they're going to fight Roche, this is the best case scenario. There's no Bruce. Oh, there. he thought it was real. Oh, did he? Might have. It's, they, they realize now that they're into the pit, and that one's for free. They can't get here in time. Waveform wants to make something happen, but Bet Boom, they're coming in just a little bit too late, and they're going to have to dodge for a while. All right, Ages and Cheese, 30 minutes, Luna lineup. Things back on track right now for Azure. This is where the high ground push, if you're willing to go to the high ground. Are happen. they willing? Do you think? Would you be willing in this game? I'm kind of scared, I feel like. Elimination. Yeah, I think, I think you you want to. There's always, there's, even though you have to be scared, you have to at some point be like, we have to take the win. You can't be scared to take the win. So there's not really much jump from Bepum or, you know, there's no Tusk Kicks, there's no Magnus, no Pudge, nothing crazy like that. So I think it's pretty simple execution for them. They can even X the Luna, keep going back and forth. The Kunkka copy seems very scary, though, I guess, right? That'd be the big yeah, one. Like, with the, the X's, one. with the, the shard. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess this is the other question, is that if Azure do decide to go high ground for Bet Boom, how do you try and contest that for themselves? Do they step up and fight? Do they let a lane of racks go? Like, what's sort of the, the call for their fighting strength right now? Never let the lanes get there. Yeah, it's probably going to be pushing out the lanes with the Legion lurking, trying to get a pick on the lanes to delay the Aegis timing, and then... If they, if they end up getting there, it's on the Invoker to just delay with Tornado, EMP, Deafening Blast. And at some point, hope you duel the guy and burst the guy. And outside of that, there's not much, you know, not much more you can ask for. And if you're going to force that high ground, it's probably going to be Clockwork, you know? Yep. You, you get this crazy flare in the back line, which is a lot easier with the Agnum, since he's about to complete that on Tian Ming. You try and get this vision, and you get that one hook shot that just enables everyone to actually come high ground. Because that's the scariest part. It's, it's getting over the wall, right? Up that oh, yeah. staircase, you just have to have, like, something confident, something that's uh, at least secured by your allies, where you feel like you can actually step up and have a good opportunity in a team fight. And that's going to be Clockwork in this game. As they back up their Luna here, taking down one of the last two Tier 2 standing near that Radiant Side Tormentor. They could pretty easily go for it again. Uh, and, you know, Tian Ming, he's missing a shard. You know, help a guy out here, but uh, time is of the essence, I suppose. They have three minutes on the Aegis. They got their Butterfly, and, you know, what else do you need? Go? It's just oh, go time. Man. Apparently not a jetpack. So. The X play. Yeah, why not? Tornado oh, lift up. Not going to pull him in in time. That was also the Hex reveal. Had more than enough space. You make that X play with Pure, you still could be in some issue. I mean, I guess that you're still gonna, you'll actually probably pull Pure closer than you would the Luna. Yeah, it the might range. be scary for the Pure getting far in. Yeah. But it's good for them, uh, for the side of Azure. They force everyone back to TP and just show in their own base. So now Azure can kind of either choose to sit here and then go again, knowing that there's no TPs, or they can just kind of fan out and farm the whole map. Yeah, get that farm going on. Yeah, grab the outpost as well in case maybe for some buyback plays if you get the high mobility. GPK did not TP, so he'll be ready for the next one if they need to. Currently, though, Tian Ming with that Aghanim Scepter is going to enable the uh, map hacks that are the Rocket Flare spam. <laughs> as well as the Creep Push. Oh, yeah. Clockwork Eggs is, I think it's slightly undervalued. I think this is such a strong tool just for everything. You can push lanes out across the map anywhere. You slow heroes during the team fights, which that change is crazy. It's so strong to just have a slow. Yeah. You can even just like cogs do become a right click carry at some point in the game with a harder. Oh, where you get those oh God. All right, well, they are scanning. They realize that GPK is stealing their wisdom rune, but they're just going to have to deal with that. So they're going to go grab the one from Bet Boom. Bet Boom was so scared after the Tormentor. They oh, yeah. They want to stay there for an extra 10 seconds just to get an experience room. I mean, with good reason. I could have been a pretty quickly dead hero. But Lul walks up to high ground. Chalice pops ult, and there it is. Just like that, they're going to be able to force out the glyph. And I think with his rulings, 
Care. Be enough damage. They are burning through them pretty quickly, but a couple more hits. Beating into it. Back to our protection is up. They don't quite manage to take it down. So low. It's actually going to survive through it. Sunstrike not going to connect. They are going to have to back away. Now, that was the Aeon disc that they managed to proc onto FY. I mean, it's just good poking. They have so much time on the Aegis. The Bruce split. I wouldn't say they need it to fight. I think if Bepum walk into them right now, they would still take the fight with or without it. So it's kind of just free damage. And it's a, you have to keep forcing them back. You can't let them play this whole map game and delay the game. So you have to just keep making pressure, but do it in a way that's safe which I think they're doing a really good job of not dying on any heroes. Yeah, I mean, they get the Glyph forced out as well, and now they're going to power up their push here by getting the Assault Crash finished on Chalice. So from having a pretty tough start to this game, he's now sort of blossoming into this big Brewmaster that you want. He wasn't able to go that Manta build, but not really necessary this game because he's just playing with his team. He doesn't have to do a lot of the split push himself. He just wants to ensure he gets off his ulti, and they take down these big objectives. So what is the window that we're waiting for for Bet Boom? Because obviously their plan is to delay. Is there a particular item timing that they're looking for? Is it just getting all of their heroes very farmed? What, what, what's really their game plan on Bet Boom? Big Muerta. <laughs> I, think, I think, honestly, they kind of have their timing. The Morphling has... Morphling is really fun, even based on the situation. There's a Hex on the Invoker, so they have the ability to burst these heroes really fast. It's a lot about the angle of how they take the fight, whether they get a good duel off and they actually burst the dual target. Maybe they get a Hex on the Phoenix and take down the Phoenix. So it's just a lot about finding finding the fight, which yeah. is really hard when Azure has so much lane shove. And clockwork. so many Aeon discs. Yeah, Clockwork, Luna shoving out the lanes. They have Vision from the Clockwork, Aeon on the Brew, and so... So what you're telling me is the game is just getting started. The game is just getting started. Uh, I mean, and, Hero is going to go for the Nullifier, too. Yep. Frank. I really like this Nullifier. Yeah. Can actually duel the Brew, can kill him. The Aeon proc won't, like, status resi uh, resistance the duel. I fall. Go back. Oh, that's tough. Someone's not getting their tier four. Oh, no. Well, Someone they'll have plenty of time to find it, surely. Oh, there he goes. Yeah. Yay. Saved. Picking up garbage. And you know it was one of the supports, too. Oh, totally. Yeah, you're oh, definitely yeah. missing out. Support's fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Chalice in the mid. See if they can maybe burst the uh, Aeon disc, force that out from him, and indeed nice. they will. I, I mean, that hurts, right? I mean, now these, nowadays, like, that is the forced cooldown. Like, it increases every time, so just getting it passively like that feels great. Oh, is, that a, is that a DD Luna? That is a DD Luna. Oh, that's kind of scary. Interesting. With the Vindicator's Axe. I mean, again, it doesn't feel great wanting to try and make some type of a play if you don't find a pickoff, but if they manage to find a pickoff, that's a whole different story. In towards mid, Azure Ray are going to head out. Deal with the Morphling Illusions. Bet Boom, they're fairly spread out right now, and right away, oh! Anticipated the movement, but didn't quite find him there. Nightfall is the Morphling. No man's land, it's the Morphling. He's gonna walk forward. The stun, it's done, it's gone. Oh, that can't happen. And he is dead for 70 seconds without a buyback. And immediately the pandas. Oh, no. For oh, another. no. Oh, no. Azure Ray. They get gifted a freebie. The decision to walk back in. That is going to haunt Nightfall. Will it be for just a couple of seconds or years? We'll see in just a minute if AR walk up high ground. Toronto pops Shikibi almost dies just to the glaze bouncing around. Step and this is a forward. The fear, I, I, it's, it's, it's all falling. They've got 40 seconds of freedom. Save is caught there. Do they keep going for more? That's going to be a second set of racks. All it takes is one pickoff, and it is so much damage done. Azure Ray. They move from tower to tower, building to building, and bed boom. I mean, all they can do is watch. You can't initiate here. You oh, don't have your Morphling. Keep it going. 20 Good. seconds. They try and look. Save is out there. Starts to hit on the Somnus. The X mark. The play. The ghost ship. He gets a little bit of separation. There he's going to pull him in closer. Save is gone too. He doesn't have buyback either. Creeps are still in the mid lane as well. Oh. And they had enough on Azure, though. It looks like they have. Wow. They nice. hold. I mean, it could have been worse, but a huge opening for I Azure. Mean, they're going to bring her back, you know. Roshan had an instant spawn as well, so they might just oh, walk into the Roche pit, and it's third Roche, so there's going to be an Axe. And oh, jeez. Yeah, there is no vision, at least, to see, like, the walking Roche. The Sunstrike comes down, but it's going to fade mark. in time. Oh, the Sunstrike right before Roche walked in. Yeah, Roche was making a trek across the map here, and there's the flare. <laughs> they know. Power. Letting them know. They know. Azure Ray. <laughs> I mean, that is such a huge, unbelievably 
monumentous moment in this game. That's going to be revealed now, and they're not going to get here in time. Third Roche to Azure Ray. All it takes is one mistake. Coming out here now feels like going just through the motions right now at this point. For a bet boom, like, do you really want to make your way over here? Walk out there, pharmacy camps. Yeah. Just walk backwards, and just, it's all going to be this high ground hold. It's how do you take this fight, and who do you focus? How do you cast your spells? Oh. And they're going to choose to fight outside the base. I think this is a good idea because it, once the Luna gets on the high ground, I think it's impossible. I mean, you can see it just bouncing around the buildings, how much it's just shredding through them. They can't actually fight inside their own base because of it. This is going to limit their buyback possibilities, though, obviously. You know, your buyback not quite as valuable if the fight takes place outside of your high ground. It's also only the Invoker and the Legion who have buys, and you don't really want the Invoker to be the one having to buyback. Yeah. And the Legion, once she duels, as we talked about earlier, she's not one of these heroes that has a massive amount of HP and constantly is doing damage just being alive. She's kind of a one and done. You duel, that's it. You just exist to just say hello to everyone and purge some stuns off. And look at how they're positioning, too. They're just so clumped together on Azure. Five heroes smoked on each side. So to our bet, Oh, don't. Yeah, they, they have to back away. I mean, they, they stood there as long as they could, but they TP out. Need to get away with everybody, and the problem is, Luna, it's come high ground. Bedboom, they've had so many moments here. So much of the year spent trying to get it all to this point, and potentially it's all going to be for naught if they can manage to claim this high ground. Disarm for now. Lul steps forward. Building being hit. They tied a wave in, save, try to control. Chalice does have refreshers, so they'll have another salvo of this if they want. X mark. Control, Torrent, got him caught, saved dead again. That's a buyback. Lowell hitting, they don't have answers. As a ray, there's the hook shot. They find the high ground, but look at the turn from Nightfall. Pops the oh, team, staying alive. Duel. The duel jumps forward, they didn't get anything off. Bedboom trying to hold for all their worth, but do they have enough damage? Do they have enough to take him down? Nightfall, he's out of the base yet again, he's gonna die! 80 seconds gone! As a ray, they lasted long enough, and one death was all it took. Lowell feeling himself there on the finish. You go back to how this game started. It was not looking good for Azure Ray. They had to wait for the timing. Chalice, a tough start on that Brewmaster, but he held out and saw this. The plays on that Kunkka to get around the map, really keeping them in this one until they were ready for that timing, and then they struck hard with those last Aegises. Yeah, and it all goes to the Morphling plays, but they yeah. kill the Morph two times in a row with an amazing boat from the Fog. 100 to 0, the Morph. He didn't even get his Morph off. They take the fight, and I think after that, it just started crumbling. Oh, an unbelievable performance here. The series going the distance, and one of those moments again. They're going to feel the love from the crowd coming out of the booths. They managed to take this one, and oh, man. You've got to imagine for Bet Boom, it hurts. Well, it was a really good showing. I think all the games were really close. Bet Boom also showed in the second game how like how much how strong of a team they are they just completely crushed the second game so yeah. just great performance from them. and again of course you know some fan favorites here moving on forward something you'll have to see you know some storied memories there on this team we'll be continuing forward as we will lose one of our uh, potential ti second hopefuls here in toronto tokyo absolutely he put on a good performance again switching roles doing so much work with this squad but it is going to be azure ray that will be moving on, continuing this top four as we head on back to the panel. An absolutely devastating loss for Bet Boom, but all of the Azure fans in the arena right now, they got to see some beautiful adjustments in game number three. These guys had a game, rough game at two, but ultimately they're gonna be going. They're a top four team right now. That means in top four, we have two China region teams. That is amazing representation for them. It's phenomenal. And in game number three, let's break it down. Let's talk about it because this Luna was able to have so much impact at the end of the game despite it being a little bit rough in the earlier part of this game for a uh yeah i think they did a really good job just being solid throughout the game they stayed focused i think 
it was sort of like you can see the differences between the two teams where the um, Azure Ray team was a lot more composed and focused. And meanwhile, uh, I think Nightfall had a couple of deaths on Morphling that looked a little rough. They like after he died, even the team was like running in. It felt very desperate for them. Whereas Azure Ray, they were always confident in their timings. They're always confident. Like even this first roll chain gets sniped, doesn't matter. Don't need to go desperate. Don't need to take some crazy fight. Just keep building up your advantage, and eventually you're gonna go high ground with some Luna, some Brewmaster LT. Really good methodical Dota from them. I mean, Absolutely, that really showcased veteran Dota because um, at some point after the lanes, when they came up with a 3K with advantage on the side of bed boom and they were getting kills it looked really rough for azure ray but they just rotated their conk out of play with the rear bottom they got that first kill on the morphling they opened up the tower they stuck around and they got the sneaky torrent on morphling when he tp'd back in and that just turned the entire game reza yeah it was really like the turning point because of this morphing death they had to like accumulate this uh, huge lead that uh, translated into you know more advantage later on but that third death after like uh, when he was walking on the high ground as well like it was um, i think it's like i think it's the nurse that's mm -hmm. coming to the players and there's like really high stakes uh the elimination match it's uh yeah it just seemed like they didn't you know cope with it and they didn't they didn't manage to deal with it yeah, we were, we were uh, praising Bebim a lot about how much they had adjusted over these over this month, over these last few weeks for themselves. They should still be really proud. A top six finish. They're coming in fifth six now. Uh, it is tough to be eliminated, but Azure Ray, I just cannot get over this game, right? Because even if you get a couple kills on Nightfall, sure, it's impactful, but it's how they continued playing after that one Epi, how they made sure that they weren't going to overextend. They didn't feel the need to go all for Mega Creeps on that first time that Nightfall died and didn't have a buyback. Absolutely. Everything was so calculated. It was so textbook. I mean, it's just what you want to see coming out of Azure, right? And on these main stages, I do feel that the closer you get to that potential finals day, the more and more the nerves start to kick in, even for teams like Bedboom, who we've, been, we've praised consistently for how confidently they've been playing. You can see even the strongest carry players like Nightfall fall victim to those nerves, but Azure did not do that. They played the map perfectly. They got every single Aegis that they could. They never overextended, and in the very last fight, they knew when to use their buyback on Kanka. It was not bad for them at all. Yeah, all their high ground pushes were very like, like methodical. And, like uh, they didn't really overcommit because like many players uh, say that the, it's really hard to break the high ground this patch, but they managed to do it like very methodical and very nicely. I hope all the Azuri fans are still in the arena because right now we're going to be gifted with a Chalice winners interview. Hello, everyone. I have Chalice standing right next to me. Uh, Hello, I'm Charlie from Azure Ray. How does it feel to move into the next round and uh, did you guys predict the victory? Um, I hope we can I hope we can successfully meet Team Spirit tomorrow. 那其实第二场的话比赛很一边倒，当时的话，我想你们也是非常有经验的选手嘛。当时队内的一个氛围是什么样的？ So the second game is a little bit one-sided. As an experienced player, you you all are. I want to know what was said during the break and what is the adjustment being made. 呃，其实兄弟们早就想打GG了，装模作样的打了一会儿。我再说一下，就是中路早就早就劝兄弟们要不投了吧。during that game, maybe always try to make us GG earlier, but I feel like it's TI, so I have to, we have to drive, drag the game longer. Now, you have many fans in here in the arena, and uh, they are very happy to see you moving to the next round. Is there any word? Can I have a round of applause for our position three? Any words to the fans? 有什么想跟粉丝说的吗? 呃,谢谢大家支持吧,然后等一下我们努努力把这几个干了吧。Thank you fans for all the support, and I will, we will try our best to get the next victory. Back to you, panel. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful Chalice interview. He's already looking at what he wants to accomplish tomorrow, let alone the series that he's going to be playing later today that's going to be up against Gaming Gladiators. It's the fourth series. I loved hearing the confidence from it, and I loved hearing the roar of the crowd for Chalice.
every time he finished talking. And the confidence in his colleagues, right? Because he said, we'll successfully meet Team Spirit tomorrow. So he's saying that LGD will be Team Spirit in the next series. It was, it was a double whammy right there. Well, that's what he was saying. We do have to quickly look at the other side, though, to close out the rest of this series is the bet boom. Okay, they're coming out. Fifth, six. I know Toronto Tokyo in a content piece that we saw earlier, he really wanted to hit top four. That was his goal for this TI, especially with the massive position change. So he falls just a little bit short of that. But Reza, words for the teams out there, at least definitely for Bet Boom in this hard for three game, best of three. I mean, I think this team is like keep improving and like they're very young. So I think they're going to just keep continue together. And uh, like all I would work from their, from their side, just like on the mental game, like find some play, play colleges and just keep grinding and uh, work on more on the mental state, like, you know, find some routines that help you both uh, gameplay and the mental state as well. Yeah, I think when the team formed, they mentioned it was like a project they want to be play together for two years, keep improving through that. I think this year was phenomenal for them already. I, we could already see how much stronger mentally they are. And I think, as Rezo said, if they just continue along that path, like they keep improving their mental side, you know, maybe a bit more stable in the picks. I think they're looking really bright for the future. And then when you can just compare this to their year overall, like this is the first time we saw, got to see all five of these players playing together in a healthy way, right? Because in Lima, they were all sick, is what we heard. So they couldn't really perform the way they wanted to. In Berlin, they had this man standing in, and he's <laughs> as excellent as he is, that's not the full roster, yeah. right? And then in Bali, there were some circumstances that went on, so we couldn't actually see what this would have happened. Again, I'm, I'm actually seeing a trend. It's not <laughs> nothing about that boom. Maybe it's about something. <laughs> Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> but, but now at this TI, they played with their full roster, and a top six finish is nothing to be ashamed of. Alrighty, well, it's time then that we do have our exit interview of that boom. Uh, they are standing by with Tsunami. Thank you very much. Yes, I am standing by with a nightfall. An unfortunate result, but uh, I've really been impressed about your growth as a player of these past few years. You're an incredibly young player. You're 21. And your growth from like Virtus Pro a few years ago, Evil Geniuses last year, and now this team on BetBoom team, I've noticed that you've started taking a lot more ownership in the performance of not just yourself, but your team as well. So I was wondering, after you can look through this entire year, what are some lessons that you've learned about what makes a pleasant team to play with, what brings success, and what do you look for in teammates or your own performance? I mean, uh, if, it, if we talk about what did I learn, I mean, I'd say first part of the season was kind of like uh, disappointing, and uh, I learned first of all that I shouldn't play, like I should play on position one. Then, um, then question about what I learned for this year, right? Yeah. I mean, th then it's just about like uh, just having uh, good people around you, like respecting the people you play with and having good team atmosphere, uh, that's first. And then just having uh, good enough players to win tournaments, like uh, you, st you still should have uh, good individual skilled players. So um, we did have it. But <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> we, we, we lose today. Yeah, obviously looking forward to go further in the tournament, but this is your best performance all year throughout LANs. So while maybe it's not the championship ending thing, it's still ending on a high note to an extent. So when you look back, or rather when you're looking forward into your competitive aspirations, um, are you still hoping to maintain your carry role? That's a role that you've definitely grown accustomed to. I mean, of course, I want to keep playing on my starting role on position one, and I hope uh, we can win more tournaments next year, since we didn't win much this one, this one. Yeah. And for all the fans out there who have been supporting you in your journey, you have anything you'd like to say to them? I mean, uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone who supported us. I kind of played bad last game. Maybe I could have carried it uh, myself. So that's it, but yeah, for us that's it for this tournament, but still I can feel the support when we walk on the stage and I feel uh, my, my own uh, supporters as well. So keep supporting us and me, I really appreciate it. Like I said, you're a very young player Nightfall. We look forward to your success in future years. Appreciate your performance at this tournament. Back to you guys. Thank you so much, Tsunami and Nightfall as well. That is going to be the end of their run over on Bet Boom, but it was a phenomenal one for themselves. Should still be very happy in it.
We can talk more about this series, but we have to look towards the next series. And before we do, we had a fun moment with the players. We asked them, who would you ban if you could ban players instead of a hero? After the group stage, you're allowed to ban one other player from any team. So, uh, just ban a player. Yeah, just they don't get to play anymore. So who would you like to ban? Yatoro. 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 I'd ban Yatoro. Probably ban Yatoro. I would ban Yatoro because he is so good. I thought about the rounds just, just for fun. I guess I would ban Pure from Team Bedroom so I don't have to lane against them. That guy's laning is really annoying. Fresh luck. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, unique answer. Why? No, I'm not answering that. I just try luck. Okay, great. Um, you get a substitute then. Um, who would you like? Uh, two whispers. Can I ban on my own teammate? Yeah, of course. Yeah, not. It should be banned. That's illegal. I would have probably banned myself. No, no. Okay, I don't all know, right. Just by nature, I. Yeah. I, I... Um, probably Artizi. Ban Artizi? Yeah. Why? He's gonna be too sad, right? So it's better to not have a cheesy right now. Let it be Thompson. Can you explain why? Uh, he's my personal hater, I guess, because in pubs he always following me, sacrificed his soul, but he killed me and he's happy. I would like to ban Quinn for his poor behavior in public matchmaking. I'm banning Queen. <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, he's had it coming, nah. So you're going to ban him to save you're him? You're going to save him, wow. of course. That is the kindest answer Thank and you. extremely toxic, but very kind Thank answer. You. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, let's say snaking from Tundra, let's uh, let remove him. I think then uh, the Tundra will have zero chance. Maybe ban like GPK for smurfing. Ban Collapse, Collapse Zofi. Uh, let's ban Collapse. Let's ban Collapse, he's like, yeah, let's just ban Collapse. Don't play, go. Don't play. Let's let, let, let Slax to his team like he can play a nice ass off lane on me. I'm banning uh, low, low. So uh, the army can come in from China. And if the army is on their team, free TI I wait for them. FY deserves a TI at this point. Come on. Sorry, Lao. I'm sure a lot of fans can agree with uh, with Moonspoon at that point, at least with FY uh, going for a TI win here. They're on the right path. They're in the lower bracket, though, and it is time for a switch because it is upper bracket time, and I'm sure LGD would love to ban Collapse, but they can't. Upper bracket finals, and I'm joined by none other than Fear, Lacoste, and Tigov. Tigov, how are you doing? Uh Oh, sorry, the series is insane, right? It is. They're at LGD, the rematch, you know, TI winners, LGD, they want it, they need it. And oh, I don't know, this series is just a banger. Absolutely. I mean, this is the one that I've been waiting for the most uh, today, and uh, it's going to be a banger for sure. These are definitely the two best teams right now, record wise, and they're going to go against them. This might be the hypest match of the day, I would say. I will definitely say. Now, these teams, of course, have extended history. In we're going to talk all about what the players did this year, but of course, we got to say rematch of the TI-10 Grand Finals. They've met each other in finals before, and Team Spirit often has the upper hand, but LGD, maybe this time around, they're in the right place to take their place in the Grand Finals and go all the way, but before they have a chance to do so, Team Spirit, can they do it? Let's bring them on stage.
Ace and LGD, but one of these two teams will today punch their ticket to the Grand Finals. Which team is it going to be? We can only hope for some explosive Dota to find that out and to talk about that Dota with my panel here. I want to first talk about Team Spirit, how they got here, Fear, because it's been a tremendous road for them. They have looked unstoppable. Oh, they definitely have. And we heard in the last segment there, everyone seems to be afraid of Yatoro for good reason. This entire team in general, like you think of Collapse and especially Laurel, who at the beginning of the year, a lot of players like he may be the weak link of the team. But now for what he does, he may be the best at it. And what a year he has had. Every single player on this team is a threat. Yeah, Lacos, I think you called Laurel the most improved player. Yeah, absolutely. He was the easy target to pick on because results were lacking. You know, you're playing with uh, other members of the team who already won a TI. And uh, one thing I really like about the rest of the team is they decided to lift him up. You know, they wanted to win a big tournament, big LAN tournament coming into TI and they won Riyadh Masters, which was, you know, when there's a lot of money involved, you know, the team spirit, they're, they're going to level up. Yeah, and throughout the year, they've been trying to find where to put Lao in the team, right? They've got, they sometimes drafted him for like last pick during yeah. Burning Major. The majority of his picks were at the end of the draft and now coming into TI, he's kind of shifted back into the middle because they're more confident with what he's trying to bring for the team, trying to give the game for Collapse and Yotoro to pop off as much as possible. So it's been a long year to get there, but it's clicking at the right time. It is clicking at the right time. When we're talking about clicking at the right time, LGD is clicking at the right time because I mean, yeah, it's great that Team Spirit is doing it at the right time, but they have had Laurel for the full year, and it, and it clicked towards the end. For LGDT, Neo hasn't been around for that long with the squad, and they clicked fairly fast with him in the midst. Yeah, it's testament to, I think, Zhao Wei's scouting abilities, right? Like, when they're trying to look for this offlaner, every time it's like, okay, there's a good element here, what's happening? But for New, he just kind of popped up, he used to play on Vichy Gaming, and he is having an incredible time at this TI. You know, the stats are supporting it, everything's supporting that this guy is such a foundation of the team so quickly is, you know, I, I think a lot of people were probably shocked at how easily he's just looking within the team. One thing that they were lacking coming into this like DPC season, first one, second one, playing with Zeal, Zhang Yu, they did not have enough hero variety coming out from that off lane, and this is where Niu comes because he can play pretty much anything. He's the type of explosive player. He wins his laning stage most of the time, and they can rely on him making rotations because in, also one of the things that he does really well is not die. That this guy is like top two, top three when it comes to dying on the core and one thing I really like about him is also communication with the team. There was a game yesterday when they played against Azure Ray. Uh, he was going Blade Mail on the Night Stalker, which is, you know, not your item that you usually go for. And then NTS on Magnus, he had Blink Dagger queued up, uh, and then he was like, okay, maybe I need a little bit more damage. I'll go for Echo Saber. Switches back to Blink Dagger because he saw this Blade Mail, and then they get like three, four pickoffs, which kind of seals the deal for the game. Yeah, he slotted in uh, fantastically, and LGD, it has been working out for them. Uh, again, I, I mentioned it earlier, only one game loss, Fear. That is super impressive. Yeah. Like it's, But we're talking a lot about New, how well he's doing, but there's always like the behind-the-scenes characters, and that's yeah. Planet for me, and he's actually done the most stacking of any player in this tournament, which will definitely help like players like New get that head start, doing a really good job there. And this is a Zhao Wei team. You're always going to expect that consistency. They always have it going into every game. Even if they have a rough early game, they know how to pick themselves up, back up, just continue to play the team fights. Their draft is always good. This team is just stable. Yeah, the team is incredibly stable. When we're talking about stable, I want to switch to Team Spirit as uh, there is a player incredibly stable. He's on your screen right now. Yotoro has played phenomenal. Now everybody knows TI-10, most rampages, great records, did amazing, but fear the records. This TI, it's unparalleled. This is the guy to beat. Everyone knows it. His stats are showing it. Highest kills, highest GPM, XPM, second in hero damage, second in tower damage. And he has, this is the best part too. He's not just doing it on a couple heroes. He has the second highest hero diversity as well. This man is doing it all. He is taking the spotlight and everyone's afraid of him. Yeah, and the key thing as well is when you look at the, the kind of the how impact of Yotoro, when you look at the damage he does per minute and like at the minimox, he's entering the mid game keeping up that. He's not going from killing in laning phase to hitting the creeps. Like, he's consistently farming and fighting, and he's got that perfect balance. It's why in that previous video, they want to ban him out as a player, because he has found that perfect harmony between it all. That's what carry players are always aspiring to find. And one thing that he really does well is the shot calling. He's the one that, uh, you know, calling for these shots. Whenever he feels strong, he's going to be the voice of the team. We had a couple of interviews throughout the DPC season where he's, like, very vocal about his timings, and the rest of the team is going to follow whatever he does. 
One thing I want to mention also, when we're talking about Team Spirit, last year, it, it wasn't, I mean, the year itself was great, but I'm talking about last international. It wasn't great for them, Lacoste. It felt like the patch might have just not fit the team very well. Yeah, I think it comes down to this heavy zoom meta that was happening and the collapse. These are not his, you know, favorite heroes to play. Well, he really shines on these initiators, uh, team fights that have some kind of a stun. He likes to be the one controlling the tempo of the game, going in first. And uh, now the two meta is kind of over, you can see the team spirit is doing much better. Yeah, it fits collapse well. It fits the team well. And I have to ask this question, Fear, but comparing this form of both of these teams, both Spirit and LGD versus the form TI-10, how, how, how similar are they in terms of peak level? They look more dominant here to me. Team like, Spirit does. Yeah, I mean, they were doing great at TI-10, of course, but, like, they didn't go in as the favorites every single series. So, like, they had a lot of, like, challenging games they overcome. Now it kind of feels like every game is just a little too easy for them. So they're just looking unstoppable at the moment, where LGD, they're bleeding here and there in the early game. They're just, like, as I said, they always have a stable draft. They always come back into the games, and their fundamentals are probably the best of any team. Where does the dominance come from? Where, what part of the game are just are they just exceptionally good at? I think it also. Brought, I, I'm going to detach from the game there, but yeah. I think these are the only two teams where, when I look at a draft from them, if they take a loss, if they win in a difficult way, you know the next game, the draft's going to be completely different. Or there's going to be a whole element and shift. And I don't think a lot of teams have that ability within a series at TI to have that room. But when you have you know sign up for one coach Zhao Wei as well, like they are teams that are refreshing in this way. Personally, I'm a I want to see these guys in the grand finals. I want to see the rematch because just they bring the most invigorating drafts of any team. It seems like everybody wants to see them in the finals. We heard Chalice say the same thing. He's ready for Team Spirit tomorrow. So we'll see uh, who gets the honor of, of being up against them in the grand finals if they make it that far or lower bracket finals. You know, that's also tomorrow. That's also something Chalice could have meant there. Uh, but Team Spirit LGD, there is a, a war of battle going on. Dota 2, great. Uh, there's another war going on while, the, uh, while everybody else is playing Dota 2. And as a support player, Lacoste, this is something that piques your interest. It's the, it's the wards war. Yeah, pretty much uh, PSG LGD, they're the best uh, at this TI in terms of the warding. Also, the amount of wards that they lose, the amounts of observer wards that they kill. It comes down to them picking up one of the earliest gems. They love to pick it up early, like a lot of Chinese, Chinese teams do, is just to be able to, like, continue the domination with this gem. It's all about the tempo, and they're setting up a really high tempo whenever they pick up the early gem. Yeah. I also like the fact that now, because of the, I say now, we've had five couriers for a long time, yeah. but it took some time for pro players to feel comfortable buying an early gem, having that courier out on the map, ready to snipe it away. Because if you do die and give away a gem, it's going to feel pretty bad if you're buying it 20 minutes. But just these pros, they're so much better now, micro in the crews, making sure that the gem is at the forefront of their ideas. And when you have heroes like this, like Night Stalker and stuff that can utilize it so well, you can just choke out your opponent in both vision and gameplay. I would say you kind of need it in this new map change because the map is so big now, right? And there's not enough sentries to cover the whole map. So if you want to choke players out now, you kind of need that gym, whereas before you could just deward certain areas of the map and feel pretty good about it. There was this one guy on Reddit yesterday that uh, could be on the analyst desk. Uh, the, the question was how to beat Team Spirit. Uh, number one, don't get outdrafted. Number two, don't get outplayed. Number three, most importantly, don't lose. <sighs> It's so oh, wow. small. Good, yeah, good advice. Do you yeah. have his username? Because he might be needed right now. Oh, you don't have it. I Wait. don't have it. No. I mean, out. Shout out to him, though. Yeah, shout, shout, out to him. shout out to that guy on Reddit. Team Spirit has lost more games than LGD this uh, this TI, though. You can't, uh, can't deny that one. And one thing that we often talk about, but when it's in upper bracket finals, it's something different. We talk about momentum a lot. Both of these squads come fresh off of the win in the upper bracket semi-finals. They have all the momentum they can wish for. The only thing they've got to go on where they, they might be faltering a little bit, we'll, we'll see. How much did their opponent learn from their series before this? Fear, we watched both the series yesterday. Let's talk about Team Spirit first. They, of course, dropped a game. Was there anything that you feel like LZD could really pinpoint in Team Spirit's gameplay or draft that they're like, okay, you know what? We learned from that and we can beat them now. 
Well, I think for the most part, like when you play against Team Spirit, you always have to be ready for their late game because they've shown you can beat them in the early game, but sometimes this is why Yatoro is so scary. He can always find a way to come back into the game. So keeping Yatoro down and also in the early game, keeping Collapse down, making sure he can get on his axe and get a bunch of kills around the map. I think that's something you should definitely focus on, but they don't have like one weakness that's consistent throughout all games. It's going to change by one, game to game. Yeah, one thing that I've seen from LGD Gaming is Shiro is amazing, slightly weaker laning stage compared to Yatoro, but he's the type of a guy that also can make a huge comeback. Game yesterday when they played against Azure Ray on Spectre, he got dominated. He couldn't do anything, then went back to jungle, farm Hand of Midas, and he's also the type of a guy that is not too afraid to sacrifice some of his own farm for the rest of the team to be able to pick them up, because it's not all about the carry, while on the side of Team Spirit, they like to heavily rely on Yatoro. Yeah, and for me, I think Spirit, that game too, it was maybe an overreaction to the Spirit Breaker, right? You ha they had a lot of counter-aggression heroes, but they weren't able to push out the lanes, make these early moves, and we talk about how good Team Spirit is in the late game, but they just didn't really draft themselves a way to get there. Yeah. And I think that's my main kind of concern in this upcoming series is if they go a little bit too defensive, LGD, they're going to be able to punish that. So it's finding that balance once again, and uh, you'd think Spirit also would identify that after quite a, quite a nice victory from, uh, from Liquid in that game. Yeah, with LGD Azure Ray series yesterday, there was a very, uh, it was a very clear switch that was flipped halfway through the game in both of the games where Azure Ray was running at LGD. And yeah, LGD lost a couple of heroes here and there, but uh, cool and composed LGD mid game, 15 minutes in, flips a switch and is able to make a comeback happen. Will the series be similar to yesterday? Will Team Spirit have a better plan in place than Azure Ray did? We're finding out game one draft starting now. Team Spirit versus LGD Gaming. Game one. Here we go. We got LGD and Team Spirit on stage. LGD will be Radiant side. Team Spirit will be Dire side. First pick will go to LGD. And we've seen how important first pick has been throughout the entire international. But maybe Team Spirit has a better plan than uh, previous teams had. Team Spirit was able to beat Team Liquid yesterday who had first pick. So they have got something figured out. In terms of the bands, though, we're going to have a lot of the... Um, a lot of the, the fan favorites, or maybe not even fan favorites, but a lot of the player favorites removed, T. Yeah, I think right now the only question mark is will Team Spirit ban out that like Phoenix? It's been quite a regular ban, but also Murch is still in play. Because they've pushed Spirit Breaker into the first phase of bans, the kind of classics is Phoenix, it's Murta, and this time around, Murta is going to be let through. I know it's not the most popular hero right now, but we've seen Magnus, not necessarily a first pick material here. Like, they go way back. This is LGD against Team Spirit, uh, TI-10, three games of Magnus. And yesterday, nothing to say. He showed really dominant performance on the heroes. So I think we might see the hero just being picked, especially if it goes to game three. Yeah, we'll definitely have to see here. I'm very curious to see what the first pick choice will be here for LGD. There's still the Brewmaster in the pool. They do like this hero from time to time, but I think the last time they picked up was more of like a block pick. Is there going to be something similar in this series? Are they going to try to do more block picks against Spirit here, or are they just come out with something that's more comfort? I mean, the LGD, they've been predominantly second pick throughout this tournament, unlike most of the other teams that are rushing towards first pick. So that is something a little bit different. We haven't got as much data to go off of them, but I think that yeah. they needed to lose more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a learn a bit. Oh, they ban out a Tusk, and that means that they leave a large amount still in the pool. They'll pick up the AA first, but it does mean that the Brewmaster is still in the pool, which again, Spirit is not often the case. And it is very annoying, mostly, to be up against Collapse's Brew. CK is still in the pool. A lot of ones, uh, a lot of usual suspects still that Team Spirit can choose from here. Yeah, a lot of options, but I think just this AA is a hero that we've seen on and off from teams. And it is so potent, of course, in this tanky meta, being able to stop that healing is incredible. But I think Vortex is the key spell for me. Because the damage is now inside Vortex, it's a lot of blink cancelling, it's a lot of vision that you're applying, and you set up a lot of these position fours, these mids, to even throw out even more damage in these fights. So I think this is a hero that we probably should have seen more throughout this TI, but now we're seeing it as a first pick overall. Yeah. Oh, 
Just go ahead and just pick an A. All of a sudden, you're in a situation where we're just showing support. They're going to answer back with another support here. Most of the cores are getting pretty deep in the turnout now, so a lot of these good cores you would pick in the early phases, they're getting banned out now. And when I see an AA, we talked about, like, Clapsy doesn't enjoy playing a lot of the zoo heroes, but Beastmaster zoo-type heroes have always been good versus AA because, yeah, it is the meta right now. You want to be tanky, you want to buy heart, but this is why AA has been popular. That's probably why they're picking it now, too, to just kind of shut that play down. Yeah, and if Ancient Apparition is paired up with something strong in the laning phase, like another stun, CK is still in the pool. You know, behind the scenes, uh, pros are talking about this hero as being the strongest carry of the meta right now. And this has been old school combo. AA plus CK, you get stunned for a really long time. And also Shadow Demon, he's not uh, the best hero against the CK because he wants to be blown up immediately. He also can get the target on with his ulti. Usually he's that anti-carry. But for now, LGD, they will take care of some of these backline jumps is removing Spectre because Ancient Apparition, he can't really defend himself. Can we can we highlight the Shadow Demon a little bit? Because I personally am puzzled. I am a simple person. I look at the stats, I see Shadow Demon picked 31 times at the International. 26% win rate. That's bad, T. Very bad. I mean, do you want to call out the teams losing with it or no, I think... No, but I want to know why it yeah. might be good here. So for this game, I think it's really good for the defensive capabilities. The fact that when AA commits to a fight, as long as you can buy time, it helps. AA naturally also can't find the back line, so SD is always going to have presence knowing that at least one support can't get to you. Um, and I feel like for Spirit, they have been one of the teams that have showcased how to play SD correctly. They flex between four and five, and predominantly it is the disruption that is doing most of the heavy lifting for this hero nowadays, because if you don't stop, stop him, it is just going to open up your engagement to reset and take that next fight. Yeah, and another big thing this hero does that isn't talked about enough is he is a save, of course. His laning was buffed a lot, but he can stack a lot too. So if you do pick an off laner, we know Collapse does like playing Axe and Tides and stuff like this, he can just get him really farmed and just accelerate Collapse's game. And Collapse is one of the scariest players to play against when he's top net worth. We, you know, we were talking about the zoo for Collapse, by the way. I was just double checking. It's like, he's actually got like a 70% win rate on Beastmaster. I mean, like, his zoo is actually really good. Yeah. It's just at the beginning of the year, it didn't work out with Laurel and the Yeah, exactly. Doing. So that's where it's like, at the beginning of the year, if we're talking about this, like, the stats reflect he should be able to pick it up, but they weren't achieving results. But now, seeing AA, seeing that development, we've seen it already, like Weaver, kind of a non existent hero, but it's rising up. I feel like these, these could be the type of games that also certain heroes can shine when we haven't seen them before. Well, Weaver won't shine this game. It just got banned out. Oh. Oh. Let's go. I mean, if you're speaking about collapse, I, so, I think you talk to reader. anyone that watched CI10, you, think, you say Magnus, you say collapse. Amazing. Pretty much. We did mention the hero, and I'm really glad that they are showing it up in the first game. You know, this is not just the battle in Dota. This is also mental warfare. Oh, yes. Take it away from LGD, and on top of that, like, yes, Magnus, it has changed from the horn toss, the old school times where Claps was cheap, but then Harpoon got introduced. So you're still kind of doing the same thing. You're still dragging someone, repositioning them, and slaughtering them away from your team. Well, that's pretty scary. But the real question for me is going to be, is Claps going to play the Magnus, or is he going to hand over the reins to Laurel oh. because this hero's been picked in the mid lane most yes. of the time and we're not entirely sure the strengths of this hero right now in the off lane, at least I am not, but I know for a fact in the mid lane it is pretty successful. Yeah, most likely going to be that mid because you want to get those levels, you want to become active. We already talked about NTS picking up Magnus yesterday where he, you know, decided to play slightly more active. He understood the, what the role in the team is, but this is also a hero that can scale extremely well. New hero joins the fray. Well, we've seen it. We've seen it played, but uh, not very often. And actually, we've seen it played on the side of LGD earlier this week or last week, I should say, but not on the side of Team Spirit. The other type. In regards to draft, we were saying about like the dynamic nature of both these teams. Like Spirit, this is the most protect your triangle, make stacks, utilize the empower, farm up. If you run into the triangle without vision, without a correct smoke, you're gonna hit by a stomp. Disruption turnaround, RP, you're gonna get absolutely obliterated. And LGD so far, it's a lot of one plus one combos to get a kill, which isn't going to be the best deal if Spirit, if they are to go defense. Yeah, what I want to see from LGD is go into Triangle immediately and start blocking some camps because you have one of the best heroes in Dota to stack with and one of the best heroes in Dota to clear those stacks with. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think more than anything right now, this uh, Elder Titan, it's typically picked up against agility heroes for the aura, but in this case, it doesn't really matter. CK, he goes in, he normally blows up one hero, but then you have that Echo Stomp to just freeze everything in place, reposition. You have tons of AoE now to kind of deal with illusions. You have the Magnus as well that can keep up in the farm space, but LG's draft is still strong nonetheless. Could this be like a void game for Team Spirit potentially? Because you have the buff ups, you're not as slow as before. The supports are food throughout the entire game. The jump potential CK is always very scary, but if you don't jump, if you don't cleanly connect, that's when Void will oblige. Yeah, I wouldn't mind you have save with the disruption, so even if they manage to get a top of you, but uh, we'll pick up a Terror Blade here. Yataro's classic. This is just Spirit saying, if you want to be aggressive, we're just never going to be near you, right? Like, how quickly can they skip waves? They're going to be able to play such an intense macro game for Spirit that LGD, the next two picks for them, they need to be able to cut through that. Make sure they protect a wave, transport it towards the tower, defend it, and then take the fight they want to take. Because if they're not dictating this game, they're always going to be looking towards the next lane that they need to push out. Oh, it's oh coming. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh okay, time to get rid of some of these vision heroes from the mid lane. I mean, there is Storm Spirit of available, maybe even Zeus. Like, I wouldn't mind even having, you know, Zeus on the side of uh, Team Spirit. Uh, they're going to go with Puck, so this is another elusive hero, because they don't have this instant stun, so they might need to remove some of these elusive heroes. We did mention that, you know, NTS, he's not that cheesy player anymore. He's playing more of meta stuff, but uh, his Tinker will always come out if it's a good game for it. And why is it a good game for, for it this time around? I mean, you're playing against Terrorblade, they don't have Shadow any Demon. kind of catch of Shadow Demon, like, the, these heroes are gonna die. Everything that I was saying for Spirit, being defensive, protect your triangle, these are properties that allow Tinker to have a good start to the game. The worst Tinker games is when you can collapse onto that mid tower, to break down the map, stop Tinker from getting that blink dagger, just delaying the inevitable. And right now, LGD, they have the start of the fight that we mentioned with the CK, the Grimstroke combo. And for Tinker, he should be able to freely farm. Like this last pick from Spirit needs to have a little bit of pressure and catch, otherwise this could just be the NTS show. I think they only have two choices here. One being a Storm Spirit, and the other one being Zeus. Outside of that, it's going to be very difficult for them to find the Tinker in these fights. And Tinker is a hero that we don't see a lot of. It definitely has a lot of weaknesses. Of course, the laning we talked about, sure, the Shadow Demon can come and gank him, which could be effective, but I think more than anything, they just want to pick a hero that can just stop Tinker from doing what he does best, just spamming spells in the backline. They need some type of gap close here. An OGD, they round out their draft with a Centaur, another hero that can just absorb a little bit of that damage during the team fight. Also, should have a relatively free lane. And that There's alone, prong lane find, yeah, coming out from LGD. Ooh. I am scared for like 15, 20 minutes. Spirit, where is the damage from this lineup? There's going to be Tinker running at you, CK, Blink Dagger potentially. You've got Centaur Blink on top of you. Like, just so much swarming that Spirit. It's... They can fix it potentially in their last pick. It seems like from the bans of LGD that uh, LGD is banning out a couple of mid heroes with the Puck and the Bat Rider. So, still having that option for the Mag to be flex. Is this just. Like a boring kind of Pangalier style situation. Another hero that can find Kunka. Okay. Or Kunka. So they didn't really address the Tinker that much out like for the game, mm -hmm. but Kunka is pretty strong in the laning stage. They can still play tempo, but I think more than anything, as per usual, we're going to be looking at the Collapse Magnus to make things happen on the map. If he has a good laning stage, maybe he will be the one to find the Tinker with that Blink Harpoon build. I'm feeling this LGD draft, I'll be honest. The two strong side lanes and nothing to say on Tinker. Also, the latest Chinese meme, you know, TF. TI2, they wanted uh, TI4, TI6, 2 plus 4 plus 6 equals 12. That's TI12 for you. Yeah, it's written. Wow. That's some, some good math. And quick. <laughs> Well done, the handshake exchanged here on the, on the panel. So we are all feeling like LGD has got, a, has got an unanswered tinker here then, T. It's unanswered until Team Sprint have a lot of items. So it's kind of LGD's game to lose, where they're the ones that will be dictating a lot of the early pressure. They have a lot of really good early game timings. But of course, if Spirit gets to that late game, there's going to be the collapse pick of potential. Yotaro with these Sunder turnarounds like CK might potentially fall off into all the chaos that Spirit can bring. But it's all on LGD to break Spirit's farming patterns. Don't allow them to get these items and show us why this, what, 71% win rate Tinker across his entire career is picked up so boldly. Oh, we're seeing early aggression then. That's exactly. what you're saying. That should, come out, that should come out from both teams. Lacoste nodding yeah, along absolutely. heavily. Yeah. And you're, still, you're thinking still bloodbath, but Tinker comes out on top? 
Yeah, I think so. I, I feel like they have, you know, two strong side lanes and this Tinker that, that is not really answered until they start to get, you know, a couple of items, X mark, and they also have a Centaur to defend their... If they don't want to take a fight, they can easily just stampede away. Yeah, I think right now, if you do want to win this game, if you're Team Spirit, it has to be the Collapse Show. It really does. We're going to have to see a lot of skewers, a lot of Harpoon plays. Other than that, it might be quite difficult because their lineup is slow. And you said earlier that we've seen Mag mostly in the mid lane, but you feel like Collapse still can do this on the off lane. Let's see. I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. We're gonna have to see. He's a great Mag player, but will it fit in the meta? Will it fit in the meta? That's a question that maybe Silent can answer us as he's standing with Tsunami on the stage for a coach interview. Thank you very much. I am a standing by with Silent. Who, um... Hey. You think you're funny? What? You, uh, you think you're funny picking... Picking, picking Magnus? Uh, no, I don't think funny. Magnus just like plays Magnus. And we each, why not? See, now, I would understand that if you've picked that at any point in this tournament, but specifically against LGD, what's going on here? I don't know. He, he just want to play it. That's it. It was Collapse's decision, is what you're telling me? Yeah, you can't say him no. He's like, pick me Magnus and... Seattle, you ready to see a Magnus? I said, are you ready to see Collapse Magnus? Then let's rock it with game one. Thank you very much, Tanami. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for Spirit to go up against LGD. And my goodness, Fog, what, what, what some kind of hero player combinations <laughs> we've got coming out. Indeed, as was hyped up, the Collapse Magnus. But over on the side of LGD, the Tinker. There's been so many games, so many drafts in this, in this tournament that a lot of people have felt that maybe it was the time to bring it out. It didn't happen, but it's happening now. And Fog, do they have the answer for this nothing to say Tinker from the side of Spirit? Can could they be, deal with it? Oh, could be some limited answers, but if anything they do have is base control and base defense. There's skewers, there's an ET to hold grind, high ground, there's tidal waves and whatnot too. I think we're in for an absolute treat. Who knows which way this one's gonna go, but all I know is it's gonna be a fun one. Absolutely, I mean, when you look at both drafts, what do you feel that both teams have really kind of gone for with their approach to this game? I mean, we just heard it right there. I think it's a lot of comfort, right? Comfort, but also definitely a lot of heroes that are really popular currently at the moment. But you see Yotaro's bringing out his Terrorblade, which he hasn't been playing as much as some of the other carries. And of course, NTS playing his Tinker. I think it is just these two teams. They know a lot about each other, and we're going to see a, we're gonna see that quickly defined inside this game. Absolutely, we'll see how sort of how well Lal can do in the matchup here against nothing to say his Tinker. And sort of beyond the laning, stage, who's going to be the, the hero that has the answer to lock nothing to say down and stop him from being able to freely jump around the, the team fights in the later stages of the game? Yeah, because overall you tend to see, you know, the spirit heroes used to be the answer, of course, for the Tinker. Even the Zeus, of course, would have his merit. But overall in this game, looking at spirit, the catching for this Tinker could be difficult. They have the ET spirit, probably one of the best scouting tools, and the Kunkka in particular to ca catch this Tinker, but could fall into some issues. Nothing to say. I it's nothing to say Tinker, right? So if he's able to get away with it, he will take over this map. And they have a lot of you know, aggressive potential they can do with Global. They have an AA as well with this Tinker too, so it's got to be a lot of damage that they can have in that early mid game. Now looking at the side lane matchups, what do you think we're going to get out of this bottom one? The classic sort of CK AA safe lane duo from Shira and Why You Smile going up against the, the signature, the, the Collapse Magnus, which will be backed up by Mira's Shadow Demon. Anybody going to have difficulties down this bottom lane? Is there kill potential for either of the sides? That's a good question. I mean, overall, CK, I don't think, has really had any difficult times as we're saying. This new top. Trying to make a bit of a, a chase down on towards him. They can put the meta for that one, but New's fine. Starting in the way, though. Still going to take a few extra punches here from Eposhka. Well, backups in from Planet. Maybe just a bit of a bait as New. He's ready to turn with Planet and start to get aggressive over towards the Elder Titan. They're in with the first stun, follow up with the Who Stomp. They got, got the burst. They'll find first blood. That's nice. LGD bait Meposhka perfectly. Nice play from Planet. You know, sometimes you do see, you know, these four positions or these greedy supports. They tend to just hit the creeps when something like this has happened. Planet immediately runs to his buddy. So quick little identification. They can go for that kill. Yotoro does get uh, pretty much every single last hit out of it there, but a good kill for this Centaur to start off. Yeah, and that was, yeah, the, the first usage of the meta. So there'll be this long period now where New and Planet, unlikely to feel under any sort of heat themselves. They'll be feeling very solid in the lane. And Meposhka, just have to be very careful with his positioning. With a bit of an advantage, they'll get off that kill. They could look to 
to go again if Maposhka gets too sort of ahead of himself. No, absolutely. We haven't seen too much of the ET, right? I think it was only nine pandas who've been playing it so too much here, but you can understand the idea what they want from it. I think T was talking a lot on the panel about just trying to stall, get that farm up. It's a very, very farm heavy team that Team Spirit's looking for this time around. And it's a lineup that can stall forever. You get a stomp on one person when they're trying to push at some point. You get the skewers back in the base, the tidal waves, etc. So. I'm talking about stalling, you know, this TI, we've seen some incredibly long games come out. If this was yeah. one to, to go to the later stages, who's going to have the better job of stalling and carrying out this, this game through the later portions? Spirit has a pretty scary one, but it's going to be the test too, because the Tinker, if he's at a point where he's just absolutely out of control, he can just take over. Uh, he can right? And it's nothing to say, yeah. so definitely potential for him having that if he gets off to a good start. And so far, it is pretty good. Having a very good match matchup here versus Laurel, but Laurel is handling it. Yep. 16 3, 17 4, pretty much dead even. Yeah, they're both basically free farming in the mid lane, pushing it back and forth. So no one getting shut out completely at that one. Top lane, bit of aggression here is new. Trying to put the set up. They've got the ink swap up with the stomp. Ooh. Ooh, coming nicely from Maposhka. Holding you back. And not able to get the ink swap pop onto your Toro. Still bringing this terribly incredibly low. New's going to be able to close it with a. It, it didn't matter that they didn't connect with the ink swap. They still managed to take your Toro down. All right, great plays from New. Lacking a little bit on the last hits, but getting these kills, it's going to set him up for a pretty damn early Vanguard. He's actually buying the boots, so looking for more aggression in this lane. I mean, I like it. It's a lot of magic damage up here versus this squishy Terror Blade. Yeah, it's got to be pretty frightening for Spirit, right? They're losing heroes, despite the fact that LGD didn't need to hit all the spells. Exactly. It's a scary part of the map already in the first few minutes. This top lane for Team Spirit, they've got to be more careful and perhaps need to have that extra backup come in if LGD try for that sort of play again. Quick moves for the runes. Mira looking to set up perhaps onto nothing to say. A rotation that's probably unexpected here. See if they've got the damage. Set up into the torrent. Uh, there's nothing to say. He's got the laser at the ready. Lars still has the X mark, but back up to the one X mark. Get the drag back with the X mark. One more poison. There's a lot of damage that's going to be coming in on this Tinker. It's not enough not to quite. pop him, though. Nothing to say. Manages to escape. The, the attempt unsuccessful by Spirit. I think the blood grenade was off the mark there. I think it didn't right? connect. I don't think it connected. I if think it if it hits, it's very likely to get the kill. It would have been very close. Yeah, it would have been close. Good attempt there from Mira. Not expected gank. I don't think they saw that one coming, but that's the beauty of the Shadow Demon. I think that's maybe also part of the reason, besides, of course, Kunkka being so popular, but this hero stacks. This hero's good to gank with most of his cores. I mean, yeah, with the Magnus and with that Kunkka, it's definitely set up. A close start. Despite the kills that LGD have been able to pick up, as you can see on the last hits, it's not shaking up Team Spirit. Team Spirit, three cores, slightly ahead uh, at this stage right now. That's collapse. He's more than happy to be left on his own down here. Mira can continue to roam the map right now. This Magnus in a position where he'll be under no sort of threat really from this laning stage unless they bring in additional members, which is unlikely. I think the focus from LGD very much going to be towards this top lane, getting the pressure on the Terra Blade and just making sure they have that back up when required away. Right, look at this top again. Lane. It's big damage. It's set up with the combo onto your turret. It's Wait. easily enough as you takes him down. Not an easy lane as we're seeing here for the Terra Blade. You know, you tore an absolute master on this hero, but getting caught out by LGD's combo. And he's overall a pretty squishy hero throughout this game versus all the magical bursts that they're going to be having super early in the game, right? That's the reason that the Tinker gets picked up. If Yatoro gets off to a slow start, yeah, that's rough. it'd be hard for him to catch back up. The other thing about the Tinker is that, that people used to talk about, it's not just that you have this big burst being able to find this Terra Blade. It's also you just clear the illusions. So TB thrives on being able to farm the map without showing himself. Tinker can easily just show up, wipe those illusions out, constrict the farm too, so... Yeah, tough start for Yatoro Nu. Uh, he's been, honestly, he's been the one to watch for me these last few games. His Brewmaster took over, his Night Stalker as well, and now his Centaur is off to a phenomenal start. Uh, at the least, you know, obviously a Terra Blade. Yatoro, he's on a hero that can absolutely back up and recover through, yes. the, uh, for, through the farm and from the jungle. But uh, not the, the kind of start he would have hoped to have had. Still trying to hover around this top lane, but it's getting scarier and scarier for Spirit to be up there. I mean, they've already started moving heroes. They move Y top, so they have the three top, and then they have the CK and a 1v1 for Magnus. For Magnus, that's fine for CK. They're going to try and step in from the Poshka. This time, TP backup will be coming in. Lal ready to try and help turn things around, but New is in with those. He still gets the kill. They're able to just take the kill. There's nothing they can do to stop New in that attempt. See if they can hold him back at all. I mean, Lyle's looking towards him, but you, he's just walking he's away. He's going to be able to walk it off. Lyle's not going to be able to throw anything down onto the centaur. He's just getting away with everything and, in this top lane. New, and it's a cool approach. Cause I feel like in. I feel like in almost every one of these games, people just default a lot of times. They're like, oh, I'm having good lane. I go Vanguard. You can't kill me. No, News like, I'm going phase boots. I'm going bring out. I'm playing the aggressive Centaur. And so far, look at that differential. He has 1,000 gold over. Yeah, I think an exciting start to the game. You can see already in the net worth. This yes. is very much going to be down to the off laners to see what both of them can do. New coming in with a hot start through this early laning stage. See in the mid, they'll get the setup. Stomp into the boat. 
Fox did enough though. They're gonna turn and get the laser off onto Lal. No further hits coming in, but the X mark is still there. Now the TP backup comes into play. LGD wanting to try and do their best to keep nothing to say safe, and it will work. This Tide of Spirit can't go in any further. You see Collapse is also swung across, but the silence was there immediately. Stampede comes out for new. LGD able to separate themselves from Team Spirit's attempts. All the little things mattering. Raindrop and a bracer. Maybe not something you expect to see on the Tinkers too much, but nothing to say he knows. Just be a little bit tankier first that versus this burst as Laurel. I should be all right here, yeah. Planet. Just throwing out a blood grenade for a bit of fun. And as we know, there's a lot of aggression going on so far for LGD lanes are looking good. But as the panel said, and as we see, it's a greedy draft that Spirit is setting some, themselves up for. And looking at the stacks, they're getting them prepped. I think this is what, a quad, a quad hard camp stamp or something like that at the moment set up inside that triangle for the Kunkka. Yeah. So they will have these recovery outlets. No, for sure. Spirit can calm things down even just a little bit. Very likely that you're going to see your Toro's Terra Blade get back up to the top spot in net worth. As long as they don't lose these stacks. I mean, they might have to go clear them pretty soon just in case of anything. Because if a Tinker walks over there, it gets cleared in no time. Yeah, lanes. I mean, they've kind of broken the lanes a little bit here. LGD with this dominance from new. They're going to force your Toro a bit to the jungle there. And the supports are having to make these moves around to get these stacks around to try to fix things. And yeah, they're going to work on those stacks. In terms of Collapse's progress, he's of course going to go straight for that Blink Dagger, 1300 towards it, so should be on Could track. Could be in trouble though. Having it a good timing, they're in with the Silence, and with the three of them, there's a huge amount of damage that Collapse he cannot withstand. LGD. Clean. Taking kills wherever they want right now, 5 to 0. They planted, making it happen. All five kills are at the back of this Grimstroke so far. Inkswell connecting perfectly. He's got ma he's got level three Inkswell already too. I mean, this is very scary how much magic they ha damage they have. I mean, he's gonna have such an early blink dagger too. He's just omit. He's like, screw it. I don't even need the Vanguard. He's gonna have it at such an early time for these early aggressive moves, and they're just continuing to pick up the pace here. It's gotten to the point now where Spirit, they're they're not gonna be showing any faces up no. on this top lane unless they bring a lot of numbers. But Collapse, he actually did port down bottom, so TP will not be available for the Magnus to be able to join if there's a big battle committed up top. Looks like Laurel was able to sneak into the enemy triangle a little bit here. I think he stole a double stack, it looks like, so a little bit of extra gains for him. And Poshka's got to be careful. He's hiding in the trees, trying to soak up some XP. He's got to be so cautious. Stampede's at the ready. So slowly but surely siege this top tier one tower, LGD. Maposhka, he'll start to... To back off, he does not want to be around here. Too much of a push, they've got the vision on him. All right, that's pretty much the blink dagger going to be finished up from you right after that tower goes down. Trying to give level levels the AA. Why? Trying to get a little bit in the mid lane, but seems like he knows something's up. Having that ward on the right side does see the kunk on the shadow demon set up. Playing far left, trying to get this level six online. Well, it's got the DD in the bottle, so good amount of burst if he can find some sort of setup around this mid. Laurel. How close to six on AA? Oh my goodness. So close. If that's if why is six there? That just is probably a dead Kunkka. Oh, has to be a little bit careful. A planet. Okay. He's, he's going for the player. By he's himself. up by the stampede. He's able to close it onto Maposhka. That's going to be Maposhka going Look down. Look at him go. Another kill here for LGD as a whole. They just are six to zero. Spirit still struggling to find anything so far in terms of kills from this early game. And Yatoro, he's getting bullied out of this top lane. Has to TP out of that. I mean, New is just bringing the action to him. Him and Planet, right? The six kills, they're involved in five, and then six on the counterpart, they're Planet. Super active so far. And you see the scans are coming out already. LGD, they're taking notes. They're like, all right, well, Spirit, they're going to back up to their triangle. Could see some early contests come out here. They're actually just going to throw a casual AA blast to scout and potentially snipe someone. Won't connect, but a nice attempt. Yep, they're going to need time. And, you know, Yatora, obviously, with his build, he's uh, approached that, has the Midas on the Terror Blade. He just wants to be hitting the creeps without any interruption. Well, we'll see if the rest of Spirit can create that sort of space for him. Collapse has got the solid timing on his Blink Dagger. He's keeping it hidden for now on the Courier. We'll see if they try and make some sort of move around this reveal of this pickup. It does feel complicated, though, especially with Yatora going down full greed route for Midas. All of the heroes on LGD are going to be ready to fight at all times. They want to try and get something mid. TP over to the mid lane. Blink Dagger at the ready for Collapse. Got the, RP. the jump, gets the skewer back. Straight underneath the tower. Tor will miss, but it doesn't matter. They'll still Great get catch. the kill. A solid Blink Dagger reveal there from Collapse. He is the one who kind of has to bring back that early game a little bit for them. Six to one. He finds the biggest catch he can. A lot. Another one potentially too. Yeah, should manage to find this one here. X-Mark straight back into the boat. It's going to be a couple of kills for Spirit as they start to get themselves on the board. Nicely done. Nuke does have that Blink Dagger finish, but as you said, you know, Yotaro, he's just chilling on the sidelines. Quick little RP usage, and they're back off to getting that farm. So for Spirit, it's going to be a lot of that this game. 
Getting a quick kill, backing up farming, and it's gonna be up to LGD to punish this farm to find these heroes and hunt. I mean, how they are looking for it. How easy is it for LGT's heroes to hunt down around that sort of tier two area top? Is, is it easy for them to set up to try and get the Terra Blade, or is this a pretty safe part of the map for Spirit to hold for, for Yatoros to keep farming up it? It'll probably be pretty safe for some time, especially until they can get out that mid tower. Because there is a lot of counter gank. That's the one thing that Spirit's Draft really thrives on, especially for like later stages and stuff like that. ET stomp, Magnus, and SD save. So multiple different things they can do to protect each other. If a kill doesn't happen instantly, it could get quickly turned. Six to two. The gold now. Spirit, those stacks starting to work out. Three cores at 6k. And TS has been slowed down significantly just off that one kill. Yeah, fully set up around this bottom tier one, really, Spirit, just in case LGD were going to group up and try for a tier one tower push. I mean, they're going to have RP back up in about 20 seconds. Yeah, they're, they're, they're ready very ready respond. for this fight. Yep. And they do have, they will have pretty decent damage, at least because the ET does have okay levels. Mipusha has hit six, and Laurel is 11, so if they do catch anybody in your tower, very likely they will just pop. Not for sure. I mean, they may have got that tier one on the, the top lane pretty early, LGD, but finding any of the other towers, it's not, not going to be an easy ordeal. No, they need to fight for it. They need to get a pick off first, ideally, or get some vision by tower. They can't just go straight for these towers versus Magnus. It's going to be down to if Nuke like can get trying. the jump here. Smoke up from the three of them, Nuke. Instant ward down. And the two supports. They've got the Inkswell buff. They'll go for the jump on the Poshka. Quick and easy. See if they can turn this into anything else. Laurel is immediately rotating over. Has he, a shield rune as well, too. He, this he's is hard straight for at them. He is incredibly tanky. They do not have the damage for him at this point. If he gets the shield rune off. Now they'll back off. They'll get the kill. And they'll pull back here, LGD. They're actually going to give nothing to save the Wisdom Rune as well, too. I think he was perhaps farming the left side, but they'll giving him, they have to give him anything he can just to get him boosted up a little bit. And he is going to, I mean, at the moment, he's got the Aghanims queued up, so... Cool. Does feel pretty awesome versus a lot of these tanky heroes and stuff like that, right? So, besides just the Terror Blade, of course, that counter, but... Yeah, cool. game resuming oh, at this sort of pace I think uh, it's be happy Yatora that is indeed gonna be in a very happy place getting to freely catch up here in the farm and uh, this stage and, and will we'll continue to be you know this is one of those games where he's gonna probably be the only man with the Midas does feel in the long run that should be set to pay off unless LGD can continue to put the, the pressure on hey spirit ready ready to go again collapse he's got the RP they're hunting they see the courier moving toward top. Might have to just settle for an AA. Yeah, they just, don't have to uh, use RP. It's a free easy kill. Not the biggest they would hope for. Just Get Yotaro the kill. Yep. Perfectly set up. Quick move towards the twin gates, maybe. Ooh. See if they can make a play down bottom as well oh, off the, cool. the remainder of the smoke. They've still got a few seconds left onto it. New, he's just, he's close to showing himself on the wave. Oh, this would be huge if they are able to And they're bringing further tanks in around the tier one. It, it's, it's a tanky hero. And again, any sort of setup. Maybe Mirror with the disruption, but no, new. He's already out of the area. No, this is a, a scary place to be. I look at the TP's coming in. In fact, LGD bringing three further TP's in on this one. They're happy to try and fight this. They get the setup here straight away onto Mirror. They'll find the Shadow Demon. The Battle of Vision as soon as somebody shows himself. And that ward will actually expire in 30 seconds. So it won't actually be a D ward. Quick, easy kill. Yeah, it's all right. Making the most of it, though, knowing that with that sort of yep. focus down bottom, he was able to push forward an extra couple of waves on the top lane get some pressure onto the tier one tower so maximizing what he can even in these like, scarier parts of the map yeah, and i'm watching it let's actually check to see if collapse was trying to throw any powers on him as that beta was wearing down i think he is maybe looking to do so but still looking for place collapse he's constantly looking for something i mean sorry lgd you yeah. continually see them grouped up pretty heavily i mean at the moment right we've got four of them around this mid lane I'd imagine for them, they're looking to accelerate a little bit I more. I think so, right? That CK with his timing, since right now he's absolutely a menace. He's got this Echo Saber and Armlet finished up, so if he joins with this team, he's quite a bit stronger than Yotoro if he joins in. Yeah, you've got to imagine they want to fight. They don't want to sit back LGT. No, I would imagine not. The Shard is also finished. Planet bought it right away at 15 minutes, so a very, very strong dispel, especially versus something like RP. If he's able to be in a good position on this Grimstroke, he could stop a lot of aggression that comes out from Sp Team Spirit. I'm going to keep my eyes on Planet, because he was quite a big difference maker yesterday as well, too, on his Rubik, the spell steals he was able to do. He's been phenomenal, so I'm going to be looking at him. Collapse. Ready to go. Smoke up between himself and Mira. Okay, let's see what he's he got can decent catch. damage now with the Echo Saber completed they over the Blink Dagger. All five heroes are set up in the area as well. Can't quite find him. Could be a little bit of a bait. They could look to jump again. 
And LGD, they are prepared for this one, but Spirit, they have the numbers. Lal, trying to fish for something here with the Tauro. Not gonna find anything. They have Ward Vision inside that lane, so they do see every time that LGD does step up at you. Ooh, he's actually making the first move. And we see in fact collapse. He's able to get the jump even before that gets the drag back on the way you smother. Bring down the AI. Oral's gone. Spirit getting a bit split there with the focus heading over towards that jump that they made around the mid, but indeed the, they left their Kunkka vulnerable on the top lane. And he had vision too. They have that lane ward, so he saw it completely coming in, but just got caught off guard. Maybe just the communication that was happening on the side gets caught off guard. It's a big kill, slowing down Laurel's momentum. And I believe what, did Shiro get the last? Yes, Shiro got the last hit as well too, so bumped up a little bit more. CK, Shira, hitting fantastic timings. He's huge. He really is quite large, and he's always going to have that buff up, of course, from that Grimstroke. LGD, once again, everybody to the mid lane. Really trying to look for, for these constant and consistent fights. Hey, look for Poshka. They'll get the jump. New in with the burst. There'll be defensive disruption from Mira. But there'll be no getting out of here for Meposhka. Easy support kills that LGD can continue to find. Just continuous, it's, it's new and planted every single time, making the setup happen. He's big, he almost has the heart finished up on the Centaur already. Once he disassembles the Vanguard, he's pretty much gonna have it finished. Gonna be tough for them to, I mean, fully bring him down. ET Splitter, of course, is probably gonna be the, one of their better damage functions. It's just that max HP damage, but sometimes it's pretty difficult to keep them always in line with it. Yeah, Shira, he can really get involved. To He's first up, takes the mid tier one tower with the BKB complete. Okay. Very little chance that Spirit can take him down unless they catch him completely on his own. Cool down. Yeah, and immediately just rebuys his Echo Saber too. Yeah, he's having a phenomenal, phenomenal start here. Uh, this is the timing for the CK. We'll see how much LGD can get done around this. Right now, I mean, they're not playing like super rushed by any means. I'm sure they're like, we also scale really hard. They always will have this Tinker versus that TB matchup. So he is getting closer and closer to that Agony. Maybe that'll be the call where they start taking over the map a little bit more because I mean, it's, it's pretty even in terms of gold so far. Zero. Yutoro. Going to find Yutoro here with the opening. They're going to have an Ice Blast flowing as well. Straight in on top of the tail by Yutoro. He's going to be going He's down. Uh-oh. Did not expect LGD to be there, Yatoro, but they, they find him as he walks straight into them completely on his own. Shiro gets handed a massive kill, and it is right as the Roshan is repositioning down toward bottom too, so they could consider even looking for it. I guess, I mean, in that sort of situation, what do you imagine was going through Yatoro's mind? He just didn't expect them to be playing around this part of the map? I guess not, right? Just got caught off guard. I mean, LGD has been incredibly active the way that they're swinging around the map with the supports and with new. It's, it seems like three or four heroes are constantly together. Just kites got off guard, and now, yeah, that Roche is gone. Yeah, that was He's gone in seconds. And it was sort of the, the first time he'd really left his half of the map. Yeah. I think Yatori won't be doing that again anytime soon. And he went down the S and Y route. Pretty interesting one. Quite different than I feel like we usually do see on the Terror Blade. Spirit. We'll be able to secure themselves there. So Mira? Mira? He's oh gonna be my fine. God, he has yes. a healing Lotus. <laughs> the shout out from Aposhka's Elder Titan. <laughs> Aghanim's done. They didn't commit to finish the Roshan. That will still sit there. Oh, they didn't actually. Okay, good call. Down to about Sorry. half HP and then decided to pull back from it. I guess they got a little bit scared because they didn't see exactly where all the heroes were. Okay. Aghanim's now finished. So for Laurel, big power spike now. He can look to get involved a little bit more for these team fights. But so far, it's been, again, just very farmy from Spirit. 11 to 4. And now for LGD, Aghanim's finished up for Tinkers. Yep, just still feels like they're going to be moving around at least at these two supports, looking for potential setups. There we go. Smoke okay, Spirit's going to do it first. Spirit. See if uh, Yutoro wants to get involved or if he'll hold back to farm. For now, it doesn't look like he's too keen in, in joining the smoke. Does have the, the Eagle Song done. Who are they going to find, though? He's going to show himself at least the illusions around the mid. Maybe see if he can get some sort of a bait. We'll join the smoke now, but he's ready to reveal. He, it's a full bait here with a push from the Terra Blade. Okay. Who they are able to grab. I mean, you, he's walking up. 2,800 HP Centaur. It's a hard one to go on, even if they get the vision upon him. Especially if, if they don't know where Planet is in particular, right? This ink swell, it could just stop the entire aggression that comes out from them. If they can and find him, try get the, the grab. perfect one. And do indeed, they'll get the Grimstroke, drag him back. The Stampede's there, but the Ice Blast is returning. Two men's done. The few jumps with a Who's stop. He's going to be able to burst the boat floor. Collapses out. And Love, he's going to be in a whole world of trouble as well. The BKB's popped. They push up for the Kunkka. Take him down. They do and lose New in return. And two for two, and it is LGD that are able to take down two cores. 
The target's time to farm, though, right? So it's, it's always like these positives and negatives that they're gonna get out of these smokes, even if they do lose some heroes. Closing in on the butterfly. Very close to having that one complete, at least. And it was, it's good that uh, Laurel actually got the Torrent Storm off. It was very close to him actually not getting that one off, and then they probably don't get that return kill. But even new, with that heart, you saw the damage that comes through. It's quite a lot that actually blew him up. Oh, CK items. A full Shadow Blade now for Shiro. So I, the hunting is going to continue. I feel like for him, he's just going to continue to look to get involved. And a lot of these kills could just get popped if he was able to find them on his own. That plus an AA Blaster plus a Tinker Rotation. And they'll head back to deal with the Tormentor on okay. their side of things. A planet. Cool. My goodness. He'll get a pretty nice one there. Why you smile, able to finish his. On top of also now having his Yule Scepter. We've been seeing a lot more Yules, but it, I think it's also because of the rise of these contests and stuff like that. It's going to be very nice for him and also versus the Magnus, since I believe he did go for the Echo Saber on Collapse. So if they do have Vision as the fight starts, it could be difficult for Collapse to do the usual, you know, Harpoon Skewer kind of play. If he gets Yules up, they can just fully go for him. Yeah, he's going to be trying to get that, trying to get that BKB online yeah, next, it. but it's going to take him a bit of time. He will need it to be able to get that type of setup for his team, but still 13-6. Gold continue to be very, very nice close, place. but LGD feel that they're feeling they're probably feeling pretty good with getting away with this NTS Tinker so far, yeah. not getting caught out too much. I was sort of in that bottom spot that the lowest of the core for a while, but now he's caught up Chin to up. both Collapse and you. Making that, the, the right sort of progress here on his trajectory towards getting the BKB done himself, so he can jump around these fights without the threat of getting caught in a straight torrent from these torrent storms from Lyle. Yes, that's the big thing, right? He absolutely needs this BKB versus the torrent storm. The tip comes out. Didn't see what the one is for. Your blood runs cold. <laughs> so DD in the, the, the river here. It's underneath the water of spirits, so I'll be aware that it gets picked up if they go for a play with this one. And Shiro swinging around for it with his Shadow Blade. They're instantly smoking with it too. They want something, but it got seen. Like you said, Spirit, they were yep. completely aware of it. So everyone positioned it around the area. At least, even if he was in this. See if LGD can still catch them by surprise. Oh, the big clash looks like it's going to happen here. Planet, he also buys a Blink Dagger for positioning on this Grimstroke. Who's able to get the big jump? And Spirit, this should be full defensive right now. They know that LGD is going to be looking for this sort of move. They get the scan, they know where they are. Maposhka in position to break it. Yeah, maybe they'll just allow support to get caught here. Oh, Laurel, be careful. He's got Tidal Wave. They have a ward on the high ground. Perhaps they could fish for somebody. Oh, you smile getting the vision set up for themselves. They're hey, going to go for right it. They're going to get the Skewer back as well. Up towards you. Instant X well. You is going to be able to pop the Stampede still. Gets himself back up to the high ground. Both teams. Holding back from one another. Is there any further catch? Lyle trying to close the gap over towards New. They get a reflection out on towards the center. I mean, Spirit wants to catch something here. It's hard to so much. Hero. He's going to be able to wrap around for the back lines. He gets straight in on top towards them, but the Stu is there once more. Collapse getting Shiro under the tab. The BKB is popped by the CK. Shiro steps back. Soul by. He's stuck. Holding together the Big stun. In with the who's done the double edge on the boat for the first. He can throw it down over the defensive disruption. Comes out from Mira. They'll finish at the cook. Get Toro's gone. gets blown up here by the burst of the laser. Nothing to say, finding that huge kill, taking out the Terra Blade in the midst of the fight. Oh. Both teams to lose two. The mind games from these fights too. They like Spirit had used so much. They had meta pop. They used literally all their ultimates. They keep chasing forward. But LGD able to get the big cleanup on these two cores. And even around sort of their own tier two tower, it's so hard for Collapse to get that kind of start to the fight yep. that he hoped for. You know, he's getting these skewers onto New, he's getting these skewers onto Shiro, but neither hero feels good to start the action off. I mean, the way it started was awkward too. The X comes out, they skewer, but the Ink Swap was already put on New right at the start. So the Dispel comes out, things get very, very weird. And yeah, at this point, Spirit, look at how much they've already used. Meta was used, RP was used. Quite a bit was actually used before that. Yeah, full chase on towards New, and at this point, it's the fact that they, they've kind of forgotten about Shiro. You know, he just yep. is able to get this opening immediately on towards Maposhka, who will get that extra bit of time with the fact that Collapse drags Shiro away. But at this point, Soulbind out into the two of them. New, he's hitting these hoof stomps every single time. Huge connections, and even the double leg, which of course, connecting on both there with that Soulbind. It's nice. Constant, like two for two trades. The gold continues to just be... Right, they they want to keep it going, LGD. They yep. do not want to allow any time for Yatoro to get his items on this Terra Blade. They know there's downtime. It's for Spirit, they need every single spell. Posture. RP, five seconds. The final posture out on his own. And that's right next to the Roche. This now they can they... likely force it. Yeah, they're they're going to go for this, for sure. Instant Phantasm. Oh, Shiro had just hit 18 off that kill, too, so actually gets the level 3 Phantasm. Sends an illusion to the wave. 
should be able to finish it off this time. There's no yeah. ET to scout. Yeah, they've got great team fight, but yeah, even, even as a support, you know, Miposhki is a crucial part of yes. that. And with him gone, Team Spirit they won't look to contest this Roshan. I mean, Miposhki really is the biggest scout scouting element that they have to be able to find this tinker, find these initiations early on. Luke Thou just collapse, YOLO blinking in. Which Collapse can now do also. He does have the BKB finish, so a little bit more liberty for the Magnus to pick and choose how he goes in. But now, into that Aegis. See how much LGD can get done with this Aegis. Tier 2's on the horizon. How many Philosopher Stones did we get in this game also? Okay, looks like all the supports got Phillies. So we have four Philosopher Stones in. Greed is good. It's all right. He's got his BKB done. So really starting to beef up on the Terra Blade. I mean, they have what? Is that the double? Okay, double BKB. Laurel not quite having his just yet, but definitely going to protect quite a bit versus this control that we've seen from New in particular. Now LGD sort of split themselves back up despite getting this Aegis. I'm just trying to work their way towards their next items. We've got the BKB just a recipe or so away from New. Yep. The Sentinel to have a much easier time just kind of getting in with the Hoose comps and being able to reset and looking to come back into the fight with further jumps. They are grouping up though. Looks like they are potentially going for a smoke out here. And Poshka in a very deep position. I mean, look at this warding expedition from him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Getting away with it. By himself, runs in and gets a pretty beautiful ward down. That's going to scout quite a lot from LGD, and that is not going to be expected at all. So could even catch maybe a smoke that comes out. LGD looking to perhaps get more assertion on the map. They actually buy a gem pretty early. I think this is. I think we've been seeing quite a bit of 20 to 30 minute gems, but wanting to take advantage of this Aegis timing perhaps with this. I think they need to. I mean, just Yatora, he's like really maybe. scaling up to be an absolute beast on the Terra Blade. Top CS right now and, and very much closing in on Tashiro CK's net worth. Who knows what could go down? I mean, there's a Tinker versus the Terra Blade always, so as big as that TP gets, sure. he can fall very, very hard. But, it, you know, not, to say, not necessarily in a point where he's kind of you know, zooming past everyone in the net worth, right? Has been held back, still in sort of that mid area of farm. He's level 20, getting the E on this next, making sure that there's very little chance that Spirit can lock down and kill the Tinker in the team fights by going for that BKB into the E on. Of course, the team fights will be one thing, and the high ground push, that's going to be quite the other. You know, we don't see a lot of Tinker. We have you know, the first Tinker's appearance that we're seeing here at yes. uh, this international. Pushing into this hero, it, it, it's never easy. I mean, pushing into Tinker is never going to be easy. Pushing into Magnus Elder Titan is not going to be easier. So we yeah, both sides. Strap yourselves in. Could be in for a long one. Spirit, they're on the hunt. Poshka, Marlin Collapse. Gonna do a quick sweep of LGD's jungle, see what they can find. Still not quite a BKB finished up on Laro though, so does probably have to be a little bit careful how far forward he puts himself, at least at the start of the fight. Doesn't look like they'll find anyone down here. They pop a scan around the, the creep camps to see if anybody's stepping around this area from LGD, but LGD completely on the other half of the map. A lot of dodging going out here. I mean, Poshka's ward is still alive somehow, even though the gem from the AA was out, he wasn't able to find that one just yet. BKB done for New. We've got the heart. It's completed as well for Shearer. Looking towards the AC next. Oh, I mean, levels across the board still feel... Everything just feels very, very close. It's going to be some crazy team fights that are going to dictate this. It does feel like. Shiro, soon 20. Starting to hit tier 2. Yeah, I have to play that bit more aggressive. Yep. Minute 40 seconds. No signs of a response yet from Spirit. Now look at these. The LGD supports are looking to play so far back in these team fights. Both of them actually finish up a later, later than usual Aether Lens. You see Planet and both Wayu Smile looking for that. He had the Aghanims queued up for quite some time on this, uh, on this Grimstroke, but looks like they want to switch up the way they play their style. Just look to play behind those tanky cores. They're going to go through the Twin Gates, try and get this play where they, they sort of come in from behind. He's potentially pushing out on the bottom. This could catch at least somebody off guard here, but oh my. They can find. They won't this? walk into Mirror quite yet. <laughs> How many times has this happened? I mean, both supports here, by the looks of it, are going to get away from this. But Poshka and Mirror on either side of this move that LGD were trying to come at them with. Ships passing in the night. Silver Edge done for Yatoro. He's in that top spot now in the network. And Unless LGD finds some further fights, Yatoro, he is going to start zooming ahead of everybody, Shiro included. Yeah, their greed is definitely starting to pay off big time here. Yatoro. I 
this is going to be such a crazy, <laughs> crazy collapse of everything together. But that greed, of course, 4K lead. I mean, they didn't okay. find a fight with the Aegis. They're yeah. about to have it expire here from Shiro. The question is if they want to try and find something without that. And they'll finally find that ward that was placed. I mean, that lasted almost four minutes, that ward that the post was able to sneak in there. So they got quite a bit of information, you can say, from it. Where do they go? What's, what's the plan? It's been pretty calm for I me. Mean, how I mean, who, when who is the last time there was a kill? It's who, been, what, like six, six minutes or something. Who is feeling more calm in this sort of situation? Is it Spirit or is it LGD? Or do you think it's pretty equal? I think they're both probably feeling yeah. pretty good, right? I mean, they have an NTS Tinker scaling versus a Terra Blade, but Yatoro's probably telling his team also, guys, I am I am massive. You know, I'm getting away with murder. I'm getting away with so much farm on the map here, but it's really going to be up to how those fights be dictated. Who gets the jump? And even then, even later on, it's, are they going to be able to even break base out of it too? Not easy for either side. Little bits of vision. Team Spirit trying to reclaim those. Both teams close to one another. Toro leading the charge. Trying to get some vision himself here off the back of the Silver Edge, leading forward. And once again, LGD up to the Twin Gate. Or at least ready to hold around this area. Gem. Purchase now here from the Poshka. All of it, it really does feel like it's just going to be a down to that one big jump. Whoever gets the vision, whoever gets that control, whoever finds one of these squishier heroes, is nothing to say going to be able to use a rally of team fight, like rally of spells in a long duration team fight, or is he just going to die right at the start of it? These moments, you know, Yatoro just item after item, getting very close to being able to get the nullifier. Now, pretty much is his sixth item. Already here, 34 minutes on the Terra Blade. That sort of landing stage, nothing more than distant, distant memory here. As the, the full recovery has been made by Yatora. I'm just running as a unit. Look at the, how they're just running together across the map. All five heroes of spirit. Wherever Yatoro goes, they go. Here comes LGD. Shiro. We'll see what sort of catch he can get. I mean, Mira is pretty far up right now. Ghana's here. Can't get, it's on an illusion. Indeed, onto an illusion. They're going to be aware of that by looks because They won't try chasing with Yatoro. He's just going to walk into the midst of them. Actually, Mira. Him. He's still ready. The support to be caught is just Mira for now. Yatoro's going to try and fight. He's trying to lead in onto a support himself. They'll turn to get the blast. He's the isolated. Plus the BKB with the physical Yatoro. Oh, and he's able to turn against the Sunder off. As you'll be able to help bring down one more. He's still being completely focused though by Shiro. The stun comes in. Yatoro is ready to shut back away as he gets out with the infant. Shiro controlled by the top. He's going down. Shiro is there for Galat. They take down Shiro and Yatoro survives. Oh my. Was that like, a, what actually did so much damage? I guess it was the ET and everything in combination, but it feels like the ET actually did so much for his I mean, it sort of seemed that there was a point towards the end of that that the rest of LGD, they sort they of bailed out on that. They knew that there was no saving Shira. I think after that initial attempt where they weren't able to 100 to 0 Yatoro, they're sure they hit him with the blast, but of course that Sunder, it's still going to be it. there. Gets himself back up to full HP, and at that point, the whole move, it starts to get a bit tricky for LGD, and they end up losing their carry. So far, I mean, NTS, he can't actually do, I feel like, what he wanted to in that last fight. He got completely ignored, just actually unable to blow up any of the targets. Who was actually holding the gem there? I think, okay, Neo actually kept it, so LGD did not lose their gem there, but pretty decisive fight there from Spirit this time around. Yeah, big stuff uh, for you, Toro. Getting in and getting out of that one. The team bailing him out with the multiple Glimmer Caves, I believe, as well, allowing him to just weave in and out. And that was what I think is... Yeah, the first BKB revealed too, right? So that long duration one where they can't actually break through him. Ah, that was the money for the Vanilla Fire, and now we're well on the way to well being able to pick up that Blink Dagger. They're playing it cool and calm on Spirit, waiting for the action to come to them. They have such a good lineup to be able to go for those counter initiation plays. I mean, they're ready. They're ready again. 30 seconds till that RP is going to be coming back up. But still positioned around your Toro. They might still be able to, to, to burst this Terra Blade, but they have to stop him from getting the Sunder off. They Every time that Sunder's there, they're getting him from 100 to 0 twice, it's probably not going to happen right I now. I think we're going to... Okay, yeah, but I was just thinking. They had the E-Blade queued up on the Tinker for a long time. I think the Hex is necessary. I think they have, to, to, have it. Damn, they have to have that 100 yep. to 0 control to be able to bring down this TB before he's able to oh. get Sunder. Last coming in towards the pit. Spirit Hips holding this area. LGD, they are approaching. LGD still does have vision on that right side, too. Very close to Shira having the AC done. Okay. Plunger Golden will have it. Doesn't mean he spent all out. 
Well, that's he does, he that. commits it. That's definitely a bit of a risk. We know how quickly this Terra Blade's going to be able to push down towers if the fight goes well for Spirit. And he also has no boots now. So could be a position where he just gets kited a lot in these next fights if he doesn't isn't able to stick on these targets. They're going to get the Roshan here, Spirit. As LGD not able to interrupt this, Aegis now in Yatora. So even if they are able to burst him, he's going to be back with a second life in this team fight. That is a huge deal. That Collapse now also is going to have Lincoln, so he's going to have the freedom to always be able to get those initiations now too. Spirit, the patience, it's working out for them so far. LGD is still not afraid to step out of their half of the map, though. Crossing the river. How close to the Hex, nothing to say, is getting very, very close to it. Definitely going to be eyes on him. Now 2-1-4. and four. Had to sort of take do? a lot of time to, to catch up on the farm, but very much in a point now where he's... It, it's getting to that stage where a, a nice bit of tinker play can take over the team fights. He does have to watch out, though, as you mentioned, the various saves that there is. And the top of the rum that's always going to be coming out from Laurel, which he's probably going to get off in every single one of these fights, has to watch out for these glimmers and resets as we saw in that last fight. And he's... Okay, never mind. He goes straight for the E-Blade at 7. Okay, anyway, so just wants to get the which is it up. real burst damage. Okay. I mean, maybe feeling, as you say, even if he's able to have the lockdown at the Hex because of the fact that the saves are there, you know, having that control, that's not necessarily going to get the job yeah. done. Maybe better to just focus on bursting the rest of the lineup so that they aren't alive to save and back up the Terra Blade. Hey, the, the push is going to start commencing, though. And right. they have a lot of ways to poke. And yes, he gets no, caught. Run, is there, right? is the the tree, the drag, man, straight he in just RP'd. He just RP'd. He can't be up with the RP's there. The Delete. damage is out for Yatoro. Nothing to say is caught. Oh, it takes. 90. One little catch, collapse, no hesitation. I think he wanted Torrent to scout the tree line. I think it was. Low. Setting things up, and now the push, it's going to be coming in. And it's going fast, these towers. I mean, With no Tinker, there's no way to slow I'm down. At least there's tier two still up in the other two lanes, so they may just let this Rax go. I mean, it's, too, it's so risky. If they buy back and he dies, that could just decide the game. So no. they're just going to sack the Rax. But Spirit, they're lingering around. They want to go for another catch here. Collapse, he's eyeing his opportunity. Oh, he is. You've got to be careful if you get close to the walls of your base here. Collapse will be ready to tear you out of it. So many different ways for them to reposition on top of that tidal wave too. LGD. It's definitely starting to look like that maybe LGD just weren't able to get enough done in the mid game. Spirit taking over and they get any sort of catch like this, especially if it's nothing to say, they're going to be on the verge of taking another set of racks. He needs to be way more careful with his positioning here. But just not easy. A lot of pre-positioning as we see. Yatoro blinks in. Meta is wearing off, but they'll get the tier two and they'll be able to back off. Pretty damn good usage of that Aegis. It really is. 9k lead now for Spirit. They've broken one of the hardest things you can do in this patch, of course, breaking that high ground. First step. I respect the fact that nothing to say is responding in a few seconds. Spirit heading back to the, their half of the map. LGD, they're trying to chase. The cooldowns are all coming back up, though. Meta is still on cooldown for about 30 seconds. Oh, RP's at the ready. Shiro, he's looking. He's going to get the pullback into the stun. We'll see a lot of throw down the both the defensive disruptions there to try and help Yatoro out of the combo. So the Fallen Stone comes in. Jump on. The Toro Stone. He gets the thunder. He's able to get back on the full HP. Shiro trying to keep it out of the BKB. RP. He's caught by the RP for Kalan. Shiro's going to be going down. They've lost the CK for 85 seconds. News surrounded here by Lala and Kalan. The title went pulling it back over towards Kalan. In the river, nothing to say, manages to finish off Mira. They're, but they're losing two of their cores. Shiro and you taken down. They keep your Toro up. He gets Whoa. the thunder. Nothing to say, we'll manage to get out of that one. But why? Looks like he won't. I mean, they were so close to potentially being able to burst your Toro at the beginning of that fight, but I think sort of the straight time for the Toro still, it caught the Tinker at the start of it. Nothing to say, tried to get in position, but as soon as he was there, he's up in the air. They get another kill on Hawaii Smile. It's three dead on LGD Spirit. They can look to push again. I mean, so clutch by Mira. That disruption there, it makes him actually lose. He dodges his own teammate's rum buff, but it gets oh, the same potential. It. It's well worth it so he can get that Sunder. Just beelines it to Shiro and gets it off. I'm very close towards the end of that. that maybe nothing to say. He, he, he nearly didn't get out he himself. Did not. And now Meta's back up. That was without Meta this yep. fight. Yotaro didn't even need it. Now onto high ground. Collapsed 40 seconds till he's got RP, but they're still fishing. That's all sort of damage they can do at Spirit. LGD 20 seconds until they've got the full squad back up. I mean, just nothing to say. Has to be so careful. Literally one one stray spell catches him. He's very likely dead at this point. Another Rax to fall. Completely taken down his spirit. Wow. And a very comfortable hold on the game right now. 
Still yet to sort of find that fight where LGD are able to set up and allow to, you know, to allow this Tinker to just run rampant. It just hasn't happened. They just don't have what feels like enough control and enough burst. They have the one stun that comes in from the Centaur, and then there's a little save that comes out from Team Spirit. Then boom, there goes your Tor, and the rest of the spells just come in. Beautiful execution so far from these these two supports on Spirit, honestly. Just these little little saves and resets they've been able to do with their their glimmer capes and even disruptions. As we're seeing, Sean you know, sure knew, you know, he's, he's incredibly still tanky, big, the same to be said for Shiro, but at this point, Spirit, they absolutely have the damage to still take these beefy boys down. They're always going to have the percentage damage that comes from the ET and just the overwhelming damage that, of course, kicks off from this terrible, uh, from this terrible, yeah. Let's see where they can go. Oh, nice, Sam. and Collapse actually goes for even more, uh, uh, even further. Yep, the Arcane Blink. That ex extra little bit of a range as well can really catch you by surprise. I look at the cooldowns as well, too. 6.2 second cooldown, Blink 7.9 second yeah, cooldown. Yeah, he's going to be jumping in, skewering you out, and then he's going to be pretty much as soon as pretty he's done, again, ready again. to jump back in and again and skewer someone else. Yep, fight's getting harder and harder, LGD. Who do they focus fire is the question. They have to, I mean, it feels like they have to focus fire the supports, but they have to deal with these, these, these cores as well. I mean, I don't know, they just don't sort of have the same Impact is starting to fight. It's the same strength that Spirit has. Now, at the end of the day, this Collapse RP, it's going to reign supreme if he hits it. I mean, the big team fight, in particular from Spirit, it's been reigning supreme. Uh, and they're the going to be able to get the opening here. They might just have to let Planet go here, LGD, as they'll start backing away. They'll let Planet go. Uh, collapse. And another catch. He's going to get a grab steal with the RP. Straight back into the RP. Look at this They've damage. They've the sense on you dead in an instant. Can't even get out of the stun. They can't fight them here, LGD. Spirit. Too strong, ready to push the waves in. Look at Shiro, he's looking to try to do I mean, something this is crazy. So risky. He's gonna try, he's gonna open up on a mirror, but the EO disc is able, he's able to assemble it just in time. Mirror's able to bleak out as well. He gets he's it. alive. The buyback will come in from you, but Mirror, he walks out of it for barely a scratch. The TP's out there from Lyle. Mirror also able to TP away. Nothing to say, he'll find Maposhka. But they get the, the majority of them out. They only lose the one of them. They force out a buyback from you. Things continuing to go in Spirit's favor massively. It's, yeah, domination. They even cut the creep wave. The Toro just sends an illusion even after all that too and kills every single creep in mid. All they find is the five position ET. Beautiful identification from Spirit. Oh, what do LGD do? Are you setting up for the high ground? Are you continuing to just try and take your chances outside of the base? You buy the Hex on the Tinker and yep. you hope with this level 25 that you're going to just be able to get some consecutive back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back kills, but it's just not easy at this point. 30 seconds until Roche. Will NTS be able to make that happen? magic happen with a Hex and a 25? They also do have the Agonims on the Grimstroke, so that's, I guess, the other thing that we can look at. Will there be an enormous dark portrait of that Terrible that maybe can also reign supreme? Not an easy fight. Yatora. He's Ooh. hovering around here. Him. Oh, he is. I mean, if he, if he catches nothing to say, he'd be ready to jump in and, and try, and, try and get aggressive upon him. He's seeing if they can get the catch on towards the Kunkka, but no, not getting tripped up. I won't catch him for now. Spirit's just been dodging. I feel like all the, pretty much every single movement from LGD, all the moves that they tried to make in that mid game to be able to slow down this farming draft from Spirit, just they, they were not able to connect. Uh, it looks like they have complete control on oh, the, yeah. the sort of the, the second half of this game. Team Spirit, LGD. Look at collapse. He's been ready. Pulled all over the place. Blink in two seconds. They'll back it up, but perhaps maybe setting up for top. I mean, look at your Toro, look at your Toro and Laurel. Trying to catch this Tinker when he's doing the split push. Yeah, they, they want to make sure that when they go high ground, once again, they've got all waves in good position. They don't want to allow for the split push to happen from LGD. Roche is also up, so they, they have to go scout that one out. And it looks like they should be able to claim this one, but this is maybe LGD's chance to go for the fight here. I mean, they have to try something. Are they aware that it's up, though? They do have a scan. There it is. So they will know which angle of approach do they want to take. They have a ward on the far right side. Do they want to take their chances here? They, the, the next fight, wherever they choose to take it, it may just be their last one. I mean, do you want to give a full Aegis cheese and a refresher yeah. to a team with this Magnus, though, right? It's like you, it almost feels like you have to. The Hex gets purchased. It's so hard to fight into. Eyes on nothing to say. Can he make magic happen? Spirit in a much more favorable spot here. 
I think they, do they see him? Right? Oh, he's right in the fog. Okay, pops up for a quick second. So they do see collapse now and then inside that tree line. Tough target to go for him. There's double saves behind him. But they might just have to go for the risk. Jira. He heads in. We'll be going in underneath that sentry and observe a combo. The lanes are starting to be a problem. Yotaro sending illusions. They have nothing to say to clear them out for a second right now, but they have to be careful with their positioning every time the Tinker goes back. I just don't know if they can do it out here. And look, every time Tinker resets, you see Spirit feels a little more bold to step up. Hey, the collapse. He's going to be able to try and get the jump. Has to put the BKB there. Two of them will get caught by the soul bind. They've got the dark portrait at both. The dark portrait being collapsed at incredibly low. The hexed in there. The Tinker collapse out. Shiro moves forward. Looks towards Lava Lava. Puts the BKB in the blade. But the Torrent storms out. Nothing to say. Focus the Terror through the Tinker here. But the BKB is there. Nothing to say. Johnny Dino. RP at two. RP catches Shiro. Catches nothing to say. Use him with a hoost up. Double A. But it's immediate buyback from collapse. He wants to keep this fight going. Screw over the walls. New. He's pushing back the sensor. The further buybacks coming in the TP as well. Over towards New. The backup will be there. The hex from T nothing to take comes into play. They jump forward. They take the it the second time. That's two. Die back on collapse. Yatoro, do they have detection? They will find it. They got the poison. But Shiro buys back. I mean, this, five versus this is, four. This is the window that they have to abuse. Two minutes without the Magnus in the game. LG, they have to go for everything. He's just in. He's in. Who's up straight away on him? Poshka, he catches him on this attempted escape with the TP. But Poshka oh also the fight. Goodness. I mean, what a way to start a fight. The double dark portrait really coming into play, taking out the mag the first time. A lot oh. of buybacks, though. This LGD, push. they can absolutely breathe sort of a sigh of relief here in a game where they were getting nothing. They found something. They found something. It, it collapsed out of the game for as long as he is. This gives LGD the room to get into the Roshan, take this Rosh for themselves. What a beautiful initiative. I mean, the way they started this ward, honestly, vision is something we always tend to talk about. That ward on the side there, as soon as they see a moment to sneak in and get that dark portrait, they do get a beautiful connection on two. Not an easy move to make at all. So we'll, we'll see again how they were able to pull this one off. It all started with the attempt from collapse, but as you say, the Soulbind into the dark portraits onto the two of them. It's just so much damage coming out to collapse, immediately going down at the beginning of the fight. And from this point onwards, things started to get tricky here for Spirit. I mean, look at the micro also. From, I didn't even notice on the left side there, but the dark portraits with the stampede just starts chasing the supports out as well, too. It's it's chaos from them. Uh, chaos yeah. inside this moment, too. And you hitting some fantastic hoof stomps towards the end of it all. And even at this point, you know, maybe Collapse felt that he was going to be able to walk away from it, but the buyback for nothing to say coming in, TPing over towards you meant that there was no escape. And they find that huge kill, taking Collapse down twice. Holy moly. And now with comfort of an Aegis, too, I nothing to say. Feeling a bit better for him. A Hex now also for Planet. Fin fully finished up on this Grimstroke, so more levels of control that they've actually started to now pick up that they were kind of yeah, lacking point for the as time. well, you know, the fact that there were so many of them there. Honestly, it was lucky that they did only lose yep. from Poshka at that one. Yeah, if they didn't make the call to just go through the Twin Gate, he could just catch like a double sun and even kill out the Terrible, and we could just... Could just be seeing a different high ground push. Uh, either way, this game in a much better spot now for LGD than it was a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, Aegis, a cheese. They also have the refresher start for new. Could be pretty massive. Of course, plenty of buybacks were expended in that last fight. Just the two supports on the side of Spirit have it left. I mean, Gr the Grimstroke does too, but he spent his gold. Planet did commit for the full hex. Vision, I mean, initiation is still going to be a big thing we have to watch for. If they're able to get that kind of jump, if they see Collapse on the initiate and go, looks like that could be the answer for LGD. And I have this Aegis, but with the state of the game, Ooh. likely that LGD do hold things off until they get their next round of items complete. They can't get a, too ahead of themselves. A, a bad fight could cost them the game. It's getting to that point here, 51 minutes in. Definitely like that for a bit on both. I mean, Yotaro with no buyback, too, has to be so careful with his positioning. LGD all grouped together. Probably going to be a scary for four minutes for both sides. Who's going to be the one to take the bigger risk? Who's going to go for the big play? High risk, high reward at this point. Playing the win, as we call it. Level 25 starting to be hit. CK also now has gotten his hero. Quite a bit more damage. Spirit just staying completely away from this. Right up in their base right now. Only Maposka that's sort of stepping out here and there, trying to get some vision out for the team. Wow. That the rest great. of the squad making Good sure that job. they do not leave their high ground.
Poor baby. They know how many ways that LGD have to set up with these two. So the invis with the jumps. Setting up all over the place too, just with the tinker. They can just, yeah, they have to stick as a unit on the side of T-Spit or they will get outnumbered and caught outside the base. Two minutes left on this Aegis. Shira just consistently on the hunt. You know, this is why Spirit is staying as far back as they are. Especially with the DD on this CK. Shira, if he finds someone, they're going to be caught in a pretty bad spot. Yeah, these hexes. The hexes, the dark portraits, their own allies turning against each other. Definitely something to always look at here. How is the itemization looking for Spear? I mean, Miposhka's considering he almost has his Hex, too. Holding on to the buyback, of course, first. Spirit. Closing in on the Aghanims on Yotora. With the buyback on cooldown, he wants to spend up as much as he can. He already has the Moon Shard finished up. He's pretty much gonna be hitting that critical mass when he does have it finished up. Seven minutes until those glorious neutral items as well, too. We said a very likely game that would go to distance. So far it is. Definitely going to be watching out well for sort of the, the, the mirror shield, the axe machinas, the, even maybe the seer stone for some of these heroes. Lincoln's now for nothing to say, an extra bit of protection for him. Centaur buyback available. Same thing for the Grimstroke so, soon, too, on the side of LGD. Difficult for them to force anything, though. Still playing into this Magnus, playing into this high ground defense that Spirit has. Just looking to control the map, sweeping across side to side. Uh, two and a half minutes, really, until we see the, the majority of these yep. buybacks come back up. Spirit, they're looking to time the hit with the Aegis, though. Going down 20 seconds, nothing to say. They're ready to take this risk. I mean, if they find the Tinker... I think LGD, they're going to be aware that this sort of move's coming in. Oh, yeah. I don't know that Spirit will want to try and abuse that Aegis timing. Look at the Illusion battle in the mid lane. The CK Phantasm versus the TB Illusion. Very exciting. Not to find anything here, Spirit. How are the smokes? Just checking to see who has more at the moment. I'm not seeing any on the side of LGD at the moment. I didn't see if any couriers have one. Okay, one on they have one, one on the courier. Okay, one on the one. also. E so. Each of the supports have got one to pop in while you're smiling, planet. So two smokes on the side of LGD and... I don't see one on the side of Spirit, though, so for the next upcoming engagement, it would be difficult for them to get that angle if they don't have the initiate, initial vision to be able to get the jump. Well, the Aghanim Shard now from the, the Tormentor out onto Nothing to Say, which could be quite something still against uh, Yatora right when he's uh, kind of used the BKB and said, that reduced attack range. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's something. I don't think I've ever seen more player use Mira. Uh, it's jump He's got the Eon, just got the ready. They can continue to follow this up on the side. Maposhka does it down a jump. Maybe they can find more here as Mira also take a heavy damage from the illusion. And what an angle. Was low, low, low. Get the torrent storm and the BKP off. Tries to step back. The Get torrent storm. He's in the midst of the fight. The torrent storm continues to throw him up. Big RP. Yeah, he looks down to the Zeta. Take it. Nothing to say down. They take it at you. No buyback available for nothing to say. As he's out for two minutes. And the Toro also able to find They get Shira as well. Uh, they don't have buybacks. They don't have buybacks. 50 seconds until Shira is back up. And, and nothing to say, he's not even got the money, even if it was back then. You try to hold them out. He's in with the... Uh, he's doing a pretty good he's job. There from Nero, buys a charge for your dog. He's just there. He's just there. What my goodness. He's keeping this game alive here for the score collapse. He's trying to find Planet for the big count. The Dark Portrait. The Dark Portrait's done the damage. Planet takes down collapse. Holy crap. <laughs> I can't believe they held on. <laughs> I mean, you and Planet. They lost their carry. They lost their mid, both without buybacks. But it doesn't matter. The rest of LGD pulled through and keep this game alive. I knew and Planet have been doing it for a lot of this game, but holy crap, they just actually killed Yotoro. That was a wild fight. I mean, we'd have to see it again, but this was pretty much Yotoro and Collapse versus the world, killing three heroes, and then they just get turned on by the Centaur Grim. Oh, man. I mean, Planet having a hell of a tournament. Let's see this one again. The angle of approach there from LGD at the start, too, looked beautiful. It looked pretty good. The jump in from Yotoro, I mean... <laughs> now they weren't afraid of anything here, Spirit, at the start of this fight. They knew how strong they were, if they could get this Terra Blade into prime position. And for pretty much the 80% the, the of this fight, it looked fantastic, right? Yatoro's here, Collapse has got the hold and control. They take out these two huge cores, 
You know, new and nothing to say to start things off. Of course, new's got the buyback, but as I say, Shiro and nothing to say. They did not have the buybacks nope. ready. So at this point, Spirit, they've got to be feeling fantastic. They know that these buybacks are still on cooldown. So yep. Yatoro, of course, he's going to push onwards. But new and Planet turn it around, and Yatoro caught absolutely by surprise by the potential for LGD to do so. It's these split second things, too. If you saw that, we hovered over Planet for a quick second. It was like one second until that dark portion ah, comes back up. So every little thing matters at these points in the game. I think, yeah, Team Spirit, they could taste the victory there, but it's very, very swiftly knocked away from them once more. LGD keeping this game going. Oh, man, we're getting blessed. In two and a half more minutes until those neutral items come out. Everyone's buybacks soon coming back up. Gold, of course, still needs to be acquired for some. Refresh, Refresh on collapse now. now. Okay. Second salvo of that ult. They're going all out. It's still a... A little short on the buyback off that perch. It's only a thousand gold. I mean, that's the thing, of course. Same thing for nothing to say. I mean, they're both. He, he'll have it shortly as well. Yep. But in, in, teams, in terms of overall buyback situation, definitely in a better spot for Spirit. Did cost the buyback from you and Planet to pull off those moves in that last defense. What run do we get? Shield run bottom. No DD this time around. Such tense moments for both sides. Vision, jumps, everything. All important. Trying to kill off these supports seeming to be a very big answer as well, too. They're very difficult to bring down with all these Aeon Discs and protections. Planet, even now having a Shadow Blade of his own to try to hide himself into the back lines. I mean, he could be one of the most important heroes oh, he in this could. game at the moment. This Dark Portrait, yep. it's a big difference maker. Double X, double yep. Dark Portrait. It really could set any of these fights in LGD's favor, especially if he's getting it on the big causes. If he's getting it on your Tora. Poshka still hanging on to his gold. Just seen him. He has the gold for the hex, but he's just been sitting on it, waiting for those buyback plays. And hitting that timing where it might not be too tempting to take risks with the, the new tier of neutral items. Just one minute oh. around the corner. And he minus his queued up. Not quite yet, but perhaps we'll see one. Roche, it's back. Who wants to step into the pit, though? Both teams. Having a formidable team fight. Yeah, there's just there's very limited vision from both sides at the moment. That one ward placed up top at the moment from the side of Spirit. Shiro. Look, continue to keep these waves shoved in. Collapse. Maybe looking for some type of fishing play here with the X marks. Pretty good ward from Spirit right now. That has not been taken out from LGD. They're gonna this try and giving the a, move. This is giving a ton of information. Planet, Planet. He's gonna get he's gonna show himself. Collapse, catches him immediately to get the jump. Onto one side, RP, but they're really gonna No buyback. Oh, oh man. The RP collapse, he's still got it good to go. Sure with the Phantasm. And the BKB will make sure the collapse isn't able to pull him back. Hey, he went, he got aggressive. He tried, I mean, he got the dark portrait of the Terror Blade, but nice. put himself in an incredibly dangerous position. Yeah, bit Two of a, minutes, no grim. Bit of a bait there, really, from Spirit. Oh, Collapse immediately in with that jump. Instantly pops the refresher as well, so has the second RP ready. Absolutely. If the rest of LGD try for anything, they'll look to swing attention over to the other side of the map with the Twin Gates, get down there. Be able Let's to get go this straight rush. into the pit. And the rest of this metamorphosis should be able to take this down without any questions coming out from LGD. I like how there's just no hesitation, though. They, they you know, these, these players, they have all the timings and everything they have. They know this Grimshaw did not have to buy, so no hesitation to get that RP out from Grimshaw. I mean, honestly, yeah, and as we said, at this point, it's it's pretty much it's the biggest catch the they can one. get. Yeah. They can get Planet before he can get any of his spells or items off. The team fight's going to look to be in a pretty solid spot for Spirit. All right. Rocha, Aegis on Yatora. Here come the tier fives. What do we get? Tier a pretty, but nothing to pretty say. busted one on I the tinker. I think that's the one he was open for. <laughs> Does he have a telescope on his team too? I know he was carrying the telescope for quite some time, so he won't have both. He won't have a telescope plus a seer stone. Yeah. And Collapse, he's ready to go with a bit of an ode to his previous TI performances. The Horn Toss now online. <laughs> More than ready to start pulling heroes out of LGD's base. The high ground defense is not going to be easy. No. Ex Machina now also for Yotoro, the constant refresher on refresher. He actually sells his refresher himself because he has an Ex Machina. He'll buy it out, buy out a full eye of Scotty now for this Terror Blade. Giant Shrink for new. Potential 10,000 HP Centaur definitely coming into play as well, too. I see what's going to be stronger. The, the, the ability from Team Spirit to jump in with Collapse and rip heroes out of the base, or the potential of nothing to say's Tinker just to, to, com to completely infinitely hold the high ground with this insane amount of spam. Oh. He's got a Seer Stone as well. I love it. He is going to be jumping in from a mile off, and there we go. Look are. at this. 
Gets the grab on Hawaii smile. This poor old ancient apparition out of the game. Oh my God. Hey, oh this my is God. This so is, insane. This, this is this isn't even fair. I mean, you give look the at the blink bridge. He's, tools. He's gonna be catching everybody and anyone. You tourists push it in. They get the jump on his shield. Try and skew him out the base. Look at him down here with the low ground. His new jump sword. I don't know what you're talking about. Who's done that? I've got fighting. You is killing your Toro. You're talking about Leonard taking him down the one. Collapse. Also to fall. He's done to the same. Finish him off with the laser. They're ready to set up for round two. Toro put the BKB. He's looking for the TP out. With the BKB TP, he makes it away. But Maposka will not be. They got Mira. New and nothing to say. They chase out the two support. No get Mira as well. Holy moly. Nothing to say. It's LGD hold. Oh my. I was new just. I, Killed everybody. 12,000 damage oh. from a set top. Okay, you're toy, but okay. he wants to try and get these mega creeps. That was cute. All right. Little uh, X mark play. An X mark play. I mean, <laughs> they, they are that close to getting the megas. That right. does force out the fortification. This is the highest tier of Dota that you can possibly imagine. These players, this is absolutely insane. I mean, I mean, New, New like, killed Yatoro by himself, it felt like. I mean, the Centaur, what an absolute monster. And they started the fight as well, but they sort of nearly got that clean start with the skewer out, but I think what was the soul bind right from Planet It caught it stuck, it, right? It, it stuck in mid skewer. Yeah. It looked a little weird there. I was like, wait, what is this interaction? I thought okay, he was stuck gonna, on the lamp or something. You know, was but... it gonna end up outside of the base or in the base? Yep. Oh, he's going for the Megas and he's got them. <laughs> he's got them, an easy X mark player from Yatoro and Lal. And honestly, that, that's something to be concerned about for LGD because that, that sort of move, it could absolutely come in again, going for the tier fours, going for the ancient LGD. They've got to get all these pushed out of the base and get that backdoor protection back in play. Yeah, we see it again. Yeah, here. good. I, I mean, I could barely see it. looks kind of weird, right? Because it pulled one, but the secondary one didn't break. All mean, right, cool. As you say, you just getting it on your He was on your I mean, sort of him against the four here as a spirit. Yep. They could not hold back this giant three centaur from just slamming down the terror blade. And look at his target prioritization. He sees the TP coming out. They stop ET, and then they he go immediately goes for Mira, too. The quick moves. All right, this is some incredible spell casting. Quite the push now. They're able to get this push going down the mid lane. They've taken the tier three themselves here, LGD. Probably not going to be able to get anything more out of this one. It's Spirit, they're pretty much all back up. I mean, I love that you're seeing the smiles. It's such a stressful situation, but I'm sure both teams are having a hell of a time in that booth. Still anybody's game, but there is mega advantage at the moment for Spirit. A yeah. big advantage on those objectives, and they're starting to get the Book of the Dead as well, too. ET has that one picked up. Also has changed his build up a little okay. bit too. He had the hex yep. all kind of done, switches it up for a BKB. He wants to be able to stand inside the midst of the fight. Absolutely, he wants to survive and make sure that this aura is being pumped yeah. out the entire time. Everything everything matters. Every little thing, as we like to say. Why are you smile, right? Still holding on to, to what he's gonna decide to go with with his tier five. I'll get the Book of the Dead. Okay. Make sure they've got that extra way to keep these waves pushed out. And incredibly important to do so, as I say. You know, they have to be prepared for the fact that Spirit, they can absolutely look for, for these X mark rat plays with the Terror Blade to try and close this game up. Oh, nice. And they get a Book of Shadows. I, I think maybe, I, I'm always wondering, like, what, you know, maybe why you smile had the Book of Shadows or something as well, too, on the Book of the Dead. Maybe contemplating they're deciding which one he wants. But another form of saves, Mira has two charges of disruption and he has a book of shadow so crazy amounts of different plays he can do to protect his allies still as we saw before no collapse he cannot be underestimated no. from how much of a distance he can jump in and grab someone lgd they're stepping out of the base here Bro. they got a vision uh, collapse uh, he's having to jump get the hold on straight back straight away into the fair put back for your joy the boys can fly again put the metal off and then take it down shiro's still alive put the metal off and the big enemy goes for a second round of shiro he's trying to escape him with the invisitory jumps forward He's going to drive out with the x mark Shiro is out of the game as well. Huge catch. Collapse. You've got to be ready for this, Magnus. And he's got another one. He's at the ready. Perfect layering of skills, too. Gets the tower wave while they're skewered, so they can't pop anything. Immediately get control. The full hex now for the Kunkka coming out. They're ready. Well, they've got to stay right by their fountain. Honestly, if you, if you step anywhere further from the Ancient towards the edge of this base, Collapse will find you. Uh, yeah, the Blink Rage is absolutely ridiculous. He can almost hit the Tier 4 from where uh, he, he is can. right now. With a little Harpoon play as well, too. It's all right. X plays. Proceeding onto the Tier 4s. You're trying with the jump in, but the X mark drag back's there. Uh, poking and prodding. The towers are dropping. And they can just keep doing this with the X. And, and with that X Machina constantly as well. They're trying to hold on on the Spyback. So they can get away with that one, but the tier four's gone. The ancient now exposed. Oh boy. The Toro. Hex. Again, they catch him with the hex, but the X marks there. 
Four from you. So with the hoops coming up and plus with the defensive disruption comes into play. Torrent up on the wall. Hex on collapse. Look at that for Think of the edge of the glass. The soul by four. He's true. He's got it. We'll get the sleep stop off towards you. Newell's up here as LGD is ready with a set of try from Poch for a second time round. But out with the glimmer, it doesn't matter. New still finds him, jumps in with the hoose stop. This shadow, the book of shadows there from Mira, trying to buy some extra safety here from Poch. Gonna get away, but New and Shira stay upon him. They bring down a second New with a double kill. They push back to the tide of Team Spirit. Damage still being done here by the Book of the Dead. Oh, this could, I mean, this game could end in a pretty kind of cloudy way where they just say Book of the Dead and the X Mark, you know, and everything. There's, it's just so much rap potential at yep. the 67 minute mark. And there's no glyph for how long? It, okay, it's 15 seconds. They're gonna have it back up soon. I mean, can True I, uh, defense of the can LGD push out quick enough? I mean, it, it is a minute where there's no Maposhka, no collapse, but it, it just doesn't feel like enough for LGD. I think they're still going to just con get consistently held in their base. You He's, total He's, He's got the X it's upon the X. him. They can take him out every single time. They're hunting behind, though. Mira? Ooh. Get away. You find him there, but Mira indeed will manage to escape. Spirit. They just got to keep their composure, and they should have a solid chance of closing this one up. Oh, and they know actually, they know that Yotaro went all the way back to base. The Phantom actually chased him all the way across there with the X, so they know that Yotaro is back over here. LGD. Getting the lanes pushed out a little bit here. Book the Dead shoving out bottom. Top, they have Tinker pushing, and they have all three heroes in the mid lane. It's still a little bit of a window where maybe they can try for something while Spirit oh, catches the three of them up. They catch Laurel. They outside of the base. They get it with the opening stun. The second round is spelled in front. Nothing to say, ready to burst it low. Mira comes into off round with the to try to keep him safe. But Lars still goes down. And now Mira. Still up into the high ground, trying to chase him out. Gets pushed back by the tear away from Yutoro. See if they can force any of these buybacks, Lars, out for two minutes. Oh, he's blasted the scout. Can they connect, connect up collapse? It's not like they'll capitalize on to this one's LGD. They don't want to jump the tier fours for now. But 100 seconds, no conquer. And they're getting their lanes dealt with. Why you smile just continues to shove out bottom. Laurel getting greedy, getting outside there for just what a medium camp gets punished for it. Quick little scout there from LGD. Such tense moments. Shiva's guard done now for nothing to say. No. LGD, they're absolutely in position to try and jump again here aggressively into the base of Team Spirit. Has he used the warp flare, by the way? I don't think so, right? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anyone use the warp flare. Uh, Why? Too, yeah, too many buttons. Even too many buttons. Too many. Why? Hits 25, another pretty impactful one. He's going to help clear out waves and in these team fights, more chaos. Got their lanes in a good position for the fight. 60 seconds, still no Kunkka. Spirit. Yatoro teasing with the idea of heading out into the triangle. It's a risky play. Oh, it is, but collapse if we can find a grab. Trying to get the ward down. That seems a little bit low there on the this so it doesn't actually get up into the high ground. So I won't really give them any information with that regard. They'll back off to the high ground of their own base. I mean they're considering it, but then they're probably like, yeah. they're called Kunk is coming back in 30 seconds, you know, our lanes. They're still pretty okay. Yeah, they're, they're sort of happy to sit back and just hope that LGD don't push in within these next 30 seconds. Wait for the full five man to be back up on Spirit. Yeah, Seer Stone constantly being used to get vision around those high grounds. 70 minutes. Have been hit. Another Wisdom Rune. Anyone not 25 yet? Everyone's kind of hit it now already, right? Yep. Across the board. Yep. Everybody. Soon 30, I guess, for, for Collapse, but not the biggest difference maker. What's the timing on this race? Just a minute. One more minute. minute. There's the Roshan coming out. Spirit. They, they got a smoke. Yep, they know. That Rosh could be getting up pretty soon. Seven get turns, positioning. Initiation is, is collapsed. That sort of is, is the king right now. This Magnus. They've got more buybacks right now. They have a lot more bodies they can throw on the side of Team Spirit. Two buybacks not at the ready on the side of LGD. They have got the Axe done on Shiro. They do. So an extra way to sort of disrupt the initiation from Spirit. If I mean, new is, illusions pumped out. New is in already. He's wrapping right around the back. Pumps the Shiva's guard. Yatoro. On this. They're on they planet. They found the Grimstroke. Planet's out of the fight. He's Buys planet. back straight away. And you see here, New and Shira still trying to see if they can wrap around from the side. But the Book of the Dead, it's out upon them. Kind of stopping them from being able to lead them in the way that they want it. Shira, they found him. Shira gets the grab back. Straight away into the RP. Full focus over once again. Down and taking Shira down. Shira out for two minutes. Buyback on cooldown. The chaos. They found him. buyback from the Tinker, but Spirit now five versus four for the next 100 seconds. All right, collapses, pulling out his magic, catching the perfect heroes back to back, drags them all the way across the fight with that skewer. Roshan's up, Spirit 
They can look to take this. I mean, oh, actually, but... Actually, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Do it, Lowe it, plan it. Forward. Lowe, he was not expecting to see LGD still out at this point in the map. Lowe gets caught. Uh, you cannot forget about these two. They've been menaces all game. Again, finding Lara collapse. Won't find the catch. Makes things a bit more complicated now for Spirit. It was a buyback. Like that. It was a buyback from the Tinker, though. Should still be able to have the luxury of taking down the Roshan. These fights are just so wild. How much damage there truly is, but overall the catch again and again from Collapse has just been beautiful in these. We'll see. I mean, th this Aghanim is going to the SD or the, uh, the Elder Titan. Ooh. And he's got PK. Uh, you probably give it to Mira. Yep, give it to Mira. Or Mad so. Yeah, there we go. Yep. And also taking the Aegis. Aegis as well. I mean, the saves okay. are pretty damn important right All now. All right. All right. Cool. I love it. Supports justice. No, de I mean, definitely makes some sort of sp sense, right? Especially when you know, Toro right at this stage, relying on the X-Machina to sort of refresh his items. He, he's, when he pops the, the Metamorphosis, he, he can't really afford to go down and then come back up. Everything I mean, has to be invested in keeping him alive in that one life and making sure that the Shadow Demon is always able to save him could just do so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's besides just for these disruptions and stuff too, it's just having, I mean, more and more demonic purchases is always massive versus this Tinker, so. Yeah, definitely huge here for Mira. More and more potential to do the save out. And Toro as the push commences. Yeah, approaching the base once more. Shiro's back up, immediate smoke from LGD. Okay. Lal, he'll be ready to join the push of spirit in 10 seconds. Of course, worth noticing, fortification is back online for both sides. And Neo, his buyback is back at the ready. I don't know why, I just feel like for Neo, he's, he seems to be the most important hero on, this, yeah, on the side of LGD throughout this entire game. One minute until Shiro has it. Okay. Toro X marked up, jumps in to get a bit of information. Take okay, cool. X back. Ice Blast won't connect. I mean, collapse. He will. He will connect on two. Get Shiro drag the back of the other. The Phantasm's there for Shiro. Dodges the RP. Doesn't matter that the damage coming out for your draw. It's too damn high. As you've taken out. Shiro in trouble. They chase on towards the Yule set up there. He's got a cheese. He'll get the cheese up, but it doesn't matter. Your draw with the aggressive Sunder. Helps to bring Shiro down a second time. He's out of the game. 95. Buyback still on cooldown here for the Chaos Knight. And collapse. He's got the refresher at the ready, so he can go for another round. Oh, and he's looking for it. Tried to check out along the tree line. Won't find anything other than an illusion on this jump. But of course, with the low cooldowns, he is ready to jump time and time again. Hey, he's ready to go every single time. And Miposhka also with his 25. This Earth Splitter cooldown, it's actually doing an immense amount of damage versus these super tanky cores at this late stage of the game. I mean, this Centaur has like 8,000 HP in a lot of the fights. 40, like just 4,000 HP gone instantly. Can LGD hold this? Four versus five. Buyback would have been back up in five seconds, but Shira, he's low on the gold. 1,600 short of buyback. Spirit, let's collapse. He'll get the grab on the AA. Quick drag back on the YU smile. Look. A couple of hits from Yatoro, and the AA is gone. Yatoro's in. The BKB, they're looking to drive closer. They're straight onto the H, and the buyback comes out from YU smile. The Spirit, instant. they'll respect that immediate back off. I collapse was so quick. He actually popped his own refresher the second the AA buyback comes out, gets himself out of there. No hesitation whatsoever. I doesn't want to get caught out by no. this blink, Yule's ice blast combo that YU smile can offensively play with. Spirit, still hovering around the outskirts of the base. Collapse, looking for another grab. Smoke up from LGD, they'll look to try and stay hidden. They are gonna have to reveal themselves soon though to try and pull the creeps off the Ancient. They kept it cool, they didn't put the fortification, they still have that at the ready. They gotta re reveal their book though, their book is just standing there, at least to start clearing out some of these creeps, because the building Toro's is starting to go down. Posta BKB Toro. is ready to try and force a reaction, Post the Metamorphs as you look to close up, the fortification's there, they were able to force that out, Spirit, they'll back off. That's their only one. It Ancient's already down to eight, half HP. Toro. He's gonna back up and reset for a second here. Gonna get X. He has 20 seconds until Matt is back up. Oh, look at the jump! Look at the hit! The jump at the disruption there from here. Hold back you! Shiro, he's in on top of Aposhka! Another the save. Disruption. Dying time for Aposhka to potentially walk out of this one, but he's used up. The setup's there. Aposhka still managed to get the BKB off the Glimmer Cakes out. Aposhka is able to walk away. Refresh your pop for Null. He's gonna be ready with another round of spells to throw down upon them. They look over towards you. They've caught up with the body plays with the grenade. You throw it with the BKB. I knew. For two minutes, they've lost you, and they're going to lose more. Collapse, Stuart back on it, and they think that is out. Collapse has done it. The two biggest and targets, it feels like they just call it. Wow. Spirit 
take this game one 76 minutes in. Wow. LTD, despite their best attempts with his consistent hold to keep this game alive, it was just too much for them at the end of the day. Uh, is Magnus going to become the hero of this series? I it could it definitely be. I mean, we saw what LGD was able to do with it yesterday and sometimes throughout this tournament collapse, putting on a different kind of display. Every single one of these catches was perfect. Have to, of course, highlight these saves. I mean, Mira, how many times did it feel like he just bailed his teammates out of these incredibly tough scenarios? There at the end, I think he saved three people. He does a double disruption in a book of shadows. I mean, both both team supports throughout that game really getting their time to shine. Oh, yeah. Mid-game planet really keeping things going with these consistent soulbind hexes, dark portraits coming out but those last few saves and the ways the mirror was disrupting the uh, offensive attempts from LGD it just allowed spirits cause to play the game out and push forward and indeed collapse Magnus Magnus as a whole we are absolutely gonna see this hero come out very very early on in the drafts for this for the rest of this series uh, with a performance like that from collapse to open things up but there we go ladies and gentlemen what a game one, Fogged. I mean, you, you can't really ask for more from these two teams. Everyone expected it. These two teams, they just play it through to two at a level that no one else seems to come close to, Fogged. Right no, absolutely. Now. And how are we going to follow this one up with the next game? I don't know, but I cannot wait to see. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> what a game one. Give it up once more for LGD Gaming and Team Spirit with the opening of this best of three. We've got so much more to come from these two teams. But as for now, Spirit will take game one. Oh, thank you very much, Only Pixel and Fogged. Only game one. I'm so here for it. If this is going to be the longest day in Dota 2 TI history, I'm here for it. This was fantastic. World class. Uh, Team Spirit coming out on top there at the end of the L. Uh, uh, but we know it could have gone either way at any point of that. And we're going to break all of it down. All 76 minutes of it. And that is the sixth longest game in TI history. Tigov, Lacoste, Fear. Uh, Fear, where do you want to start with a game like this? Because I... I actually want to start with the tier five items if you want, because they had a massive impact, especially Book of the Dead. Yeah, we can skip right over there. Book of the Dead, that's one of them, but Seerstone was the oh, big yes. one for me, yes. right? Like, if you want to talk about this Magnus and what it was able to do, you have an Arcane Blink, you got the Agnums eventually, you have the Harpoon. There's only one thing you're missing with this Magnum, vision. And the Seerstone gives them that vision. They're able to go in. Book of the Dead was also giving that vision. It was a game of vision this time, and that's why Collapse, not only being like the best Magnus, in the world, but also being able to see the heroes jump in time and time again. But there is a lot going on. I mean, if you had to summarize like what you want to see from a TI game, this is and it. This right? is it. This is like the perfect example of TI, and I don't think anywhere, any, uh, nowhere can come close to what we saw here. Right? It's that. LGD, they're 20k down, and then they find this opportunity to get back at some, into the game. You're talking about Vision with the Seerstone, with the Magnus, but on top of that, then you have New on his Centaur. Every time he found an opportunity, he was just popping off, giving LGD life in all these fights. And we said during the draft, like, if Spirit is to win this game, it's going to be to one player and one player only, and it was Collapse. He was a shining star for this team. Time and time again, he found multiple hero playoffs, multiple initiations, but it was just an incredible game. Yeah, if what? Collapse asks for Magnus, you give it to him. Most definitely. I mean, for a good reason, he is the best Magnus for, uh, you know, he's been like that for quite some time. And uh, I want to point out the, the high ground defense from both of these teams. You know, these teams just create magic when they play on the main stage for a good reason. No one comes even close when it comes down to spellcasting. There are so many cool things. We've seen Virtus Pro try to use this X mark to spot, but uh, didn't work out. This is also like 87 minute game or something. And now 60 plus minute game, you see Team Spirit doing the same thing, X mark to spot, but they're not caught. They're not making any mistakes. So all these things that they do, they're very clutch. Coming from the skewers, uh, I think Mira, I like for me, Mira is the guy that uh, his positioning is top tier. And most of these fights, he's going to be standing further away, away from the fight. He gets that axe, has multiple disruptions, uh, Book of the Shadows as well. Uh, just his understanding of Dota is through the roof. And on top of that, Team Spirit recognized that they gave him the ages at the end. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you've got to protect him. And I just feel like the level of trust that Spirit plays with, like Yotaro, his positioning, he knows at any minute there's going to be the disruption. He knows that Collapse will go fishing, will drag that hero towards him. And you saw it in time in every single fight. It was just, it was like, just an incredible game. <laughs>
It, it definitely was. I'm gonna give an honorable shout out to like LGD as well for yes. holding on to this game for as long as they did. But like, I thought the carries were gonna be CK and the Tinker, but in the end, it actually turned up being more of like the Grim Stroke and the Centaur. So very impressive in that regard. Yeah, I think at some point we we heard Fox say "Holy cow!" and I couldn't think of it. It was so fitting because Niu means cow in Chinese as well, and he played his heart out together with Planet and I mean the whole team to make it to that long of a late game against a Magnus and a Terrorblade is already fantastic. And I do want to talk a little bit about how we got there because start of the game, I know I'm going back very far here, T, but at the start of the game, it was looking pretty good for LGD. Rewind, yeah. no, rewind. Just, just, there's, a, there's a lot in between there. No, I think for LGD, they did kind of hit an awkward mid-game timing where the first Roshan, if you can remember that one, it's... Like, it took them a little bit of time to get it, they got it, and then Spirit was doing a very good job just constantly pushing out the waves, poking for a pickoff, and then going, you can never get to our towers. And that might have been LGD's demise, was when they had a little bit of mid-game timing, they never could capitalize on the map, because Spirit non-stop, skipped the waves, keep the players. We saw on the stat there as well, the neutral creeps, it was nearly, what, double, di double the amount of neutral creeps of Spirit towards the side of LGD. Just because of the, the macro play from Spirit, it was built into their draft the entire time. I feel like Team Spirit kind of prepared for this long game, yeah. judging by the <laughs> items, judging, judging by the heroes, because uh, it's super difficult to go for the high ground if you're, even if you're ahead, and they were, and then, you know, Terrorblade farm, Hand of Midas kicks in, uh, these illusions are sent out to clear the camps as well, plus the Empower, They're, these are the heroes that, you know, show up on the lane, they clear out quickly, and they go back to farming, and they understood that, so they just decided to keep farming. Yeah, I mean, speaking of that, you're talking about how Spirit kind of planned for this in their style of play, and it is Purge that would like to dissect their style of play and why it worked. Thank you, Shiver. Yeah, this tournament so far has been a big battle between farming long games and playing really fast. And most of the teams that farm a lot have been knocked out thus far. The teams that are remaining are the fast teams. So what some commonalities between Team Spirit and LGD, uh, they contest one in four more deflex, Willow position four, and these offlaners are generally tempo offlane heroes. Night Stalker's been a big hero for both of these two teams. But this game was a little bit different. It was finally LGD saying, we're gonna play aggressive fighting style and team spirit says we're gonna play really slow and aim for team fights and the late game which they did very su su uh, successfully now a very normal strat for terrorblade is you summon these illusions here and you send them to lanes that are dangerous to farm and you push them out and this buys you time while giving you farm Yatara did this consistently throughout the game and he grabbed a fast Sanjin Yasha and a butterfly to be able to do that as quickly and as fast as possible but the problem is that even after they got successful kills on LGD in this case Shiro using his BKB they didn't have very good tower pushing heroes so even with marginal advantages they couldn't accelerate the game as much as they wanted to and this bought time for Team Spirit basically to get pickoffs across the map and to ensure that they had more and more time for Yatora to get farmed so even though LGD had an amazing early game because they're solid laning stage and even though they got great ganks off and had more kills Spirit basically just sits in a really good position while they continue to delay the game. He uses the gate, he spawns an illusion to push the creep wave, goes back, just a lot of movements and gank dodging. And this got them to the team fight point where all of Team Spirit's heroes were just perfect for team fighting. Even in this engagement, losing Shadow Demon first, they had a really big advantage. Yator runs in with BKB, he gets a Sunder off on an illusion, picks off the enemy's support, and this is kind of where things get messy in every fight. It's basically this guy over here, Mposha, playing the Elder Titan. This is a late game team fight support. He has an aura that lowers armor and magic resistance. His ulti here does damage based on how much HP you do, do. And this allowed Team Spirit, in addition to the Magnus, to find team fights that allow them to delay the game and find team fights that win them the game in the end. Thanks, Purge. That game was definitely delayed successfully for Team Spirit. And both Team Spirit and LGD need a little bit of a breather in between the games and get ready for game number two. Who knows? Might be another long one waiting in the wings there. And while they're getting a little bit of rest, strategic rest, mind you, uh, we're also going to have a little bit of a break. Or rather, we're going to learn a little bit more about Team Spirit. Если вы желаете вообще победить на интернешнале, это нужно понимать, что вам придется потратить огромное количество времени на игру. У вас просто не будет банально хватать времени на что-либо другое, принести все в жертву ради того, чтобы только играть в одну игру. По поводу нас, я бы сказал, что 
Мы довольно, мы очень хороши в том, чтобы не сдаваться, как по мне. Несмотря ни на что, как бы игра плохо не протекала, мы всегда стараемся играть до конца. То есть куча игр, где, ну, у нас было, где мы довольно сильно отстаем. Но потом все равно находим моменты, потому что, ну, тут такая игра, всегда где-то можно переиграть на вижене, где-то подловить, где-то оказаться чуть быстрее, первее. Нет такого, что прям чего-то боишься. Но скорее есть такое чувство, что ты всегда можешь проиграть. И чувство проигрыша, оно ну, такое довольно досадное. Ну, вообще не люблю проигрывать, поэтому именно и всегда я стараюсь в каждой игре до конца как-то. Собственно, поэтому мы и стараемся всегда играть до конца, побеждать. Вот, а так страха нет. There is no fear here for Team Spirit, and they are a game up, which is good, so they don't have to feel that vexing feeling of defeat. And that's the reason why they want to keep winning. I would imagine that same thing goes for LGD as well. And going into game number two, I'm smiling because I'm like, Fear, what do you what do you learn after a I'm, game like that? Where do you go? Just for the record, I'm here for Team Spirit, and just in case they need me, but <laughs> I think the one thing you do really have to learn from this is Maybe don't give Collapse Magnus again. It's more than anything going to be a mental thing. This guy is so good with the hero. Sure, he played great that game, but there's going to be history. You could start having flashbacks at TI-10. Do we want to give this away? It's definitely going to be in their heads now. A, m a mental win as yeah. well here for Team Spirit and Lacoste. The way, yeah, the way it happened at TI-10 is first game was, was not contested. Second game, Team Spirit did manage to get the hands on it. Third game, also not contested. Fourth game, they pick Magnus for themselves and decide not to ban it for the last, the fifth game. And this is going to haunt them. This has been, you know, the downfall of the LGD at TI-10. Is it going to be their downfall again they they need to figure it out because this is the hero to look out for i mean the real question is magnus like in these type of series the mini meta starts appearing is magnus going to be a first pick hero is it going to be banned out in the first phase suddenly all these other heroes that we've been praising now for weeks are they now in play too like gone gone <laughs> you say ban it or insta pick it what would yeah, say pretty much if, if you don't have the first pick you might need to ban it yeah now, I also want to highlight a hero that we saw for the first time on the main stage in the Tinker. I know it was it was a fantastic late game. Uh, normally, I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this, unfortunately, in their own games. Tinker late game is hell. And I feel like we didn't really see that hell come to fruition here, Fear. Yeah, I think there's a reason why this hero isn't picked very much. Even though it was a perfect game for Tinker, he just didn't get off the ground, do what he needed to do in this game. and. I think if we can't win a Tinker game like that, you're not going to find a better one. Yeah, unfortunately for Tinker, it is a hero 41% win rate at TI. It's not the most show-up hero. It is uh, probably not going to see the light of day here again. And we'll see if Magnus sees the light of day either. We're going to have to wait and find out. The draft of game number two, of course, very, very soon. Around the corner, if you will. Before we head there, though, let's learn a little bit more about LGD. 因为总的来说，我是总共有三次的TI之旅。如果让我来重新思考这个关于我对三个三次TI有不同怎么样的心境这个问题，刚好是三个不同的我在对于我来说都是全新的我去参加TI。胜利的时候往往学到的永远没有失败来得多 
最主要的还是不光是游戏内的，更主要是游戏外自己的队友、自己生活上面的一些人、一些支持自己的人。要好好珍惜跟这段经历吧，就是可能就是这种。哦，还有可能更多就是珍惜每次机会吧。所以骄傲的是，我更为我们团队引以为傲，是我们三个第一次来 TI 的选手，他们到线下，并且能够去很好的投入，然后也去享受它，这是我为他们引以为傲的。关于成为 TI 冠军这个秘密，如果你在一六年或者那个时候问我，我可能会那个时候会告诉你，但是现在我也在找寻他的路上，所以我现在我也回答不了。捧到盾来说，我现在我我无法，我想象不出词汇来形容我。我我如果还在捧到的话，我是怎样的心境？因为我认为过去跟现在都是我自己。我本次 TI 我并没有什么可以让我害怕的。You cannot forget that LGD is in the booth with three first timers. I feel like we've, we've mentioned it, and we mention it quite frequently, if you ask me, but I feel like it cannot be mentioned enough here because coming here, playing on the main stage in the upper bracket finals, having an over 17 minute, close to 18 minute game, almost coming out on top, that is character making. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, it doesn't feel like they have three no, first timers doesn't. at all. They're all playing really well. Even though they lost this, it's more of like, I feel like they tried something new with the Tinker. It just didn't work out. But every single one of these players that's playing top-notch Dota, that last game we just witnessed, the highest tier of Dota you will ever see in this patch, and yeah. it was quite amazing. I like how every one of them decided to step up at one stage of the game, where you had, you know, Neo carrying with the Centaur, you had Planet on his Grimstroke, uh, pretty much like he was the most feared hero for like good 20 minutes because he was causing a lot of issues. And then you had also Y uh, with Ancient Apparition, and of course C. Okay, so they, they know how to utilize those heroes and the very fearsome team. I think we're in for a treat. I better hope this is going to be a three-game series. <laughs> I mean, Not I, just for the sake of the games, but also for our chances of getting more Crimson Witnesses. True. <laughs> I mean, it better be a game three, for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, but also, if, like, going back to the whole LGD new players, it's like the fact that they had obviously big shoes to fill and it just feels like they, they belong here. Like, I, I cannot emphasize, I really want to see this as the grand finals. Like, I just want to see this Time and time again, I just want to see all, only LGD spirit. I'm sorry, I'm going to show some bias here, but like their <laughs> drafting, their play, it's like it is just on another level. And I think you emphasize it perfectly. The fact that every single player in this game had a moment where they shone. In a 70 minute game, there was not a single player that had a bad game, that had an awkward moment. Like every single player just had a, like a highlight worthy moment. Yeah, we're gonna find out if we'll have a third game. I know everybody can just hope and see that we get that, but let's see if LGD can do it. And it all starts with a draft. Team Spirit versus LGD Gaming. Game two. I said earlier, long games is where characters are made. I feel like drafts is where we can see if a team is truly the best team in the world because games like these, you're gonna have adaptations and you've got only 10 to 15 minutes to make the perfect adaptations while your opposing team does the exact same. And we're gonna find out um, if LGD is able to do it here, if they can force out a third game. We have LGD on the Radiant side this time around. <laughs> we got Spirit on the Dire side, and we have first pick going the way of Team Spirit. Yeah, it should be pretty interesting here to see what adjustments will be made. LGD was like, Mag, nah, it wasn't a problem. We're gonna go ahead and leave him in the pool. We'll see if Team Spirit are escalating this to a first pick type of hero, or if they LGD will snatch it away. I think that'll be the talk that they had after the game, and if they do give it away like this, surely they have a response in mind. Yeah, and that's that's the joy, right? Right now, it's like maybe spirits like they they think the hero is very good, but it's like, do we really want to first phase it? Because there's like what ten or so heroes that have been so popular, but I still feel like it should be the hero of the series. 
If you watched earlier today, and there was, uh, well, I, I know you've all done that. You all sat here for the past, what is it, almost 12 hours. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> Wait, has it been 12 hours? Uh, no, it has not no, been 12 no, hours. No. It's been very long, though. But if you've been here for the whole day, uh, respect to you. And you would have remembered a video where we see a lot of pro players talking about which hero they consider to be OP at the moment. And it was almost universal. One hero in particular, Spirit Breaker, previous game banned, now still in the pool. The question is, will Team Spirit want to pick it up? And it is a no fear. That's a surprise. Just a little bit, especially because uh, Magnus just beat this DK. Yeah. They have something in mind. And plus, especially the AA is generally good with the CK. So I'm very curious on what they're thinking with this pick here. When we were saying hero, I thought you were talking about Yatoro because everyone else yes. unanimously agreed it was the, <laughs> something to ban as well. But yeah, this is interesting. Now LGD have the choice, right? They either go with their preparation of when they normally see a CK or do they adapt and be like, let's get the Ah, oh, there it is. Oh. Oh. Themselves. I love it. I the love flashbacks. it. Yeah. And I wonder if this, I really wonder if this is just like Team Spirit underrate this hero and they're like in the LGDs overrating it. Whatever the case may be, we're finally gonna see which team will Mag win both games. Is Mag really the hero of the tournament coming up? I also think, uh, like, is this uh, some mental warfare we we're talking about? Because community, they went really hard on Zhao 8 about uh, allowing Magnus to be picked in the fifth game. So he either needs to pick it or he needs to ban it. Uh, like, so he just decided to pick it. Yeah, and I think... Can't really blame him. Yeah, that's <laughs> sure, why not? And I think for Spirit, at least, going for the CK, you know that if, it's, let's say, a Mag off lane, the Spirit Breaker off lane, CK is such a dominant laner that, yes, these heroes are very popular right now, but CK will always trump them in the first 15 minutes. And Spirit, maybe they don't want to take the game to 70 minutes. They want to actually win based off their own kind of tempo in the game. So I can see why they went for CK. It was a good answer because they had a lot of AoE. They had Empower. They had this Elder Titan with the Echo Stomp to deal with CK Illusions. Uh, Kunkka, he makes his life miserable against those Illusions. The Storm Storm, uh, later portions of the game with the Refresher, like triple boats make it six boats it makes it super hard for ck to come into a fight and just blow people up that's pretty funny actually they're banning the heroes they pick yeah. magnus <laughs> i mean we talked about the shadow team being really good with the magnus because even if your lane isn't great you can always fall back to the stacks and there's no better hero than the shadow demon to get stacks going for your team and they're like you know you're not going to copy our strat we know this is a good strat we're going to ban it out you have to come up with something new yeah and of course format the extra time Guess who's been trying to play offlane Magnus in the last breakdown? It knew. He's been giving it some time. Of course, we've seen NTS play it from mid lane, but they now have that flexibility because they've had that extra little bit of time off away from the schedule of TI. And uh, yeah, got to keep that in mind. This isn't just has to be mid. It, it has that flexibility. And maybe after seeing it in the hands of Collapse, he was like, I want to do that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't be opposed to it. And I now think Collapse is going to take the Centaur and be like, I want to play that Centaur. <laughs> <laughs> It is a possibility. It is in the pool and it is strong. It is strong. And we got the bands out of the way already with the uh, Spear Breaker removed on the side of LGD. And we got the Elder Titan and Shadow Demon, as mentioned, removed on the side of Team Spirit. And it's time for Team Spirit to uh, to pick a hero. And they're yeah. taking their time, taking it into the bonus time for this as well. So Collapse actually has the record as well for most stun duration of any player in this game. I think after last game, that'll continue to be true. He really likes to play these Blink Initiators, these stuns, Axe, Magnus, we could see the Centaur. We'll see what he picks up here. The one hero that was uh, kind of rising yesterday and today as well was Pugna. This hero just does everything in terms of the laning stage, save, the scaling. Hero becomes obnoxious to play, but again, there's still Dark Willow in the pool, this hero. Like, they, there's also a little bit of a flex to it because they could run CK on the offlane, something that uh, Bad Boom did earlier today, so keeping things open for now. Yeah. And I love that Team Spirit, they're seeing this Magnus, right? They banned out two of the heroes they played themselves, right? The, the ET, the SD, they clearly respect the vision and the save that these two heroes can provide. That gives Magnus the time and the kind of the fight construct to always execute. And for LGD, the Grimstroke, they're kind of also block picking it to some degree, right? Because you don't want to have CK Grimstroke in a single lane. That is just going to be so potent, especially if Mag is going into the off lane. It is going to be a little bit weaker. Tree and Protects are coming out. It's a hero that we've seen banned so many times and you'd think like, oh my gosh, then he must be, you know, the best hero being played right now. But so far in this uh, this event, he's been picked 36 times, which is quite a lot, but his win rate is just a solid 50%. And not too bad. This is the vision hero because they want to be the one seeing Magnus before he can get the jump. Also, Dark Willow, this, is, this hero is pretty similar if we talk about ulti. 
to Winter Wyvern against Magnus. This has been historically one of the better heroes. He wants to jump in. He wants to use this big team fight ulti. And these ultis, like Dark Willow ulti, they stop this from happening. Ten seconds remaining. Yeah, very curious. They'll probably just pick another five here if you are an LGD. And then you do have to respond with the core coming up here. Which Doctor? He's a strong hero. The Voodoo Switcheroo has been pretty good against these heroes. I have like these slow projectiles like a CK. If you can get it off in time, and the cast might help us a little bit of AoE. Strong laner. Yeah, and we saw Y play Witch Doctor yesterday, yeah. and we thought he only picked it because of his Crimson Witness. Maybe he still is. <laughs> but maybe he's like, oh, wait a second. This hero is pretty good because he did have a great time with it. It's a well. good hero because you have, like, you know, something against this Dark Pillow if they decide to, you know, run it as carry. And, of course, against CK and the Illusions, and it also helps Spectre in the laning stage because Spectre is not, the, you know, the strongest laner. Yeah, it's also a support hero that's going to be able to sync up quite nicely on the map. Because Spectre has the 60 second cooldown on your ult, level one, you always want to have things happening in the early game. You don't want to play that classic sit back farm, we need Radiance, we need Ice. No, you can always look for him. So Witch Doctor, Grimstroke plus something is always going to be able to net a kill or two. And that's why I think Spirit, they opted to go for a slightly defensive route with their heroes. Tree, Willow, Kunker all have very good capabilities of protecting themselves if they are aggressed. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely like this Kunker pick here because they don't have last pick of the game here. So not only are they leaving the CK open to be either their offlane or their carry, which is going to make the next two bans from LGD a little bit more difficult. It's like, do they need an offlane or do they need a carry? Who knows? But it's if they didn't pick their mid there, they would just ban two of the best mids, right? And then you don't even have last pick. So they're just going to pick the mid that makes the most sense for them. Laurel, he's great on this hero. Technically could be a flex as well if they really want to. Collapse could play this, but it's a really strong hero of the patch, and it also takes it away from LGD. We saw the power of this Konka versus the CK just locking down the illusions, so really good pick here. What are we looking into? I'm feeling this Dawnbreaker potentially have a little bit more global presence, a strong laner against Spectre. And also you can use ulti on top of the target that is being skewered away, so you have at least something to follow it up. Uh, the other one I'm looking into is potentially Night Stalker, not the strongest yep. laner. Team Governor, he's like, yeah, that's yeah. You're, you're on point. Because you want to be the one getting the first jump, having this vision. We already talked about uh, Trian Protector being the vision guy, where you can blow up people with CK Illusion. He uh, wants to be the one jumping in, Blink Dagger and killing people off. Off instantly. I think the only concern with that would be the lane like you mentioned, but if you do get into that mid game, you have first of all Magnus into Gunker mid, so you're going to have these skewer back into your tier 1 tower, yep. potential plays to annoy him, break the farming pattern. The Night Stalker, you get an early gem, now this 15-20 minute timing of tree is now removed from his shard, so yep, they ban it out. Oh, right, LGD ban it out themselves actually. I mean, I think it's, <laughs> okay. it's a free lane versus Spectre, right? Oh yeah, because yeah. of course Spirit right. can pick beforehand, so they could just steal it away. Yeah, yep. they could take That's that, fair. then now all of a sudden your Magnus won't be able to jump because he's yep. been found first. Yep. So highly contested for both teams potentially here. But I think for Spirit, that would be really big. And those are the two heroes that I've seen him play the most for Spectre, the Night Stalker, the Tide. His other Blink Initiators are probably not something you want to play. I mean, Centaur is still in the pool. He could do that. That's also a free lane for him as well. A respect band to the Tinker as well. Yeah, they just don't want to play another like 90 minute game. Like offlane is now, it's like there's still Dawnbreaker, but Mag can just always skew it away from that sort of Guardian. It just, yeah, it can be a little bit awkward. There's not a lot of these tanky boys left. But there's still a Brewmaster. I mean, in terms of silences oh. that they have, there's Grimstroke Silence, which he doesn't care too much about his, because of his stances. Uh, they're running out of time. Oh, no, they're still a bonus. Side. They have 30 Wait, seconds. Still, it's it's Centaur. Yeah, it's Centaur. Right, yeah. You haunt and you yeah, press agree, yeah. R, and now your yeah. supports can survive a bit longer and just kite it out. And it's an absolutely free lane for yeah. him as well. No, yeah, I, I like the Centaur a lot. Especially because you have the Willow as well. Such a classic combo. Big beefy offlaner for the high rank. Offlane combo. Oh, oh, offlane wow. CK. Offlane CK, Morphling going the way before. We've seen Morphling not do too great. Why, why Morphling this here? True. Elimination games, though. You know, there's sure, been, um, sure. certain players that have been picking it. So, so why here? Why is it good? A Willow Morph used to be great. Is that still a thing? Uh, no, it's not. But <laughs> it is. Uh, if you think about like what Magnus does, you're generally gonna look at the laning stage. I think they think it might be an offlane mag. This hero has really high base damage, especially if you get them power. It's hard to CS against. Morphling is one of those heroes that can just have more base damage than the Magnus. There's no real kill threat from a mag on the laning stage. So as long as you can just sit there, CS, not get skewered back into some combo, you can get out with the waveform. You can just survive the laning stage. It's also 
one of those things where now with the Morphling, Spectre has to think, okay, do I want to go for a Midas Diffusal Scardi type of build? But then maybe I'm not the strongest against the CK. But then if, do I want the Radiance to deal with like It causes a lot of questions, but yeah. Uh -oh. The big Out combo, Doom. double Doom coming out, uh, yep. stopping yep. the healing uh -oh. from Morphling. It, it looks good. I don't think it's on the greedier side. Spectre needs a little bit more time, so does Doom, but we've seen nothing to say play this Magnus against Azure Ray, and he didn't go for greedy items, not at all. At first, picking up the Blink Dagger as his first item, and then going for scaling. Key thing for me now is Spirit's offlane, a Willow plus CK is so strong. Can a Spectre and a Witch Doctor get through that lane? Because if CK just starts getting kill after kill, it could be a little bit of like, uh, you know, catch up for the Spectre, but I think this lane for Spirit should be really, really good for them. It is for sure, and I think uh, they're no strangers to losing their lane pretty hard and coming back. I will say, though, you do have this Grimstroke Doom combination, just Doom in general versus Morph. It's so hard that you can't shift, the Tribute shift. So if he ever gets an Ag, it's just gets on top of you. This is a terrible matchup for Morphling. So you're thinking high chance we're going to have a third game. Unless Spirit can just, like, stomp this game pretty hard, this late game looks very difficult. Exactly. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry goes. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, this late game, we've seen Magnus, what he can do in a 60-plus minute game. This is also Spectre Doom we're talking about. And also good scaling supports on their side. Witch Doctor plus Grimstroke. We've seen this being super greedy meta for both supports. And if they get items, they go, both get Aghanim Scepter. This late game should belong to LGD. Yeah, the speed of the game has flipped. Game one, it was Spirit, survive, they win. In this game, for LGD, it's like, same logic, right? If they survive, they're going to have this mag, the Spectre, the Doom, the late game heroes, the ones that crush it all. So it's Spirit, they need to be the aggressors, they need to win their lanes and set the tempo in this game. So they are on a timer, and they will try to make it a bloodbath at the start. At this point in TI, I'll never say there's a timer. <laughs> Anyone can win at this point. There's so much magic in the air, but yes. They just have more tools, I think. Yes, exactly, yeah. There are more tools in the LGD bank as the game goes later. Oh, that is uh, an important factor. There's a lot of LGD chance going on here already, and they will definitely need your support. I think the majority would like to have a game number three, but can they do it? Before we head to the game, we are first going to check in with Michelle, who is standing by with Coach Shawait. Hello everyone, I have Xiao A standing right next to me. Coach, I just want to ask, both teams play extremely well in game one. It comes a little bit close, sh a little bit shorter for LGD. What do you think guys could done better? Uh, 可能玩下来我们自己整体的节奏还有一些做得不够好或者个人上有一些失误 I feel like we've been picking all the good, all the strong heroes for, for, my, for my player and uh, I feel like we just make some, a little bit of mistake and uh, we didn't really, we just made a little bit of mistake and we didn't really play our best 那想再问一下,那这场比赛的话是我们自己二选了马格纳斯,你觉得蒙马是这场比赛这个系列赛的关键英雄吗? So, we pick Magna's second pick this game, do you think this hero is the key of the series? 我觉得应该是吧,因为拉森2队的蒙马值得信赖 Yeah, I think so, I think we can trust NTS on his Magna's play, back to our casters Thank you very much. And yes, I can't wait for this game to get on the road here with game two. This first game of the series already fogged in a phenomenal start to this best of three. Game two coming in. We are, of course, once again getting this Magnus, this time on the other side of things. I think indeed that this hero is going to be one to watch out for. We saw no hesitation in the draft. They picked this up straight away, LGD, for game two. Yep. Big Wombo combo team fight this time around. Spirit going down a route that, as far as I was looking, I think the last six games or so, this Morphling has not had any success. It's a different not. monstrosity, of course. Yotoro playing at Grandmaster tier, but mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of these Grandmaster tier Morphlings have. falter here. I mean, what, what do you think it is about the hero that's sort of maybe kind of causing the, the carry players to call for it? You know, why, why, why are they saying, give me the Morph in I, these situations? I think overall what we've seen is he's been getting away with the lane in particular, right? The hero gets farm. It's just what does he, what's he actually able to do afterwards? Is he actually able to carry games like we've seen these tanky, beefy cores? Ever since, I mean, for the most part, ever since he's had this agony, all changed, and since that whole crazy patch of just stealing attributes, he has some, had some stuff for a time. So we'll have to see if Yotaro can make a difference with it. 
Because, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure, unless I'm someone who can, of course, correct me later on or something, but I think I looked like six, I think it was six games or so. It was the last like, eight days. Yeah. Hero just has not won. I think so. What overall in this tournament is about a 36% win yes. rate, regardless. So, not the greatest of numbers, but as you say, if any carry player is going to make it work, your Toro would be the one. Yeah. So we'll see what he can do on the, the Hero this game. Uh, overall, looking at some of the other lane matchups, nothing to say. Of course, the man bringing in the Magnus. We saw Collapse pop off in it last game. We have seen in previous series how impressively nothing to say can also perform on the Hero. So, every reason to believe that he's going to be able to pull out the big plays. And even even in the slaining stage, of course, Lyle has got to be careful. He's a melee hero in this matchup. Nothing to say. Might find some cheeky skewers under the towers. Yep, Such right off the bat. One. Shouldn't be able to get the kill here, but still hefty amounts of damage being done. Not an easy matchup to play in as a melee against a Magnus. Yeah, it's kind of a skill-based matchup, though, overall. I mean, Laurel, he's actually been quite excellent. His Kunkka that last game, I feel like there was just so much crazy stuff going on that he got kind of ignored no how well he played as why. We'll be okay. It's gonna be okay on this one. Yeah, and let's see overall. This is a bit of a dynamic change that I would say. When I watch Spirit, it's traditionally Collapse playing those big team fighters. He's the one kind of dictating the pace of the game, how much he's be able to catch and make these massive fights happen. He's playing CK. It's a very different type of style hero. Not to say that he's not going to play it wonderfully or all, but it's just a different kind of thing that's going on. Sure. I guess sort of the, and the, the change up there, having the knock-on effect towards what the supports are going to be doing, right? Last yeah. time around, we saw Mira coming out with these incredible saves. This time, playing a more offensive position with the Dark Willow. When it comes to setup and starting fights, a bit more focus on towards what Mira can do. Absolutely. And the same thing goes for... Well, top lane. Okay, that's an early point in the Phantom. Yeah, just trying to go for that potential opportunity of tripping Yatoro up. But Yatoro, he'll be okay for now. That's pretty cool. You don't see that very often. But Planet, we I mean, excellent game last time around in the Grim Stroke, going for a little bit of a different approach to put some pressure onto this morph. So far not working, though. Yatoro is getting these last hits under the tower. And he has Tree, probably one of the best supports when you're playing with the morph lane. Just pop a Leech Seed, zero drops low HP, you just get the heal coming up. Yeah, absolutely. Having any sort of sustain is going to yeah, feel fantastic for the laning stage. And we saw last time round, you know, Yatoro on the Terra Blade, he had a rough lane. It did not matter in the long sort of picture, you know, the, the long term yeah, of the game. Absolutely. And this time around, he's not going to even have to worry about having a sort of, sort of a tough start. This is a seeming to be an easy first few waves here for Yatora. Yeah, we'll see how he's going to be able to deal with this mid game overall too. And even like later stages of the game too, because I think what I've been seeing a lot of times with these morph is as soon as Scotty timing comes out for a lot of these carries, he just can't actually stand toe to toe with them anymore. You literally just, I saw the Luda the last game when we were just watching earlier today, just gets hit by this, loses the heal, the heal regeneration, and then just can't actually stand to toe to toe with most of these tanky cores. But we'll have to see what Yatoro can do. Playing into this Doom could be an issue with that heal removal, but immediately we'll see him queuing up for that Lincoln. So natural itemization for him. Uh, we'll just sort of see kind of what point the, the Agonims comes into the build for new this game. Bottom, set up. They get the get in. Uh, Close the gap on a YU smile. He's pumping out that, that heal, that Voodoo Restoration. It's going to be enough to keep him alive as he gets back underneath the Tier 1 tower. Not quite enough damage right now from Spirit to get that first blood. Very aggressive lane down bottom, just like you were saying, right? They have the Willow, one of their most comfortable, of course, on Mira and Collapse. He's going to take advantage of playing the CK, just putting the pressure onto the Spectre. And you're seeing it already. Shiro is getting slowed down quite a bit here. 12 last hits, Morphling, free farming up top in comparison. Early rotations toward the runes. Nothing to say. Does it, is able to get that water rune. Laurel, though, Kunkka is able to X back. But so far, slight lead there for nothing to say in the mid lane. And yeah, big differential between how Yotoro is able to get the free farm at the moment and just nah, he really is pressure onto the Spectre. I mean, it's be a slow one. A lot of damage here. Shiro should be all right, but again, Ooh. brought incredibly low by both Mira and Collapse. And he's going to do his usual build, but in this game, it looks like, I mean, there's definitely potential for him to full upgrade for this Spirit Vessel this game. Playing into the CK, you playing into Kunkka Tree side. Morph. Definitely merit if you'd like to go down the route, even though it's not your usual Spectre build. And he's been the kind of the one who did the urn and then just go straight for Midas and stuff like that. This is definitely one where he could look for that full vessel. Especially if he gets slowed down this much at the start, he might just look to get involved a lot with these early aggressive movements that I mean, happen. You see, the they're map. bringing a third hero in on the bottom lane here, oh, Spirit. Yeah. Maposhka making use of the twin gates to maybe try and go for a dive under this tier one. They've got a double range creep right now. Glyph is available if they want to they, go for They could try and go for this. Yeah, Looks at Lina with the lead sheet on towards Shiro. Why you smile? Turns around with the paralyzing cast, but it's not enough to hold them back. First blood for Spirit. They should be able to chase out the Witch Doctor as well as Why you smile surrounded. Spirit, they'll get the two of them. And without even using the glyph to go for the dive. Usually you see the glyph to keep the creeps away, but not even necessary. Maposhka oh, in the mid. Beautiful connection. A bit of a skewer here for nothing to say. I've got Planet sweeping over to help out, but TP's backup's going to be in for Lyle. Lyle 
Heading back up to the safety of his half of the river. He's fine. They can even turn. Look at the X mark into a potential torrent combo. Into the tiger. Oh, the yeah. smash. The Poshka turns up and helps Lyle turn things around. Oh, big start here for Spirit. 3-0. And this is going to be around Power Rune as well, too. Nothing to say. Getting a little overzealous going for this tanky kill onto the Kunkka. Yeah, now Rune very likely to go for Lara unless it spawns up top. And, and with the way things have gone on this top lane, this is what a point where Yatora can be happily can left chill. on his own. Yep, for the most part, absolutely. Until New gets six, he should be just fine. And Power Rooney will spawn bottom. Laurel should be able to get himself safely down over toward that side. Seeing a lot of stacks being made this time around. Spirit looking to already contest, actually get information. Miposhka, he's going to be able to scout the fact that there's a three or four X stack that's been being made there. That's planet. true. I mean, yeah, they have potential to steal with the Oh, they certainly up. could. They could just bring him over, drop the boat down, even if they want to try and clear this out. See how healthy Laurel is, how he feels about it right now. I mean, he's even got an arcane ring. ring. So they're actually just bringing, yeah. they're just bringing the Magnus over. Nothing to say he wants to go over and start getting some clear. And looking at it, nothing to say his build. Something that I don't think, I've seen so much on the Magnus. Smiposhka trying to set up for Wisdom Rune. No, he's going to make them work for this. Ah, he's making space. Yep. You know, there's three heroes chasing after him. And he's I still mean, in the tree line. He should be pretty dead surely if they get the sink swirl connection, which they do. He makes them work for it. He'll continue to make them work for it, but he does go down. I mean, space created. That's what he would say. Then Maposhka is three here. I spent a lot of time chasing him. And yeah, uh, pointing out the builds here from nothing to say. I don't think I've seen that. I, it, I've been seeing a lot of various different kind of builds coming out here. The Magnus, he's actually just going for the max shockwave. I haven't seen like 1-1-2 one, one, build. I think that was from the off lane from Collapse, but a lot more we've been seeing the Empower build be able to contest for that mid lane. So All right. Yeah, a bit different because he okay. wants to be a little bit more playmaker around the map. Yeah, I guess so. So having that extra nuke damage to yeah. obviously maybe catch your Toro out when he's shifting True. low, and also True. just have that extra bit of burst that they can throw out for kills like going from yeah. here you know, shadow rounds pop maybe that higher level shockwave will still finish off the kill i feel like it makes a lot of sense in this game too when he's playing with the specter and a doom kind of greedy heroes overall he's probably wants to be quite a bit more active than you maybe would anticipate for this magnus but so far spirit and this mag i mean this morphling's getting absolute free farm he is. as well and they're they're really showing slowing down sheer i mean he's had games like this where he gets slowed down massively on the specter but this is quite ridiculous this time around yeah, all going to be down to really that, that blink dagger timing or nothing to say. There to be the yeah. point where they can start to look to try and make the moves to catch out Yatoro. Because up until that point, Yatoro, he's, he's just going to continue to have complete free farm up here. As long as he stays away from the threat of that tier one. Because LGD, they are beginning to group up and look to pile the pressure onto that top tower. No points in the living armor from Miposhka. He's got full aggressive build on this train protector. 2-3 build. Eight minutes oh, in. The tower's already dead. I mean, they can look to defend this collapse. I mean, can the TPs are coming over. They're actually going to set up for the kill. They'll drop the doom. Okay. Straight away on the collapse. So, should be an easy one to chase down. Watch for the deny. Mira. Or can he time it? Ooh, oh, not quite. So, nice. new. He'll walk away with a kill. Let me see if we can chase out Mira as well. Mira's going to go for the TP. They've got the cast. They do. So, LGD. They should find the boat for them here. Shadow Realm's there. And there's no escape here for Mira. He can just continue trying to. Makes a space, buy some time, but he'll still be going down. LGD, they'll get a couple of kills with that rotation. But look at this. I mean, will they be able to contest this stack here because of that space that they've been able I mean, to it make? would be huge if they could that take this. Massive. Oh, he's just going to boat it. Yeah, yeah no cares. Said, just drop the boat. Drop the boat. Pick up this what, pretty much what a quad stack at least here that was prepared by LGD. They'll oh. get it all here, Team Spirit. Big money. Huge for Laurel. Oh, planet. Careful. Right, nothing Moshka. to say. Do you want to commit for this? He will. He'll drop the RP for that. Nice little turn play. All right, take it what they can get. I mean, Maposhka, he'll also drop the ult in response. Shiro, nice. he'll jump across, make sure he's the one to pick up the bounty of getting the last hit on Maposhka. Cool. And that's, is that his vessel pretty much done? Yeah, I think it is. So Shiro, yeah. slowed down a lot, but it looks like he's going to try to be very, very active with the spirit vessel. And it's good versus, yeah, all three cores. Definitely very valuable. All right. I mean, he sort of moves, though. Definitely size of relief, I think, for Yatora. Any sort of focus and attention in ultimates that are being dropped elsewhere on the map, it's going to continue to mean that this yeah. Morphling is going to feel pretty safe uh, during this stage of the game. Absolutely. And he's constantly just turning into the Doom, eating a creep, getting that extra little bit of efficiency, too. And overall, looking at the way that LGD can take towers, definitely not the easiest this game. They kind of have to just brute force them, and they are playing into this train protector, this Kunkka, this massive team fight that Spirit has set up for the early game. Yeah, I think one of the reasons as well why that skill build has come out from Maposhka this game. He, he just knows. He's you know, not they're, they're not hitting the to. towers anyway, yeah. so he doesn't need to heal anything up right now. He can go full aggressive. Yep. He's probably going to be, I mean, maybe level 7, he does get that point in the living armor and then starts to build up on it from there. But yeah, so far, just all about aggressive. Aggressive plays. Now even looking to set up onto mid. Planet. Maybe see if we can catch the tour out. Bottom, Shiro. Oh my, collapse is solo. Oh my god. 
Wow, Shira was not ready for that one. I he mean, he just in walks in with his armlet reveal and indeed that just completely obliterates the Spectre. I mean, he has duelist gloves on top of the armlet. This is probably the best item that you can get to make these type of aggressive plays. I just deletes him. I mean, Team Spirit, they're quick with the moves. They're going to see if they can find something else up top as well. The silence comes out from Planet over was Lyle, but he's instantly able to remove the bug. Doom. He turns with the Doom, drops it down onto the Conker. Can they chase him out, though? He's going to be able to reset away. They're driving the Brambles caught on the way. You smile. The heels keep him alive. Nothing to say. Trying to close on Shisora, but the RP is still on cooldown for 20 seconds. He's got no further control. Shiro. In terms of what's chasing out Maposhka, but it's a hard hero to go for. They can't continue for this one. Shira backs out of there. Ooh. LGD not able to, to sort of get anything in return. But at the same time, they do stop Spirit from finding a kill themselves. Hey, that is a Doom, though, used to just walk away there. Laurel, he will just reset. Spirit, a nice lead for them with these last few moments. The CK is absolutely massive. Yeah, both him, you know, Collapse and Jotaro having a, a fantastic opening to this one. And I'm watching Bottom, he's got Phantasm back up right now. Quarter step as well, too. Shiro, you can't he's going to need, though. he needs somebody else to come down to help him. He can't be playing here by himself right now. I mean, he collapsed the solo, killed him once. There's no way that no way happens again. Alone. He's thinking about it, though. Scan will come out. Even checking with the scan. I think that was sort of collapse, seeing if there was any backup just in case Shiro stayed on the way. But Shiro does back up himself and gets caught by the scan. So I'm top with you. Root. Push in for this one. Caught him with the brambles and burst down by Yatoro. An easy kill found around the tier one tower. LGD, they're getting bullied away from this spot. Nothing to say. He's hit that timing. They need something big to happen with this blink dagger reveal on the Magnus. Hey, they're just getting so much out of the map. Yatoro's going to have Lincoln's pretty much done by the time this Doom comes back up for the next round. This is going to be a pretty safe morphling in these next few instances. Yeah, nothing to say. He's got the pressure cut out for him. Him and Planet probably have to link up and start looking for these plays to start slowing down this growth of these two enormous scaling cores on these side lanes from Spirit. And the tower, I mean, they're the ones who actually have ways to hit these towers quite easy on the side of Spirit in comparison. Yeah, Another one to likely to fall. Now 12 minutes in, taking these tier ones out, and LGD not able to answer it. Hey, that's huge. Like, just because the fact that they have these these two super strong scaling cores on the side, but also very strong scouting heroes, right? They have the tree protector. So when you get these early towers as tree, I'd imagine the Poshka, as we've seen most of the times, you get the shard as fast as you can, and then you just give this scouting information. You limit a lot of the aggression from something like LGD's draft. And nothing to say, he's shown himself mid, so they are completely aware that the Blink Dagger is done. All right, yeah, a bit of a, a loss of being able to abuse that surprise potential. And we'll, I mean, with that, and it's sort of regards that they are still going to smoke up, but as you say, Spirit, they should be pretty aware that and, this play's coming for them. And look how they're playing. Like, who are you? you're not going to get a big team fight. You might get one individual kill, but everybody's farming all over the place on the map. It here might just Spirit. be Maposhka. You know, Maposhka shows himself. He's happy to tank. There's nothing to say. He will jump him. As Jiro, he'll join as well, but it is just Maposhka on the tree, and they need they need something a whole lot more than this LGD. If they're not killing the cores, it's not feeling I, good. I think you stay down here, though. I nothing to say. He does find this kill, but now he can potentially look for a secondary one because he still has the RP available. Maybe they can catch Collapse off guard here, but I mean, they're just split up in farm. So I think Spirit, they have a pretty good read of what's going on in these next few moments. And Laurel, is he actually going to just be able to sneak himself over here for the Wisdom rune? Oh, and time, look at this, a stack. He could oh, stack look it at again that. if he wants to. Sure. I don't know if he wants to stay in this area for that long. He's probably expecting someone to rotate. Right, he's certainly going to get the Wisdom rune. Yep. So two Wisdom runes, the big ones at the 14-minute mark. Pretty big deal. Both of these cores getting it. And, you know, Toro just getting away with an absolute free Morphling game so far. Yeah, really no is. pressure onto him. I think there's sort of a, a lot of the times that we've seen this Morphling pick suffer is when it's been picked and the lane just hasn't been set up for success. But this game, the draft, it certainly seemed right for the way that they start things out with Yatoro's Morph. Here with the, the, the lane setup. He's had the free farm. There's not been any pressure from LGD upon him. They've just not been able to make any sort of move to hunt him down. Even with this blink dagger on nothing to say. So far, all it's achieved them is the kill on the treant. Other than that, they're not getting a lot done, LGD, and they're falling behind. And the fact that he gets this blink in so early, the only real thing to trip him up now early on is just the Magnus catching him with an RP before a shift, and they get him just blown up. Because he's going to be able to block the Phantom. He's going to be able to block the Doom. It's going to be very effective that he gets it so early on. LGD. Still need to try to get some catch on here for nothing to say, but they, slowing down the pace of the game is something that they ideally want. But Spirit, they're going to look to hit. They're feeling very strong here with Laurel. I mean, 
especially with Collapse too. I mean, the Echo Saber is finished up. Anybody he finds is just going to get evaporated. Oh, for sure, if they get an X mark set up, that's it's going to be a dead hero. LGD, they just they don't really have the tools to save one another right now. Oh, and look at this positioning here. They're going to walk right they in. Are, oh, Shiro, ooh, ooh, actually ooh, jumps fancy. across. Quite fancy here for Shiro. Allows him to sort of step back. He toys with the idea of going back in onto Lyle, but it's going to be why he smiled that falls. Can LGD afford to chase this? Shiro, and nothing to say. They're thinking about going for this one. You, he's headed over as well to help join the forces here to go for Lyle. They get the opening, they drop the RP, they'll kill Only Lyle. On one. Collapse looks to turn. He's caught by the Doom, but Collapse is still able to cut over the right click. Damage Fear on two. Him from mirror. Collapse trying to chase over with the right clicks, but he's falling low to the damage on the Doom. The deny's there, though. What? Koshka comes in with the deny onto Collapse. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> LGD just cannot catch a break. They get something at they least. Get something. They get the Kunka. They're able to at least force Collapse out of the game, but they don't get the bounty for it without Deny coming in in clutch and from Maposhka. It's, it's a lot of ultis committed as well, too, on their side of the map. Look at where they're positioned. Yotaro is just like, all right, everything is used. I have full freedom to reign across this top side. I guess, and I don't think Spirit's too fussed up with that one by any means. And this small thing becoming more and more of a problem. And they can go again. Spirit, 20 seconds until the boat's at the ready. Why? Oh my goodness. Shows himself for a quick second there. Has to be very careful. Laurel buys the shard as well too, right after he does come back up. So more and more spells built to get these catches. Tidal wave at the ready. I don't know if we've got any more smokes coming out from LGD. I mean, it feels like they've They've got to continue to just try and make some moves happen around this Magnus. There's this catch from nothing to say. They need ults, though. I mean, they just don't have the Doom or the RP right now. So, I mean, it feels like they need that, at least even just for the damage, or at least to stop the healing that's going to be coming in. A 5k lead for now for Spirit. The post gun, a full. Now he has a shard finished up very early. He bought the arcane, which I actually thought it was going to take him a little bit longer to get it. So, look at Spirit's position. Pretty huge. They're ready to fight around this tier two of LGD. Shiro has got to be careful. He's very fragile still at this moment. Not able to go down the route. I mean, he's got the Gloves of Haze, so maybe considering if he still has the potential to go for Midas, because usually that's the build that he's gone for every time on Shiro. When he does struggle a bit in these early games, it's usually been the Urn, right. Midas, and then Manta and stuff. But I mean, he's farming there. They're trying to Shiro. win his own, but they still can't really catch him. Going to be bottom and deep with the setup there. Shiro will pop the Blade Mail. Ooh, Both it's off the mark. Flying in. TPs are going to be there. Collapse. He'll just still commit fully in onto the Spectre, and Shiro's gone in immediately. As Mira, he'll die under the tower, but you see at this he'll stage just how quickly Spirit can kill this Spectre. Shiro still struggling to catch back up in this game. He collapses, just literally disintegrating him, and he's going to be going straight down the route, probably of that Silver Edge. So even more so ways to just yeah bring down the Spectre constantly. They are going to make a smoke move. I think they've got to do this ready. every time the ults are up. LGD, they need to look for action. And honestly, it feels like they might have to start looking for Yatoro. He's try. just having absolute freedom. See if they can catch him before he's able to shift. Look at Miposhka, look at the positioning to break these smokes. So hard for them to enter in onto this one. There's the jump, though, he gets, he gets the waveform off! Yutori's he's already away! The waveform was there, they may catch Miposhka, but they again fail to catch the cause. Yutori, he just smoothly walks out of there. What the heck? <laughs> that was absolutely instant. I mean, and now, catch on the Witch Doctor. Gonna be able to get the away to pull back while you smile. Yutori, he jumps back in to pick up the kill himself. Spirit continuing to hold the lead. Lal, he's still got the X mark. Gonna be able to get the setup over with you. They'll throw out the front end to best to try and interrupt it. Over into the mid lane, collapse. He's toying around with Shiro. Shiro, he's got to back away from the CK. Back up top. The silence that came out from Planet was enough to disrupt the combo and allow you to step back away from Lal. Too scared to commit into. Laurel still has the boat available, so yeah, they can't actually take advantage of any type of soulbind play. And yeah, look, I mean, Collapse, he really is just hunting down and ruining Shiro's any, any attempt for him to kind of recover in this game. Keeps finding him. Shiro, though, slowly recovering, but quite slowly. He is what, almost 4,000 gold behind Yotoro right now at this moment. Yotoro's going to have Manta. He's going to be ready to fight constantly. Shiro's going to need way more time, and Collapse is not really getting Oh, he's it. on the Look un Collapse. I mean, Shiro's pretty low right now, half HP. Phantasm in three. TP's are coming buddies. in, though. A lot of backups coming in. They want to try and look for Collapse. If they can get the kill here, it'll be pretty tasty. They get the jump. They'll be able to punish Collapse this time round. As Collapse will fall, Shiro to get the kill. Great warrants placed down around bottom here. The Ob's in the sentry. Catches him for a split second. Instant TP's come out. Good protection. This time they get Shiro. A nice needed kill. Poshka playing in unbelievably aggressive. A super early base ward actually I'm being placed. Giving so much information yeah. as well here for the team. That's really cool. Keeping eyes on LGD beyond their tier twos. I mean, look at all three of these wards. All three lanes are actually perfectly watched here from the side of Spirit now. 
10 seconds or so until the overgrowth's back up. They could look to get aggressive under the tier two, even without collapse. Uh, he's thinking about it. That's both Yatora and Mira in the neighborhood. Yatora, he starts to back off. Doesn't look like they want to try and force it. Yatora, I mean, he's more than happy to just keep hitting sure. troops right now. He's not under any sort of pressure. He's happy to just find his farm. He's got the Lincolns. He's got the Manta. Even if they do get a catch on him, it's highly likely that this morph will be able to slip away every single time. That's LGD, a good play. This is really nice. Catch Lala in the jungle. They're in with the aggressive shadow step, and nothing you say takes him down. I mean, that was so much patience. I think Planet was waiting there for, what, like 20, 30 plus seconds or something, waiting for a teammate to join him. Do get that catch off. Now he's there two, two big moves. Killing Very off Collapse, moves. killing off Lala. This is exactly what LGD have been looking for. And but it's... for sort of the entirety of this game, beyond the opening laning stage, Ooh. they're starting to find these core kills. Niposhka, though, now he is getting the scout on Shiro. They've got the backup. Yatora, he's coming over. Whoop. It's the opening. There's any way for Shiro to play his way out of this. There's the overgrowth into the brown ball. Jump ball for Yatoro. The burst is enough. Shiro's out. Yatoro getting the kill to up to almost level 16 on this Morphling. Shiro only level 12. A top lane top collapse. Two collapse. Gonna get the grab on nothing to say. The adaptive strike's coming out. Nothing to say. Pop by Yatoro. From the bottom to the top, Yatoro picks up two core kills. <laughs> a, a usual carry involvement right there. One button to get the kill. And now bottom. Looks like they should strike back at least on Tamira, but these. How many support deaths is that? I feel like it's just the supports dying on the side of Spirit. The cores keep getting away with so much. I mean, Yatora just continuing to, to steam ahead and farm here. So massive. 3-0-1, they're yet to be able to touch him. He's got 2,600 oh. gold in the bank on top of the Manta and the Lincolns. Oh, and this is kind of cool here. He's actually got the Aghanims queued up here on Collapse. Definitely has merit this game when he's playing with the Morphling. That could be a really cool item, item choice here from that offlane. Now, what's the plan now from LGD? They'll have nothing to say back up in a few seconds. Ultimates are at the ready. See if they can head out and look to make a jump themselves. It's difficult, at, at least for the next few moments, to get these lanes out in a good position to go for it, though, because they're just spotted by everything, right? The ward that was placed top from earlier, the ward that Mposhka placed in the base, it sees nothing to say walking out. That ward that they've placed also down bottom, it's giving so much information for them to prepare for the next movements. As looks like it will be a Tormentor on the menu here for Yotoro. Here's the spot. Exactly what we need to be seeing from LGD. Can they find anything down here? Oh, Yatora actually gets the Tormentor. All right, well, <laughs> blessed. They did buy quite a bit of them this time around. And it's hard for them to go from this sort of angle. The tier one still stands on this bottom lane. Not easy for LGD to get around this. Hey, look, Toro, he's playing very far. But he's got the Shadow Blade. They lay down a stage. Shoot off the side of it. The jump of the Lincolns is there. He's able to fade away from the initial attempt from LGD, but still there's the RP. Not that they drags him back towards the rest of the team there. They've got Toro it. down. Team is coming up with Spirit. And the final pretty much the fallback tidal wave there. Pulling them back. The fear fall up as well. Straight down onto nothing to say. The Magnus will fall. Here comes Collapse. He drags back Shira. They fully focused the Spectres, the top fell out there for Raw. Double kill for Collapse. A Spirit, they'll lose your Toro, but they make up the pay. They'll find the third. Triple kill for Collapse. Give it the fourth. Four. They chase out Planet. Ultra kill in. 23 minutes in for Collapse on the CK. <laughs> He's a move over, Yotoro. I'm the real carry. Uh, Yotoro pushing the, pushing the limits there on the morph. Incredibly low HP, but the four-man tidal wave coming I in really from Laurel. I really want to laugh. Woo -hoo -hoo. Dragging them back underneath the tier one. I mean, it looked like such a, a decent start right for LGD. They get the sentry laid down. They see Yotoro step into it. I mean, how can you not go for that sort of play? They go for that every single time, LGD. But Spirit, they come in with the immediate TP responses, and suddenly LGD are paying big time for getting that chance to take Yotoro down. I mean, it's all important that Laurel's the first one to get the TP off because he gets this humongous connection. He gets one. It's a four-man tidal wave under everything there so that Miposhka can get the follow-up. A right, beautiful play there. And yeah, Collapse able to clean up and now also clean up the Roche. They'll give that one to Yotoro. Almost got a rampage on the main stage. Yeah, Very close 23 there. minutes as well. Collapse, yeah, just getting a huge influx of gold and XP on top of what he already had. And as you say, it very much feels like it's just sort of collapse. And Yatori just trying to outperform one another, trying it to does feel the like bigger it. carry as this game here for Spirit. And yeah, Collapse after that, he's like, I was going to get you an egg and nah, my friend. No, 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 himself. No. I'm going the Orchid route, which makes oh, it's a very good choice if he wants to go down at this game. 11k lead now off Pretty the back of that one. one. Yep. Four and a half minutes to play with, with Yatori having the Aegis. I mean, they, they, they were able to take him down that once, but getting him now in his next four minutes, 
I mean, LGD, they, they again have to wait for their cooldowns. They're back up now. They have the RP, the Shadow Step, and the Doom. Have to watch out, though, because also now they're getting close and closer to BKBs on the side of LGD, so maybe feeling like they want to just wait for those before the next go. But the gold lead just continues to increase for Spirit. And it's so hard for them to sort of set up to make these sort of plays with just how much information Maposhka's getting yep. for the team. That's what, like, these early tier ones, I think it's really important that Spirit, they claimed all those early tier ones, and Maposhka, he's just been giving literally all the and information. And he's just messing around with them. Another one. Up on another to say the ball with the side, nothing to well. Skew up into the RP, they've locked down Collapse. The Fizz gonna be flying from air, pushes back Shiro. So Collapse is gonna get the chance to survive a little oh. longer, but he will still fall. They bring the CK down. LGD, can they chase for more? The Doom got thrown down onto Lyle. Lyle keeping his distance, New trying to charge forwards, but they're off to the side. Maposhi continues to hide in the trees. They catch him under the vision though. Shiro just so with the shadow step. LGD, they'll get a second on the defense. Nice place. Can they catch more? New trying to reset away. Your Toro's on him. Oh, he's looking to go back in with the burst. They turn around with the Infernal Blade, but the Tidal Wave comes in and tears New out of the server. Spirit. And they lose a couple, but they're still, again, able to sort of keep these trades at the least even. LGD still yet to sort of find an opportunity to, to start to close down this, this incredible lead that Spirit have just 26 minutes in. At least they got something out of it, though. Good positioning something. there from Planet. Gets that instant dis dispel, of course, at the Inkswell. But now, a couple more heroes might die. Yatoro, look at this positioning. Uh, he's under the tier two. He's, got, he's the back. He jumps back while you smile. I mean, why you smile? I'm trying to walk this one off, but it's going to come to an end, and so is this life protected the Voodoo Switcheroo. We'll make Yatora work a little bit harder to get the kill, but he will still find it. Another kill to be found by Yatora under the tier two, and nothing that LGD can do that time to punish him. He knows he can push the limits. Every single ult being used there. Looks like he's actually going to even hit the tier two top a little bit here. I mean, he's got this Aegis for two and a half minutes still. He brings it down unbelievably fast, too, because he just yeah, threw the Empower onto himself from that Magnus form, so pretty much effectively a double damage onto him. Tier 2 to drop. More and more map control, more and more space for Maposhka to do his shenanigans of his train protector. How's the itemization for Shiro doing? He's got the man Manta at the least finished, so he does have a protective form now for himself, a dispel versus his train protector versus Willow at the least. But still unbelievably far behind his counterpart. Almost, he's getting kind of close to double the net worth of this Spectre. And the Magnus, too, started to fall further and further behind. The farm that Spirit's been able to get on this map is absolutely ridiculous so far. Now BKB finished on you, so at least a bit of a okay. better chance for him to get in and have a bit more luxury at taking his time to find the correct Doom target. Yep, and they are getting closer and closer to Planet having an Agonis, which was one of those big things that almost allowed them to turn that last game. Oh, it did. He pulled off some fantastic stuff with the Dark Portrait last time round, and once again against the Morphling, definitely opportunities to do something similar. Even against the CK, if he gets both, right, that's going to be pretty absurd. Spirit, ready to strike right now. You might strong. not expect this wraparound, though, from LGD. LGD coming in from the, the, the jungle. Spirit there on the other side of the tier two. Yatora will start to show. But still, he is the target that has an Aegis for a minute. They need to find Laurel. See if anyone walks up to the high ground. LGD. The tower just drops too fast. They can't even set up to go for this defense. Now, let's hope with the tier two gone, they're sort of backing off of this. But they're going to have to I mean, they're hitting Spirit, the they're pushing three. the high ground. Glyph forced. They're LGD. looking for the wraparound. They, they're going to have to make the call soon. Pressure on nothing to say, ready to find the RP. I, he just wait for me. Yeah. They're heading over towards they to He's able to start things off by pushing towards nothing to say. Over to the side, Collapse. He's getting focused by New. They'll jump forward, try and take down the CK. Collapse being focused by Sharon New. They brought him down. They're going to collapse. Soulmind into the dude down over the two of them from New. But the Torres still comes down, controlling Shira. Shira across Shira. He'll fall. They'll drop the RP here, but is there the fall of damage? There it it's is. It's a nice oh, cast. Fire. Close. And but here's your Toro. As he's looking at it, go low. Slow, but not quite enough to kill him straight up. Dude, just back in a photo play takes him out, but they couldn't deal with Yatoro a second time round. As Yatoro gets a decent clean up for inside. Overall, though, it's four dead on spirit. LGD definitely able to give them quite the shake up in that fight. I look at the witch doctor, David. Yeah, look at it go. Gets a beautiful connection onto the two of them there, but the Aegis, I think it had what, like 20, 30 seconds left or something as it was expiring. Great usage there from Yatoro. Yeah, solid fight overall, but still the, the threat of this Morphling grows. 24k on Yatoro right, right now. Look at him just charge. I mean, the, right the, the, in. the fact that he finds nothing to say at the start there definitely makes things a bit more awkward for the jump that nothing to say wants to get away with. Collapse just charges in, sort of tanks the immediate focus of LGD. It's a great soulbind double doom but not able to control Yatoro. They get a lot from it. 
Honestly, the buyback kind of salvages everything there, right, for LGD. If they didn't have this Witch Doctor buyback, it's probably just a rampage that comes out for this Morphling at the end of the day. Absolutely. They miss out on those two last cleanup kills that they do get LGD without why you Small coming in to do that. So. Oh, look at Yutoro. Look at the positioning. Hey, look how aggressive he's playing, pushing the limits. Right, Silver Edge Man to Lincoln's BKB. This morph insanely farmed for the 30 minute mark. And he finds probably the most dream neutral item he could have in this game. He gets a Titan Sliver, of course. Incredible versus that Magnus. Status resist is always going to be godly, but also just the base attack damage as a Morphling is the best thing you want. I think it's, you know, after that last play, maybe time why your smile starts to build for himself. He, Get an he, he was queuing up the Blink <laughs> Dagger first, but now he's going back for the on disc. Yeah, he can't go for the... He still just dies way too quickly in these fights. If he's just... Yeah. He needs positioning, needs extra survivability. Yatoro, I mean, positioning. Again, uh, they're getting these Wisdom Runes as well. Wisdom Rune was still there for Yatoro to step up and grab. I feel like they've gotten almost... They got a lot. They've gotten the vast majority of them this game. Eagle Song now, too. Just the speed that he's getting these items is just absurd on this Morphling. Like I said, almost double the net worth of the Spectre. Ideally, the Spectre timing, when you want to play versus Morphling, is getting that, that Scotty in particular at a good timing. It's so slowed down for Shiro. And he's also, of course, it's not just the Morphling he has to deal with, right? It's this CK who's also still getting this explosive farm. And Collapse, he does go for the BKB. I was wondering if he was, because he's gotten pretty aggressive without having it. Now he will go for the Disassemble. LGD, all ultimates to the ready once again. We'll see if they want to try and step out and get aggressive. They tried for that last time round in towards the Aegis on your tour. Of course, there's no Aegis to worry about as of now. Yeah, let's see if they can always get these Lincoln's Breaks in particular. Get the Lincoln's Break, get this Dark Portrait, get the Doom. Ideally, they want to be able to get all that onto this Morphling. Doesn't look like they have any smokes on them at the moment, so not easy for them to make a move. They can just Definitely look not. to try and hold things around this bottom area of the map. Stay together as five. They don't want to get caught out alone. They only really have this one war down on bottom. They have the one up top too, but this is the one that they have to control this area, and they are playing into a jam right now of Maposhka, or he had the jam a few moments ago. I guess he passed, okay, passed it off to Mira. Now, ideally, maybe just waiting for Shiro to get his next item done before they force something, or at least try for a play that the Spectre's going to have to get involved in. There's what, about 4,000 gold coming up to that he's yet to invest in his next item. Yeah, they keep just putting down this ob sentry combo, just be able to scout out the poster, scout out the CK, or looking to get this constant setup. But they're having to spend a lot of time together. The only reason that the gold lead isn't growing that much further is honestly because the Doom has a Midas and this Octarine, so it's keeping it that consistent 13k. But Spirit overall, they're farming way more of the map. Morphling, CK, the, this Kanka overall, always split up from each other. And they're all itemizing, or most of them are itemizing for the Lincolns, right? Another Lincolns, of course, finished up for Laurel, too, so more and more ways to block. They'll find the Posca here. Oh, and he just actually got the gem back to pass back over. This is a big kill. See if Spirit can do anything to help out. They can't. Mira throws out the brambles from the side, but as he, the gem hits they the deck, it. and Shiro, he's able to grab that hit for LGD. They were passing it back and forth between the two of each other, Mira and Maposhka there. Pretty big pickup there for LGD to reestablish some control. It's all right. So they want to get their around. gem back. Nice well. A little bit more breathing room here for LGD with that gem. Switching into their hands. Breathing room to potentially finish up that Scotty. Yep. It is getting close. pretty close now for Shiro. Uh, recovering. Aeon disc done for why you smile. Some more chance that he's going to be able to get his full toolkit off in the midst of the team fight, even if he does get focused. Yeah, essentially has three different ways to protect himself now. LGD stabilizing things a little bit here. Still, the, the, it's just this imminent threat of the morph continues to grow. Yatoro nearly hitting level 24. He's very close to having his next item done. Scotty, of course, though, is going to be... Uh, it's going to be a pretty big timing versus these cores. Yatoro joining his buddy's bottom. Hasn't quite decided if he does want to finish up the Eagle Song. Maybe he's going for like a little bit of bait play. I mean, he hasn't shown if he does want to actually go for the Blink Dagger just yet. I got eyes on why you smile. And now with the Glimmer, but they get the dust into the Yule setup. They're looking to focus the Witch Doctor first for the Adaptive Strike. But they're going to with the Voodoo Switcher. But they bait it. They're dropping the Torrent. They're going to be able to put oh. it to the side here. Wait, that was weird. Was that the Tidal Wave? The Tidal Wave pushed him the wrong way. What <laughs> <laughs> the hell happened there? It was right on the cusp. Anyway, they're still catching him in the Torrent Storm, but it's, it's right on the tip of the team fight. Yeah, collapse, he wants to charge him with the stun, but the Eon Disc, it's there. We'll they get Proc. 
not able to get the full control there on to this Witch Doctor. I mean, honestly, he might be pretty lucky right there that the tidal wave. I think it's like right when you catch them on the tip of it, it does it push them the wrong the way. way yeah. Yeah. So he gets, honestly, a bit lucky there. Because that's a gem. It's a pretty big kill. That's true. They, they grab him in. He's, he's dead for sure, and he's dropping a gem. The smoke comes out from LGD. They want Ooh. to try and go again, especially Rocious. knowing that the Torrent Storm's on cooldown. Rose is swapping. All right, well, it's going to be coming back up, right? So six seconds, they're setting themselves up top. Do they want to go for the twin gate? Uh, oh, it's risky. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They don't want to approach through that angle. No, you have to go the different angle. So They've got to they have straight down the top lane if they want to try and fight around this Roshan. Does Spirit have a ward to place up here at the moment? Checking the courier. They do. They have a ward coming out on the Dark Willow, but right now, no ward placed outside of the pit. LGD. They make their way to sneak in right now. Roshan's going to start. You. Ops placed. They see new. Smoke Mira. Spelled. Mira. Got the scout right away. But the Yule's quickly set up with a cursed crown. They'll hold back the Doom. Collapse is trying to wrap around towards the back lines of the fight potentially, but he's careful. Notice they have detection upon him. I mean, they're killing the Roche while they're scouting with the Phantasm. They're sending it all in. This Roche is dying. They've got to make a move soon, LGD, if they want to put a stop to this. The dark portrait of the CKP sent in to try and scout things out. Nothing sick gets pulled over the Harpoon on the collapse. Collapse puts the BKB, they drop the RP. They've got Shiro on top of them with the Mantra Illusions there. And they pair through the CK, they bring him down. But Yatoro Doom. gets the Aegis new, jumps over towards him, has the silence here from the Doom to open things up. Instead of the dagger as well in from Shiro, the Torrent goes there. Mira lays down the fear to hold back the Spectre for now. New fall, Spirit, they get the chance to kill off the Doom and maybe even look for more. All right, Mira's doing so much work in this fight. The control, he just completely blocked off New from having any allies to join him. He just completely controlled that Spectre there. Doom used, but doesn't matter. Yotoro resets. He's going to come right back into the fray. Collapse. He gives his life for the cause. And it's absolutely worth it. Super they couldn't worth it. even take down Yotoro to once. He still holds that Aegis intact. And the cheese as well, too. Still has it at the ready. Nice play. Honestly, Mira, that was a really nice play of how he gets the op toward out the center and immediately just kind of controls things, stalls out so they can finish off that Rojan. Swift Blink finished up now for Yotoro. I so close to 25. I mean, a, a real treat, especially for all the Morphling fans out there after seeing so many times this hero just fall flat on its face. This game, Yotoro showing it to its full potential. Even getting very involved too. It's not like some like zero, you know, zero kill involvement. He's got eight kills on this Morphling. In terms of timing, so LGD. 40 seconds until the RP. Uh, Spirit, they could definitely look to push with this Aegis, get a tier two, maybe even start to consider pushing for the high ground with the, with the lead that they have right now. I mean, Yatoro, 10k net worth ahead of anyone else in the game. He's just been able to keep that consistent this entire time with the pressure that, I mean, kind of, like, Collapse kind of took those reins of having that top net worth, then he sacrificed himself a couple of times, and it's worked out. Tier two to fall. More and more openings for the map. No towers yet have fallen on the side of Spirit. And that's without even, I don't even think I've seen Maposhka throw any living armors onto them. He just hasn't had to. I'm gonna say. Talking about Maposhka, he's got eyes on him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, 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 oh. Jeez, that was close. Should be fine now. TP out from the corner of the map. He'll get whoa, back whoa, whoa. Place. The Bramble catches him. Oh, it does, they've scored him. He's got BKB, he but no TP. Oh, Fear won't connect. I mean, he can beat KP and run around for a little bit, but I don't think there's any way out of this one. As the whole of Spirit's pretty much closing in upon him. Yatora, he wants to take the kill for himself, and he'll get it. That's the gem hitting the deck as well. The scouting of Maposhka, these two support. I cannot believe that Bramble connects. Now collapse mid. He's starting to start things off over the wall. New, new has to be KP TP out. He's terrified. The HP Hex. comes in. It's the time. It's time. It's time. It's going to be there. He's, He's got him. him. Back. They pull him out, but the blink was there. They weren't able to follow up with any damage to stop the blinks. And new still having a chance of escaping. The tidal wave won't clip him. He'll get out, but it was close. I think Laurel maybe doubted that he actually got the timing perfectly there, but he did. New able to get away. Pressure everywhere, though. Look at Yotoro, even. I mean, all the lanes are getting pressured here from Spirit. I mean, and they've still got the two minutes of this Aegis. They can go for so much more here, Spirit. 30 seconds, no nothing to say. He has buyback, but he'll really not want to use it in this situation. They want to force as much as they can while that mag is down. Glyph gets popped. And when they have got everybody up, the high ground defense, it is strong it is from LGD. Absolutely. It's all right. So they can take him out, the watch, Kask is out, Yatori is falling low, now he's getting out of the way for me, so he's dropping the They get the stun control under the spectre, the damage coming in from what? there, Shiro's out of the fight! See if they can turn for more, they look to white, you smile, he's got the Voodoo switcheroo. Yatori slides past, pops the lead for the Eon disc here, on and you smile, and still doesn't fall even the once, keeping this Aegis fine, they chop him up with the cheese, Yatori's still good to go for more, nothing to say, he'll get a grab on a Maposhka, gets him in with a pull of the Harpoon and the Skewer, and Maposhka though, uh, he's still alive, he's still surviving! They're 
show nil to Yatora. Yatora got the BKB off. He's perfectly fine. He just he jumps in. Jumps he in, wants the skewer. He's trying to the skewer. You has to pop the BKB to make sure he isn't dragged out of his base. <laughs> I didn't see, like, it, did he actually get the Silver Age break hit on the Spectre? Because he died he so fast. I, I think he did. It looked like he did. Now Rax Back on the The push so continues. Fast. Spirit getting so much done here with his Aegis on Yatora. A full set taken on the bottom lane. And he's just using that Magnus. Look at just the Empower itself. Look at the damage that he has. He's thrown to the, throw the Solar Crest as well, too. He effectively has that DD. Look how quick these towers are. I mean, are and out. they don't want to use these buybacks. Sure, he's back up in 15. But it's costing them so much. The next few items coming out. Hex now done on Yatora. That's a cool item choice. Another Thanks. tower to fall on. Yeah, they'll back away. They got so much out of that push right there. I mean, that's the 20 more seconds. The one sort of play that can maybe catch them out, the sort of blink out and skewer in that nothing to say is going to try and do, that's completely put to a stop by the potential that your Tora has to turn with this Hex pickup. Yeah. He just, all he's got to do is precast the Hex on the Mangas if they get that high ground vision, and suddenly the game can be over in an instant. He's, he has to just use the BKB pretty much every single it's time he him. goes for it. I mean, that's the case also when you're playing versus the Yule Scepter a lot of the times with these Magnuses, but yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. Huge opening. I mean, even bigger now. And you spending up as well with that refresher purchase. Laurel also full Octarine is finished up to a shield rune. My spirit, they're definitely very, very, very keen to fight. Collapse full Aghanim is now done. Also another layer that they're gonna have to go through to try to take out this Morphling. We'll see how chill they're playing. Do they want to try and push again or do, do you think they take the relaxation status and go for the next Aegis? I think they're, they're still, up. I'd imagine they're still pretty keen to fight. They're so okay. strong right now. And these Phantasms kind of constantly keep these waves shoved in. They already have the lanes in good position too, so it does feel like they are definitely ready to look for going for this closeout, especially when Magnus does not have the RP just yet. Coming back up in five seconds though. Boy, you're smart. Definitely going for the dream here. 200 he in on the Aghanims. I think they need every little thing they can get right now. Doesn't feel like Shiro is going to be enough by any means versus these triple yeah, spelling cores. Why? And he's going to find him. Oh, and that's he just brought the gem, I think, right back out to himself as they went on him. We do switch to try and make things a little bit more awkward. Uh, the Eon disc is popped. They've got the X mark. Why you smile? He's trying to get back to base. Actually, yeah, it's going to be dispelled off him. So why you smile? Will still be able to walk off. BKB point for Yatori. Actually, uses it aggressively to try and get the kill on some planet, but planet was able to TP out. That's okay. The BKB charge down the drain for Yatori. LGD cool. survived. Nobody to get caught. They all get out of there. A nice attempt from Arl. He actually tried to use the X Torrent instantly because the Aeon just status resistant kind of thing comes out there, but wasn't able to get the connection. That was actually fun. Why literally had just brought the gem out onto himself, like almost dies the instant he gets it. Are they going to try and get back out on this LGD? Maybe see if they can hit back at Steam Spirit. Okay. Definitely difficult, but maybe trying to catch them off guard here. See Laurel here. They want to jump the Kunker. They're going to try. But the Lincolns. The Fizz going to be there. But New Plus the BKB. They drop the Doom. Shiro jumps across. They're going to go fully in on towards Laurel. He's still pretty tanky. Can they finish him off? Collapse. He'll turn with the Grab Arrow to New as the Doom gets blown up by Yatora. Shiro, he looks to finish off Laurel. Takes him, it so But it's going to cost him his life. Yatora and Collapse clean up Shiro as well. As Shiro and New, they're out of the game. 70 seconds without them. And now and this he just dies to the illusion. All right. <laughs> That was the Phantasm it illusion. Was. <laughs> and Laurel, I mean, it takes them too long to bring him. He got the boat off before the Doom comes out. He's able to actually protect himself. It takes forever for them to kill him, and now 60 seconds. That's more than enough time for Yotoro. A lot of damage to be done here. Maybe even the, the game if they want to try and force it. There's a jump forward. They get the RP. They get the drag back. Have to the damage to bring him down. They're fully focusing on the one the morning, but Yotoro's out to put the round. The effect is getting aggressive. He jumps in with the egg. Looks out of one planet. Look right at him there. go. Bring that planet. He plays full. He's ready to the wall, the skewer! He's into the fountain, the Phantasm's there! Nothing to say, will fall, collapsing your tower, they walk out alive! Oh and they just God. can't kill him, even in the fountain! Oh, whoopsie! Okay, he's actually <laughs> dived out. Where was the arm that toggles hold out? I don't know, he didn't need to. He didn't need he's to. He's ready to ride this one out. He knows there's four dead on LGD. They're feeling great right now about the Cell Spirit. They go towards the top set of racks. Ah, uh, Yatoro, I... <laughs> what, what, what other player would wave for me in aggressively right there? Just so confident. 15 seconds, no Spectre. Will back up. But massive damage done. Two buybacks forced. Can't even kill that many heroes inside the fountain. That's crazy. 30k lead here now for Team Spirit. 12, 1, and 7. Yatoro, impeccable performance from this Morphling. Um, well, what do you do? Is this, even if these fountain skewers aren't cutting it, what is going to cut it at this point? Good question. Back it up, wait for their CK to respawn. I mean, they can go for the rush, 30 seconds or so. We'll see that one back up. Poor little career. 
floating in the air. Comes with a buyback as well. The dream of the Aghanims, which Doctor has put on hold for quite some time oh. for why you smile. I mean, they need to get some type of enormous double doom plus another doom. I, either like a double doom on two heroes and then maybe even the, the, third, the third doom being thrown out onto the Arl. But they have to catch this Kunkka. They have to just, I mean, they have to stop so many different things. The layers of these fights are getting more and more complicated for LGD. Lacking damage, lacking control, lacking everything it feels like versus Spirit. That's your Toro. Now just playing so confident. The swift blink that he's been doing has been, I mean, pretty cool. These little plays with the waveform. I've got the Shadow Blade pick up on nothing to say. So maybe yeah. something that, that will give him that extra chance of closing in and getting the jump by surprise on towards Spirit. But Spirit have been pretty good with the vision. And he still only has one round of everything too. It's not like he has a refresher. It does feel like they need so many different layers of these fights. Oh, they're thinking about taking this fight up towards the pit here, LGD. Spirit. Looks pretty prepared for this mirror. Just scouting things out aggressively, stepping up with the Shadow Realm. The space is being made. Yatora. She dies fast. Cleaning up the Roshan. I see whether the Shadow Step is able to just over towards the, the illusions. They're not finding anything with that one. They're just having to deal with the pressure of the creeps pushing in. So all the space in the world given for the Spirit to clean up this Roshan, get themselves another round of the Aegis onto and, Yatora. And a refresher shard for Laurel. Chaos in the fights even more so. Oh, whoa. Planet. Pretty deep position. Okay, we'll be able to blink himself away. The final Rax. Spirit looking to close it out. Yotaro buying up the full Moon Shard. How do they mount this defense? Now, it looks like they're going to try some type of very risky play, yeah, they've but it got feels it. like they absolutely have to try this. They can't sit back. If they sit back, they're losing the base. They can't let Spirit be perfectly set up for the high ground siege. They have to catch them somehow. I've got another layer to add to everything. Mira with another Lincoln. So many Lincolns. Good luck getting these double dooms off. They're heading out. Oh. It's all right. Ready to play aggressive with the X mark. As you can think, the Hex is well. Oh, Shiro. He's, he's pretty much gone. He puts he's the just dead. And the same as Shiro's out of the game. He'll buy back immediately. He just solo kills him. New. It's caught by the Brown with the Fizz coming in as well. Down onto the two of them. Pushing back. Shiro. Back why you spot Shiro? Trying to jump it over to Woodman Posh. He's alone. Oh, he's got it with the tire. The boat goes crashing down onto one. Shiro. Your tour is able to take him down a second time. Shiro out of the game for good. There's nothing to say. Caught by Collapse. Both dead. No buyback. Spirit. They've got everybody up. They're ready to look for more kills. Deep up towards the fountain. Your tour kills off G another. GG is called. Team Spirit that we're moving on towards the grand finals, knocking LGD down two to zero. In such a fashion, this game too. Last game it took them what, oh, like 80 something, whatever minutes. This game, absolute domination from start to finish. Every single player just having impeccable performance. Yatoro in particular, I think so. 14, one and eight on a hero that had lost several days ago. It across. really has. You know, Yatoro not afraid to pick up this Morphling that, if anything, has seemed a bit cursed for a lot of the other teams that try to bring it out here at this international. Uh, he goes to show that there, there's nothing wrong with a hero. He makes it work and phenomenally. 14, 1 and 8 at the end of this game. 42,000 net worth uh, and a hell of a lot of damage done as well. The highest hero damage on his team, 43,000. I mean, well, what a performance, what a series. I mean, they're coming into day team spirit and doing this two times against Del GD, who, as we saw, especially in that first game, were bringing out an insane level of Dota 2, but not insane enough to be able to tackle team spirit. Team spirit, they're even that further ahead. That further ahead and overall looking at things like looking at the building damage, something Something we talked about early on in this game, LGD did 29 building damage this game. They could not get to these objectives. The lane domination from Spirit. Yeah, just too damn strong today. Yeah, some crazy, crazy Dota 2 coming out from this series. And Team Spirit, they're the ones that will come out on top today as they move towards the Grand Finals. Team Spirit take this series 2-0 against LGD. Utter dominance from Team Spirit, and they will be your ultimate raid boss. They will be a Grand Finals here in Seattle in the Climate Pledge Arena in front of a massive crowd. And of course, last time they were in a Grand Finals, there was no one apart from a couple of talents here and there, sure. But no one in the crowd. COVID sucks. But this time around, they get it. They get the Grand Finals. I can't wait to see who gets the honor to go up against them. I know that will be quite the battle. But let's talk about how they got here. I'm joined by Fear, Lacoste, and Tigov. Lacoste, this game, we did not expect it to be that dominant, did we? Definitely not. But the uh, team's first we did expect them to go and run at them completely with the draft that they had, and that's exactly what happened. First game was close. This one was not as close. They did not give them any breathing time. Constant pressure.
Ravager coming out from Team Spirit. Double Shadow Blade from both safe lane and the off lane. Very aggressive item build coming out from both of them. And they were just hunting them down. Also, Miposhka providing vision with the Truant Protector as expected. And they were just picking people left and right. I, mean, I just gotta say, like, I feel like the CK for Team Spirit, right? The fact they could flex it to offlane, like this Spectre pick, we, we heard in interviews as well, like, Spectre, it feels like the casual hero that you can just pick in the draft. You don't really care too much because you know the game's still gonna be the same. But when there's a CK in your lane, battering you down with a willow on top, like, he just had a free time. And then he just itemized beautifully, like you were mentioning, Lacoste, and the entire game just felt like, who's gonna get picked off next? Where's that next move coming? Maposhka on the tree. It was just such a high paced game. And for LGD, sure, they've got all the scaling, all the fight, but they never were really able to dictate this game. Yeah, I think the one thing we haven't mentioned yet, the big one is Yatoron is Morphling. Like, he played so well on this game, and even all the way up to the itemization. Like, towards the end of the game, he, of course, you're against the Spectre, so you get the Silver Edge, but he bought a Scythe of Ice on Morph. He was just so confident that he was just initiating the fights, instantly killing the enemy carry everywhere on the map. He's playing versus Doom, too. This is supposed to counter your hero. I remember there was one fight, he turned into a Doom, ended up getting Doom, and he just right-clicked the Doom as the Doom, and ended up <laughs> winning that man fight as well. Like, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen, but he played an amazing morph. I really like the Hex pickup he got at the end to just initiate for his team. I also will say two games in a row, we saw Laro on his most comfort hero in the Kuka. How did he get away with that every time, T? It's like you're banning out like all these big impactful heroes and suddenly it slips through. Like it is a product of the new system, right? Like in the second phase, one team gets one ban, one team gets two bans. Like can you really get the Kunker into that when you're respecting so many other factors? And for Team Spirit, this Kunker, it was a first phase ban against them time and time again. Like this hero, it's so easy for them. And you guys, you just keep going, don't you? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they're saying. <laughs> Oh, it was a, uh, a great battle and a great battle team spirit punching their ticket to the grand finals and here to talk about it with probably a big smile on their faces, it's Slack standing by with Silent. Hello everybody, may I introduce you to Silent, the coach of the first team in your grand finals, baby! Give it up for him one more time! <laughs> ah. Used to hearing that, right? Hmm? Are you used to hearing that? The roar of the crowd? Yes. The excitement of the people? Yeah, I'm enjoying moment, just. <laughs> All right, must have had some uh, very deja vu feelings, huh? Uh, pretty similar to, you know, that big game back in the day. Uh, two wins first. Do you think uh, LGD would have won game three if there was one? Uh, maybe, everything possible. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Now let's talk a little bit about that first series. I mean, Magnus, come on. You picking that against LGD? Was that on purpose? You trying to relive some uh, PTSD from our boys over on LGD? Uh, Magnus is a good hero. Uh, we think we also can play him, so we at some point steal it from them. Second win, we tried to do the same. We tried to steal it, but we was prepared, so game was not that hard. I see, I see. They pick uh, Magnus game two, so you just pick Morphling and then you steal it back, right? That's how, uh, that's the way? Yeah, that, that, that was the plan. Oh, okay, now, very good. Now, y y uh, Yatoro, you know, uh, he back in the day said that you guys were content creators, you know, making some content, you guys have fantastic content. You didn't let him take a single tower. That's not good content, my friend. That's bad content. You can't even let him take one tower in that series? Um, the game was uh, in our advantage from the start, and we have Trend Protector, and, uh, and also their lineup is very bad to take towers, in my opinion. Doom, Magnus, Spectre, it's very uh, turtle heroes. You, you can play aggressive, for, in my opinion. All right, now, we've been very calm. You're a very calculated man, so I would like to ask you the lame question, but as one of the smartest men in the building, who do you think is going to be joining you in the grand finals? What's the thought? Uh, I'm not sure from these three teams. Gladiators looks like uh, in a good shape right now. LTD also very hard to beat team. Uh, we're really good at draft. Uh, like we have big hero pool. It's not easy to draft against them. And also Azure. I also think we are a good team with good picks. I don't know. Maybe. Looks like LGD or Gladiators. Okay, come on, pick one, please. The audience wants to know just what? Uh, gladiators, maybe. All right, fantastic. 
Fantastic. Well, we'll see if your prediction comes out to be correct. But an incredible 2-0 series. Such a pleasure to watch you play once again, leading these guys into victory. And we'll throw it back to you guys on the panel. Well, Slacks really put Silent on the spot there. Thank you for that. Now, I mean, fear. I mean, he just straight up said Game and Gladiators in the finals. He did not straight up say no, that. Yeah, kind sure. of, Lots of his arm was twisted a little. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Gladiators looks really good right now. Like, sure, maybe the group stage, they fell to the lower bracket, but ever since they've been in the playoffs, they've been unstoppable. So I would not be surprised to see him there. But as he mentioned before, the other two teams look really strong as well. Azure Ray looking great. LGD, maybe this is a good learning experience for them. They could come back even stronger. Yeah, LGD was a team that before the series only lost one game so far. So losing two here on the main stage, Lacoste, that, that does make you rethink strategies. So they got, got a night rest, they can sleep on it. And uh, surely they learn a lot from this. Oh, absolutely. This is a team that can recover. I mean, they have a variety of picks. Uh, this is the like one of the biggest brains in Dota that ever existed. Zhao Wade's going to cook something really good for tomorrow. Sorry, the background. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I was also like for, for LGD at least, it's like in game one, super close such small decisions they have to deal with. And the second game, they jump on this mag idea, right? And I think, if anything, it will be the argument of CK, do we need to go for mag? Did we get in our own heads? Do we rush towards it? So, yeah, the mini meta, it appears. I kind of expect this to be the finals, but that's on gaming and Azure Ray to step up and try and muscle up against these two titans of the teams. Yeah, a little bit of mind games definitely there with the Magnus also being back in mid, and we talked about how it looked good on the off lane with Collapse, so a lot to think about there. Also, we didn't see a lot of the Weaver, which we thought was going to be highly contested here today, and, and it feels like the meta is ever shifting, and it's up to the teams to really learn from each other and take it to the next level. And speaking of learning, I believe a lot a lot of people have been learning, or at least they should have, because Tsunami is going to test the knowledge. Hello, friends. It's between series three and four. How are we doing right now? That's what I like to hear. Now, if you recall yesterday, I played a little game with you guys. You mind if we do it again? Well, then let's roll it. Let's get ready for another edition of Forced 50%. Now this edition has a little bit of a twist. I'm gonna make it a little bit easier for you guys. It's called higher or a lower edition. I'm not gonna make you figure out which is the answer. I'm just gonna say a number and you tell me is the real answer higher or lower. And as usual, I have my lovely assistant in the crowd. Slacks, do you have some contestants ready? Wrangled up some contestants. Hello, contestants. In case you didn't hear, you must simply say, is the number, the real number, higher or lower than the one that Tsunami is giving you? And if you're, thank you so much, very eager. And if you're correct, you get this beautiful Tide Hunter. That's Ooh. it, that's the prize. Ah, careful. All right, All right, then. Are we ready to get started? Mm -hmm. So, specifically, I'm going to be asking about questions from all TIs. I'm going all the way to one. Group stage, playoffs, finals, everything. So let's get started. Hi. How many unique players have competed at TI? Is it higher or lower than 500? 500 players. Is the real number higher or lower, sir? Higher. He says higher. He says so higher. Computer, is the real answer higher or lower? Oh! TI is a very exclusive club, friends. We're not just handing out these invitations. You gotta earn them. And only 434 different players have earned it. That's just getting started, though. Let's take things up a notch. Three million creeps have been killed at TI. Is the real number higher or lower? And I'll give you a little bit of a hint. At this TI, almost 400,000 creeps have been murdered. Gee, I stopped paying attention as soon as he started saying numbers. Uh, well, do you have any idea? Must be higher. Higher. Must be higher. 